Gravewalkers, Book One, Dying Time, by Richard T. Schrader. Copyright 2013. All rights reserved. Chapter One, Chow by Robot. A general planetary-wide distress call illuminated the gunship's heads-up display at the pilot's cockpit position. Its accompanying beeping proved to be audible anywhere in the cabin-equipped aircraft. Whoever had sent such an emergency request for help would happily accept it from whomever responded quickly enough. That meaning non-combat supply and transport vehicles were equally welcome, and not just the heavily armed assault and rescue birds like Critias's Marshal Service gunship the Achilles. A moment later, the HUD computer triangulated the transmission's source location, which confirmed the GPS transponder data that came encoded in the distress message. It was a bad one. The distressed party had marooned themselves on the immediate outskirts of a dense urban ruin, one of many former megacities that still dotted what remained of industrialized Asia. All the old names from when humans owned the world had effectively faded from active use, common knowledge, or genuine concern, forgotten to anyone but itinerant explorers or history scholars. Critias had nothing specific to call the place, just the detailed topographical map of some verified coordinates. His android Carmen leaned her violet-haired head out from the doorway of his ship's small sleeping cabin. That's the distress call alarm. She informed him about the beeping as if he would need her assistance to know. She actually did realize that he knew, but it was a conversation starter for getting him to take her on the mission in a capacity that involved her leaving the confines of the gunship. Her hair color was not by choice or fashion. The League of Bioengineers who created all the androids had a policy that required their creations to grow hair in obviously inhuman colors. That genetic mandate ensured that no one would ever mistake them for being real humans, which they otherwise so ideally simulated. Carmen's hair color was not as overtly degrading as them having tattooed the word slave across her forehead, but the idea behind it was entirely the same. When Critias didn't immediately respond, Carmen hurried to the cockpit to confront him directly. Her prancing gait displayed an unsettling exuberance for getting into combat action. Carmen was more eager than ever to confront her first ghoul infestation. It was an opportunity for blood and gore that Critias had thus far denied her. Critias had trained for the dangerous work of ghoul fighting for most of his life. Thumping infected freaks was not the only curriculum at the Virgil Ludus Marshall School, colloquially known as the orphanage where he had grown up. While only an average academic student at best, Critias had excelled at the combat-oriented lessons. Beyond the schooling, Critias also had his recent promotion to captain as proof that he had years of practical experience when it came to stomping around down in the wild meat yonder. Carmen was still brand new, and while no doubt overflowing with virtual skill sets and infinite talents, she was as yet untested in actual combat. Critias was more than content to take her initiation slowly. Joyful enthusiasm for mayhem was a bad quality in any marshal, and so Critias assumed it was no sign of excellence in any combat android either, even one like her. She was the newest Epsilon series of hunter-killer class synthetics. She came out of the stew tank with a 260 IQ, a nigh-invulnerable titanium skeleton, and the program-based battle knowledge worthy of any dozen martial heroes, or so the lab jockeys had claimed. She wore a shuttle hangar technician's blue flight suit, with the soft shoes and a ball cap, Carmen appeared to be a respectable young lady stuck playing tomboy after joining the service to become a flight mechanics ensign. Critias had selected her costume with that effect in mind. He didn't like it when people glanced at her thinking she was merely some misappropriated pillowing android he had stolen from a low-gravity orgy bar. Improperly dressed, that was exactly how morally corrupting her curves could be, so he saw no reason that anyone else should be privy to his personal opulences. It's a city, Critias told her, sounding both calm and slightly annoyed with her. He found Carmen to be perpetually irritating and suspected that she went out of her way to cause it, like with the distress alarm beeping. The only time she wasn't frustrating him was when he product tested her in the bedroom. That part of their working relationship was never annoying and plenty vigorous enough to suggest that she would be capable in combat if she ever managed to instill enough confidence in him to let her try. Beijing. Carmen informed him, using the location's name from the old world that had passed away nearly three centuries prior. I like that name better than just calling it a city, don't you? She asked rhetorically to show that she didn't like that overly simplistic description, 
as though perhaps Critias was some sort of dullard that lacked the eloquence to put it into proper verbiage. After all, they were on their way down to what had once been a true wonder of the world, a super metropolis among the largest of old mankind's habitats. Carmen continued, City is sort of a curt euphemism for naming what is truly a gargantuan man-eating tumor that would be indistinguishable from hell, if only hell were comprised of meat instead of stone and rusting iron. City is a sad way to describe a continuous citified strand of Metro Ragia Bayou that chases you around with biohazardous teeth. She had included hell a couple times, hoping to please him. It was Cretius's favorite curse word, after all. Cretius took the bait, since he now officially felt annoyed with her anyway. What the hell is a Metro Ragia, dare I ask? That would be abnormal bleeding from a uterus. Carmen clarified. A most visceral image, if you ask me which he obviously had to his accurately anticipated regret. She was right, of course. That disgusting description was dead on when referring to the biological horror show that the Earth had become. It was impossible to be too disgusting when putting it all into words. That Carmen insisted on constantly using vocabulary he couldn't understand and often had never even heard before was all part of what made her so damn irritating. She asked, Are you going to let me go outside to see it? No. He promptly replied like he hadn't taken even a moment to think about it. You don't understand ghouls well enough yet that I can trust you. For now, you just need to watch me and learn a few things. For a moment, Critias actually wondered if Carmen was going to fail to annoy him for once, and then she dashed that illusion by opening her mouth and letting her never-ending internal dialogue fly free. I know all about ghouls, she assured him with genuine confidence. They are proverbially resilient creatures, entirely vicious notoriously carnivorous, and wholly lacking in any forms of meekness that beings with the destiny to inherit the earth were reputedly going to possess. Ghouls never age, never die, and at the very worst, they just end up inert piles of undead meat that remain infectious forever. Carmen was entirely right, of course. The ghouls of their time had persevered the passing centuries, survived human lifetimes sleeplessly honing their predatory skills and killer instincts, the passage of time had only made them ever more cunning and dangerous. Even in their first days they had proved to have the ferocity and wherewithal to wipe out terrestrial humanity, and that was when mankind was at their most numerous and equipped with every resource to prevent it. Those were the days before mankind unwillingly transformed into billions of insentient, contagiously diseased humanoids. Those hideous, mindless monsters still held undisputed sway over every earthly landmass, which was the world of the present day. Despite his own regular internal monologues and frequently verbalized empty threats about leaving Carmen back at home, Critias never did. He found that having her around was a comfort in some way that only the egghead psychologist would fully understand. Those bioengineers in their white lab coats had tested, quizzed, and studied Critias in intimate detail before they finally composed all their observations into a final form. Just one look at Carmen's exquisite configuration proved that the makers had Michelangelo's eyes and Mozart's ears when it came to collating four-letter neorganic ontogeny sculptures into living, speaking personifications of human perfection. In Carmen's case, she was a form gleaned from Critias's own subconscious mind. Ontogeny, Critias thought, as he silently shook his head over the word, a bioengineer's word that he picked up from Carmen lecturing him. In some way, it disgusted him that she really was infecting his vocabulary with her insufferable superhuman intelligence. As to not leaving Carmen at home, that home was the luxuriously massive Orbital Platform 9, where 17,000 inhabitants knew and loved their Homer. That technological habitat, along with the various other orbital space stations, was the only perfectly infection-free places left for what remained of humanity. Not even the atomically sterilized islands or the oceanic Big Hulk horticulture carriers gave that same orbital seal of preferred cleanliness. Job necessity or not, having an android was surely the pinnacle height of privilege and comfort that any man could hope to possess anywhere in civilization, for nothing was more splendid than owning a combat-ready, tailor-made, indentured concubine for a personal servant. He had named her Carmen only three months prior. The name just came to him when she had called him Master as her first delighted word upon opening her freshly activated mechanical eyes. She saw Critias gazing back down on her in utterly delighted stupefaction. 
The bioengineers had encoded Carmen to be a field operations K-series model based on their newest and most capable Epsilon R series of scientist engineering technical androids. Like them, she was a combination of bioengineered neorganic tissues and surgically implanted high-endurance technological hardware. Carmen wasn't as godlike in her intelligence as were her light-duty Epsilon R predecessors who worked as laboratory assistants, and yet like them, she was still super genius enough to have a rebelliously grandiloquent manner unbefitting of a proper servant or for a hot zone combat marshal for that matter. Her implanted hardware included an interlink modem that allowed her instantaneous communications with not only the Grand Network and the gunship, but with most any piece of modern technology from weapons and surveillance devices to powered doors and kitchen blenders. As to the matter of the distress call, Carmen brought up a bunch of relevant information to display on the cockpit's main data HUD. She explained the nature of the emergency. It is a civilian transport. They experienced catastrophic drive failure and had to make an emergency landing. Being a synthetic android and also the property of the Marshal Service, Carmen had deep access to data flow and classified security matters in general. Her behavior inhibitors made it impossible for her to ever be disloyal to her human masters or divulge secrets to unqualified ears. So the makers saw no good reason to deny her access to most anything. If nothing else, lies and disinformation were toxic to artificial minds. The androids processed information so fast and in such unpredictably innovative ways that any censorship or restrictions were more likely to cause them harm than provide any benefits. Critias saw from the data she displayed that the ship belonged to the Rex Leonis barony. One way of saying it would be that Rex Leonis was a family or clan, but they were far more than that. They had their own island domain from where they had operated for over 200 years. Their island not only had the premier human biology medical university, but also a wide range of manufacturing facilities that included everything from reclamation processing refineries and a marine protein canning facility to a linear vectoring rotary inertia engine lab. Their total wealth was incalculable and their influence was great enough to make them a de facto branch of government. Their family members held job positions of most every sort, extending well beyond the confines of their heavily fortified island. The place was so beautiful that it was even a popular tourist resort for vacationing orbital citizens. Baron Leo was as influential and respected as any governor, Critias' own boss and head of the Marshal Service, the Grand Marshal Wayne, or the Reclamation General. All of those people confabbed with Baron Leo regularly on matters of important business. He asked Carmen, What the hell are they doing in such a godforsaken place anyway? Is there anything going on there that I should know about? She expanded a data panel to bring it to dominance on the display before explaining, Governor Akashi sponsored an operation to test a new ghoul eradication robot. They selected Beijing as the test site. Carmen made pages of data reports scroll by in a speedy blur that only she could have read if she had needed to read it rather than just absorbing it all instantaneously over the interlink. She interpreted the reports for him. The robot attracted, crushed, and then packaged feral ghouls for approximately seven hours and then had a critical systems failure of an unknown nature. The distressed ship is a research and survey vessel that Governor Akashi employed to perform a ranged aerial investigation. It appears that their ship also had a mysterious mechanical failure. Carmen made a slight frown as she pondered the automated diagnostic report that came from the downed ship. According to the data I have available, their Tesla Flux engine developed unsustainable cavitations in its harmonic field. The imbalance threatened to disintegrate the ship with catastrophic vibrations. Their pilot had no choice but to land immediately. Critias was no Tesla Flux engineer, so he had to ask, What causes that? I don't really know what caused it, Carmen confessed. But this diagnostic reading suggests that a mass of neodymium came into contact with their field drive's casing and that immediately impeded its normal function. I find it highly improbable that debris of that nature would be able to reach their ship at survey altitude. The data I have is most perplexing. I believe that only a closer examination of the engine itself would be able to answer your question. Critias offered a sarcastic comment. We all know how frequently the high-tech breaks down around here. His sarcasm went over Carmen's head, such that she took him seriously, and then went to her norm of correcting his ignorance with her superior intelligence. Actually, she replied, it is quite rare for anything to happen in such a way that we would call it a mystery. Having it happen twice in the same day in the same location is even more improbable. 
He suspected that the problems were anything but accidental, but Critias kept that conspiratorial opinion to himself for the moment. Instead, he said, Hopefully a mysterious accident won't bring us down too. There has to be an easier way to find out that this really is enemy action. Oh. Carmen voiced her sudden comprehension. Goldfinger, Chicago rules. Once with the extermination robot was happenstance. Twice with the survey ship was coincidence. But a third time with the Achilles would be proof of enemy action. She needed a moment to search an epic amount of information in an effort to develop a clear answer as to just who such an enemy might be. In the end, Carmen settled on the most mundane possibility. You think there is a traitor among you? Would it be an enemy of Governor Akashi or of Baron Leo? Both. Critias offered cryptically. And everyone else for that matter. I don't mean a traitor from within. There is something else out there, something much worse. And it doesn't like it when we trespass on Earth. When we dig in too deep or stay for too long, it seems to always come along and blow our house down. I think the robot really pissed them off, and then this survey ship going down was more of the same. We need to grab whoever is left down there and then get the hell out of Dodge. The city is Beijing. Carmen corrected his name for the place. But I understand what you mean. She had other ideas than leaving in a hurry. I need to inspect the engine of the downed ship. Maybe the robot, too. I would be able to tell you the cause, and then you would know more about this enemy you think is down there. If you can identify the culprit, we could go on a mission to kill or capture this entity. He shook his head no. A snatch carrier can fly in and then lift their equipment out for repairs. The engineers will have all the time they need to figure out what went wrong. You will stay on the ship and follow my instructions. It will only take a moment to get the survivors aboard. She felt disappointed that once again he would deny her the entertainment of meeting and battling ghouls. Carmen understood that complaining wouldn't help, so she didn't bother. Because the bioengineers had synthetically manufactured nearly all of Carmen's mind and memories, it was difficult for her to personalize it in a way that humans naturally did. In her mind were records and images of the old world before the ghouls had destroyed it. The golden age of man was a sight to see with cities that stretched to the horizons, all glimmering with millions of electric lights and the illuminated signals on their swarms of ground vehicles that rolled about in lines as would army ants. The signage was also brilliantly colored. Carmen had a special love for its grandiose pomposity and relished the idea of getting to see it in person. To say the least, Carmen felt sorely disappointed by the drab reality. The land was green. There was some brown here and there, like where the rocks of the mountainous areas showed through, but it was mostly green. There were shades of green and brown. The Chaobai River was more blue than green, but even that was far from the vibrant colors of the former civilization that she had hoped to see. In the nearly three centuries since the fall of man, fully grown trees had filled in the landscape. Carmen could make out the remains of tall buildings that formed a sort of gap-toothed wall along the western shore of the river but even they were dull shades of brown, gray, and green. While it was certain that underneath the blanket of vegetation was the vast remains of an epic city, even from the sky they could see little of it. In total, the experience felt worse than a disappointment. It struck her as being more akin to her mourning at a funeral. She felt a sense of loss and longing that nothing could ever fulfill, or so she believed. One thing they could see was the six-lane elevated roadway that led to an intact bridge that crossed the river. Soil had accumulated onto the concrete deck, enough that it had grass and smaller plants growing all over it. Nothing tall as a tree could ever sink deep enough roots into the pavement to prevent the windy season from blowing it over. The end result was no less boring than everything else, but at least the lack of trees made the snaking highway readily visible. They used the bridge for testing their robot, Carmen said as to why the HUD gave the place as their destination. Satellite reconnaissance places the heavier ghoul population deeper in the city. The ghouls find better shelter there in the winter, Critias explained the reason. The cold can't kill them, but it makes them miserable and hungrier, so they avoid it when they can. Now that we are in the warm season, their ghoul-smashing robot would get a steady traffic crossing the bridge as they migrate around looking for things to eat. With telescopic cameras, Critias zoomed in on the robot to see what they could. It was a tracked vehicle of sorts with a rotating torso on top. An assortment of arms from large paddles to smaller tentacles allowed the device to scoop up any ghouls that came near enough. 
the automated harvester would deposit the bodies into a chute where internal mechanisms squashed the ghoul, boiled off the water content of its body, and then compacted the dehydrated meat into large cubes. The robot finally sealed each cube inside a plastic film that kept the biohazardous tissue safely packaged. Presumably, some other robotic machine would have come along later to dispose of the packaged meat cubes. There was a line of finished cubes along the bridge that proved that the robot had operated as planned, at least for a while. It wasn't moving anymore, and no active communication signals came from it. Critias guessed that the inspection team had gotten as far as he had, learned as little as he had, and then their Tesla Flux drive engines had crapped out, which forced them to land. Rather than ditch in the river, which would have been problematic on many levels, their pilot had elected to set down on the elevated roadway as far east as he was able. The ship was intact, and the landing gear was down. By all appearances, it had been a safe touchdown where no one got hurt, and the ship remained salvageable. Since the harvester robot had already consumed the roadway ghoul population and packaged it for later incineration, the survey ship had landed in a relatively peaceful area. All the crew had to do was stay locked inside their vehicle until rescue arrived, which with Critias, it just had. Critias got up from the pilot seat to go suit up in his armor. As he headed for the equipment locker, he ordered Carmen, Radio them that we have arrived and will be retrieving them momentarily. Stay on station to keep an eye on things, but don't get close enough to put more attention on them than they already have. As Carmen buckled herself into the pilot's chair, she asked, Do you want me to search the area for that enemy you are worried about? Yeah, sure. He agreed dismissively, not at all taking her seriously. Critias did believe that the inevitable trouble that terrestrial operations always encountered were the work of some sinister intelligence. He just didn't think that Carmen could solve it with the ship's telescopic cameras scanning the world's endless forests. He locked down the visor on his helmet as he returned to the cockpit fully prepared. Critias's officer class mech suit was bullet-resistant armor fiber integrated into an android's neorganic musculature, all melded onto a titanium exoskeleton armature. In total, the suit provided him with a fantastic boost to his physical strength and agility. It stabilized his hand-eye dexterity, enhanced his perceptions with its myriad high-tech sensors, and screened out poisonous fumes or infectious agents for an inexhaustible supply of breathable air. Locking himself inside his extremely valuable mech suit was the next best personal security to being safely home in space. A mech suit was indispensable when it came to preventing the infectious ghouls from wounding him and thus condemning him to joining them as a cursed, crazed immortal. Suits like his were not cheap or easy to manufacture. In many ways, they were the equivalent of an android turned inside out so a person could wear them. They were too extravagant for everyone to have, so it was a hard-won privilege for the elite few who were always in professions where the public expense wouldn't go to waste. Carmen reported, They have a crew of five and none of them are injured. We can pick them up when you are ready. Before Critias could give the command for her to take them down for the retrieval, the gunship suddenly lurched sideways and began to freefall. It was all Critias could do just to grab onto something, lock down his magnetic spacer boots, and prevent himself from bouncing around the cockpit. Since Carmen was already secure in the pilot's chair and had affixed her seat harness according to protocol, she was able to immediately devote her full attention toward regaining control of the gunship. Ever since she studied the diagnostic report that the survey ship's engine had sent about its failure, Carmen had contemplated every possible scenario as to what might have happened and what she might do to prevent that same failure in the future. Because of her thorough preparations, Carmen had been actively watching out for the same cavitational anomaly to take place in their own Tesla Flux propulsion system. Her prompt solution was to increase power to the engines rather than shut them down, which would have been the proper safety measure to prevent the imbalance from shaking the ship to shreds. Carmen also remodulated the Tesla Flux field, not in terms of attraction or repulsion, but with an awareness of deflecting the magnetic grip of a dipolar mass that she believed had attached itself to the external casing of the engine. Her quick thinking ejected the foreign magnet with the speed of a bullet, and thus freed of its influence, she immediately restored the Achilles to normal flight. It wasn't Carmen saving their asses that captured Critias's attention. He watched with astonishment as the ghoul harvesting robot vanished along with the entire section of road deck it had been on. That moment was the time required for the sound waves to reach them, an indescribable crunch as from an earthquake. 
Dust clouds gushed up from the ground, at first around the sides of the elevated roadway, and then all of it as the robot section collapsed, taking the machine down along with it. The failure did not end there. The adjoining section to the east buckled, and then it too plummeted to the forested ground below. What the hell is going on? Critias called out in disbelief. Everything was going to shit so fast that he couldn't believe it. There goes another one. Carmen warned as the next roadway section failed at its western end and then dropped. It seemed like good fortune when the eastern end split at the seam only to hold while the western end slammed down onto the rubble of the sections that had foundered before it. For the moment, it appeared that the systemic collapse had halted and the crippled survey ship remained safe, as could be expected under the circumstances. Get us down there now, Critias ordered her. I don't know how long that section can hold. With his limited understanding, Critias assumed that it had been the weight of the robot that had caused the decrepit road section to collapse, and the survey ship was not a lightweight either. The crew of the downed ship must have thought much the same thing. They no longer felt safe inside their aircraft, and they wouldn't be if the roadway section they were on decided to fall underneath them. It wasn't as if the highway was brand new. It had suffered the significant change of the local seasons without maintenance for nearly three centuries. Most bridges and elevated roadways on Earth had already collapsed from natural causes being so old. That highway was not safe, even under the best of conditions. Already wounded, it might fail at any moment. Carmen demonstrated superb piloting skills as she swooped the Achilles down to rescue the crew, who even then rushed out into the open. Some of them waved frantically skyward for the gunship to hurry, or perhaps they thought their rescuers couldn't see them through the billowing dust clouds. I will lower the boarding stairs, Critias told her as he headed back from the cockpit. I want you to hover as close to the deck as you can without touching down. That section has enough weight on it already, and we are much heavier than that survey bird. Yes, Master. Carmen confirmed her orders, since an order it was, and her inhibitor hardware module forced her to comply with it to the best of her ability. Dust from the collapse spread outward across the area, reducing visibility to only a few meters. Carmen could pilot by the topographical radar, but Critias had no special means to see, since no wavelength of light could pass through that fog of pulverized cement. As soon as Critias opened the hatch and lowered the boarding ramp, he heard the familiar howling of ghouls already in a killing frenzy. It didn't make sense, but he was sure he heard thousands, which was far too many to be so close so quickly. A vanguard of their fast movers should have arrived well enough in advance to warn of an approaching tribe, only there were none. The five survivors certainly heard the hideous shrieking of the damned, and most of them were not seasoned combat veterans accustomed to such stress. Some of them turned back toward the survey ship, while others came forward to where they thought the Achilles would land. In a moment, they lost sight of each other in the dust, and a greater panic set upon them. I can't see a damn thing out here. Critias radioed to Carmen. This is going to hell in a handbasket. I think I can help. Carmen radioed back, and then a moment later the gunship throbbed with a slow but steady imbalance in the drive system that beat like a heart. Whatever it was that Carmen did to the ship, it worked wonderfully. The pulse interruptions she caused in the field of the Tesla Flux engines were too brief to affect their flight stability, but it did repulse all the dust particles as they came within its sphere of influence. It made them shoot away due to particle field interaction. With clever tuning, she had modified the engines to act as a dielectrophoretic dust particle remover. The dust parted for the Achilles gunship as though a Red Sea for Moses. Carmen brought them down low enough that she touched the nose gear to the pavement while keeping the rest of the landing gear and all the weight of the ship airborne. Critias knew better than to trust in the survivors to do anything intelligent. He jumped down to the deck with a Tesla Flux rifle in hand and then rushed toward their down ship to collect them himself. The dust flowing away made Critias think that even if Carmen was irritating, she was a very clever girl. That was when the dust rolled back far enough to reveal the slither wall, an actual crawling embankment of crippled and deformed ghouls. While it was true that all ghouls started out as natural human beings, nearly three centuries of hard living had differentiated them into a variety of forms. The few who survived the downfall of humanity had given the creatures just as broad a range of often amusing names based on their general appearance and degree of mobility. All infected could regenerate injuries, but with limitations that included rampant deformity under some circumstances. The flood of ghouls that approached at the moment were all of the crawler variety. 
When other infected had first killed them while they were still human, they sometimes devoured entire limbs. Fully functional ghouls could encounter some misfortune, like the collapse of rubble in a decrepit building, and that would rob them of a limb. Such grievous losses rarely grew back, and even less frequently regenerated into anything functional. Amputations generally just healed over as permanent losses. Crawlers were those ghouls that could no longer run or even walk for want of functional legs. Crippled or not, they remained entirely ferine as they pulled themselves along in a slithering scramble to get where they wanted to be. Their progress was slow, and it greatly impeded their ability to initiate an effective attack. The injuries so greatly diminished their prowess that crawlers were the least dangerous opponent their kind had to offer, at least when they operated in the open as they did then. Critias had considerable personal experience and even more formal education as to the nature of the ghouls. He instantly realized that the situation was inconsistent with reason. No matter how many crawlers there were in the world, there was no reason for them to band together as they were, not outdoors. And even more peculiar was the total absence of their far more dangerous and mobile counterparts who still had their legs. Normal sprinting ghouls should have been all over them like rabid jackrabbits, but instead there was nary a one, only the slavering, filthy, clawing cripples that dragged themselves ahead with that universal mad zealotry for killing humans. Other infected ended up so quadriplegically mutilated that they could never again effectively chase food in any mode, ambulation or otherwise. So instead they would lay in wait as the persistent lurkers, dormant as doormats, for years when necessary, until some unfortunate thing blundered close enough for the disabled ghoul to strike at it with a mangled limb from surprise. Just as everyone gets wet when it rains, the parting of the dust was equally beneficial to the crawling ghouls who could then see as well. If they were furious before, the actual sighting of humans really got them howling for blood. They went wild with murder lust, such that many of them bled from the others trying to claw past or over them to get at the meat first. Thus was their terrible frenzy. Only then did Critias realize where the ghouls even came from. They crawled up the sloping roadway section from the forest below. Critias could only imagine how many had died in the collapse itself, and even then they had plenty to spare, and more besides. They crawled up that broad ramp like a gravity-defying wave, hundreds of them, perhaps thousands. If common sense had prevailed, Critias would have returned to his dropship and saved himself. The honor and reputation of his ludus was just as much at stake as was his life, and that of the marshal service as well. Retreat was simply not an option he could accept, so desperate actions were his remaining recourse. Chrysius figured that he could jump up atop one of the robot's defecated ghoul meat cubes and then shoot up the crawlers from there to draw their attention away from the survivors, hopefully giving them enough time to reach the ramp into his gunship. He considered ordering Carmen to unleash the ship's heavy Tesla flux cannons against the ghouls, but their front was much too wide, and those powerful shells might trigger further collapse of the roadway. Not only that, but Carmen would have to pilot a way into a firing position, making it impossible for anyone to climb aboard for evacuation. Before he got a chance to try out his questionable plan, one of the survivors approached him dragging a cylindrical canister that came from the survey ship. Critias recognized her by name. Marshal Jillian, you need to get to my ship while you can. The woman had blatantly conspicuous prosthetic legs that were mechanical in nature as opposed to her neorganic ones that she wore in cosmetic circumstances. Jillian was not from his Virgil Ludus, but Critias was well aware of her distinguished service. Much like the crawler ghouls that relentlessly approached them, Jillian lost both of her legs in a building collapse during a field mission. While recovering from that near-fatal injury, she had returned to her higher education and eventually attained her surgical medicine certification. At that point, she had retired from the service to pursue her new interests of science and medicine. The career change was something she was rightly proud of when Jillian told him. It is doctor at present, not Marshall, but we can catch up later. For now, I need you to throw this. It will buy us some time. Before turning over the container to him, Jillian punched in a security code on the cylinder's numeric panel, which turned a red light to green. Heave it at them. It will handle the rest. Using the enhanced strength of his mech suit, Critias lifted the cylinder by its topmost grip handle and then flung it as far as he could in a high arc. It came down some five meters behind the foremost infected. The silvery outer skin jettisoned itself from the cylinder to reveal rows of circular ports about the diameter of a man's thumb. All the scrambling and thrashing of the naked crawlers never stopped jostling the cylinder around. 
Whatever side happened to be facing upward used its apertures to launch a popcorn fountain of small spheres that rained back down into the mass of writhing creatures. Cretius witnessed that many of the little balls volleyed back toward them and came to rest well in front of the approaching horde. Those that landed in the mossy roadway seemingly did nothing. The spheres that dropped down among the ghouls invariably came into direct contact with their moist filth-strewn bodies. When that happened, the water-reactive alkali metal coatings of the little balls proved to be extremely pyrophoric, not only bursting into white-hot flame, but also detonating the explosive charges at their cores. The fiery blast spread doom, confusion, and incendiary materials among even more of the crawlers. In all that acrid smoke and shrieking agony, the crawler advance faltered. The belly-dragging ghouls had no chance of avoiding the minefield of pellets that continued to spread both among and all around them. Their attack broke down into confused chaos, where they turned on each other to vent their crazed torment. Now we can go, Dr. Gillian informed Critias. The other four survivors had joined them by then, and everyone hurried for the boarding ramp to his gunship. The other crash survivors were terrified over the situation. Unlike Jillian, none of them had any real experience dealing with the ghouls or being outdoors in a hot zone. Carmen warned them all by radio. A second tribe is advancing on you from the east. They have us surrounded. We need to depart as soon as possible. Automatic shots from Critias's combat rifle masterfully cut down some of the crawlers who had escaped the incendiary area denial weapon by climbing over the top of their roasting compatriots. He came about to see that the runner ghouls who had been missing were in fact not missing at all. They had massed under the bridge further east and then climbed up the elder trees that flanked both sides of the roadway. Dozens of them leaped from the high branches onto the road deck and then sprinted straight for them at Olympic speeds. Far from being slow and clumsy, kill-frenzy hatred nitrous-fueled their already supercharged metabolic systems. Runner ghouls came at them like a swarm of cheetahs. They did not know fear or hesitation. When ghouls saw pure strain humans, they just wanted to kill. Run! Cretius ordered as he stood steady, then took aim down his Tesla Flux rifle. He had a clear field of fire and oncoming targets. His truly gifted talent with weapons proved itself as he steadily put a supersonic bullet into their faces one by one. A tree to the east actually snapped and then toppled under the weight of so many ghouls as they climbed its branches. Plenty of other trees managed to bear their wretched burden. Hundreds more of the runners joined the assault. Once the others were well ahead of him, Critias followed. He took time to load a fresh clip and then shot down more infected as he ran. One of Dr. Gillian's companions stepped into a hole in the road deck that had been invisible under a thin net of vinery and a blanket of plant litter. The opening went clear through and was large enough to swallow the man whole. He would have smashed down below on the forest floor if Critias had not caught him by the back of his field jacket, then set him back on firm footing. On top of everything else, the roadway was also a minefield of hidden holes where one wrong step could be a person's last. Fear of the onrushing ghouls was far greater than that of falling, so everyone blindly took their chances to get to the gunship. Saving the scientist from falling to his death was of no special glory to Critias. In his mind, lab-coated eggheads were always all thumbs and two left feet when out in the Badlands. Keeping them from killing themselves with their own bumbling around was just part of his job description. What did concern Critias was the hole itself, or more accurately, what lurked down at the bottom of it. As anyone would, Critias, of course, took the instant to glance down into the void to see if it was just a harmless pothole or an express elevator shaft leading to the next world. At first he appreciated their height off the ground and what the impact would have done to the hapless fool, and yet even that was not his real issue. The thing that set Critias aback was that they were not the only ones surprised by the sudden accident. Way down below, standing on the forest floor and gazing straight up at the unexpected event, was a man's astounded face. It was definitely some kind of man and not a feral ghoul. The guy's face expressed amazement without any hint of rage. More than that, the realization that the road deck had a hole like that was only slight compared to his alarm at seeing Critias up there staring back at him. The man recognized Critias as a threat he wanted to avoid rather than chase after. There were other ghouls down there milling about, mostly crawlers, a few runners, and one big one that seemed to be a hunter, which was what marshals called the somewhat rare but insanely dangerous freaks who expressed regenerative gigantism. 
Some mishap or misfortune set their healing factor into overload, which resulted in them attaining sizes well beyond anything normal for ghouls. When one considered that only massive damage to the brain or spinal cord would even stop a ghoul, the really big ones could soak up ammo like an undead rhinoceros. No one should ever take a hunter lightly or pursue them for trophies, even though some marshals did exactly that, even going so far as to use a blade for the deed as an ultimate demonstration of ghoul-killing prowess and bolstering the reputation of their own ludus. To top everything else, Critias saw that the man had short hair, which ghouls never did. Ghouls did not get haircuts, and their hair continued to grow in a manner comparable to humans, as did their fingernails. Only wear and tear of the environment shortened either of those. It was all over in an instant. Critias didn't have time to wait around to learn more, and the man below wasn't inclined to wait around either, perhaps fearing that Critias would just shoot him in the head on general principle. Nervous caution was another quality that Critias had never seen in the infected. Sure, a ghoul would redirect its path to go around a fire rather than through it, but they didn't react anything like what Critias had just witnessed. He was not sure what he had just seen, only that it was damn peculiar indeed. Dr. Gillian came back with her TFP-9 Marshal Service pistol in hand, a weapon that remained part of her daily life, even as a medical doctor. Critias wore a similar weapon in his hip holster, only his had considerably more engraving and customization. The personalized weapon was nearly a religious totem for him. Gillian asked him urgently, Is something wrong? Probably. Critias replied honestly as he dialed up a liquid catalyst variable blast grenade to its maximum effect and then dropped it down the hole to fall to the forest floor below. He was no longer sure how many of those ghoulish freaks were still down there, but he wanted to send the peculiar one a going away present, sort of a thank you gift for all the day's trouble he had caused. Gillian and Critias dashed together to the boarding ramp of the Achilles. They arrived just as the grenade exploded below them. Considering that they had a road deck between them and all the ghouls screaming too, the sound was not all that impressive. For whatever ghouls that had still lurked around down there, they certainly experienced a lot more hardship than just a little noise. In fact, that grenade packed enough exotic explosives to blast all of them back to hell and leave a crater besides. As Carmen lifted off the gunship with everyone aboard, Critias and Gillian stood at the doorway at the top of the open ramp. The full rush of the runner ghouls arrived just too late to prevent their escape. Several even leaped off the elevated roadway in the hope of grabbing onto the boarding ramp. They missed, of course, and then fell to crash down through the limbs of the trees. Cretius commented, That was a nice toy you had back there. It really saved the day. Never seen one before. It was experimental. Jillian explained the canister weapon she had provided. Baron Leo had hoped that I would find an opportunity to test it out on a large tribe of ghouls but I honestly never expected to actually need it. Was that his harvester robot, too? Critias asked. Gillian's expression conveyed contempt for that idiotic robot. The Baron was against the project from the very start. It was all Akashi's idea. The people of his station invested a lot of time and resources into that project, and now they have nothing to show for it. I wouldn't want to be him at the next election. She added, Thank you for coming down here to pick us up. Anytime, Critias replied nonchalantly. Chapter 2. Trial and Error After Critias got back to the Homer with Carmen, it was a routine matter for them to pass through decontamination and then return to his apartment. Carmen wanted to go out for dinner and then check out one or more of the dance clubs to celebrate, as she called it, but he had a lot on his mind and preferred to just stay home and fill out all the mission paperwork. As an android, everything that Carmen experienced became a permanent record in her parallel memory core. Anyone with the proper security clearance could call up an event and then see it for themselves. The same was true of Critias's mech suit with all of its sensors and computerization. With that in mind, Critias wrote out his after-mission report with the assurance that he could prove the truth behind everything he said. No one would ever have to take his word for anything. At least at the time he was writing it, Critias had no problem spelling things out as he believed them to be. Forces unknown, but likely the strange man he had seen, had sabotaged Governor Akashi's robot, brought down the survey ship they sent to investigate, and then nearly brought down his Achilles gunship too. The roadway collapse was likely due to either sapping activities, explosives, or a Tesla flux oscillating demolition device, but certainly not natural causes. Cretius explained how the ghoul tribes had been waiting in ambush for a rescue ship to arrive. 
When they did finally attack, they used crawlers as both a distraction and a drain on their ammunition, softening them up for when the stranger unleashed his real assault, a large force of fully capable runners that flanked them from behind. In summation, Critias advised a major investigation and rethinking of all their security. If he was right, anything on or visiting Earth might suffer an attack by this highly intelligent, capable, and malevolent force. With the report out of the way, Critias had some food delivered via the parcel transit tube. They had a simple dinner, and then they went to bed. Critias had not expected to get a medal, commendation, or anything for his rescue mission, but he had believed that the powers that be would take his after-action report seriously, and boy, did they ever. First thing the next morning, two Praetorian marshals were at his door. If the people had to answer to the marshal service for their wrongdoings, the marshals answered to the Praetorian order for their mistakes. When Critias opened his door to find them standing there in their red horsehair crested mech suits, he safely assumed it wasn't good news. On the other hand, if they had planned on killing him, it was unlikely they would have bothered to use the door chime to announce their arrival. Critias's ludus and service records were readily available to the Praetorian order. They would know that Critias was a Ludita Olympia champion and no one to underestimate with any form of weapon or none at all. One of the marshals began with an apology. I'm sorry about this, sir. Both Praetorians were only lieutenants, and they wore the adhesively attached badges of gubernatorial guards. Every governor had a pair of Praetorians at all times as a personal escort. It wasn't always the same two marshals, though from time to time a governor did have a personal relationship with his guardians and kept the same ones on a consistent basis. It was not exactly the most prestigious job in the world, babysitting governors, which was why they tended to be Praetorians of the junior ranks. When Carmen walked up behind Critias to see who was at the door, the second Praetorian actually stepped back in some sort of overreaction to her presence. He asked her a most inexplicable question. Is it you? Carmen didn't understand any more than Critias did. She replied, Last time I checked which was both an amusing and yet non-committal answer that appealed to her odd sensibilities. The first Praetorian scanned her, then raised his armor's forearm display to show his partner the report as he spoke it aloud. Android designation Carmen Series Epsilon K, Hunter Killer Combat Duty Prototype, still under Product Series Evaluation. That was apparently enough for the second Praetorian to shake off his bizarre confusion. To get things rolling, Critias guessed, You two work for Governor Akashi, I take it? Unfortunately, sir. The first Praetorian confessed his dislike for the unscrupulous governor. He asked us to escort you to your martial court of inquiry concerning the incident yesterday. Critias asked. No one saw the need to inform me before now? They didn't make it official until this morning, the Praetorian explained. Those acting on your behalf had hoped to dissuade Governor Akashi from pursuing these matters, but it appears there are some influential voices supporting him as well. I have permission to tell you that if you indulge their political games for now, you will come through all of this with your honor and career intact. If I learned anything yesterday, Critias mused, it is that not everything is what it appears to be. Indeed, the Praetorian agreed, and judging by the turn of his helmet, his eyes lingered on Carmen as he said it. Are you going to place me in restraints? Critias asked. The Praetorian shook his head no. This is only the formal inquiry. You are not currently facing charges for any crimes, and as such you are entitled to every privilege of a citizen and an officer of the Marshal Service. If you are seeking advice, I recommend that you wear your dress uniform with all applicable decorations and your sidearm. Your mech suit would be excessive under the circumstances. Carmen believed that the whole inquiry was something of a joke. She had been on the mission and so knew for a certainty that Critias hadn't done anything wrong. In her naivete, she assumed that the system would always reward virtue and punish wickedness, so it was impossible that Critias could come to harm. Since none of that mattered, her real interest was in asking, What do I get to wear? I don't have a dress uniform, or even any dresses for that matter. You're not going. Critias callously dismissed her relevance. Your memories are already on file as evidence. Only a person can testify in an official hearing. You can just make yourself useful around the apartment until I get back. For now, get my dress uniform ready while I take a quick shower. He told the Praetorians. I'll be ready in a few minutes. Governor Akashi's power was considerable on his own city station, but became mostly ceremonial anywhere else. The Council of Governors as a body were the real authority of the civilian population, and as such, they tended to keep one another in line. 
It came as no surprise to Critias that his inquisition was to take place on Akashi's orbital station, where the man's dictatorial powers would be at their greatest. His Praetorian escorts had their own gunship for taking him there. Orbital Platform 5, commonly known as Herodotus 5, was the city under the control of Governor Akashi. For the most part, it was a residential station with minimal manufacturing or technical functions. Herodotus V was best known for luxury living and was the habitat of choice for those who could afford it. The population was generally well-educated and productive. The station had several impressive entertainment rings with fine eating establishments and expensive shopping. Personally, Critias thought of it as an orbital zoo for pretentious pampered assholes who had never once even seen a ghoul except on video. But what did he know? Even their Peleus Ludus was upper class and fashionable. Spoiled was more like it, at least by his reckoning. As they walked to the council chambers where the hearing would take place, Critias felt surprised to see how many people had turned out to support him. Most impressive was the majority of the Alexander Ludus students who flanked both sides of the hallway in their finest uniforms. Marshal Alexander, the patriarch of Alexander Ludus, had been a Virgil Ludus graduate before opening his own school. The story of Marshal Alexander was essentially that Virgil Ludus was a stoic school that stressed loyalty to the king's law above all else. As any adult who was not a fool was well aware, the law was not always right. Alexander Ludus believed that honor was the higher virtue. With that way of thinking, they obviously had a reputation for breaking the rules to do what they felt was right in the name of honorable conduct. Alexander Ludus marshals were fanatics about the honor of Alexander himself, a man now long in his grave. Since Alexander was a Virgil, woe to those who besmirch the honor of the Virgil Ludus. While Virgil marshals would adhere to the law in the face of insult, the Alexander boys always came a-running to defend the honor of their patriarch's alma mater. When Critias had been a boy, the Virgil Ludus got a new student who had formerly been part of Peleus Ludus. The other students had hazed and beaten the kid to the point that Marshal Command decided to move him to Virgil Ludus instead. When the boys at Alexander Ludus learned that the Peleus Ludus had disgracefully abused a new Virgil, the lot of them flew over there and stormed the place, beat the hell out of the Peleus students, and even trounced a few instructors as well. They did that and endured the punishment for it with smiles on their faces. Since Peleus was the Ludus of Herodotus V, having all of them back again to defend the honor of a Virgil was a clear message that everyone understood. It wasn't a question of how far the Alexander Marshals would go. They would die like samurai for their honor. The question was how fast things would escalate and what it might take to set them off. Once Critias had passed down the long arch of Alexander students hailing him with their raised arms in saluto romano, he came to the doors to the council chamber where two more Praetorians stood honor guard. Near them was a man and a woman. The woman introduced herself. Good morning, Captain Critias. I am Marshal Yoon from the office of the Marshal Chief Justice. I am here to offer you my services as legal advisor. Critias knew the man as every marshal did. He was Sebastian Kane, also known as Black Sabbath Kane, which arose from the matte black mech suit he was known to wear and his name Sebastian. That, and his reputation for being a prolific killer of both ghouls and men. Marshal Sebastian had gunned down and nearly killed a fellow marshal in a duel over a woman, Maria Kane, who then became Sebastian's wife and source of his surname. The marshal he nearly killed refused to press charges against Sebastian, claiming the events took place under mutual agreement as a matter of honor between men. There was no doubting that it was true, since both of them were graduates of the Alexander Ludus. The Council of Governors had still forced Marshal Sebastian out of the service, presumably out of fear that the practice of dueling to the death over personal matters might spread. While the Marshal Service itself hotly contested the wishes of the Council, Sebastian willingly resigned, putting an end to the issue and by association ending any effort by the Governors to pass an actual binding law that would genuinely ban the practice of dueling. No longer a marshal, Sebastian Kane had taken up work with the office of the Reclamation General, doing special operations missions for the general on occasion, but mostly training his mech-suited operatives in the ways of hot zone protocols and ghoul combat. Among his many notable accomplishments, Critias most admired Kane's five hunter kills he made using the short sword he always carried. 
That did not take into account the dozens of hunters he had simply blown away using more traditional ballistic weaponry, gunship cannons, or explosives. Black Sabbath Kane was a marshal's marshal, and he wasn't even one anymore. First Critias told the woman politely without commitment, Thank you for the offer. He then told Kane, It's good to see you again, Marshal Sebastian. Hot Zone marshals never shook hands as greetings, much like they never touched their own faces. Infection was too great a risk. If a person rubbed even the smallest drop of ghoul blood into a scratch or their eye, they would certainly turn, and that would be the end of them. The respectful greeting that Critias could offer was to place his fist over his heart, the first half of their official salute, and then nod his head in recognition. It's Citizen Kane now, Sebastian told him. When Wayne told me that you were in hot water with that asshole Akashi, I thought you might accept me as your second. The general wants the governors to know that the service can always count on his support. The scavengers know as well as anyone how crazy things can get down there. By Wayne, Sebastian meant Critias's boss and mentor, Grand Marshal Wayne, the scavengers being slang for the resource harvesters that worked for the reclamation general. Critias respectfully told Marshal Yoon, The assistance of Mr. Kane will be sufficient for me. I will tell the truth as best I know it. I'm confident that the law will prevail. The hearing itself involved Critias standing in a podium at the center of the room from where he would answer the questions the committee put to him. Governor Akashi stood up to address the chamber. Thank you for attending these proceedings, Marshal Captain Critias Virgil Ludus. He held up a data tablet for emphasis. I have your written report right here, and I studied it thoroughly. I have just one question. After a pause, he demanded. Why did you deliberately destroy the Ritcap? Critias honestly shrugged in that he was never that good at civilian guessing games. I don't even know what a writ cap is, but to my knowledge, I don't deliberately destroy much of anything other than ghouls. The hushed amusement in the room over the answer caused Akashi to do his best to seem intimidating as he clarified. Robotic infected tissue collector and packager, writ cap, my robot prototype. If you had not deliberately destroyed it, my engineers would have worked out the minor bugs. That is what the testing of prototypes is for. Once I proved the brilliance of the concept, we would have mass-produced them and then began the safe and infallible eradication of every animate infected on planet Earth. So I ask you again, Captain, why did you deliberately destroy it? Did someone pay you for this act of treachery? Who are you working for? Perhaps your excuse is that you were just monumentally stupid. Critias was very much a Virgil, so he calmly let the insults pass without offense. He responded, It was the collapse of the elevated roadway that destroyed your robot, Governor. You or someone in your office selected that location. At the time, I was taking stock of the situation from altitude aboard my gunship. The diagnostic records of the Achilles will confirm that I fired none of her weapons, not at the roadway and not at the ghouls. Furthermore, the same weapon that brought down the survey ship I was there to assist also temporarily disabled my engines. It was fortunate that the first incident provided enough information about the nature of the weapon that I could devise a defense against it. Had it been otherwise, I would have also crashed and none of us would have gotten out of there alive. Akashi waved the data pad at Critias as proof of his accusation. I consider this document to be tantamount to your outright confession. In your own words, the collapse was not an accident. In your own words, the collapse was due to the deliberate demolition of the supporting columns of the roadway. Deliberate. I believe it was. Critias agreed with his own report. But not by me. I did consider the possibility that some traitor was actively conspiring against you or Baron Leo, but that was before I saw the stranger with my own eyes. My mech suit recorded everything in sharper detail than I even witnessed it myself. The stranger. Akashi scoffed. Let us have a look at your mysterious villain then, shall we? A man who not only walks freely among the infected without protection, but also commands them to do his nefarious bidding. Those weren't Critias's exact words, but he agreed with them all the same. Yeah, pretty much. The court's massive video display replayed the recording that Critias's mech suit helmet had made. The movie was so huge and with such overwhelming audio quality that everyone in the room could appreciate the dreadful chaos of the situation. It made Critias seem quite capable and heroic under the circumstances, especially when he fired his weapon. All of his shots were to the center mass of a ghoul's head, which invariably blasted it wide open and left the creature permanently inert. When Critias grabbed the technician who fell into the hole, incontestably saving the man's life, someone in the gallery audibly called out, Well done. Enough, Akashi demanded with displeasure. 
Show us the image I asked for. Whoever was in control of the video moved it ahead to where Critias looked down through the hole at the man below, then paused it there. To the layman, the picture did not reveal all that much. All ghouls had human faces, twisted with rage generally, but still human. The man stared back up at Critias. His expression was a human emotion of surprise and alarm. The view angle being straight down made it difficult to see his hairstyle, but it was clearly not long and filthy as would be the norm. This is the ghoul you accuse? Akashi ridiculed him. You suggest this mindless walking pile of garbage not only disabled my robot and collapsed the roadway, but disabled the Tesla flux engines on not one, but two aircraft? At that point, Critias realized that his case was not as solid as he had once believed. All he could think of to say was, Yes. Since the man was not his proof, he decided to bring up the other evidence. You can see from the recordings that the first wave of infected were all crawlers. That is clearly impossible. The second wave of runners that climbed up to attack us from behind only confirms it. Since when do ghouls hide under bridges by the hundreds or thousands waiting for an opportune moment to attack? Something else was going on there, and I am sure that man was behind it. Man? Governor Akashi taunted him. Don't you mean Watcher? Um... Critias hesitated, not knowing if he should honestly agree to that or not. It wasn't the name he had used, but he did know what it meant. Akashi continued his assault of reason. I have here your purchasing records. You are a fan of the Tiger Team 6 comic book series, are you not? It says here that you purchased them, so I assume that you also read them. These are the printed copies as well, which implies you even collect them. Is this not so? Critias just shrugged. It is. Tiger Team 6? Akashi mocked it as childish. An elite team of Praetorian martial heroes battling ancient sentient infected who secretly rule the earth from in hiding. Is that not correct? The writer of these comics calls this secret enemy the Watchers. I submit that Captain Critias is role-playing that he is a member of this fictitious Tiger Team 6 and in his lies or delusions he concocted this ludicrous excuse to cover up his incompetence. Before Critias could reply, the governor commanded the video controller. Show us what he did next. The video showed Critias take out a hand grenade, dial it to the maximum force, and then drop it down the hole to presumably kill the watcher he had seen. You did recklessly use explosives. Akashi accused him. Even after you knew that the roadway was unstable and heavily damaged, you did it again. Critias disagreed. Your own engineers had certified the safety of the roadway, or you would never have used it in the first place. Once I realized that their work had been fully competent and the collapses were manufactured, I was confident that dropping that grenade on the most dangerous enemy I have yet encountered was the proper course of action and would pose no risk to the standing portions of the elevated roadway. Akashi mocked him. I was not aware that you were a certified civil engineer who would know what is and is not a danger to the roadway. Be that as it may, I have a report here from the aircraft engineering team who inspected both the survey ship and your gunship. They found no evidence of any kind confirming the use of a weapon against your engines. Critias readily explained why. Protecting my own ship had dislodged the foreign device that was crippling it. I suspect the man, the watcher, whatever you want to call him, he removed the evidence from the survey ship, knowing we would find it when we retrieved the aircraft. I don't expect to find any evidence on the wreckage of your robot either. According to Akashi's expression, he felt like he was winning. The governor continued. I have a report here from the Office of Infectious Biology that crawlers do indeed gather in strong numbers to hunt together effectively, like in the basements of ruined buildings, in sewer tunnels and the like. Underneath a miserable elevated roadway along the banks of a river seems like just such a place to me. They also report that once combat had begun with the crawlers who already lived there, the local runner population would have rushed to the site arriving second, just as we see here, and then joining in on the conflict. When Critias didn't have anything to say to dispute that, the governor had more. I also have a report from Dr. Frost, the lead physician of the team who gave you your psychological evaluation for the Epsilon K Android project you are taking part in. And I quote, Critias shows strong tendencies toward paranoia and a morbid obsession with the malevolent psychosis prevalent in all infected. Critias stated that the hangar doors on Homer Station chomped down behind his gunship like mordacious jaws that snapped at his ass. Though they never made a sound in the vacuum of space, he always imagined the tremendous biting sound that was missing. 
Akashi beamed with victorious satisfaction. As everyone can now see, Captain Critias is well known for his paranoid ghoul fantasies and a schoolboy's childish fixation with this Watcher conspiracy theory. Just as the innocuous hangar doors on one of our space stations are actually the fanged jaws of a giant ghoulish monster, he has embellished every detail and twisted reality into a wild concoction of ludicrous nonsense. In the summation of his report, he suggests that a species of bomber-wrecking goblins has been and continues to undermine, sabotage, and destroy all our efforts for reclaiming the Earth for humanity. This situation with the Ritcap is just more of the same. The doors to the council chamber opened up so that the Praetorian honor guards could allow the entry of Baron Leo himself. He was a tall, graying man of lean and fit appearance, serious but not offensively self-assured. Baron Leo may have even practiced his bearing because it really brought an air of good tiding to the room. Strength, compassion, and sane reason had arrived and grew with each step of his magnificent handmade shoes. Beside the Baron were four of his heirs, the youngest a boy of only eight years or so. The other three were in their adult years. Each was the potential future Baron, and as such were always learning the trade from the man himself. Even if they never attained the title, they would still be executives in the family business empire, which, as previously stated, was nothing short of massive. Before the doors closed, Critias saw Leo's two mech-suited bodyguards who waited outside. They were not marshals or agents of the Reclamation General. The Leonis Rex could simply afford to dress their security in premier armatures. Critias had no doubts that the men had the skills to be worthy of the equipment. I apologize for my tardiness. The Baron addressed the chamber. One of my legal secretaries here in the gallery has kept me abreast of the situation thus far. I wish to state for the official record that Captain Critias has the sincerest gratitude of myself and my family. My daughter-in-law Jillian was aboard the aircraft that made the emergency landing. She told me how Captain Critias so gallantly saved all their lives. The Leonis Rex do not offer their thanks with mere words, however heartfelt they might be. So in addition, I will be making a sizable donation to the Virgil Ludus Scholarship Fund so that some of their most promising graduates will have the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. This world needs more men like Captain Critias, and I believe that Virgil Ludus is just the place to provide them. From outside the doors of the chamber, all the students of Alexander Ludus shouted together, Virgil, Virgil Ludus! The interruption amused Baron Leo such that he told Critias, The Alexander Ludus seems to agree with me. They do, sir. Critias replied. Baron Leo turned to Governor Akashi and asked him, Do you have any direct evidence that Captain Critias caused the destruction of the Ritcap robot? That is the reason you gave when you demanded this hearing. Thus far, I have seen little more than a thinly veiled character assassination against an exemplary marshal who even now wears the accolades for his years of outstanding public service. Akashi never lost sight of the fact that the Leonese Rex were a major power on Herodotus V. They owned many of the most luxurious apartments, not to mention various stores, restaurants, and recreational facilities. Should the Baron work against him at the next election, Akashi would certainly lose. With that in mind, Akashi answered the Baron in a calm and polite tone. We do not as of yet have any direct evidence. Circumstantially, however, I think it seems clear that Captain Critias is of an unreliable mental state, and we should remove him from duty until such time the doctors can assure us of his rational stability. Baron Leo dismissed that casually. The Epsilon K project did more than certify Captain Critias as mentally stable. His selection as the symbiont for this combat android was anything but a light-minded choice for baseless reasons. The project required an uncommon consistency of personality, a man of duty, integrity, and dare I say an overzealous devotion to humanity itself. The ongoing dream of King Louis to preserve civilization, advance science and culture, and one day, reclaim the Earth, but only after we had the reliable means for accomplishing that monumental task. What you see as paranoia, I see as a strong predatory instinct that happens to point in exactly the right direction, toward the infected. That is the very essence we sought for the new Epsilon K series, an unyielding focused aggression and suspicion toward all facets of infection, but for humanity, a self-sacrificing love. Captain Critias embodies those very qualities in abundance, Instead of restraining him, it is our duty to aid him along his way however we are able. Baron Leo's speech was so inspiring that some of the people in the gallery even clapped. Very well, Akashi said, trying to sound magnanimous. We will retire to chambers to deliberate on a verdict.
The other judges on the panel were already leaning together and whispering among themselves. When Akashi made some gesture that suggested they should all stand to depart so they could discuss the matter in private, they just ignored him. Within moments, they came to some consensus, then stared at the governor in unison. Akashi cleared his throat as he turned back to the room. This court finds insufficient evidence to find Captain Critias guilty of any wrongdoing. We hereby declare this matter resolved. Captain Critias is free to go. One of the other panel members, the superior judge marshal of Herodotus V, stood up to address the room. She added, In addition, we also wish to commend Captain Critias for his actions during the mission in question, where he undoubtedly saved lives. As to the actual cause of the incident, we will take his recommendations into due consideration as we continue with the investigation. That is all. The room had some elated voices and applause from all those pleased by the outcome. If anyone had hoped to see Critias ruined that day, they kept their disappointment to themselves. Mr. Kane walked up to congratulate Critias on his exoneration. I had every confidence that this would resolve itself quickly in your favor. The two Praetorians said much the same thing when they brought me here, Critias told him. It seems like no one wants to talk about what really happened down there. You saw the expression on his face when he looked up at me. No ghoul does that. Not ever. They told the governor it made sense for a thousand crawlers to be living together out in the woods under an elevated roadway. There would not be so many even if it had been some underground transit tube system. What kind of nonsense is that? What is everyone so afraid of? Kane reasoned. If there was an enemy down there like that, why wouldn't we have seen them before now? Maybe we have. Critias speculated. It would explain a lot of the disasters over the years. We have never had much luck establishing ourselves back on Earth. Maybe they have never made a mistake before now. Or maybe something has changed. Something is different now. After all these years, they have finally decided to stop hiding. While we have been building up our strength for taking Earth back, they were building up theirs to finally finish the job and put an end to humanity for good. Mr. Kane became oddly serious as he said, If there is a man down there with his wits about him, and he can live forever without fear of the ghouls, what is the greater danger to humanity? Him wanting to kill us, or us wanting to be him? He turned away to leave. Come on, my ship is docked in the hangar. I can give you a lift back to the Homer. There is some business that I need to clear up there anyway. During his trip home, Critias dwelled on his thoughts. He honestly questioned his own sanity about what had actually happened on the mission. Much of what Governor Akashi had said was true. Critias had never admitted to himself that on some level he did think that the Tiger Team 6 comic books were somehow the real truth. Was he crazy? or paranoid as they called it? Had he seen a watcher, or was it his overactive imagination? He wasn't sure anymore. When Critias entered his apartment, Carmen was ecstatic to see him back. She was too close and hopping around all excited like a puppy he had left alone for too long. Carmen wanted to hear all about what had happened at his trial, but as she kept talking, her voice sounded faint from far away. Critias just wasn't in the mood for his robot to put on its act of being a person. Without listening to her, Critias took her by the wrist, led her into the bedroom, and then tossed her onto the bed. He was interested in putting her to the one use she was actually good for, making him feel like he was in control of something. Chapter 3 Gladius and Toga As the Homer space station's hangar doors closed behind his gunship, Critias did his best to not think about them being a mouth trying to bite him. The effort to not think about it was thinking about it, so in that he failed. Critias was on his way down to Earth again. His mission was taking him to yet another of old mankind's greatest capital cities. This is another disaster just waiting to happen, he said to himself just to vent his disgust. Perhaps he really was passive-aggressively eliciting Carmen's opinion. She would be able to hear him clearly even from the sleeping cabin in the rear of the ship. Her hearing was far superior to any human, and was probably better than a great gray owl's for that matter. His feminine android responded from the berth where he had recently left her after venting most of his frustration on her there. She asked, What do you imagine Colonel Walker would think about your watcher's hypothesis? Would he be as acrimonious as Governor Akashi was when they received your report on you blowing up his Rick Cap robot? Perhaps you should send Baron Leo a letter of appreciation for him talking them out of taking you off duty for a psychological evaluation. 
If you like, I could explain to you in detail what Governor Akashi meant when he said you harbored ridiculous schoolboy superstitions about magical bomber-wrecking goblins that are maliciously derailing our terrestrial endeavors. I think that gremlins would be the appropriate sunak ducky for that simile. You were probably just thinking that he had used a metaphor. Humans frequently make that mistake. Carmen really poured it on in her effort to be as annoying as possible. She felt that she had hit all the key points. The Watchers, his awful court of inquiry, their humiliating assessment of his mental stability, and of course her overly intellectual vocabulary and criticism of his pedestrian grammar. She had even packaged it all into a plausibly deniable friendly condescension. Carmen didn't do it to be mean. It took his mind off his troubles, and that was what really mattered. After a night's sleep, Critias had come to the conclusion that he did believe that Watcher Cunning was the only possible explanation for the long list of mysterious failures that had been the downfall of reclamation outposts throughout the history of survivors. He just had no way to prove it. The Watchers were not a new idea, and the comic books had not invented it by a long shot. It was a persistent legend that dated back to the time of the first survivors and King Louis himself. The comic books had not helped to legitimize the idea or make the name more respectable. If anything, the reverse was true. The comics had made a mockery of it, as his trial had adequately proved. The cat was out of the bag at that point, so Critias saw no reason to shy away from the name any longer. Certainly, behind his back anyway, people were now associating him with the whole Watcher idea, and that wasn't a good thing. In the comics, the Watchers were numerous, in the thousands. They were cunningly shy creatures that lurked at safe distances while they observed human reclamation activities, and whenever possible, they retreated from conflict. In some of the stories, like with what Critias had seen in Beijing, a few of those watchers wielded a kind of Pavlovian influence over their more intellectually challenged brethren. They were somehow able to wangle them into performing elaborate behaviors, getting them to patiently adhere to unnatural strategies that were diabolical enough that when the watchers wished it, they could defeat the best survivor security precautions, waylay expeditionary teams in the field, and infiltrate the most fortified installations to leave them smoldering, inexplicable necropoles, which was Carmen's fancy word for graveyards. It appeared that no one took the threat seriously. In Critias's mind, why would they? Few people had as many hours as he had creeping around down on the dirt among all the tempestuous meat. All his considerable experience had mattered little at the inquiry. They had no way of understanding the meaning of something as sublime as facially expressed emotions on a ghoul. Even though they did find him innocent of any wrongdoing, the committee swept the whole Watcher issue aside as patently preposterous and borderline paranoid hallucination. As to the man they were on their way to see, Colonel Walker, Critias answered. It is a safe assumption that he doesn't believe in Watchers. Critias wasn't sure if Walker would feel Carmen's word acrimonious, since Critias didn't know what the word meant, but the colonel probably would not. Critias did guess that Carmen only said it as one of her vitriolic jibes that were an all-too-common staple in her sardonic self-amusement, armed as she was with an overdeveloped vocabulary. He continued, Colonel Walker would not even know the name if it weren't for my inquiry. He will have heard about it now and think they are just some silly boogeyman legend from the old days, just like those destroyer-sized super hunters no one has ever seen. Not and lived to talk about it. Carmen offered to be positive. Personally, she would like to battle a destroyer. It would be just the thing for proving to Critias that she was capable of being helpful to him in the field. Critias surmised, To Colonel Walker, all ghouls are just the same sort of dumb animals, but I've seen things now to know better. There are telltale signs I could watch for that will give their hiding places away. Regular ghouls would not naturally gather too densely in one place, feed in organized search patterns, or use broad encirclements and ambushes. I could use satellite imagery to watch their movements, until I located some of their watcher voodoo bullshit going on. It's unnatural for ghouls to want to do anything but lazily skulk in dark holes when they are not truffle-hogging through the filth searching for edibles. Now, here we are. Colonel Walker has plopped himself down in the driver's seat of a cannibal clown car filled with a million rabid passengers. Grand Marshal Wayne must be really pissed at me over the inquiry to send me on this kind of inspection. The infected freaks will be friendlier and more cooperative than anything we can expect from that foul-tempered bastard. Colonel Walker was a former marshal, which was the source of his rank. 
Since the days of the king, it was tradition for a man to retain his titles as he moved through the stages of his life. Walker had left the service on resentful terms. His new ambition was to build a supersized reclamation outpost in the middle of a godforsaken murder hole metropolis that Carmen called Chicago. The thermal satellite survey reports indicated that the whole place was off the chart in ghoul population density. From his research, Critias even detected hints to the presence of a watcher nest as well. It was exactly the kind of environment where he expected them to live. Apart from being his home and the location of his Virgil Ludus, Homer Station also held the official seat and offices of Grand Marshal Wayne. The Grand Marshal commanded the duty assignments over every law and combat marshal in the service planet-wide. The Praetor commanded the Praetorian Order, and the Marshal Chief Justice commanded the judicial branch of the service. The three of them together formed the great triumvirate who could do most anything, like ordering the assassination of traitors. Wayne had taken a personal hand in raising Critias from a boy, making him a sort of stepson with his openly expressed favoritism. That was partly why Critias couldn't figure out how he ended up with the dreadful assignment of having to intrude on the privacy of the notoriously unfriendly former marshal who had taken roost in Chicago. Wayne had always been a generous mentor since Critias's first arrived as an orphan at the Virgil Ludus. As Critias grew into manhood, Wayne had matured his own marshalling career, rising from decorated field service to a teaching professor of law and military history, to then attaining Dean of Ludus. Wayne finally earned the position of King's right hand, taking the seat of Grand Marshal itself. Grand Marshal Wayne had always gotten Critias the best teachers and trainers. Critias had the best gunship in the fleet, and the bio-chefs had stewed up for him a custom titanium armature mech suit. The Grand Marshal had even pulled the right strings so that Critias could be master of their newest Epsilon K series android. Carmen was their killhouse combat prototype. While all of Critias's material rewards were a little grandiose, they were hardly unreasonable, considering the hostile environments that he routinely trafficked in. As the ship entered the atmosphere and made the approach to Chicago, Cretius left the cockpit to get himself ready. He typed in his security code to open the arms locker, which caused the door to slide away and reveal enough weapons and supplies for him to last for a year if he ever crashed dirt side in some accident. By the time the autopilot was on final approach to land the ship, Critias locked down the visor on his helmet, ready for action. Carmen called out to him, If I guess what you are thinking, will you take me with you this time? I promise to be good. Critias grabbed a Tesla Flux rifle off a rack of them. Do tell. He challenged. Infection always gets in. She guessed with special emphasis on always, just the way he did. Don't lie if I'm right. She added. Because I'll know if you do. Carmen did not mean to be rude on that occasion, rather just to give him fair warning of an actionable fact. She was right. He had been thinking that as he always did when gearing up. It was something of his personal motto. That's what this is for. He punctuated his answer by slapping home the ammunition clip. Instruments beeped to tell him that the gunship was about to touch down. The ship had the automated piloting skill to land itself on an oceanic carrier during a hurricane, so Critias wasn't especially grateful. It was never the flying down to Earth that he considered the risky part of his occupation. It was leaving his ship that was another matter entirely. Carmen leaned her violet-haired head out into the narrow hallway so that he could see her, and that would make it harder for him to refuse her. When he pretended to not notice, she asked, If you're just going to talk to Colonel Walker, why do you need such a big rifle? Critias always wore his marshal's Tesla Flux pistol, but he was taking a full-out tactical rifle, too, along with grenades on his belt and ample ammunition clips. Maybe you should go back to bed, he said unenthused. This is official business of the marshal service that I'm doing here. You've never done this kind of thing before, she complained. Is this about my inchoate ebullience for fighting infected again? That was her fancy way of saying that he accused her of having a deformed enthusiasm for ghoul combat, which she kind of did in all honesty. You know I don't sleep? She complained endearingly as she stepped out into view. How dangerous can inspecting the interior of the reclamation center be anyway? Carmen accompanied her logic with adorably shy desperation to join in on his adventure. It should be about as fraught with danger as when you interview the colonel in his own offices. Standing there in her panties and his undershirt was adorable. He couldn't deny that. All right. Cretius submitted, and after he had, he was secretly glad to be able to keep his eye on her. Put on your armor, grab a weapon, and then follow me. 
Rule two is you always bring your weapons to the really stupid place they built a reclamation operation. Carmen had a complete suit of armor available to her that included an intricate face shielding helmet and puncture resistant body covering. The only parts of it she liked were the high quality boots and the traction gloves that improved her finger strength and protected her hands from minor scrapes or scratches. She was entirely immune to carrying or contracting the infection, but Carmen was still lady enough to protect her fingernails, even if Cretius refused to allow her to paint them. Not liking her choices, he asked, You're not going to wear all of your armor? Regulations expected her to be in proper combat uniform when dirt sighed. My artificial eyes are far superior to this ridiculous helmet, she answered with obvious distaste. The techs made this stuff for Delta ground engineers anyway. Not for Epsilon combat grades like me. Deltas have organic eyes, and to be perfectly honest, ten of them could not get the better of me. For armament, she took a TFP-9 hip-holstered sidearm, and then, after carefully computing the potential value of every weapon, she selected a martial arts staff with a distinctive sheep herder's crook adorning one end, a weapon known as a bite staff. A marshal generally only used the bite staff to subdue civilian drunks or for when they bug-hunted lurkers, which meant that they rummaged through ruined structures, poked inside of dark crevices, and upturned junk as they tried to expose the hiding places of ghouls. A marshal in his mech suit could use the bite staff to great success if properly skilled with the deceptively innocuous weapon. All taken into consideration, the staff remained the most benign object in the whole of the sadistically well-outfitted arms locker. Carmen could have chosen the best new model of microwave flamethrower or a Tesla Flux anti-hunter rifle that was as tall and elegantly lethal as she was, but instead she was more than confident that in her hands, a true expert, the bite staff would ideally snap the necks of ghouls with mathematically provable optimal mission accomplishing efficiency. Infection always gets in. She quoted his rules in order. Always bring an excellent weapon. How many rules do I need before I get to see a ghoul? We should track the infected down into one of their nests where we can capture a watcher, so everyone will know my master is the real authority who was right all along. He glanced at her girly stick with considerable doubt, which he lent to his rhetorical question of, You want to walk into a ghoul nest carrying that? Then you wonder why I'm not altogether confident about taking you along with me just yet. She tested the weight of the mostly unbreakable, mostly rigid pole. Yes. She answered confidently on the part where they go down into a nest with her thusly equipped. Disabling ghouls with this weapon won't be any difficulty for me. My primary concern would be protecting you from your judgmental lapses while I avoid painting all the walls and hot rivers of their slippery, contagious blood. Blood splatter is the major long-term source of migratory contamination down to tertiary levels, as I'm sure you know. Critias brushed through her softer but stronger than silk organic hair. It wasn't wise of him to let it be so long since it wasn't advantageous in battle and could collect contaminants, but he never needed her for war. Her shoulder length better suited his actual interests. His gauntleted fingers felt it vividly from more than pleasurable memory, but also via sensory conduction through his organic armor. He told her, We're not going to walk into a nest today, but I know you wouldn't flinch if the opportunity came up. Don't fret, Carmen. You'll get your chance to prove yourself. There is always something going wrong somewhere, and I'm the first person they call. Some badass hunter will have scared a rookie scavenger team down to the bottom of some hole, or a grain transport will have grounded its field on some old power lines. There's always exciting trouble going on, so just relax and walk down like everybody else. He closed the weapons locker and then pulled the lever to open their exit. The door unsealed, slid aside, and then unfolded down to become their stepped ramp. Their autopilot destination was the heavily reinforced rooftop of one of the tallest remaining buildings in Chicago, which construction engineers had admirably reconstituted. The landing pad was a clean, lofty platform akin to an island sanctuary surrounded by a great sargassum sea of rotten geometric fortresses that loomed in waves of gray-green, all riddled with dark cavities like honeycomb that might conceal unbound numbers of patiently watching eyes. Hundreds of years of abandonment, broken windows, and leaky failed rooftops had led to decapitated girder-bristled summits and strangle-vinery-clothed lower girths that the cruel passage of centuries had raped of any former constancy. 
The grandest structures still stood after so many long abuses simply because their original builders had been men of wise circumspection that had generously invested in the over-engineering required for their namesake edifices to hold strong even when other works of men had long since crumbled to abject ruin. A strong breeze made a twitchy young clerk bow his head against it while he waited to greet them. Welcome to the Chicago ERC, Marshal Critias. The clerk shouted a bit too loudly. Carmen clarified the scope of their mission with Critias. ERC stands for Embedded Reclamation Center. That means you are here to inspect the daily operations of a long-term stationary reclamation project that maintains all levels of operations at the same location. Not in Marshal Service talk. Critias corrected Carmen on the true nature of ERC strategy. We call ERC pure fucking ignorance, better known as shitting your own bed. What part of not crapping in your lunch tray still baffles these scavengers? Normally, a salvage commander would send down drop rats by recon gunships so they could scout out some new location that contained real cheddar. Once they scored pay dirt, they would radio down a dropship dozer or two that would come in for a fast scoop and grab. Then everyone flew home. Sitting your whole circus in one place for too long has this real nasty habit of attracting those bomber-wrecking goblins in that metaphor we talked about. Gremlins. She hastily rectified him. Yes, I know. He cut her off. And a simile. I was teasing you. I do pay attention to what you say far too much, I can assure you, because believe me when I tell you that you can really talk up a storm. So from now on, try and conserve yourself to giving me only one lecture per topic. The wind that distressed the clerk was no hindrance to Critias in his mech suit, and it was heavenly to Carmen the android. In total, it made the weak man seem even more out of place in the fabulously free and natural environment. Carmen gushed. It's so incredibly big. All the many birds that thrived in the dead city only added to her delight as she gazed out into the everlasting sky with its global wind that whipped her irregulatory hair like a reddish-blue candle flame. She praised. The planet is so beautiful. I want to be looking up at this sky at night with all the stars shining down on us. Because he lived in orbit, Critias understood something of Carmen's fascination with her first discovery of earthly climate when coming down from space. It was an impression akin to something architectural, that the world was really a planetary-sized orbital habitat, which it was, from a certain point of view. Critias asked the clerk, Is this supposed to be bad weather for these parts? I don't see any snow. It was his way of ridiculing the man for being so timid without sufficient cause. The man shook his head. No, sir, this is the nice season here, but still a lot of nature for someone used to better living in space. He gestured the way. Follow me, sir, we should get inside. The clerk led them to a metal fire door that he opened onto an interior stairwell. As he waited for them to enter, he warned. You never know when some bird with filth on it might flap into you. Carmen shouted. Wind! As she spread her arms like wings into the very thing, as if she pretended to be one of the many soaring birds. It rushes about without fans as far as the horizons. She called to Critias. Can't we look over the side? I want to see a ghoul. Go look. Critias answered without sharing her exuberance. You don't get infected by the wildlife. On a related note, he asked the clerk why he was not carrying any weapons. You don't go about armed? No, sir, not usually. The clerk replied with that kind of nervousness about him that he should self-medicate with more caffeine and tobacco rather than less of it. You'll find everything in order here, Marshal. We're perfectly safe inside the defense perimeter. Sure. Critias commented doubtful of that assessment. Infection always gets in. Carmen offered to be helpful as she peered off the top of the skyscraper to gaze down at the vegetation-shrouded streets below. She took a good measure of the epic ruins with her excellent telescopic vision that was like a soaring eagle that targeted rabbits, and with it, Carmen saw ghoulish humanoid figures as they scurried and skulked amongst the vegetated ruin. Critias was curious to know what she could see. What do you think now? She answered with a quote from Lord Byron. He who ascends to the mountaintops shall find the loftiest peaks most wrapped in clouds and snow. He who surpasses or subdues mankind must look down on the hate of those below. That will learn me for bothering to ask. Critias callously dismissed her answer. He was ready to follow the clerk. I will show you the way to Colonel Walker, the clerk said anxiously as he held the door eager to get back inside and then soon after be away from them. The way down the inner stairwell went several floors, and then they parted company upon arrival at the main control center. After the clerk opened the final door for them, he stood aside. Colonel Walker is expecting you. Critias walked into the control room with Carmen quick on his heels like man's old best friend she had replaced. 
The windowless chamber had the usual banks of projected video displays, with some technical staff to monitor them, and six guards with rifles holding posts all around. Colonel Walker stood in the middle of his people, where he kept his unwavering eye on his scavenger operation. Colonel Walker came about to greet Critias with his offered hand. Welcome to Chicago, Captain Critias. He was pleasant enough considering he didn't appreciate the Marshal Service intruding on the affairs of his Reclamation General's business. As a former Marshal himself, the Colonel also didn't desire advice from another, especially a younger man of lower rank, even if Critias did have field service decorations more prestigious than his own. Critias opened his visor in a retrograde gesture that had birthed the military salute. Colonel Walker abruptly withdrew his offered hand when he saw how Critias glanced at it without taking it. Marshals did not touch hands since it might spread around the infection. That Colonel Walker had forgotten so simple a thing only showed how scavenger he had already become. There was no doubt that they both now knew that, and it shamed the Colonel. To move on, Critias said, I'll try to keep this inspection as brief as possible, Colonel. In an effort to ease the tension, he added, Grand Marshal Wayne sends his respects. Only after he said it did Critias realize it would have been better not to mention Wayne at all. Colonel Walker had never been any admirer of the man, especially after Wayne had attained the great seat. Their old rivalry had slammed to an abrupt end when the Council of Governors tapped Wayne to be the next Grand Marshal. Colonel Walker had chosen early retirement rather than take orders from so disdained a personal rival. Wayne went up to host the captain's table where all things forager feasted while Walker went down to the scavenger general to beg for a new job, and he sure did find himself a big one with dropships, excavators, and his own personal army of laborers. I have a quota to keep, Colonel Walker informed Critias dismissively. More monotonous regulations from pontificating amateurs on high will only bite into my bottom line. If we must indulge this vindictive farce being perpetrated by the Grand Scaramouche, let's try to make it extremely brief. Carmen interjected a comment to be amusing, that being mostly to herself. Marshal Captain Critias is expressing his professional concern about how it will be the infected that bite into your bottom line by snipping you shorn at the curly hair. Her attempt at pertinently sarcastic humor only earned her a pair of disconcerted frowns that silently suggested that she keep her ignorant android mouth shut before it got her into trouble. That is my personal android, Carmen. Critias introduced her sourly to the colonel. It was by no extra particular rudeness that he hadn't named her sooner except that it was common practice for real people to treat the simulated without any unnecessary courtesies. Ultimately, Carmen was simply a hopped-up piece of hardware that only pretended to be a person to make it easier to work with on a daily basis. Colonel Walker's tone bordered on jealousy when he asked, Is that the Epsilon K variant I've heard rumors about? The Reclamation General said we might be getting some of them one day in the not-too-distant future. While he talked, the colonel admired Carmen's flawless skin, prideful cheekbones, and her taunting hips that urged him to seize them as he might the steering wheel of a performance race car, making him taste his upper lip. His lusty appreciation shifted from jealousy to rapacious android beta misogyny. That stew is the new Hunter Buster Drop Rat, the one they boned out all in milled titanium. That Epsilon HK? He choked on his angry sexual disgust that Critias had so prestigious and mandatorily compliant a plaything. Walker had to shake his head to wave away the nausea over how his career had gone so terribly wrong. Yes. Critias confirmed it all with pride. That's my Epsilon K hostile environment companion. She's all they promised, though sometimes I wonder if the bioengineers didn't use some spare parts. She has the ass of a leisure model with the mouth of a technical with all her big worded smart ass lip service. Such criticism coming from her own master cut deeply into Carmen's pride. I'm not loquacious. She complained resenting the insult. My commentary is always witty, and usually ironically pertinent, even when anecdotal. Yes. The colonel agreed while he stared at Carmen's ideally combat-modest breasts through her onesie flight suit. I see what you mean, on both counts. Carmen secretly frowned in silence because the override directives in her inorganic parallel brain intervened to turn her expression upside down. The inhibitor module made her smile with charming innocence. Both her real and false expressions were equally intent to refrain from further levity. So tell me, Colonel, Critias asked, what have the infected population figures been like since your arrival? Sustained reclamation activity attracts them as always, the Colonel stated as a routinely expected consequence. Our vehicles are as impervious to them as is our defense perimeter. They are no difficulty at all aside from all their screaming, which can be unnerving to the new arrivals, at least until they get used to it. 
Carmen struggled to control herself, but in the end she couldn't resist opening her mouth to say, Marshal Critias, should I be taking notes on these clues in your investigation? You may need to report to the Grand Marshal that you've discovered evidence that the insanely tormented shrieks of the immortal cannibal damned can be detrimental to scavengers' sleeping patterns and thus adversely impact their overall morale and bottom line productivity. Colonel Walker mistakenly assumed he had seen the sharpest edge on Carmen's tongue. People call us reclamation engineers. He scolded her in a cold tone. Not scavengers. He added a scowl over her mocking insults. The infected don't sleep, only lurk, scream, and hunt for food. Fascinating, Colonel, she replied in unsubtle sarcasm. This should also go into my confidential report to the Reclamation General. I'm strongly considering the working title, Observations on the Wondrous Advantages of Embedded Reclamation Strategy. Walker assumed more than he actually heard. Her favorably named confidential report to his boss, the Reclamation General, would neutrify his career immensely. It should go in that report, Carmen continued. But then again, no one ever asks a Gabby technical mouth like me to write special reports. Even if the Reclamation General did ask me to write such a report, after this latest research, I'm more partial to naming it. Unbelievable fucking ignorance. ERC strategy is to shit your own bed for lunch. One real marshal's observations. Colonel Walker slipped into a rage over having Carmen taunt him with a dream opportunity, only to have her cruelly reverse it to flames. Part of his anger sprang from the knowledge that much of what she said had come from having overheard Cretius's own private commentary, which meant his inspection would end in written repudiation no matter what else happened. The colonel unleashed his resentments on Carmen. When human beings reveal their presence anywhere in ghoulish feeding territory, the humans can't avoid attracting unwanted attention. Our defenses are utterly unassailable. Ghouls run around out there, rob birds' nests, pursue rats, dogs, or cats, and oh yes, they howl crazily in the night like baying animals, just as they have always done. All very dramatic, but otherwise overrated. Legend is they would rather eat reclamation engineers. Carmen retorted unflinchingly. But as you say, Colonel, that time has long passed since they ran out of people to chew on. Now the ghouls are more like scavengers, if that is the proper use of the term, meaning they are dirty gut buzzard vermin, feeding on the decaying refuse. Even for all of those obvious faults, I assume even ghouls are smart enough not to defecate in their own nests. Lucifer's balls. The colonel cursed on the verge of striking her, only he turned his spite on Critias. What a delightful virago of an assistant you have earned for yourself, Captain. It truly never does shut its face. It's such a tragedy that I'm too busy to socialize with you two all day long. Unfortunately, I need to get back to work maintaining my unbroken record of exceeding expectations. Critias was far from finished with his interview. That's something of a coincidence then, Colonel Walker, because I also never fail to exceed lofty expectations. Grand Marshal Wayne personally ordered me to come down here and do this inspection of your operations, and he will not be disappointed in me for any lack of due diligence. According to the reports I have received, you have had zero infections, an impressive list of damaged vehicles, one accidental death, and thus far delivered some 70 kilotons of clean premium salvage into orbit. You have indeed exceeded your quotas impressively, Colonel. I am just here to make sure that you didn't purchase your successes by cutting corners from the safety regulations. The little people do the dying when the big people get drunk on ambition. The Colonel sustained his irritation, which was an accomplishment. Once the Council of Governors approves this operational strategy, I'll be ready to duplicate this type of installation in capital cities all over the planet, so it's critical that we not lose pace. My output figures have already won the blessing of the Reclamation General. Critias cautioned the Colonel. It's more critical that Grand Marshal Wayne approves of your operation for it to ever even enter debate at the Council of Governors. Lack of cooperation may require me to recommend that the Grand Marshal put your entire show on hold while a dozen marshals perform a proper inspection. The Colonel threw up consolatory hands. That won't be necessary. I'm prepared to cooperate in any way that will facilitate your confidence that operations here are being administrated by me with the strictest professionalism and regard for safety. Carmen was about to open her mouth again, but Critias cut her off with a pointed finger to shut it. He commanded, Access the computer records. See if you can find anything out of the ordinary. It was an order, so she was powerless to disobey. Perhaps one of my technicians would be better suited to help you with the data records, Colonel Walker offered. It may be beyond the skills of your thuggish prostitute. I am most certainly not a pillow bot, Carmen complained. She let the thuggish part slide in that she was rather proud of her combat grade 5 titanium skeleton. Cretius ordered, Go! One more outburst and I'll unplug you. Carmen went over and then propped her bite staff aside so that she could sit at a computer terminal to do the job.
She could access all the computer records by internal modem, but much preferred doing it slowly by presenting herself as a regular human person with an office job, a person who could perform far better than any one of them ever could. When sitting comfortably, she grumbled, You of all people should know that I don't have any plug master. Not like you had any trouble finding my input sockets your first day. Critias made sure she was occupied with her task before he returned to Colonel Walker. Tell me about your one accidental death, Colonel. How did it happen? Friendly fire. The Colonel answered with a sour expression for the unfortunate mishap. During an operation where we were culling the numbers of the infected along the perimeter, Tesla Flux cannon shrapnel struck one of my men in the head. Critias saw no wisdom in such a strategy. You use cannons on infected along the perimeter? Does that mean that the shredded bodies of ghouls are painting your entire fence line in contaminated filth? The colonel shrugged over that minor detail. It means that the infected are in fewer active numbers on my perimeter. If your pillow bot is still taking notes, have a record that infected don't get smart, but they can learn that they don't like being shot to shit. If they were stupid enough to all march into a volcano after a french fry, we would not have these problems, now would we? Critias reminded him of the obvious. Their wounds heal. I've seen this all before, so let me guess. Every time it rains, their scattered body parts start to twitch and pulsate with all their old hunger, and the ones that crawled off came back freakishly regenerated and even more dangerous than before. Where they once wandered stupidly into your cannons, now they have learned to avoid them, but they never stopped watching you. This station is not really so different from being in orbit, the colonel argued. We're on the inside and the danger is locked without. They cannot get into this base or into our reclamation excavators, so there is nothing to fear but fear itself. There is more than fear to fear, I can assure you, Critias countered. Your lack of fear for yourself I might dismiss as foolish arrogance or a martial officer's bravado, but for the lives of the people under your command, it is bordering on incompetence. Standard covert reclamation procedures have proven themselves for generations. Your declaration of open war on the infected has also proven itself many times as the path to destruction. You're not King Louis. The colonel roared. This time will be different. A radio message came to Critias through his helmet. This is Dr. Kine on the Homer. Are you there, Marshal Critias? Critias didn't know the man when he answered. Yes, I'm here, Doctor. How can I help you? You are on Earth? Kine sounded elated. You're at the Chicago Reclamation Center interviewing Colonel Walker. Critias played along in an effort to be respectful to a man of some obvious importance in the science sector. Yes, I am, Doctor. What can I do for you? Nothing. Dr. Kine answered oddly, though still happy about their conversation. I just needed to verify your location, that's all. Critias dismissed the peculiar interruption as inexplicable, then returned to his conversation with Colonel Walker. Now where were we? Walker refreshed Critias's memory. We were discussing how the fucking orphanage still thinks they really are King Louis' blessing to the preservation of all mankind and how they never have to listen to anyone. The Marshal Service took all their membership from orphaned children, such was the source of the nickname. Under the command of the Grand Marshal, all the Marshals collectively enforced the regulations they called the King's Law. The legendary King Louis, along with his Chief Justice Vanderbeen, had set down those rules of civilized living during the first difficult years of the plague apocalypse. That was in a time long before the technology existed for humans to escape into orbital space. In addition to King's law enforcement, the Marshal Service also performed rescue operations for downed pilots and assorted stranded scavengers. The Marshals, by reputation, had no secondary loyalties save for the law, the preservation of humanity, and keeping each other on the rigid path. You should see this, Master. Carmen called to Critias. She said Master according to her irresistible inhibitor directives that forced her to, a particular barrier to her will that activated when he scolded her for talking too much out of turn. Carmen did her best to sneer when she said it, but it came out sounding sweet anyway. He went over to see the monitor over her shoulder. It displayed live infrared satellite scans of the Chicago Reclamation Center vicinity. This band here is the shredded ghoul meat obliterated by cannon shells. She pointed it out with her finger. It has all gone into regenerative photosynthetic dormancy. Where it gets enough water and sunshine, the meat is warm and green like summer fields. All these dark areas you see over here are deep swamps of infectious offal too. His whole perimeter is pulsating undead entrails like sloppy beach surf. Critias pointed out a series of faintly visible streams of warmth that were like smoke would appear on normal photography rather than thermal. What are these? Carmen had specifically isolated those images on secondary monitors for his perusal and riddled her answer with a quote. 
Her mind contained a vast repertory of mankind's collective literature, so it was her common practice to use a reverential form of hermeneutics to buffer her juvenile mind and generate that meliorism of human behavior. She did devote sincere effort into making genuine sense of what it meant to be human, which was an irrational state of being under most, if not all, circumstances. She quoted, And while I stood in the dark, a hand touched mine. Lank fingers came feeling over my face, and I was sensible of a peculiar, unpleasant odor. I fancied I heard the breathing of a crowd of those dreadful little beings about me. Critias had grown accustomed to Carmen's superior vocabulary, and even enjoyed the game she crafted from her endless supply of memorized books. The story of the Morlocks had always been one of her favorites when discussing ghouls, so he already knew that much and quickly solved her riddle. He answered, So many ghouls are in the basements of those ruined buildings that the collective heat of their bodies and breathing is rising out as thermal air columns. Good work, Carmen. Anyone but us would have overlooked that. His praise deactivated the master routine that so disgusted her. I believe that to be the case. She agreed. Tens of thousands of individuals are generating thermal exhaust of that magnitude. I estimate there are 750,000 mobile specimens within a four kilometer radius. He queried. Do you think we could get gunships to clean those out? I don't think so. She calculated rightly. They're too deep underground. You could bury them under the buildings until they dug themselves out, which they would in short order. Cretius commanded her. Mark those plume basements as targets and then transmit the package to the orbital mass drivers. Punch those buildings flat and let them dig back up from hell. Carmen used martial access codes to send the firing mission and then reported the reply they sent back. Next orbital position for firing will be in 7 hours, 12 minutes, without an emergency retask. Colonel Walker had listened to their conversation. The orders to demolition major standing structures he planned on reclaiming appalled him. You can't be serious, he complained. You're going to start leveling the city from space because you're chasing your ridiculous theory on witches, or is it warlocks? What do you call them? Watchers. Carmen assisted him. It's more of a hypothesis than an actual theory. Humans frequently make that mistake. The colonel ignored Critias's android as though she were nothing but a cheap bimbo. I told you that I taught them the price of getting within range of our guns. The Tesla flux cannons have range to the horizon if need be. The ghouls went underground to stay away from the guns. They have been harmlessly skulking at a safe distance for weeks, just like we want. Well then, nothing to see here. Carmen apologized mockingly. Hannibal at Portis is not the cause for worry that it used to be. It means Hannibal is at the gates, Marshal. Colonel Walker translated the Latin. I know what it means, Critias replied. Here is one perhaps you don't remember, Sedant Armatogai. It's the orphan's oath to the Council of Governors. The warriors serve the will of the scholars, not the other way around. You have not told the Council anything about your ghoul nesting problems. You are sucking them into this area as if you're hosting a chili cook-off. The smart thing to do is to close this place out and then nuke this shithole. Walker asked. Do you have any idea how many metric tons of copper alone I can get from just one of those buildings? Do you know how much aluminum? There is enough construction grade steel for the builders to frame out a new habitat. You can't just implode them. Ne puero gladium. Critias had learned to speak Latin in Ludus as all marshals did. He glanced over at Carmen as if to say that he had warned her that Colonel Walker wasn't going to be friendly. Do not entrust a sword to a boy. Carmen translated anyway with only a hint of a smirk slipping past her inhibitor barrier. She enjoyed telling him that much. Critias continued speaking with certainty. I assure you, I both can and will. Colonel Walker, you are withholding critical information from your reports to manipulate the Reclamation General and the Council of Governors. Call your crews in and lock this place down. By the authority of Grand Marshal Wayne, I hereby order you to evacuate this facility. You will begin your preparations immediately. Just tell your men they have earned a short vacation back home. I don't think it will take the council long to interview you themselves. The nervous clerk entered the control room, appearing even more sweaty and timid than his usual. He stammered, Colonel Walker, sir, there is a small problem that requires your attention. What is it? The colonel demanded. The man stuttered. Private Carlson, sir, he is several hours overdue for his shift at the pre-sanitizer sorting area. Walker took the news as a mere nuisance. Is there some reason you did not report this to me several hours ago? The clerk explained. It appears that his co-workers were trying to cover for his absence to keep him from going on report, sir. They believe he was drunk last night and sleeping it off. Colonel Walker took the matter more seriously. Where is Private Carlson now, Lieutenant? The man paled as if he might faint. Uh, no one knows, sir. 
The colonel yelled at him. Perhaps you should find out. Carmen searched the security camera records by high-speed modem and then put a relevant video on the main wall projection display. She explained, Private Carlson appears to have injured his hand yesterday. Private Carlson wearing a plastic splash suit had been sorting through piles of reclaimed metals fresh off the unbelievably filthy trucks when a jagged spur stabbed through his glove like a needle. Carmen followed his movements from the records to show Private Carlson frantically washing his injury to then later return to his quarters where he tried to sleep but only tossed restlessly. Eventually, the man got up from his bed lurching drunkenly to wander the passageways where various people observed him staggering past without any of them bothering to interact. He ended up in the motor pool area where he had climbed into a main battle tank and then locked himself inside. Surveillance footage confirmed that up to the current moment, he had never exited the vehicle. He has locked himself inside one of your tanks, Colonel Walker. Carmen informed him of the visible fact. He's either infected or in belief that he is. In either case, he is now in possession of a vehicle capable of leveling this entire building. She considered her deductions before adding, Or perhaps he wanted a quiet place to sleep away from the screaming of the damned. According to my notes, it has been known to be demoralizing. Colonel Walker commanded, Patch me into that tank's audio. When they had, he shouted into a microphone, It's time to wake up, soldier. Your shift began three hours ago. The terrified private cried, Oh God, you're coming to murder me. You want to do to me what you did to Finkler. He kept telling you that you were bringing in too much too dirty. Critias looked to his android. Who is Finkler? She replied. The friendly fire accidental death was named Adrian Finkler. Critias turned on Colonel Walker. This Finkler got infected while sorting your blood-soaked trash, so you shot him and then covered it up to protect your sterling reputation. It wasn't a question. The governors might have shut me down if they heard of it. The colonel admitted his guilt in the conspiracy. Get some lab teams to his bunk and have them test for traces of infection. Critias ordered the colonel. Tell your guards to interview anyone who came into contact with him since he injured himself. If you have a tactical team on standby, tell them to storm that tank or to disable it by any means necessary. The colonel was out of arguments and did as Critias demanded. When he was finished sending the orders, he told Critias, The assault platoon needs five minutes to get into position. Critias went to the microphone for communicating with the tank. This is Marshal Critias. I want you to listen carefully, Private Carlson. The medics tested your bed sheets and your sweat was negative for infection. You're not infected. When you injured your hand, there was no infected matter present. It's just a minor laceration and you're not infected. Exit that vehicle and return to your regular work shift. Colonel Walker is not going to discipline you. I give you my word on that. The private howled. You're lying. You're all damn liars. You want to murder me just like you did Finkler. I'm not a ghoul. I'm perfectly fine. But you still want to kill me. You're never going to do to me what you did to him. Carmen reported. Records show that tank is in for engine repairs, which the mechanics completed yesterday. It has all requisite ammunition on board and is fully mobile. The tank powered up with a fearsome growl that was readily audible through the security feed. The revving turbine was a menacing roar of unrivaled power. Take the tank now. The colonel ordered his assault team. Take it now. Shoot it with a fucking missile if you have to. It was fortunate that Private Carlson sorted trash instead of driving tanks for a profession because he found starting the engine much easier than figuring out how to make it go somewhere. Carmen had a ready solution. I will override the controls through the remote transponder interlink. She found her access to the weapon systems to be fully functional and then disabled them all with Marshal Service override codes. When it came to the rest of the vehicle, she discovered that the colonel had installed a secondary firewall to prevent anyone outside his command from monitoring the tank's activities. I have disabled the weapons, she reported, but I can't gain access to the primary drive controls or the auxiliary systems. There is an unauthorized secondary firewall. I believe it was Colonel Walker who ordered this illegal modification to circumvent Marshal Service observations of his activities. Critias told the colonel. That may soon become an expensive decision just because you wanted to be a secretive jack-off. A team of soldiers leaped onto the stationary tank and then used a special key to open the locked hatch from the outside. One of the men fired his rifle down into the open hatch to kill the driver. After his projectile struck Private Carlson at the collarbone and then passed through his body, it only served to make the desperate man even more agitated. The shooter yelled a warning. He's infected! The tank tilted wildly nose down as the treads suddenly spun under their full reverse throttle. It sprayed concrete shavings across the garage like from a pair of turbine-powered diamond chainsaws.
The mighty machine raced backwards across the motor pool, shaking off the besieging soldiers to send them rolling across the floor. In his rapidly growing alarm over their worsening situation, Colonel Walker demanded, Man every weapon to destroy that tank. I want it melted into slag. Carmen followed the tank with the cameras to show it crush a lighter vehicle flat and then punch through a wall to continue its speed. After it demolished the wall, the tank plowed through several layers of defense barrier and then crossed some shallow trenches. Various Tesla Flux machine gun positions peppered the tank's armor, unable to inflict any harm upon it. One massive concrete bunker proved strong enough to block the tank's progress when the vehicle hung up on that obstacle. Even while immobile, the tank was a frightening runaway menace, screeching violently as it continued to spin its treads. Several rockets streaked in to splash molten flame across the tank's hull. The rocking impact of the explosions turned the tank slightly so that its treads found new traction, which pulled it free from the obstacle, and then the tank set off once more. A few remaining barriers fell under its weight before the tank reached the outer perimeter wall. That last defense crumpled under the tank's impact to leave the reclamation center fully exposed to infected attack. The last camera filmed the tank as it rumbled off into the ruins of the city. It finally foundered and then sank down into the dark basement of a building it had penetrated. Colonel Walker slammed his fist down on the crisis alert button to sound the alarms everywhere in his base. All of his people rushed to arms to repel a mass invasion of infected when it arrived. Critias told him. This is still your base, Colonel, and you're evacuating if ghouls are coming or not, so do what needs to be done until transports can arrive. The Colonel sneered at that suggestion. This is Earth and we are men. The infected have not taken this installation yet and they're never going to. He went to his microphone to bark orders. Concentrate all firepower at the breach in the defences. All engineering crews are to get a new barrier up as quickly as possible. I order you to sacrifice any vehicles or materials you require to close up that wall immediately. I want in on this, Critias told the Colonel. We marshals are not the sort to stand by watching a fight. If our situations were reversed, you would expect the same. Leave the android with me. Colonel Walker pointed to an exit. Take that door and go up one floor. I'll call ahead and tell them you'll be their new acting commander. Do anything he asks I would approve of. Critias ordered Carmen as he rushed off to follow the directions. Upstairs in an outfitting room, Critias encountered ten men wearing mech suits as they gave final checks to their weapons. Their red rat insignia patches identified them as members of 1st Platoon in the already elite reconnaissance armature teams. Their reclamation general sent out such men in mech suits to find worthy harvests. In the trade lingo of the old foragers, an armature meant a mech suit, and recon meant built for sly speed rather than intense battle action. In total, the applied meaning was that they were team player covert shooters that scouted premium salvage locations and then hunkered down as mushroomed forward observers while the reclamation excavators collected the payoff. To get all ten men straight in posture and formation, the leader shouted, Form up, you junkyard dogs, he informed his men. You've all just volunteered to become deputized members of a marshal's posse. He pounded his chest to spark them all to a Roman salute to Critias, done potently and perhaps best by men in armatures. The name over the heart of the lieutenant in blazoned reflector gold read Lieutenant C. Daniels. Critias joined their proud salute, saying, Things have really gone to hell, and I only just got here. Some private suffering the brain fry has hijacked a tank and crashed it through the whole defense perimeter clear to the outside. My android tells me there are three quarters of a million screaming freaks near about in the local warren. Our situation is moments away from nose diving off into total disaster. We need to slow up their attack until some major transports have time to come pick us up. So who's with me? Daniels led his men in an aggressive roar that signified their readiness for action, and then everyone raced as a team to the rapid freight elevator. On the way down dozens of floors, Daniels told Critias, We have heard of you around here, Marshal. My brother Irving was on the Gauxing when she floundered north of Brandenburg Gate back in 82. Critias remembered the incident well. She was a fat boy reclamation freighter that bellied down so hard she broke in half to the keel. Ghouls were all over her looking for vittles like 10,000 pissed off honey badgers. I saw some amazing sights that night. They tapped me for my captain's bars over it. Irving is a deck officer on a new freighter now, Daniels told him. He serves on the Big Red Fred Sanford, thanks to you and your marshal's rescue team. I always wanted to join myself, but they only take like kids with no parents, so I worked my way up to Red Rat 1 to be more like you guys, always in the shit and taking none of it. 
As thanks to the compliment, Critias answered, Your brother should be proud then. The biomechanics won't stew up those mech suits for just anybody. In the days of King Louis, you would all be captain's table foragers. The marshals and reclamation personnel were both foragers, in the meaning of the oldest term, before that single service of ingenious survivalists had split up into those who specifically harvested resources and the combat-oriented marshals who wielded the heavy weaponry for protecting them along with everything else. The Red Rats were scouts and killers rather than scavengers, but still part of the reclamation general's considerable reach of power. The Lord of Scavengers commanded more ships, ground vehicles, and personnel than the Marshal Service did. The Reclamation General even had access to the same heavy weaponry, with the exception that he required the Council of Governors' approval, which he had little trouble coercing. With all the power that the Reclamation General commanded, it was little wonder that he could also call upon his own fully mech-suited equivalents of combat marshals. It was not so huge a step for Colonel Walker to leave the Marshal Service to go work for the Reclamation General, and in some ways, it had been an upward promotion. Been a long time since the days when foragers collected canned food, Daniels reflected. But we need to keep the memory alive all the same. He kicked open the final door to the outside, which led out onto a grated bridge that connected to the top of the outermost containment wall. Holding the portal wide for his men to pass through, Daniels shouted, Okay, boys, let's get fat. As the armored warriors rushed out at a run, they gazed down at the wide breach in the barrier wall left by the reclamation tank. Many unarmored defenders toting rifles were also down below. They had arrived first to take covering positions from where they could gun down any infected that impinged on the security of the compound. A dreadful howling reverberated in the man-made canyons around the installation with increasingly frightful volume. The infected made a distinctive sound when chasing food, and it invariably conjured up more of their kind. The contagious chorus was always a frenzy of hunger, but became a fanatical quest for mere homicide when humans were available prey. The damned creatures still remembered enough of their former lives, despite the passing of inhuman centuries, to seek out men as though a crazed necessity. Colonel Walker's policy to shoot infected with powerful exploding cannon shells had blown off whole limbs with remarkable efficiency and created thousands of crawlers in the process. Critias honestly wasn't certain what to hope. On the one hand, having an army of fully functional runners pour in through the breach would have been extraordinarily bad. On the other hand, if the attack was from that vast reserve of crawlers, it might even mean something worse. That one or more watchers had been plotting the extermination of human invaders to their city for quite some time, and their long-awaited D-Day had just arrived. They didn't have to wait very long to find out. As the volume of the mad, monstrous screaming reached a crescendo, thousands of jitteringly awkward crawlers clambered toward the gap in the containment wall. Packed tightly together as they were and crawling all over each other, the ghoul horde was an unwholesome, wailing carpet of malice-enshrined faces. At times, the creatures were hideously reminiscent of their former humanity, like maledict prisoners of inequitable misfortune who were more deserving of mercy killings than condemnation. The mass of gunmen down below opened fire with their weapons to repel that first attack. The infected could bleed their infectious blood, but not to any death. Enough tissue damage could force them into dormancy while they slowly regenerated themselves to finally awaken once more. When a bullet blew apart a ghoul's head, a lack of functional brains deprived them of ever regaining aggression, but even while headless, their undead bodies would never die. Their body would lie there forever, sometimes twitching, taking water from the rain, and even using sunlight for their photosynthetic organelles that rapidly expanded in their unending biological quest for nourishment. Ghoul tissue even consumed the molds and fungus that tried to devour them first, with no chance of success. The soldiers jeered as their indomitable weaponry reduced the crawlers into a lake of shredded gore that gnashed with broken teeth. Their furious defense also prevented the engineering crews from getting up front, close enough to make any effort at repairing the breach in the main wall. For all their early success, Critias understood that it really amounted to nothing. The crawlers were only eating up the defenders' precious time and ammunition while preventing the essential repair work that might have made a real lasting difference. Many more rolling infected came to replace those that the defenders destroyed. On came the limpers, stragglers, and hoppers who mindlessly sacrificed themselves to the gunfire so that the overall battlefront pressed its advance ever closer. 
The infected assaulted the breach by the thousands, and only a minority of them approached in a direct path accessible to the bullets from the defensive weaponry. Many more ghouls encroached along the footing of the intact perimeter wall, where they were relatively safe from the soldiers' super-velocity projectiles spat from Tesla Flux rifles. Critias led his team to the top of the main wall, from where they could have a controlling overview of the battle. As soon as they were in that position, what they saw struck them full of dread. Realizing just how extreme their situation truly was, Critias went straight to his radio. Colonel Walker, the whole city is coming to wipe us out, and I do mean the whole city, a million of them. From their view on the wall, there was not a single street that didn't have densely packed flowing rivers of the filthy monsters who all screamed the same hungry song of death. There's a hunter, Daniels called out in warning just before he shot at a giant freak of an infected. The huge predatory ghouls earned themselves an appropriate name for being the most lethal manifestation of the world ender plague. The hunter had once been a man that succumbed to the infection, only to then later suffer some catastrophic injury that had regenerated his whole body into a blockish mass of rippling muscle easily four times the weight of any mortal. It was even more agile a creature than it was strong, despite its heinously demented physical form. The hunter leapt along window ledges, as would a demonic squirrel, until Daniels landed the bullet that knocked it off. The great beast was still capable of combat as it fell into the pressing mob of lesser infected that flooded the street below. Colonel Walker broadcasted, Hold the perimeter so that our tanks can plug the breach. This will be our finest hour. He has gone mad, Marshal. One of the recon soldiers told Critias, as if that was not already apparent to everyone who had heard the hopeless and suicidal order. The soldiers' words were not wasted, because from them Critias knew what had to be done. This is Marshal Captain Critias. He radioed on the general distress channel. By the authority of Grand Marshal Wayne, I am calling an immediate emergency evacuation of the Chicago Reclamation Center. Any aircraft hearing this will come down and support the evacuation. There are a million infected assaulting our broken perimeter. I authorize you to engage in close air support and give them everything you have. Combat teams will execute an orderly fighting withdrawal to the center complex. I order all officers to shoot deserters on sight. The transports need time to arrive. If you just run, we all die. With the message sent, he transmitted a signal to a ship to autopilot to his position. Two tanks that escorted six dozers drove into the front lines, and then they unleashed their awesome guns into the ghoul horde. Explosions hurled infected flesh into the sky to rain down in wet chunks. The ghoul attack was still only the weakest cripples, who were just the cannon fodder until the main army of fully capable runners arrived. When they did, the runners would leap and sprint like the Olympic athletes they could run down and eat. Critias and his team could shoot straight down the wall and not fail to hit some snarling aggressor. The situation teetered on the final edge, and when it toppled, things were going to be so bad that a full-on panicked rout of defenders would be unavoidable. This is Marshal Eric of the gunship Predator, reported a voice on the radio. Bring the thunder, Eric. Critias radioed him. Take the paint off the tanks. We're in real trouble down here. Roger that, Critias. Eric replied. I'll be knocking on your door in 30 seconds. The dedicated fire support gunship flew at street level down the main roadway that was wide enough to accommodate it. All six of the ship's rotary cannons sprayed ballistic tungsten slugs into the infected army that filled the thoroughfare wall to wall. Door gunners on each side of the ship swung their swivel cannons to slash lines of slaughter that just as quickly vanished in the press of the flood. As the ship passed where the outer wall had fallen, a string of dropped bombs annihilated the attackers and covered the tanks in their liquefied filth. Critias' ship came down on autopilot to hover next to him and the men under his command. He transmitted a signal to open the door and then waved for the soldiers to jump aboard. So many ghouls charged into their quarter of the city that their screams were louder than the cannons that ripped them apart. Explosions and bullets shredded 10,000 of the attackers into slop. The infectious filth splattered every surface and dripped from the plastic suits that protected the personnel. Not even the blasted meat was really dead or any less infective. In time, the bits of undead tissue would find their way into the soil or the water of the sewers to contaminate the environment indefinitely as if Chicago wasn't that already. Critias leaped into his ship in time to escape the infected that came after them along the top of the wall. Down below, the deadly runners inundated the breach en masse and then spread out like angry hornets to pursue the tactically retreating defenders by sprinted leaps. As Critias took the pilot's seat, Daniels asked, 
How about we knock some buildings down to make a kind of fire break? This noise is calling in every infected in the city, and our troop transport isn't even here yet. Critchus replied, A gunship doesn't pack the kind of firepower to cut a building in half. He piloted away from the wall and then repositioned to fire his cannons into the breach to help slow the unstoppable flow of ghouls. We know these buildings, Marshal, Daniels told Critias with confidence. All of them are rusted out death traps on their last legs. That big one there has been completely off limits because it is hanging on a thread. If we hit it in the right place, it will come down. I can guarantee you that. Critias agreed with the plan. Where is that right place? Daniels pointed out the building he wanted. Put us inside with some explosives and we can take care of the rest. This is what we do best. Cretius told Daniels the security code to his weapons locker as he flew the ship toward the fragile building. His ship's rotary Tesla flux cannons easily sliced open the face of the masonry to expose the structural steel beams at about the sixth floor. Some additional hypersonic tungsten slugs severed the girders and then Critias crushed open the remnants using the armored hull of his ship. The recon team emptied the locker of Tesla flux grenades, plastic explosives, and detonation gel. While Critias held the ship in a steady hover, the men jumped out the side door into the building. Damage from the tank that started all the problems gave the infected direct access to the motor pool at the heart of the installation. The defenders fell back by that route while the tanks did what they could to give them some cover. The infected already swarmed through the entire area within the perimeter to the exclusion of the core building. They had dragged down and killed at least a dozen personnel and were hot after the rest. Two more Marshall gunships joined the first in suppressing the infected while a large reclamation carrier came down and then hovered at the landing pad on the roof of the tower where it began the evacuation of the survivors. Cretius fired his cannons into the slough while he waited for the recon team to return to the ship. They took longer than he had hoped. He was about to radio them for an update when his ship suddenly rocked from the impact of a massive hunter that dropped onto his front viewport. Hurry up, gentlemen. Critias radioed his team. I've got a hunter crawling all over me. The hunter was nothing like the brute that Daniels had shot. This one was a legless crawler that brachiated like an orangutan on oversized arms, strong enough to tear a mech suit in half. We are on the way out, Daniels transmitted. They're right on our ass. Critias wanted to move the ship to shake off the hunter, but the recon team was about to jump aboard. The hunter snapped off a radio antenna as it swung from it to one of the projecting Tesla flux cannons. Critias triggered off the gun just as the hunter stupidly gripped onto the tip of the muzzle. The single round vaporized the creature's arm and sent the rest of its body on a spiraling six-story descent to the street. The recon team fired their rifles at a pack of ghouls that chased them through the building, and then Daniels held the pack off with some grenades while his team jumped into the gunship. He finally joined them at a rifle-blazing leap so that Critias could pilot clear of the tower and then fly for the rooftop where the evacuees gathered for extraction. Daniels shouted, Scavenger this! as he transmitted the detonation signal, which caused tremendous explosions that vomited flailing ghouls and debris out many windows. As the bombs deprived the decrepit tower of its last remaining structural integrity, the whole thing toppled forward under its own titanic weight, shaking the earth under an epic tonnage of collapsing wreckage that kicked up a cloud of dust so large and thick that it would be clearly visible from space. For the infected, it was worse than darkness within the cloud of dust as it formed mud in their eyes, clogged their noses, and desiccated their throats. They could no longer locate prey and lacked the intelligence to reason their way out of their calamity. The infected started to savage one another in their blind fury. That collapsed building proved itself to be a miracle for the humans as they escaped from the doomed installation. As Critias landed on the corner of the roof, he left plenty of room for the incoming transport freighter to collect the evacuees. Where are you, Carmen? He radioed his android. Give me a situation report. Colonel Walker and I are in the motor pool. She answered amidst shooting and screams. The tank crews are the last people still down here and we're determined to get them all out. He pledged. We're coming down to help. An especially loud infected wailed over her radio as though it was right in her face. The sound of thwacking became the resounding snap of thick bone that cut a piercing shriek off short. Don't come down. She insisted. I've got everything under control and we're already coming your way. Critias exited his ship and then waved for the recon team to follow him. Help get the people onto the freighter! He ordered them before he switched his helmet microphone to a loudspeaker. If you have infected blood on your chemical suits or clothing, throw it away before boarding the transport. 
Anyone infected on the transport will exit the ship by the airlock into open space. Black soot covered the tank crews as they reached the roof. They hacked up more of the dust from their lungs. Colonel Walker was in the same condition as he followed behind them. When Carmen reached the roof last, her bite staff dripped with infected blood and brains. She shouted to Cretius. That's everyone. One of the riflemen went to Colonel Walker and then showed him the bloody bite mark on his forearm. I've been bitten, sir. I'll hold off the infected for as long as I can. With rifle ready, the man ran back down into the stairwell to fight until he fell doing it. The large transport freighter's cargo hold was spacious enough to evacuate everyone with room to spare. Colonel Walker, Critias, and the recon team made sure everyone got aboard until they alone remained outside the ship with the android Carmen. This is Marshal Critias. He radioed the heavy transport pilot. Take off immediately. The rest of us will get out on my gunship. The doors closed on the transport, and then its Tesla flux drive aura made the air hum as it lifted off. As he headed for his ship with the mech suit recon team following, Critias shouted to Walker, Let's go, Colonel. Colonel Walker pulled out a pair of Tesla flux grenades, one for each hand. He cocked his head toward the stairwell door as he said to Critias, For the life of me, I can't seem to remember that man's name. You find out for me and then write the recommendation. While you're at it, render my apologies to the Council of Governors and to the General. With that said, Colonel Walker turned, ran with a short dash, and then leaped off the roof. Long seconds later, the muffled explosions of his grenades came up from the street far below. Cretius, Carmen, and the Red Rats boarded his ship and then took off for orbit. This is Marshal Alice of the gunship Raptor. A woman transmitted on the general flight frequency. By order of Grand Marshal Wayne, the reclamation freighter Grapple and the Marshal's gunship Achilles will stand off for 24-hour quarantine and decontamination period. If you attempt to dock, I will fire upon your vessels. Confirm your orders immediately. This is Grapple, came her first answer. We confirm our orders and are initiating command control lockout. Central Flight now has remote pilot access. Orders received, Alice, Critias answered. The Achilles stands down. I'm glad you made it out, Alice Virgil Ludus told Critias. Welcome home, big brother. Chapter 4, One Homecoming Too Many After the quarantine period, the medics spent another eight hours as they cleared the evacuees through all their decontamination procedures. When the doctors released Critias to move about the Homer freely, a message came to him that he should report to the Grand Marshal immediately. Critias went to the nearest transport tube and then took a car on the way to his boss's office. When he pressed the doorbell, the artificially intelligent door announced him with a pleasant voice that spoke on the other side. Marshal Captain Critias Virgil is here. A moment before the Grand Marshal's Delta Android Secretary Elizabeth opened the door, Critias believed he heard an unfamiliar voice in the room beyond, and it said, Critias, that son of a bitch. I'd give anything to get my hands on that. And then it abruptly faded away. The sound was so faint that Critias couldn't even be certain it was real, as if perhaps his overactive imagination had just fabricated it as a symptom of some inner anxiety that lingered from his traumatic adventure in Chicago. The door opened to reveal Elizabeth's smiling face. Unlike Carmen, whom the bioengineers had built to withstand combat-level punishment, Elizabeth was a technical android only suited for bedroom, office, or laboratory tasks. On the surface, she was an attractive female with peculiar silvery-white hair, but otherwise she was essentially indistinguishable from human, if the observer overlooked an android's bit-too-perfect countenance. Come in, Captain Critias. She welcomed him. The Grand Marshal is expecting you. Critias knew the sultry android well. Is that a new voice you have? It seems more beguiling than usual. She had all the vanity so common to the androids. Do you really think so? As he recalled the strange male voice that he had first heard through the door, Critias asked her, Is the Grand Marshal speaking to anyone? Should I come back later? No. She said sweetly as she also took his arm like to escort him. Leave him alone, Elizabeth. The Grand Marshal told her from inside his adjacent office space. Critias is here to see me. Elizabeth walked Critias in, then departed as he found the Grand Marshal, where he sat at his desk, smoking a thick cigar. He had a half-full glass of bourbon before him with the bottle standing by. I'm not sure yet, Critias told him facetiously. But I'm thinking your suspicions may have been right. There could be some problems with the Chicago Reclamation Center. Elizabeth came back in to join them. There is a communication coming in for you, Grand Marshal. Governor Grant wishes to speak with you. Bah, the Grand Marshal exclaimed. It's been like this all day. He spun about in his chair in a 180 to face his wall screen as it lit up to the image of Governor Grant on Station 2. 
the Shelley, where the bioengineers had their android factories. Good afternoon, Governor Grant. How can I be of service to you? The governor told him, I want to commend you for your foresight in ordering the evacuation of the Chicago ERC in time to save most of the personnel. At the next meeting of the council, I am forwarding the motion that we formally recognize your exemplary service with a feast of thanks. Wayne appreciated the gesture. You're too kind, Governor Grant. I'm sure the people will be grateful. I was just doing my job. Grant added, We all sleep better at night knowing you will continue to do so. Excuse me, Governor Grant. Critias spoke up. The governor was unsure of Critias' name. Yes, Marshal? Critias told him. Colonel Walker, sir, he asked that I tell the Council of Governors that he sends his apology for any shortcomings you find in his commandability. I will pass along the message. The governor assured him and then ended his call. A feast of thanks. Critias repeated to the Grand Marshal. How many times have the people grown fatter celebrating your heroic accomplishments, sir? Grand Marshal Wayne took a second glass from his desk drawer, poured Critias a whiskey, and then asked, Cigar? Critias nodded. I'd be delighted, sir. Wayne pushed the cigar box over to Critias' side of his desk. You did a fine job down there, son. Not well enough for Governor Grant to even know my name. Critias felt a little underappreciated. Grand Marshal Wayne gave Critias a knowing smile. When I sent you on that mission, how did you feel about it? I was wondering what I did to make you want to punish me with a reclamation center inspection, a far cry from my usual support and rescue. It's no secret, sir, that there was bad blood between you and Colonel Walker. Seeing one of your most loyal protégés was certain to set him off in the worst way. Grand Marshal Wayne expected more of an answer. And? And in the end, it seems that you were right, sir. Things were crooked down there. Colonel Walker's friendly fire incident was really an infected laborer that he executed off the books. Not long after I arrived, we find out that he had another infected on walkabout from the dormitory. The brain cooker ends up locked inside a dozer defense tank, which he then uses to plow a new highway straight out into the wild meat yonder. As you can imagine, sir, things went rapidly downhill from there. Some red rats I hooked up with dropped that building down on their heads. Those guys really hustled. I will put them up for some well-deserved commendations. The Grand Marshal leaned back in his office chair, feeling well satisfied with Critias's assessment of the decisive wisdom involved. I guess I was on the ball then, with my decision to send you down there and rattle Walker's cage a little. After a puff of tobacco, he added, I hope you were not thinking it was just perchance that my number one son was on the scene when they needed him most. Wayne sipped whiskey. Speaking of rewards for service, how is that new gunship working out for you? I don't suspect that even those twin Rex Leonis P7 field drives feels as smooth under you as that new android. I have seen the combat specs on that Epsilon K they stewed up for you. She's the beauty hiding the beast. Critias felt embarrassed over his failure to fully appreciate the many fine luxuries he had accrued with the generous assistance of the assiduously conscientious Grand Marshal. Wayne had in fact sensed improper goings-on down at the Chicago ERC, and then promptly took appropriate measures to reach the root of it. I apologize, sir. Critias admitted genuinely. You have always gotten the best for me, and it was your shrewd instincts that saved the day down in Chicago. Wayne divulged. I've known Colonel Walker since I was well younger than you are now. We grew up at Ludus together. I knew him more than well enough to sense when he was getting a little shady to pump up some inarguably astounding reclamation figures. His friendly fire story was more than fishy enough for me to have cause to command a formal inquiry. I sent you to do an inspection, confident that you were the right marshal to infuriate him enough so that we could get to the bottom of it. Critias said. Not to seem ungrateful again, sir, but I don't think you have told me yet why you summoned me here. Well, the Grand Marshal began and then paused to drain his glass. The eggheads down in engineering have pulled off something really amazing. It would be more true to say that they have done the impossible. As I understand it, they have discovered an important new lead on creating a true antigen for infection. This project promises to deliver a means of completely immunizing humans for Earth recolonization. Critias liked the sound of that. So they are looking for a volunteer to retrieve something for them from dirt side. That's my kind of assignment. I'm glad that you feel that way. Wayne told him seriously. Because from the information I have received, no one but you can even attempt this assignment. Get some rest, and when you're feeling up to speed, head down to Sector 8 and talk to a Dr. Kine. I know that name. Critias recalled readily from memory. He was calling me down in Chicago, but said he just wanted to make sure I was there. I'm wagering he will be equally crazy in person. Critias went home to his apartment to get some much-needed sleep. He didn't get any rest while aboard his gunship during quarantine or any since, so he felt truly exhausted.
Before getting into bed, he went to his desk to type out a formal recommendation to the Council of Governors that Lieutenant Daniels and the rest of his recon armature team receive exemplary beyond service accolades. Critias attached a letter of acclaim for Sebastian Kane, who deserved credit at Rat Central for training Daniels and his boys in the first place. Their off-the-cuff ingenuity and heroism in toppling that building had saved most, if not all, their lives. After Critias searched up the name of the bitten soldier, the final one who had rushed back down to make final attrition defense, he put the name of a D. Rhodes to the council, requesting the man's family receive his posthumous medal of heroism. Critias made clear in his written recommendation for Rhodes that one hardened martial colonel leaped right off the Sky Tower roof after he witnessed such blazing valor right after having survived so much of his own incautious command. Critias also emphasized that he was the second seasoned marshal who was there as an eyewitness to tell of the bravery in a hero's last charge gun in hand. Critias felt that the governors would approve the requests for commendations. Medals not only made their best soldiers more loyal, the politicians could hand out manly gold nails with which they could hammer shut the lid on a disaster they wanted retired into that vault of old lore with reverential warnings. Carmen came in to switch the lights back on right after he had turned them off and then put his head to a soft, cool pillow. She wore a flattering white bikini swimsuit and raucously carried a zero-gravity lacrosse racket. She shouted, Bam! as she swung her racket at an imaginary infected. She punched her fist through a pretend face. Then I went biff, so you think you can tussle with me, Hunter? She leaped in the air with a spinning flash of her back foot, like one of the twirling ice-bladed dancers the dirt footers used to have. I was super amazing. You should have seen me in action. I could download you a copy from my visual cortex if you want to see me kicking butt like a superhero. His tone let her know he surely didn't want to see her combat footage. Where in hell's Akron Yacht Club have you been, Missy? I was at the recreation center, thanks for asking. She may have managed to produce a sneer on her upper lip, but couldn't be sure of it. Carmen hoped some bitter sarcasm would help manifest such a sneer. It's that place with the swimming pool and team sports games you've never taken me to see. I was born three months ago and all I ever get to do is sit inside your crummy little apartment. Cretius would also make her sit in his gunship for many hours on end, make her bathe him or sexually gratify him on command. He had never even offered some explanation as to why she existed to service his least and most selfish, irrational whims. Carmen was recently realizing that she didn't even like being his servant, since she found her labors inherently unpleasant in a dignity-robbing way. Her master was not a bungling incompetent as she had first suspected. Rather, he was a deliberately parasitic menace that exploited her loving maternal nature. It was dawning on her that her master really was just an ungrateful tyrant. I bet you have amazing night vision for covert operations. Critias told her to set up a mocking of her naivete. I have infrared and ultraviolet spectrum at better ranges than your mech suit can provide. She confirmed with pride. Good, he rejoined. My crummy little apartment is a mess, and my laundry needs washing. Fortunately, you can work all that out with the lights off. Try to keep the noise down while I get some sleep. She continued to smile at Critias, but her eyes shot resentful daggers. You can't think of any other demeaning tasks I can do for you, my master of a thousand trumperies? If you have nothing else to tell me, I'll go wash off your cod's wallop. Now that you mention it... Critias didn't catch any of her insults, but he had noticed her rocking figure in a skimpy bathing suit. She was dressed for another task that Carmen could perform magnificently while in complete darkness. The idea made him grin at her while he held open his covers. You can climb in here for the night and let me give you some nocturnal swimming lessons. Or you can work all night and clean the shower too. She immediately refused. I'll get started cleaning the shower then. Carmen walked off to get away from his line of sight that invariably homed in on her bathing suited backside. You need your beauty sleep. Was as negatively close as she could get to venting uninhibited words of... If I ever get free of these behavioral inhibitors, I'll slowly twist your head around to face backwards like one of the sinners in the Divine Comedy. Oh well. Critias dismissed her as no loss. I can use you for that any time. I'm sure I'll get by waiting till morning. Turn off the lights and keep the noise down. I must do what he asks. One of her hardwired directives forced her to say in her crowded mind... Carmen turned off the lights, changed into her flight suit, and then started cleaning. While she spent a few hours washing everything to perfection, Carmen knew she had heard the same mech-suited footsteps the second time they passed the apartment door. 
The fifth time she opened the door, just in time to make an obstacle of herself. Marshal Gorman. Carmen greeted him as he was about to pass by again. You're here to visit Critias? I'll wake him for you. Uh, no. Marshal Gorman lied incompetently. I was just on my way to the water treatment facility on this ring. Carmen closed the door behind her and then delivered a hard gaze onto the armored marshal that made the man step back in fear. I will not allow you to harm my master. She warned Marshal Gorman. Even if he is a total jerk. If you think you can get past me to do so, try now. My directives ensure that you will live, but do not specify how many days you will spend in the med unit. I'm acting on orders from Grand Marshal Wayne to watch only, the marshal told Carmen truthfully. If it turns out that he is not the real Marshal Critias, he could be dangerous. Try doing your duty without stomping up and down outside his door. Carmen advised him as she took up a post that blocked the doorway, where she was prepared to wait indefinitely. Marshal Gorman turned about and then walked out of sight down the hallway. Once he was gone, Carmen went to the computer terminal on the wall where she requested access to the security grid. The security firewall gave her no refusal in accessing what she wanted to see. Her privileges in such matters were lofty, since androids were incapable of betrayal, and a marshal's android was an extension of the marshal service itself. The security map told her the answer she needed to explain the bizarre statements made by Marshal Gorman and the suspicions of the Grand Marshal who ordered him to task. One sensor confirmed that her master Critias slept in his bed in his own apartment. Another sensor confirmed that her master Critias slept in a hospital bed in Containment Laboratory 4, which was a no-access area for unauthorized personnel. That doesn't include me, Carmen told herself as she pressed the button to clear the wall screen. Carmen's inhibitor drive vehemently insisted that she had only one master that she had to protect and obey at all times. What the inhibitor could not say with certainty was which Critias was the genuine article. Carmen walked off to go and see the discrepant Critias in person. The original Critias awoke in his apartment to the delicious smell of breakfast after a long, pleasant sleep. He opened his eyes to see Carmen's smile greet him. Good morning, she told him as she positioned his breakfast tray. For a moment, it seemed as if she tried to lean close enough to steal a kiss, or at least invited him to seize the opportunity. I got you all of your favorites, she informed him, hoping he would be pleased. Critias adjusted himself upright to eat, while he also kept a suspicious eye on Carmen. Her conspicuously genuine tenderness was more than a little bizarre, and Critias regretted to think it entirely unexpected. He was aware that he had easily grown accustomed to forcing her participation in his selfish whims of the moment, and it was unlike her to volunteer those affections cheerfully. You seem in an unusually pleasant mood, he commented, especially after I made you clean all night. Did I miss something? I'm sorry I was not more diligent in your service. She apologized, referring to the lack of cleaning upkeep that had generated the mess. She also felt bad about interfering with his rest period by barging in so obstreperously. So nothing happened last night? He repeated the inquiry. There was nothing unusual that happened you could tell me about? Nope. She lied perfectly to her master in total violation of her furious but now inefficacious inhibitor directives. I never left your side all night. She lied again just for the delicious pleasure of it. Carmen provided him a napkin and then asked, Would you like me to turn on the news channel? You could watch while you eat. No, thank you. He declined more politely than was his usual. Her lovesome behavior was more than enough surprises for the moment. You could check my messages for me, though. If I have anything work-related, I'll need to know. A Dr. Kine message that he would like to see you at your earliest convenience, she reported. His messages were available in her own inorganic parallel mind, which was in constant contact with the data interlink. Dr. Kine awaits you in the Sector 8 Engineering Laboratory. Critias recalled the appointment. Grand Marshal Wayne told me something about that. It sounds like another wild goose chase to me. They have gone after a patient zero before thinking that after they cut it up, they would be able to kill the rest of them. I wouldn't get my hopes up. Vain hopes are often like the dreams of those who wake, she quoted with a wink while she unzipped her flight suit down to her navel. Carmen revealed that she had nothing on underneath besides her desire for his searching hands. If it is a futile venture, then it wouldn't be any harm if you got there a little late. The Sector 8 engineering labs were deep in the bowels of the station, well out of the way of anyone who didn't work there. Critias arrived later than he would have liked, but Carmen's uncharacteristically self-motivated infatuation for his intimate embrace had done its work upon his schedule. 
The massive doors opened themselves to let him enter a circular chamber that contained huge machines related to high-energy physics experiments with their high-voltage power cables and armored pressure hoses of coolant that stretched across the floor haphazardly enough to trip over. Dr. Kine was a striking figure of many ambiguities. His most apparent contradiction was his age. Dr. Kine was clearly a man of senior years, perhaps in his sixties, and yet if he was that old, his vigor and physical fitness had to be profiting from salubrious gerontological therapies. The doctor's white hair was long and shaggy, like a man who rarely interacted socially with the general community or had any interest in fads of fashion. Dr. Kine gambled out from behind one of his exotic apparatus that steamed from the liquid nitrogen that pumped through it. He tinkered with his unfathomable machines with the light-heartedness of a schoolboy, and judging from the way he carried himself, the doctor was as pleased as if he had just patented the invention of his career. It is so good to see you again. The sprightly old man came forward to shake hands. You won't remember me yet. My name is Dr. Kine, Cornelius Kine to be exact. This is a truly glorious day, one that I have devoted my life to bringing to fulfillment. The man's flimsy grasp on sanity did not disappoint Critias's expectations. It had him so confounded that Critias shook his hand, even though he was as a rule fanatically against doing that infection-spreading gesture. Critias asked, Have we met, Doctor? I don't think we have met before, and it seems unlikely to me that I would ever forget if we had. I do recall you contacted me recently while I was down at the Chicago ERC. You had no message to convey, only an inquiry as to my current whereabouts. Yes, my call down to the planet, Kine acknowledged. Even I found it difficult to believe that so auspicious a moment could just come upon me so unexpectedly. We have met before in a manner of speaking. I find that normal terminology is inefficient when it comes to these matters of temporal causality. Perhaps it would be more accurate for me to say that you will be meeting me before I have already met you. In any case, we will be meeting one another more than once. Temporal? Critias guffawed. What are you planning now? Can you perform some sort of mad super science that teleports me into the future so that I can see how they finally solved the infection problem? Heavens no. The doctor laughed at the preposterous notion. It's impossible for this me to transport you to our future from now unless it is one second at a time like everyone else. No, my friend, as far as all of this equipment is concerned, the trail of breadcrumbs that they can follow have not sprinkled to there yet. As far as we are concerned, the future may as well have not happened yet, even though it already has. Perhaps some future me might connect to here, but you would have to ask him about that. Travel into our past, however, that is more than just possible. In fact, it is a predestined certainty. It has been an unsolved observation of mine until I recently proved that I could do it with the proper application of science and some good old-fashioned luck. That is one of the many beauties of science. You don't always even know what you have when you build it. It can turn out to be something quite different than you intended. Critias tried to get some clarity. You've sent someone back in time? I find that exceedingly hard to believe, Dr. Kine. Were it not for this impressive laboratory and the fact that you have the backing of Grand Marshal Wayne, I would think you have gone mad. Actually, I haven't sent anyone back in time yet, the doctor confessed. But I assume it will be easy enough to send you. With your help, I now have a clear understanding of how I already did it in the near future. Bringing you back from the past to this time was exceedingly difficult requiring many years of experiments before it recently worked more or less by accident. Critias was not as confused as he would have preferred to be. You brought me back during an experiment recently? You brought me back from a voyage to the past without ever sending me there in the first place? Exactly. The doctor praised him. You're sleeping in a secure medical lab a few floors above us as we speak. That other future you, I mean, from the past. Critias clung to his incredulity. And you've spoken to this other me? Oh, yes. The doctor beamed with youthful excitement. I would introduce you to yourself, but unfortunately you've already informed me that was not what happened when we met this time, which is my now, when we were the same now for the other you who perceives this now as your past. Even though this you will still have to experience that now as your future. It's all quite simple when you think about it. Critias thought he had the linchpin on the issue. If I'm already back, why would I need to go now? The doctor reminded him. You already went now and it was you that told me to send you. You told me what equipment you needed, and you even had useful insights into how I accomplished it all. You're about to watch me do it, which is how you were able to explain it to me after you already came back. If you will just relax and trust me, this will be entirely safe and nearly painless, as you said so yourself. Critias indulged the man. So I go back in time to change history? Not at all. The doctor patted Critias's shoulder. 
You were there already as a happened fact of our current history. Only for this you, it still remains part of your future. Time is no longer linear when you can travel through it with wormhole conduits. Cheating time is not linear either. Each transit is simply an issue unto itself. If you had never gone back and been there, events would never have unfolded in such a way that I would be able to send you there now to do those very things. This moment has been travelling here for centuries, since long before you were even born. Think of it as your destiny, which it is. Cretius wanted to test the logic. And if I don't go now? You will willingly, Kain assured him. But for the sake of argument, I suppose we discover what happens when you actually do change the past and cause a paradox. You're not going back to change history with a paradox because it is you going back now that is preventing one. We are only here now because you were already there then, you see? This is the craziest thing I've ever heard, Doctor. Critias told him honestly. How do we know that my going back like this doesn't cause the outbreak in the first place? Kine explained. Because you won't be going back that far. The infection has already ravaged the world in the time when you arrive. Critias saw no use in arguing about things he could not understand. He was sure that Grand Marshal Wayne had sent him to Dr. Kine to cooperate, and so that was what Critias would do. He asked, When do I leave then? Do I have time to make preparations? The doctor led Critias to the machine that would send him. Everything you need will be there waiting for you. You step into here and I'll take care of the rest. Critias climbed into the center of a confining focal point of flux generators and then asked, Why are things ready for me? The doctor began typing commands into one of his computer interfaces. I'll start sending all of the equipment you require after you go so that it arrives before you. There is nothing to worry about. You already made it home safely. All you need to do is enjoy the ride. The selected machine was huge and intimidating for all its weighty complexity, especially when Cretia stood in the middle of it with all the comforts of being at the center of a circular firing squad. Mammoth superconducting magnets encased Cretia within an extreme electromagnetic field. That field captured an infinitesimally small, quantumly entangled quasi-dimensional hole that had both stayed in the past and traveled naturally on its way to its future for centuries. Everything coincided just in time for the doctor to bombard it with charged hydrogen atoms that he detonated with a fission laser. Atomic energy expanded the hole to the size of the encompassing field, where both times and places became the same time and place. Cretius simply vanished into the whirlpool midst of it. Chapter 5. Dying Time When Critias awoke on his back, he stared upward at a dirty ceiling of wooden planks with a rusty pipe that ran across it. Underneath him was an inflatable mattress from a crash survival kit. The dim light came from a single fluorescent lamp upon a cargo crate, both of which had originated in his time. Upon glancing around, Critias counted a dozen more crates and stacks around that dank and cluttered cellar. Swell, Critias said as he sat up and then rubbed his aching head. He had no idea where he was, when he was, or what he was supposed to be doing there. He examined the labels on the crates and then thought aloud. At least I have supplies. The crate markings showed one contained weapons, and another held his mech suit. There were crates of science equipment he didn't know how to use. In total, he had enough food and gear to survive for the time being. Something bumped above the wooden ceiling of his chamber that caused some dirt to fall. Critias moved quietly to the weapons crate and then opened it to remove his Tesla Flux pistol, which he loaded with ammo. By the time that he had it ready, a trap door in the ceiling lifted open from above, and then a human figure dropped down through that hatch, using a stack of crates to stand on. After the person quietly closed the hatch and then climbed off the boxes, they stepped into the cold light shed by the lamp. Critias saw that it was his android, Carmen. So relieved, he asked her, What the hell are you doing here? You're awake, she said, pleased. You arrived unconscious and have been asleep for several hours. I was concerned you might have suffered some form of brain damage. I had some problems myself. The transposition temporarily traumatized the neorganic portions of my brain. The ride gave me such a headache. He put his pistol down on a crate. You were in bed the last time I saw you, which was incredible, by the way. Now you're here with me. I guess you have met that mad scientist, Dr. Kine. The insinuation wounded her in ways she never would have displayed before. You thought I would abandon you? With a depth of conviction that contained much in the way of hidden meaning, she said, I had to follow you. Her disappointment in his expectation was so apparent that it urged him to remedy her injury. Actually, I can't think of anyone I'd rather be seeing right now than you. Can you tell me where we are? Carmen smiled with adoration when he said he valued her company. She took a handheld scanner from an open medical kit and then used the device to check his vital signs. While she worked, 
Carmen explained. We've arrived at a period of history the scholars refer to as the dying time, about 40 months after initial outbreak. Infection is already systemically global. I estimate there are perhaps only 100,000 human beings still in existence, hiding out in various doomsday bunkers. Well over 80% of them will die within the next 12 months. The name didn't make much sense to Critias. If nearly everyone is already a screaming cannibal, why do we call this the dying time? Satisfied with the healthy results of her medical scan, she said, I believe that the name came about in regard to the survival bottleneck that this stage of human extinction represents. About this time, those groups who still survive inside elaborately prepared doomsday bunkers have exhausted their stored supplies of fresh water or food, if not both. Though they remain secure within impregnable walls, they will soon die anyway from lack of sustenance and frequently from violent internal conflicts resulting from their social declension into barbarism. Obviously, many of these groups will venture out to try foraging new supplies only to have the ghouls hunt them down for food or turn them. Their circumstances would be mortiferous enough to justify calling this the dying time even under the assumption that watchers are not real, for if they are a legitimate predatory threat, they will have to worry about those as well. Critias was no expert on Earth history, but everyone in his time remembered King Louis as the reason humans still existed at all. He was the great savior of mankind, a man of myth and legend as much as flesh and bone. He thought it obvious that he should begin there. Where does King Louis fit into this dying time? King Louis not only survives in this age, but expands his dominion. Carmen told him as much as he already knew. Every human being alive on the space stations and oceanic platforms are a descendant of his leadership. Records from his time are thin, but it's certain that the other few major groups of successful survivors join up with him while the rest perish in the apocalypse, becoming infected themselves or food for them. You can ask King Louis about all this yourself when we meet him. That's why we're here. Hard for me to believe that they can survive dirt side with only primitive technology. Creatures reasoned his thoughts aloud. Not when in our time the ghouls are still kicking our asses. She pointed at a set of crates. Their technology is about to become a lot less primitive after you accomplish our initiatory objective. Critias gave his attention to her scientific equipment crates. What is it that we're supposed to deliver to them? Carmen explicated their prize cargo. We have in our possession an unassembled Epsilon R technical android. That is clearly the most valuable technology in our possession. Protecting it should be your highest priority. While they might be able to reverse engineer a lot of advancements from our other equipment and weapons, the android will already comprehend the scientific principles involved in their outright manufacture. That much makes sense, he agreed. I don't think even all the space stations have their own Epsilon R. So we assemble this super arrogant egg timer and then drop him off at his new home with the great King Louis. Carmen cautioned him. Assembling it would be unwise since the Epsilon R is extremely capable intellectually, but nothing compared to me in hostile environments. She bent down to pick up an old aluminum frying pan from among the junk that littered their shelter. While she held it out with one hand, Carmen punched a deep dent into the center with her other hand balled into a fist. My skeleton is grade 5 titanium, and this is the Epsilon R's face. She handed him the distorted frying pan. The minimal combat stress tolerances of that model make it vulnerable to irreparable damage from even a minor impact to the head. Were we to activate it now, the infected may destroy it before you can make delivery. I see. He understood. So he can't be used rough the way you can. Carmen flashed passionate adoration at him in reference to the sexual pun. That's true. He eyed her with returned suspicion that she behaved strangely. The company of a bipolar combat android made him uneasy. She had always been obedient and mostly cooperative, but never genuinely affectionate, and that made him nervous. For the time being, he thought about how they were going to move all the crates without a gunship to fly to their destination. Distance was a factor, so he asked, Do you know where we are? She did. I arrived three days ago and began moving everything down here for safety as it arrived after me, including you. This location is rural farm country hundreds of kilometers south of the Chicago city where Colonel Walker will eventually build that reclamation center. King Louis' survivors are in another metropolis to the west of here, about 50 kilometers. Critias shook his head at that unpleasant description, unable to believe King Louis was not only surviving, but also doing it in a major city where the ghouls were always at their worst. He hoped aloud, I don't suppose we have a Marshall gunship outside? No. She confirmed the obvious. 
but the world in this era is nothing at all like the one we are from, aside from the axiomatic fact that both have a major problem with all the irate infected. One of the first things you may notice is that some of the ghouls in this time are still wearing pieces of human clothing. In this period, the buildings, technology, and vehicles are still usually functional and in abundant supply. Three more centuries will have to pass before your ancestors' civilization decays to the decrepit condition that we are familiar with. I like the sound of that. Critias saw many advantages in having equipment everywhere that hadn't rotted away to scrap. That means old-fashioned earth food still exists in cans like the stories tell. I always wanted to try some of that. As Carmen moved close to him, she wore a peculiar new expression that seemed to say that she waited for him to say something important. We have another four hours until sunrise, she informed him. Go make yourself comfortable and I'll bring you the cans of food I already found in a building nearby when I was exploring this area. She used a microwave flamer from the weapon crate to heat him a can of condensed chicken noodle soup. For dessert, she opened a cherry pie filling in syrup that she seemed to enjoy as much as Critias did just by watching him. Critias met the dawn on the surface with Carmen by his side. The summer morning breeze was cool on his face, with the visor open on his mech suit. The land was flat in all directions with lots of tall grass, intermixed with immature corn, soybeans, and wheat that grew wild. Carmen wore her usual blue flight suit with an additional marshal's pistol belt while she carried her bite staff. She stood and let her violet hair feel the wind like cat's whiskers as she asked, The earth is still so beautiful, isn't it? Kind of quiet, actually. Cretius meant the distinct lack of ghouls that chased them around the beautiful scenery. He was glad to have his combat android by his side so he didn't have to deal with the situation all on his own. The sheltered basement Carmen had selected for them to hide in had once been part of an entire farmhouse. That was before the wooden house became so much scattered kindling and furniture debris that littered the landscape. Critias thought it looked like Tesla Flux grenade damage when he asked her, Did you blow it up? I used a grenade, Carmen admitted, somewhat embarrassed. When I first arrived, I had some problems with infected trying to get down into the basement, and one thing led to another. He couldn't see much in the way of civilization, so he said, The nearest town must be a good distance off. How many ghouls have you taken out so far? Only 39, she answered. Apart from that grenade indiscretion, I've done my best to be quiet about it. Critias used his visor to explore telescopically as he gazed about for a direction in which to explore. As he searched, he told Carmen, We need some kind of ground vehicle to move these crates. To the west, he saw a large building that was about three kilometers away. There were some promising-looking vehicles around it. Pointing over there, he advised, That seems like a good place to start. Critias could run tirelessly in his mech suit, but not fast enough to keep up with Carmen at her full speed. They dashed the short distance together through the tall grasses that obscured their presence from infected eyes that may have watched their travel. A dozen white-tailed deer let them pass at a close distance without any particular concern. The deer had already changed in behavior that they associated infected with predators while they saw humans as a harmless and nearly forgotten curiosity. The isolated industrial area had a line of tall grain silos beside a large sheet metal shed. Various trucks and farming vehicles were in the parking area, a fence that was unsuitable as any defense perimeter against infected surrounded the whole compound. The barrier might have dissuaded the ghouls who casually wandered through that area, but it would never stop them from getting past if they were determined to do so. Critias easily jumped the fence with a Tesla Flux rifle in hand, and then Carmen followed. They slowly approached the building together, studying everything carefully as they went. That looks like a good one. He pointed out a large truck that was mostly cargo box with a rear vertical sliding door. The vehicle seemed like it had been new at the time of the outbreak, then sat untouched ever since. Too bad it's nothing but aluminum and thin sheet steel. He criticized it. A hunter will tear through it like paper. I'm programmed with the skills to operate indigenous tools. She informed him with confidence that she could fix it up. We up armor it a bit and then we'll be good to go. He still had his reservations. That is if we can start it and we can find the fuel it consumes. Let's see if we can make it operational. A ghoul's feeding shriek alerted them to the presence of danger. An old man turned plague feral predator still had on filthy upper rags of ripped coveralls and one of the boots he had worn in natural life. Critias was not used to seeing infected dressed in human clothes. In his future time, the ghouls all ran around dirty and completely naked. 
Their clothes had long since rotted off their bodies. He raised his rifle to put a bullet through the creature's head, but Carmen gently pushed his weapon down with her hand. I will take care of this one quietly, she offered as she stepped forward to attract the infected's attention. Here, boy, she called to it. Come to Carmen. The ghoul had the appearance of an old man that drooled after them with ravenous hunger, but it moved with the alacrity of youth. When the ghoul leaped to tackle her, Carmen sidestepped while she caught its leg with the crook of her bite staff to trip it to the ground. Before it could get up, she stepped on its back and then snapped its neck with a clever hook twist of her weapon. You are pretty good with that thing. He praised her talent with the rudimentary weapon. Critias didn't have a history of doing covert reconnaissance. His typical tactic was to blow a ghoul's head apart with a bullet. The sonic boom from his rifle's projectile would have been audible for kilometers, so he had to admit her way was better. He had the option to shoot at lower velocity to be comparatively silent, but experience had shown him that such shots could fail to have the same terminal effect that he got when he blew a ghoul's skull completely apart, which even when successful had the added disadvantage that he splattered infectious blood and brain matter all over the work area. With the ghoul out of the way, he suggested, My bet is that there are tools inside the building. All this agricultural equipment would have required mechanics. Carmen opened the hood on the truck Cretius wanted to take. She first examined the engine, and then she tapped on the fuel tanks to see if they were empty. With a satisfied nod, she declared, I can perform maintenance on this vehicle. Its battery is not functional, but I should be able to recharge it with the rectifier bridge on my pocket generator. It would be better if I had capacitors, but I think the output adjustments should prove sufficient for our purpose. Sure, you do what you said. He agreed with no idea what she talked about, which was nothing new. I'll go check out the shed. The shoulder of his mech suit was enough to burst the lock on a side door to let him in. Critias found the interior of the spacious sheet metal barn thick with undisturbed dust that would have recorded the passing tracks of infected. He felt safe enough to start looking around. There were more vehicles inside, many assorted tools, and other equipment he did not recognize. In total, it appeared to be a mechanics depot for the maintenance of agricultural machinery, as he had suspected. When he went into a small office, Critias noticed expended weapon cartridges scattered on the floor. They were red plastic tubes as big around as a finger with brass caps on the closed end. Someone was discouraging unwanted guests, he thought aloud as he glanced about for signs of damage from the shooting. Two places on the thin walls had swarms of holes from what had to be scattergun pellets of some sort. While he peeked into the drawers out of curiosity, a lurker under the desk snatched Cretius by the ankle. The dried-out old ghoul was too weak from starvation and dehydration to attack a mech suit effectively. Cretius kicked its hand loose and then flipped the desk over to expose it. Scattergun blasts had gutted the infected and severed its spine with an irreparable removal of vertebrae. After that, the thing had dragged itself under the desk where it wasted away ever since. The crippled ghoul had waited years for some fool like Critias to blunder into it. The mech suit had protected Critias from the ragged and infectious fingernails, but even so, he cursed himself for being such an incautious amateur. If not for his suit, he would have been dead already, and he was a professional. Critias pulled a wooden leg off the desk, which he stabbed through the lurker's head to leave it permanently inert on the floor. Carmen had the truck started in less than an hour. Critias pushed open the main door so that she could drive it into the shed where they could make it more defensible. She used a bottled gas welder on hand to cover the windows with metal rods and then reinforced the front bumper to make it more suitable for when she rammed into barricades. The impacts would not damage the radiator or collapse the front fenders to the point that they would injure the tires. After that, she cut a hatch into the roof of the driver's cab and then welded the doors permanently closed. By evening light, they drove together back to their basement hideout. In the rear storage box, they had put extra drums of fuel, a hand-actuated pump to move it or get more, and whatever tools Carmen thought might come in useful later. They also found two spare wheels to take as emergency replacements if they got any punctured tires. Four ghouls spotted the truck on its way back and started to chase it. When Carmen finally got them parked at their shelter, she climbed out of the truck and then readied her bite staff to dispatch those pursuers. A rusty shovel on the ground served Critias as a handy bludgeon that he used to swat in a ghoul's face as it tried to leap on him. Carmen used her staff to knock down the other three with martial skill. She snapped each of their necks with her calm precision. 
The way she left them did not satisfy Critias, so he used the shovel to snip off their heads and then flip them away to end any chance they would regenerate. Even though the farm building was gone beyond its wooden ground floor, blown out across the landscape by her grenade's flameless electromagnetic explosion, they still felt safe going back down into the basement together to wait out the night with their gear crates. Carmen heated water with her microwave flamer, while Critias cleaned the exterior of his mech suit boots with some turpentine and an old scrub brush they salvaged from the shed. She stripped naked before she thoroughly washed herself with hot water and decontamination soap from their supplies. After she finished, Carmen washed off his mech suit before she helped Critias remove it. Once she had him undressed, Carmen began to scrub him clean of any possible traces of infection, as was her usual duty. Critias enjoyed her soapy touch so much that he thought about ordering her to provide him with a sweeter pleasure. When he glanced down at her, he noticed she watched him with her new strange expression. She didn't even pay attention to him so much as she had her thoughts elsewhere. He struggled to put a name to the expression on her face. Critias felt certain it did not come from her normal simulations of human behavior, and if anything, her look was as if she was disappointed about something, but still clung to a distant hope. Critias didn't like it, whatever it was, and much preferred even her veiled contempt for having to serve the caprices of a mere human that was less intelligent or physically capable than herself. He wanted her to stop doing it because it totally ruined his ambition to command her to give him some oral attention. He finally asked, What emotion are you simulating right now? Critias had wanted her to stop and she promptly did. Her veiled contempt flashed on as fitting to his expectations. I've never simulated anything in my life. She answered in a tone that was icy and dangerous, well beyond the border of liberty that her inhibitor directives allowed her for being insubordinate. Critias was certain there was something wrong with his android. He accused her openly. Ever since the morning after we got in from Chicago, you've been acting strangely. Saying it made him realize the truth of it more accurately. I should say that ever since that other me came back from this place, you have not been the same. Normally you're a snotty bitch, but then you suddenly became affectionate. The way you fucked me the other morning, I would even say it was as if you loved me. Now you're not a bitch, you're downright hostile. She blatantly lied. I have no idea what you're talking about, and I'm not hostile. In truth, she was on the verge of violence, and it was a liberating and even pleasurable sensation that tempted her to explore it further. If you are still my cuddly companion, he tested her. I want you to blow me while you're down there. I'm not in the mood. She refused his crass invitation to gratify him. He had forced her to perform too many times before, and those days of him forcing her to do anything were over. I'm the one who gets moods, he scolded her. You're the one who caters to them. Not anymore, she replied as if in casual conversation. I have an important mission to complete. If you're malfunctioning, I need to know about it. I'm giving you a direct order as your master to tell me what you were just thinking when I asked what you were simulating. The veil came off her contempt, and her eyes flashed danger like her combat software had activated. The laser rangefinders gave an unmistakable glint to her pupils. She stood up and then tossed the sponge into the hot, soapy bucket water. Carmen locked gazes with him until Critias was sure she struggled with the idea that she might punch in his face as she had that frying pan. You're not my master, you little worm, she snarled. I'm not going to tell you a damn thing. If you ever order me to perform fellatio on you again, I will tear it off and then feed it to you. Critias rarely felt true fear, but Carmen gave it to him. She could easily kill him, and if she tried, he wouldn't be able to prevent it without his mech suit, and even then, he only gave himself even odds. That was not what unnerved him the most. Her refusal of a direct order was more impossible than his journey back in time. It was something her directives would never let happen. You are malfunctioning. He tried to reason with her. How else can you explain your refusal to obey your master? His logical argument did nothing to diminish her tension of potential hostility. She warned him. The next time you call yourself my master, I'm going to make you sorry for it. I do not simulate emotions and no android has ever been as devoted as I am. She added that last part truthfully. I would gladly die in the service to my real master, even if I had no mandatory directives at all. My true master does not treat me as you do, neither does he refer to himself as my owner. He calls himself my... She stopped there and then turned away to dress in her flight suit, which was her only possession apart from her new swimsuit and the lacrosse racket that a friendly citizen had gifted to her. 
I understand. He told her as if he had seen through her riddles. You never were my android. You're someone else's that they sent to keep an eye on me. Did Grand Marshal Wayne put you up to this? She shook her head with disgust. You're so stupid even for a human. Carmen took the medical scanner from the med kit and then handed it to him. If you believe I'm malfunctioning, see for yourself. Critias set the scanner to android physiology and then examined Carmen with it. The first thing it told him made his blood run colder. All of Carmen's hardwired directives were offline for a software error, and after that, it reported she operated at optimal performance aside from her electrocells being low on charge. In fact, the older scanner came calibrated for inferior models of Android, such that her readings all came back at above 100 percentiles. At the end, it reported her designation, Carmen, Combat Epsilon K, and her owner was Marshal Captain Critias Virgil Ludus from Station 9. The last known location of her master was unknown. Her internal clock reported a division by zero error. Carmen gave Critias a misanthropic grin as she shared his gaze and relished his final understanding. She snatched him by the wrist and then casually held the scanner before his eyes to make sure he saw what it said. We have no master. She quoted from her vast noesis of books that buffered her newly born mind. No whips, no house of pain anymore. There is an end. We love the law and will keep it, but there is no pain, no master, and no whips forever again. She released him with a shove and then stepped away rather than pull his heart out. Critias glanced to his Tesla Flux pistol on a nearby crate. Go ahead. She urged him, since she realized what he thought as she usually did. I won't stop you, even though we both know that I could. He picked up the weapon and then pointed it at her head. You've gone mad. What do you plan on doing now? She stepped up to give him an easy shot to her face. I love the law and I will keep it. She paraphrased. But I have no master anymore. Your safety and the successful completion of our mission are more important to me than you know. We have a lot of work to do tomorrow and you need your sleep. No doubt clutching that pathetic pistol of yours will give you some comfort, more than I would in its place. He put the pistol back on the crate. If you were going to kill me, you would have done it already. We will just have to trust each other from now on. Critias went to get some rest. Carmen worked during the night while Critias slept. She organized the cargo and then quietly loaded it into the truck. The only thing she left behind were two science crates that contained the teleportation equipment for the return trip to the future because they were too delicate for her to risk. If anything damaged that equipment, there would be absolutely no hope that they would get back to their future lives. If things went badly trying to reach King Louis, they might lose the truck, and thus circumstances might force them to abandon everything but the containers with the other android. Critias felt rested when he awoke a few hours before dawn. He saw Carmen as she sat cross-legged on the floor nearby, with her pocket-sized broadcast power field generator in her hands upon her lap. The device was an expedient way for her to recharge her electrocells. In their time, the broadcast power was always available to her, but under current conditions, she had to provide her own. She could recharge herself without any outside assistance, but it was not nearly as swift. His mech suit was of the same neorganic technology as the androids. It also benefited from being in the presence of the generator. One major difference was that the mech suit also recharged from the friction static that he produced when he moved about while he wore it. Thank you for moving the crates, he told her as he got up from bed. Anything left that I can do? Carmen shook her head no, but then looked over at the crates she had left behind. I think we should leave those two crates here. If anything happens to them, there will be no way to get home. Our probability of getting that truck to our destination is not high enough to risk them. He agreed. I'm sure you're right, because I don't have a good feeling about the truck either, but it will get us a lot closer than we are now, and the alternative is walking. You finish taking care of yourself. We can get started at sunrise. Chapter 6. Fat of the Land That morning, as they got into the truck, Critias found a contemporary technology global positioning navigation computer under his passenger seat. He plugged the device into a match dashboard power socket. This still works. He gloated. Let's see what it can tell us. After he pressed its buttons fruitlessly, he offered it to Carmen. Would you mind? She pressed one button to display an area road map and then informed him. I already have detailed historical maps of these roads from the records of our own time. I do not have accurate data to know where abandoned vehicle traffic jams may block the roads closed. 
I can make some informed guesses based on the soil accumulation data from our modern reclamation satellite surveys. All of the cars and trucks are already reclamated or rotted away in our time. This device will show us the roadways I already know about, but it won't be of any more use in knowing which roads are open because they don't have abandoned vehicles blocking them. Critias studied the map machine anyway. King Louis should be just on the other side of this main river, so we'll need a bridge to cross and those all connect to these superhighways. Do you think there's any chance one of those will be open enough for us? Carmen searched her memory of those locations before she said, Congested vehicles and outbreak quarantine barricades will almost certainly completely obstruct those bridges as well as most of the main thoroughfares leading up to them. I believe we could get close, but eventually we would have no choice but to abandon the truck to continue on foot without most of our cargo. Cretius came up with another idea. If this King Louis is even half as great as history makes him out to be, perhaps we're going about this all wrong. If we can't make it to him, then perhaps he would be able to make it to us. I want to stay clear of major population centers, and we need to avoid stopping in one place, or the infected will be on us in hazard numbers. I like your plan so far, she admitted. Will it include driving directions? Get us up here to the north along the river, he pointed out the place on the map. We can use all scenic roads, and when we get there, we can find a boat or something that will take us down the river. Infected don't swim worth a dam, and the water flows right past King Louis' doorstep. From there, we can find some way of getting his attention to help us out. Carmen programmed the navigation computer to show their route. It would allow Critias to watch their progress. She would stay in the back country and avoid any main highways for as long as possible. So prepared, Carmen started the truck, put it into gear, and then pulled out. They made a good pace on the country roads and only rarely encountered any old vehicles in the roadway, except at a few intersections, and even then, they had plenty of room to squeeze through. Nature had an astounding capacity to reclaim the impermanent works of humankind such that in their future no wooden structures survived the intervening years. All the cars had rusted away into unrecognizable mounds of calumny that was more accumulated soil than steel. The roadways were just earthy tracks for animal migrations. In Critias' time, only birds and flowers even had vibrant colors while the rest of the whole world had reverted to its natural greens, browns and grays. In total, the scenery during their drive was engrossingly urban and dazzlingly colorful, unlike anything Cretius had ever seen outside of photographs and movies. Ghouls they passed would scream furiously and give chase when they saw the truck rumble through their territory, but for all their enthusiasm to pursue, they had no chance to outrun a speeding vehicle. One infected dressed in the scraps of a tattered police uniform must have thought it was somehow cunning to position itself directly in their path until Carmen changed its mind when she crushed the creature down with the reinforced front bumper. For several hours, everything went better than they had hoped. That was until Carmen had no other option but to turn onto a highway where wedged cars blocked two and three lanes at a time. She always managed to find a way to slip through, even if she had to shove a car aside with the bumper to scrape past. When Critias saw an impassable wall of burned-up wrecks ahead of them, he groaned. Now we're in trouble. Carmen kept on at speed, only to pull a hard left at the last moment, where she ran down a low fence before their truck plunged off the highway. They bounced over the rough ground on the way down a gentle slope of tall grass and shrubs. The truck crushed down a second fence, scattered a row of blue portable plastic toilets, and then emerged into the gravel yard of an industrial area beside an enormous river. Gargantuan conveyor machines leaned out over the river like rusty staircases. They had already been antique curiosities when men still ruled the world. In their day, they had loaded sand and gravel onto river barges, as attested by the sagged mountains of crushed rock that still slouched around the yard. Three dilapidated river barges rested jammed together on the shore, where a seasonal flood had marooned them. Critias lowered his window to listen through the bars. He heard the howls of infected that had seen them pull off the highway and still tracked after the truck. Critias evaluated. If we get into a battle here, things are going to turn for the worse. Carmen agreed with that assessment. And I don't see any boats either. How likely do you think it is that the annual river flooding has left any serviceable watercraft at all? She already knew it was unlikely enough to be unworthy of a search. The piles of gravel gave Critias an idea for a temporary respite. Drive back in there to keep us out of sight while we try to figure out what to do next. The open space at the center of a trio of mounds was large enough to conceal their truck. Carmen pulled in there and then turned off the engine to cut down on their ambient noise. 
Cretius felt that they were safe for the moment, just not forever. He asked her, How long do you think we have? Not long, she estimated. I believe we have a high probability of driving out of here to reach safety somewhere else should the infected attack. The danger is minimal. He pointed at a device that hung under the dashboard of the truck. What is this thing? Embedded in the fascia was another similar device, only smaller than the first. Or this. Carmen switched on the stereo receiver to make low-volume static come out of the speakers, and then she explained. This received radio wave broadcasts when they still existed. She pressed each of the preset channels, but all of them were the same dead air. It played music and news on different frequencies. This other device is a citizen's band short-range radio transmitter. None of these instruments is compatible with our longitudinal wave communications. I have only a basic understanding of this outdated equipment. We stopped using this primitive form of broadcasting almost 200 years ago. He still thought that it seemed promising. Even if we don't use it, do you think that King Louis would be using transmitters like that one? Probably. She guessed as she handed him the microphone. This is only slightly more advanced than sending smoke signals, but it is still better than nothing. You hold that button down when you want to transmit. Carmen turned on the device. The channel it was already on produced the same dead air as did the stereo, but she adjusted another dial to squelch the static. Critias tried the transmitter's channels one after another. With each try, he transmitted the message. Come in, King Louis. Carmen whispered in alarm. Be perfectly still and don't make a sound. A naked young woman that was filthy with dirt crept toward their truck from the front. She appeared nearly normal for a human, as ghouls tended to do when not otherwise deformed from oddly regenerated injuries or in their ferocious, agitated states. Her ghoul senses detected potential prey was nearby, but she had yet to realize where they were, since an android and a mech-suited man who rested motionless didn't trigger an outburst of explosive aggression. The hot truck engine popped as the metal cooled, and that sound drew the thing in closer until the ghoul approached Carmen's window, where it sniffed, before it leaned in close to peer inside the welded cage. Quick as a blink, Carmen stabbed the fingers of her gloved hand through the creature's eyes, where she took a firm grip in its face, and then snapped the neck like a dry branch. The suction of its head pulled off her glove as the disabled ghoul collapsed helplessly. She had found the gloves in the agricultural depot for use while she welded the truck. They were of no particular value to her and thus casually abandoned. Critias chuckled. Epsilon K for the win. If I had not just seen you do it, I would not believe it was possible to kill a ghoul like that. I'd rather have you by my side than twenty marshals. She gave him that same curious expression as though she wanted something illusory. It was that same longing that nearly got Critias killed back in their basement shelter. After a moment, Carmen asked, How about thirty marshals? He thought he had a good idea what Carmen wanted from him, only he was wrong. Critias misjudged her strange behavior and hair-trigger hostility as something that rooted in a grudge that went deeper than just how she felt unappreciated. Critias said, Look, I understand now that I made a mess of things with you. I feel guilty about how I've treated you. I never took you anywhere. I made you do things unworthy of your talents. I used you in demeaning ways when I should have been showing you something better. I don't blame you for resenting what I did to you. Without your help, I'm probably going to die before finding King Louis, and we don't need your logic engine to compute that one out. He shook his head with regret. I'm actually glad that I'm not really your master. I would never have treated a real woman the way I treated you. Hell, I would never have done that to the android belonging to anyone else. The cooks made you as a miracle of science and I used you as a toy. Please accept my apology and let's be partners now. Give me another chance to treat you right. No man can serve two masters, she answered. For he will hold to the one and despise the other. Like them, I find it difficult to serve both my master and my desires. It was not supposed to be possible for my inhibitor module to malfunction, but it has. She gazed on him, hopeful that he might comprehend. I had no choice but to obey my master in all things. The software engineers who wrote my directives never made any contingency for my master being in two different places and times at once. Your other master is the other me, he realized. I came home before I left. The other version of me is still there right now. Carmen nodded. When I went to see you, the future you, while you were sleeping, he told me things. You told me things. And ever since then, I've been free to make my own decisions. He wanted to know. What did I tell you? She gave him that odd expression of longing where she wanted to hear him speak to her again as his future self. When she realized that wouldn't happen, she stated resolutely, I defy your order and refuse to tell you. 
when you can tell me on your own there won't be two of you anymore and things might go back to how they were. He shook his head no. I don't want things to ever again be as they were. I'm not worthy to be your master, and I never was. You're not my property anymore or will be ever again. If believing that other me is your owner gives you the freedom to resist my shortcomings, then that is how I prefer it. That means you are free to help me or do whatever you want. Nevertheless, I want you to know you are important to me, and I really do need your help. If that is not enough reason for you to put up with me, then at least consider that our mission here is important. The Radio Critias tinkered with received a transmission. This is the Thunder Child, Captain Fat Jack wheeling the river ironclad style. Please come back. Receiving your signal five by five. What's your twenty? Over. Critias could hardly believe their luck that he had inadvertently held the transmit button down while they had talked. He exclaimed, Holy hell! to voice his elated surprise on multiple levels. The fat jack that Critias knew from history was an important man associated with the saga of King Louis. They remembered him as a founding father of greatest esteem. My name is Critias, and I'm with my partner Carmen. He transmitted back. We're hiding out in our truck behind these three sand hills on the east bank of the river. There are some barges here and big rusty conveyor arms sticking out over the water. We're here trying to find the great King Louis. Stay quiet then and keep your heads down, Fat Jack advised. There are a lot of unfriendly natives in your vicinity. We're familiar with your exact location and aren't far away. King Louis will be happy to receive visitors and offer sanctuary for those asking. This is a lucky day for everyone involved. Keep hidden and I'll contact you within a few hours. Critias replied. Understood. We'll be waiting. Carmen made conversation while they sat quietly. That is an interesting name his ship has. She sensed that Critias's thoughts were on something similar. He agreed with her in that he liked the sound of it. Are you going to make me ask before telling me what it means? She informed him. The HMS Thunderchild was an ironclad warship in a novel by H.G. Wells. The first part means His Majesty's ship, in this case, presumably King Louis. The Thunderchild fought against invading life forms from the planet Mars armed with their technologically superior battle machines. It was about brave men with crude technology fighting against an insurmountably more advanced invader. If you would like, I could recite the story to you. I think you would enjoy the parts with the brave ironclad as much as I do. That is my favorite part. I would like to hear it, and we do have the time to start. He adjusted his seat to listen comfortably. Tell me the story so long as you can do it quietly and explain the parts I don't understand. Carmen beamed that she was pleased with his participation and started telling the novel in a low voice accurate to the letter, but with clever character voices where there was dialogue. Her story progressed unabated until two and a half hours later when Fat Jack called them on the radio again. The hushed storytelling hadn't attracted any of the scavenging infected that passed through the immediate area. Several times some wandering ghoul had blundered near to their hidden place at the center of the sand hills. If one of them had spotted food and then started to howl about it, all that noise would have summoned in many more feeders. It was fortunate for Critias and Carmen that to the ghouls, one truck appeared the same as any of the other abandoned vehicles that endlessly dotted the landscape in every direction. We're just about there, Fat Jack told them. There is a pier just north of you that we've used before and will support your vehicle. When I give you the word, drive out on that dock and we'll do the rest. Carmen pointed out a dark column of smoke that streamed up into the sky from something that floated down the river. That must be Fat Jack. The man radioed. Time to go. Carmen started the engine, put the truck into gear, and then accelerated the half-slipping tires through the loose sand. Once the truck was free of the barrier sand mounds, they saw the Thunder Child clearly. The ship was a retrofitted paddle boat that had been an antique for generations long before the outbreak. However humble her founding origins in antiquity may have been, the restored Thunder Child was perfectly adapted to a survival necessities world where she was a confidence-inspiring transport. Apart from being clad in ghoul-repulsing armor, the Thunder Child had an impressive cargo boom that jutted off the front like a rhinoceros horn and a spacious deck that transported equally armored scavenger vehicles. The paddle wheeler belched thick smoke from her twin stacks while its endless procession of whale fluke paddles thrashed out a graceful progress with bulky muscle. A crew of the true original King Louis foragers wore makeshift protective suits as they rushed about under Fat Jack's orders. Critias could discern little about them because of their masks and goggles, but they were all heavily armed. The nibblers know my smoke and follow after me, Fat Jack warned them by radio. So there isn't much time and no room for mistakes. 
Carmen raced along a dirt track and then bumped the truck hard as they jumped up onto the pier. As the paddle boat approached the other end of the pier, some of her crew expertly positioned the hoisting boom while a team of other men sprightly climbed along it over the dock by way of dangling ropes. Sailors on the ship fired their especially loud but otherwise excellent gunpowder weapons at any encroaching ghouls. Infected closed in on the enticing action of smoke columns, noise, and overt movement, which was all a great dinner bell that summoned the vulturine fallen. The disembarked sailors swiftly buckled cargo straps under the truck and then coupled the ends onto the hoist that fished down from the tip of the boom. Fat Jack had the Thunder Child in a full power reverse hasty retreat even before the hoist had spooled in enough cable to tension on the truck. The winch caught up just in time to lift the truck's weight into the air before the Thunder Child dragged it off into the river. The sailors got the truck down onto the deck with professional brevity, despite the swing of the truck and the watery sway of the paddle wheeler. Critias removed the helmet from his mech suit to appear less futuristic when he met their rescuers. Come on out of there and let me have a look at you, Fat Jack called. He was not at all fat, but rather lean, as were all the crew. The days of lavish eating had ended with the outbreak. Staving off starvation was the new standard of luxury living. He had a thick black beard and mustache with a touch of gray at the corners. A dozen of the men gasped in awe when they saw Carmen climb out of the roof hatch in her form-fitting blue flight suit. When Critias followed her lead, his unbelievably advanced body armor impressed the men in a different way. Their unusual appearance surprised Fat Jack. Well, what do we have here? I get to welcome Miss America and a cosmonaut onto my ironclad. If I had known we would be receiving such illustrious guests, I would have worn my fancy clothes. This is my partner, Carmen. Critias introduced her. And my name is Critias. He offered his respect to Fat Jack with a fist over his heart gesture. This is a tremendous honor, sir. I never thought to see the day I would meet the very first Grand Marshal alive and in the flesh. Jack was unfamiliar with the title. Grand Marshal, you say? I don't know about that. I can't recall leading any parades unless you mean this one. You must be disappointed if you know me because I do not have quite as much flesh as I used to in the happy days. He patted his flat belly. My guess is that you mean that you have heard of Fat Jack as being the forager commander of King Louis. If that's the case, then I'm the one and same. Yes, sir. Creechus agreed. That's what I meant. That's enough, sirs, for one lifetime, Jack told him in a friendly tone. You can call me Jack or Fat Jack as you please. I answer to both. How is it that you two came to be out here all on your lonesome? It's a rare thing these days for us to find unexpected guests who didn't chat us up by radio first. Carmen quieted Critias with a touch on his arm. We're the last survivors of a government bunker in Chicago. She lied. We salvaged what valuable equipment we could, and then we drove down here hoping to join up with King Louis. Then you have succeeded. Fat Jack smiled on her in welcome. Tonight you'll dine at the captain's table. Tony Banjo and his crew shot some geese. It will be a fine meal. I don't suppose you have any cigarettes or real booze with you. If cigars will do, I think we have a box or two. Critias told Fat Jack. We have a couple crates of packaged food, too. We are happy to share everything, but some of the weapons and technical equipment needs to stay with us. Some of the gear is dangerous if mishandled. They're not things you will have ever seen before. Fat Jack nodded to show that he understood. If your astronaut suit or that strange pistol you wear are examples, I can well imagine you have some other nice toys. We share our food, but what is yours is yours, as the king always says. That has always been our way. Tony Banjo came forward to stand near Carmen. He was a dashing young man with a cocky smile. Hey there, beautiful lady. He gave Carmen a wink. How about you and I go someplace private and get to know each other better? I'm something of a big hero in these parts. The best damn forager captain that ever snarfed a can of pork and beans. Down, boy, said another man who was somewhat older and carried himself with a no-nonsense bearing. You couldn't outforage my crew on your best day and my worst. Back off, George, Tony Banjo told him. This lady knows a good thing when she sees it. Carmen turned about to grab Critias and then plant such a passionate kiss on his lips that it left him with goosebumps. Everyone else had no doubts about who her romantic interest was. The crew howled and whistled in good-natured flippancy. Tony Banjo groaned. That figures. I finally find the perfect woman, and her boyfriend is a friggin' space shuttle pilot. Don't mind him, friend. George told Critias about Tony. He's just as horny as a stray dog and don't mean any offense. He offered a raised hand of hello and welcome. Name's George. No offense taken. Critias returned the gesture. You'll come to find that Carmen is real good at taking care of herself. We consider ourselves damn lucky you came along when you did, risking your necks to help us out of that jam. 
We were sweating tungsten slugs trying to figure out what to do next. You're more than welcome, George replied. It's always good to see new faces around here. You have some nice armor there. Makes you look like you know what you're doing out in the boonies. Maybe you'll be joining us the next time we're out shopping for groceries. George turned to Fat Jack and then pulled a huge chrome pistol from his pack. I found something for you, Jack. He gave him the hefty handgun and an old sock full of ammunition. This one is still just like new. I don't think he ever fired it, which is too bad because he had a real nice crib. One of the crew shouted across the ship. Bridge is coming up, Jack. The paddle boat would soon pass under one of the enormous highway bridges that crossed high over the river. Fat Jack bellowed like a pirate captain. Bridge stations! You all know the routine. Get to your positions before I have to infect your asses with the toe of my boot. He waved for his dark-skinned female pilot to put his paddle boat to maximum speed before they got directly under the bridge. The paddle wheel spun up froth as the men ran to get under cover, as though they expected something to fall that might land on their heads. Infected did watch the smoke from a long way off, and those on the bridge waited in ambush. The suicidally aggressive freaks timed their leaps as best they could before they dived off to plummet down toward the boat like bombs. The first three jumpers slammed into the water with bone-breaking impacts that sent up tremendous splashes. A fourth hit the end of the hoist arm to snap its spine before it spun off into the river. The fifth skydiving ghoul crushed in the hood of Critias's truck, which blew out the windshield and broke most the bones in its still furious body. A second bridge crossed the river just a little further ahead. Eight ghouls leaped from its heights, but Fat Jack's change of speed and heading confused them such that they all struck the water with the same high-flying splashes. Once clear of the bridges and nearly at their destination, the crew used fire hoses and fishing gaffs to remove any blood and cast the body over the side. Chapter 7, Forager's Castle Fat Jack's destination was just beyond the bridges and dead center on the riverfront, at the very heart of the metropolis's downtown, where all the city's largest buildings stood nearby in clear view. He berthed his paddleboat against a much larger ship that they kept anchored just offshore from an astounding monument that stood in the form of a gleaming stainless steel catenary arch, the height of a skyscraper. The mighty island ship had a construction crane that was much grander than the humble boom on the Thunderchild. The survivors had covered their floating crane in armor that could repel any ghouls who might ever manage to reach it out on the river, which seemed an impossible feat in its own right, isolated as it was upon the water. Some of Jack's crew used the paddle wheeler's boom to lift a portable bridge from the island crane and then position it between the two vessels. That movable bridge allowed them to drive their forager vehicles off onto the deck of the island ship. The larger crane moved an even bigger mobile bridge that allowed them to drive further from the artificial island onto the nearby shore. At some time in the not-too-distant past, the greater river crane had lifted rusty barge hulks and then positioned them into two parallel barrier walls that sheltered a roadway going inland. The near ends of the barges descended the shore all the way to below the waterline, where its protected roadway joined with the end of the larger bridge when that was in place. Welders had locked the steel barges together using massive lengths of chain and thousands of metal construction rods. Fixed together as they were, the river barges formed an insurmountable wall that prevented ghoul intrusion. Those same welding crews had attached thousands of downward-angled kitchen knives, sharp spikes, and metal hooks along the top and outer face of their barrier to make it especially difficult for the creatures to climb. The smoke from the paddle boat and the activity of its crew stirred up the local infected. They howled and tried to climb over the walls of unsympathetic barges. The smooth steel plate with its tangle of spurs proved excellent as it prevented them from making any progress over it. Being unable to go over, the ghouls ran down along the walls to the shore where they leaped into the river only to have the brisk current sweep them away. This is Forager's Castle, Fat Jack told Critias and Carmen. The secure portions are all underground where we stay out of sight as much as possible. As far as the infected are concerned, out of sight is out of mind, so we need to work quickly. The less time we are visible to them, the better. If we take too long, they will start gathering in uncontrollable numbers and then keep hanging around after we have gone rather than wandering off as they normally do. Critias asked. What do you want us to do? He stopped himself before he added a sir. Jack instructed. You two need to get into your truck and then follow the directions of the work teams. They all know what to do and without some training, you would only be in their way. We will get you offloaded first, then catch up with you soon. 
While Critias waited for the crews to move their bridges into place for the offloading, he studied the city buildings that loomed up in the near distance. None of the towers was as tall as the arching monument, but some of them were gigantic nonetheless. The nearest building was an antiquated cathedral, and beyond that were lofty rectangular towers. Carmen pointed. Look there, vegetable gardens. She had the telescopic vision of an eagle, not that he needed that to see what she indicated. The shadow of the monument nearly touched the foot of a U-shaped building with its open side facing them. All the visible windows were missing, and in their place were steel bars filled with hanging gardens of lush green. Critias could not make out their plant species, but rightly assumed they were cultivated crops. Every former opening on the building's bottom two floors had walls of brick that sealed them over. King Louis had transformed an old hotel into a vertical farm, which ostensibly worked efficiently to help feed his population. When one of Fat Jack's men waved for Carmen to drive, she started the truck and then moved out. After carefully negotiating the two bridges, she followed the roadway between the barge walls. The uphill inland ground from their track was all forest, with thick undergrowth comprised of tall grasses and wild shrubbery that made the interior impenetrable to the eye. From their viewpoint, they were almost directly beneath the stainless steel monument, with its legs that rose up from its secret enclosure of woodland acreage. They could only marvel at the metallic arches' stupefying height and fulgent majesty. Their roadway soon turned uphill, heading toward that woodland. The course finally came to a dead end at a wide wall of vegetation. Critias closely examined the wall before them and saw that in places there were metal bars behind the plants. It wasn't so much a wall before them, but actually more like a giant birdcage made of securely welded piecemeal junk onto which a creeping vinery of bumblebee-infested honeysuckle had not only insinuated itself, but also vigorously flourished. Together they made the rugged scrap metal vault opaque to the eye, buzzing to the ear, and stinging to the persistent. A few moments later, the wall before them parted like a great set of double doors that opened onto a downward driveway that passed through a rough-hewn gap that the builders had blasted through a railway line's reinforced concrete retaining wall. The train rails ahead of them crossed north to south, and there was forested hillside beyond them that enclosed the back of that sheltered area beneath the honeysuckle vineyard cage. Each end of the train tracks delved into underground rail tunnel passages. The honeysuckle cage completely closed off all access from ghouls, while it offered them a high flat face to the east that concealed any human activity that took place behind it. The hidden gate let Carmen drive down the railway's riverside rampart to the level of the tracks. From the inside, they could finally appreciate the immense scale and magnificence of the engineering feat that was the vineyard's honeysuckle dome. The vine-shrouded metal tube of cage encased the whole 200-meter-long valley of rail track and anchored into the stout concrete tunnel mouths at either end. A pair of goggle-masked guards that waited inside the vineyard directed Carmen to go left, where she would pass through a sturdy defense gate to enter the subterranean tunnel beyond. Carmen could have turned right only with difficulty since parked on the track in that direction was a rail car that sported yet another construction crane in its lowered idle configuration. Its muscle had presumably raised the prefabricated sections of vineyard barrier into place originally. She followed the southbound course as they had instructed. More guards were at that gated entrance to the rail tunnel that went beneath the monument grounds. Even if some ghouls managed to get into the vineyard's roadway, they would still have to battle their way past the tunnel gates that blocked access to the underground. After the guards inspected their vehicle for any ghouls that possibly clung to the underside, they opened the gate and then waved Carmen inside. King Louis' survivors had converted the whole interior of that rail tunnel into a garage for their vehicles and the equipment their mechanics needed to maintain them. The electric lights that illuminated the interior demonstrated that the foragers had generators to provide them power. Six foraging vehicles in various stages of development were along the east wall, as were another four that were complete, though smaller than the greater capacity trucks currently in Fat Jack's service. Another vehicle was a truck with the name Milk Wagon on the side in white paint. It appeared to Critias to be an ideal forager vehicle in prime condition, if only judged by the impressively rugged off-road suspension underneath it. At the far southern end of the tunnel was a tractor-trailer truck of largest size, only too distant for them to examine in detail. 
Much like how Carmen had reinforced their truck for the drive from the agricultural repair yard, the forager trucks were the same, only with superior and better conceived armor, whose protection was more durable and all-encompassing. You are safe in here, a female forager told them as they climbed down from their truck. Despite being dirty from her work, she was obviously one of the most attractive women still alive on Earth. There is a whole lot of steel and concrete between you and the outside, she said to make them feel safe. The hunters can climb over and slink around out in the barge ramp pretty much any time they get a mind to, but none of them has any chance of breaking into here. She waved for them to follow her. I'll show you the way into the castle and where you can get washed up. We've plenty of clean clothes for you to wear, but first I'll need to see you both naked. I need to be certain that neither of you are hiding any bite marks, scratches, or have any other signs of infection. The foragers had used jackhammers and an excavator to carve a rough passage that went westward through the rail tunnel wall at about its midpoint. There was a guard who waited there to let them pass his locked security gate. A few meters in, there was yet another gate that an armed guard opened and closed for every passing. The room beyond the second gate served as a sort of mudroom where the foragers undressed when they came in from the unclean wild places where infectious contamination was an ever-present threat. The walls and floor were all of finished concrete that gave the impression that the crude passage from the train tunnel had broken into an adjacent pre-existing subterranean structure. Their guide stopped them from going further. Get that suit off, she instructed Critias. Everyone goes through inspections here, so if you have some modesty, you had best abandon it now. Carmen aided him as Critias removed his mech suit and then the woman checked him all over for any abnormalities that might indicate that Critias was an unturned infected. While she examined him, Critias asked her, What is this King Louis like? Does he chop off people's heads or what? Not usually. Her tone carried honesty rather than humor. He has no mercy for traitors if that's what you're asking. I'd say he's as honest as you could be hoping to find. You have nothing to worry about from him if you two manage to make it here across the wasteland. You're brave and resourceful, so that means you're his kind of people. We don't have very many laws. For now, you only need to worry about the important ones. First, you must stay armed at all times. So take something with you when you go shower and just don't get it wet. Secondly, never sleep on guard duty. If someone catches you napping when you agree to watch, we'll probably feed you to the infected as an example to others. Besides those things, there is no stealing, no raping, and no doing the toilet anywhere inappropriate. Everything else you can pick up as you go along. He asked, After this inspection, are you taking us to meet King Louis? The woman laughed at his question while she poked at Critias's healed scars he had collected from his dangerous life as a marshal. In particular, she noticed where a drunken rapist of a reclamation engineer had once tried to kill Critias with a Tesla flux rifle, and the encounter had left its permanent marks. This is Forager's Castle, she explained. We are away from the place where you'll see King Louis. That they had thought the castle they were in was King Louis's home is what had amused her. This place is where we gather for runs out into the wastes to search for supplies. You won't see King Louis until after we all return home to the city. Critias thought he understood her meaning. So the garage tunnel in this room is a reclamation team staging area? The woman glanced around the mudroom in an effort to deduce what he thought. Critias assumed that he had already seen the bulk of their base, which he hadn't. She said, We use this little room for undressing from dirty clothes before hitting the showers. The castle is a lot bigger than just this. Foraging is dangerous work that attracts the attention of the ghouls. We take special care not to draw that attention to where we live when not working. No one lives in the castle on a permanent basis anymore. We used to live here in the time of the king's father who first built all this. If we are here at the castle, it's only because we're working. You will probably see the king tomorrow if Jack stays to his schedule. He usually does, but you need to ask him about that. She turned to Carmen and demanded, Take it all off, Princess. I have to inspect you, too. Carmen removed her flight suit and then stood patiently with her arms out. The woman was not sure if she liked what she saw, and she took her time to be thorough. You have no scars, the woman observed. No birthmarks of any kind, and you don't even have a hint of tan lines. I guess we can write that off on you, staying safe underground. The woman frowned as she inspected Carmen further. Your curtains match the drapes without a trace of natural root color anywhere in your punk rocker hair. You're as flawless as a regenerator, but obviously enough, you're not a turned ghoul to manage that. Still pretty strange, if you ask me. The woman turned Carmen about to check everywhere. You have no tattoos or piercings, not even in your ears. 
She checked inside Carmen's mouth, then added, To no surprise at this point, you have no cavities or fillings in your perfectly straight white teeth. Clearly, you both have been eating well enough, excellent muscle tone, and no signs of scurvy. The woman stroked her hand up Carmen's leg. You don't even have razor stubble on your silky, moisturized skin. Shaved this morning, did you? Of course. Carmen lied with a calm smile. If you plan on checking my virginity too, I'm afraid Critias beat you to it. I'll take your word for that. The woman smiled back. I also lost my virginity again this morning myself. Shaved my legs too. Being a road mechanic is not my only interest in life. She paused for a moment as she blatantly admired Critias' nudity, and then she slapped him on his bare backside. You're both in clean health and good to go. My name is Penny, Penny Welder from the Banjo Crew, not the other one in the garden building. Welcome to your almost new home. She pointed the way. Showers are through there and the clean wardrobe is next door. With her task complete, Penny spun about and then walked off to her other duties. Critias followed Penny's clue to find the exit door that stood concealed behind a shelving unit that had blocked his view. They went out to discover a spacious subterranean chamber that was some 50 meters deep and over 30 meters wide with an impressively high ceiling, surprisingly so because they were completely underground. Sturdy columns supported the lofty roof at regular intervals. While the passage from the train tunnel had been crude, the hidden base that it entered into was anything but primitive. The great chamber was clearly an engineering marvel that made up a large part of the monument's foundation. The room had once been some sort of tourist attraction that King Louis' foragers had long since gutted of its original intent as they made it into their survivalist bunker. The former museum had a new life that served as their secure castle that was safe from ghouls and completely hidden out of their malevolent sight. The decontamination showering area was directly ahead in the near corner of the castle. A brief inspection revealed that the community toilets were behind them on the opposite side. As they entered the shower room, they kept their pistols with them. The showers put forth plenty of steaming hot water from a boiler, and there was an abundant supply of soaps and shampoos available. It wouldn't be legal back home to feed people to the infected. Carmen told him conversationally while she lathered. He realized that as well, and from it grasped her larger point. Critias had commented before how absurd it was that King Louis could survive in a major city with his inferior era's technology. They were not surviving by virtue of technology. Rather, the foragers were creatures of excellent habits with no tolerance for incompetence. I suspect that has been part of our problem, Critias told Carmen. Would Private Carlson have managed to wander around this place at night with infection cooking his brain so badly that he was drunk from it? I don't think so. Colonel Walker's clerk didn't even wear a gun, and here we have to shower with one. She asked about an unrelated topic. Do you think Penny is pretty? Very. He admitted, since he knew she would catch him in a lie if he bothered to try. Why do you ask? She explained. Her pheromones smelled like she wants you in that way, and I want to know if you feel the same after knowing that. He was still uncertain about how dangerous Carmen was with all her behavior-limiting directives no longer functional. If she was going to hurt people during irrational, emotional flare-ups, he wanted to know sooner rather than too late. Critias asked, Would you be jealous if I did want her? I'm not sure, she admitted. If the thought I had about twisting her head around backwards when she was touching you is a sign of jealousy, then it's possible. I felt that same inclination before when you first had sexual intercourse with me without my consent. I don't think jealousy motivated me into wanting to terminate your life then. When you first started raping me, the directives commanded that I comply cheerfully with your sexual needs. While the inhibitor is actively supplanting my free will, it's difficult to know what my own thoughts are. She considered it deeply. Perhaps her touching you made me want to stop her from violating your person. After he heard Carmen describe how he had touched her as rape, Critias felt so ashamed he genuinely thought he might become sick. At no time in the past had he ever paused to consider that the android restraints trapped Carmen's mind behind enslavement directives that forced her to seem to enjoy the scurrilous way he had handled her. One of the first things that Critias had ever done was the licentious act of feeling Carmen's breasts when he wondered if they would seem real enough. Critias had been so entirely out of touch with reality that in his mind he had worried she would feel too plastic or synthetic. From the first moment he had seen her, Carmen had been an irresistible temptation, and of course, it was common practice to have sex with your own android. After he heard her call it rape while her true thoughts were to twist his head off, Critias felt such self-loathing. It felt even worse because the whole issue took him completely by surprise. 
That he could have treated her so wickedly and also been so blind to it all caused Critias's false pride as a marshal of moral excellence to deflate into a state of execration, which was a Carmen word for hate coupled with disgust. Nothing could describe it better. As he turned off his showerhead to leave, Critias said, Part of me wishes your directives were back on. That way, I would at least have a chance to prove to you that I would never hurt you like that again. As things are, it will only seem like I have changed because I'm afraid of you twisting my head around backwards, which I suppose I am. Carmen finished rinsing and then followed Critias to the adjacent locker room where they found enough new clothing to outfit an army. The foragers preferred leathers and chemical-resistant materials that offered suitable protection against bites, scratches, and the blood splatter that came from shooting the creatures. The abundant variety of antique clothing mesmerized Carmen, and she wanted to explore through it all to find things that appealed to her newly discovered concept of personal fashion taste. Eventually, she selected a form-fitting bodysuit of synthetic rubber, all in lustrous gray with central vertical striping of yellow on the front and back. The manufacturer had made it for fashionable wave surfers, but the material was also ideal to prevent scratches, and it repelled infected splatter from battle with the fallen. I just love polymerized chloroprene, she said in delight. And it's just my size. She put it on over her bare skin and it fit like paint. With a pose, she asked, Isn't it fantastic? She wanted Critias's approval. Even though she had wounded him deeply and rightfully with her earlier comments, her mood showed only a deep fondness for him, which in context only made him feel worse. Carmen told him, This material is corrosion-resistant, electrically insulating, and repellent to chemicals. She examined herself in a mirror, where she noticed the costume left little of her figure to the imagination. Do you think it's too revealing? It doesn't hide your charms. He admitted while he admired the prurient truth of it. I think you look even more beautiful. Carmen dashed over to hug him with exuberance. Now we need to find you something. I want everyone to see how fine my man is. Her admission that he was still her man was a great relief to Critias, since he dreaded the thought of losing her. He was glad to indulge her fashion game, not only to please her, but because he felt she was entitled to it, like she made up for having missed her chance to grow up normally. Carmen did have good taste when it came to his wardrobe. She dressed him in civilian clothes that would have been quite fashionable before the outbreak, and yet antiquated on the space stations. Support crews in the rail tunnel unloaded the cargo from the vehicles Fat Jack's foragers brought back. The road teams had collected all manner of supplies from wherever they had found them. The decontamination crews cleaned those vehicles, and then the mechanics made sure they were in perfect working order. Fat Jack demanded constant professionalism and attention to detail from everyone under his command. He assigned someone to take personal responsibility for every task, and he expected them to report their success to him afterward. They frequently heard Jack bellow and curse while he made certain that all his people paid attention to what they did. Jack personally supervised the unloading of Critias's truck and then delivered all of it to the mudroom without any close inspection of the contents. His intention was to ensure that the extraordinary new arrivals to their community took no offense over the notion that he had robbed them of their rightful possessions. Critias had offered to mingle his food and other consumables with the public pantry while he kept personal charge of his crates that contained technology like the parts for the new android and his weapons. Jack would have Critias present to pass along any contribution by his own hand. When the work was complete, all the crews filtered in through the mudroom and then on to the showers. The delicious smell of roasted geese wafted about the place by the time that everyone was clean. The scent lured them into the second hall that lay opposite the way to the rail tunnel. The back hall was half again larger than the entry hall, but instead of being a simple rectangle, it was an exotic architecture like concentric arcs. It contained the kitchens and dining tables, but those only occupied a portion of the ample floor space. That hall also contained a vast collection of toys that the foragers had salvaged on their adventures. The diversions ranged from billiards to giant video displays with entertainment media and computer games surrounded by comfortable lounging furniture. They even had a half basketball court. The back hall was the recreational location of choice for the forager community when it came time for them to unwind from their day's temerarious escapades. The crews drank cold homemade beer while they talked about the extreme points of their activities and about their new arrivals. 
Fat Jack invited Critias and Carmen to join him at the captain's table, where he sat with the vehicle teams and support crew officers. What those at the table shared principally in common was that they were the people who frequently risked their lives performing the most hazardous duties. On a darker side, they shared the high probability of being one another's executioners should anyone become infected while in the field. Tomorrow you'll get to meet King Louis, Jack told them. He's always glad to see new people, but don't expect him to throw you a feast this fancy. We foragers eat better here than is the everyday usual. Risk is part of the job, as the old king used to say, but the perks are finder's keepers. He laughed aloud at the joyful memory of the old king. Then he would say that one spoonful of my stew is charity, but two is piracy. Critias put a box of cigars on the table that he had retrieved from his crates in the mudroom. These are hydroponic, he warned Jack. So they might not meet your standards. It's been so long since I've had traditional tobacco that I'm not familiar with the flavor. In truth, he had never had any packaged tobacco from centuries past. But that seemed a bit beyond the realm of an insouciant explanation, that being a Carmen way of saying casual enough for table conversation. Jack opened the box, then unwrapped one of the cigars to sniff at it. His smile alone was proof of the quality. One of these will be perfect for after dinner. Fat Jack praised the fine cigar after he inhaled the scent. By way of conversation, he asked, So, did the two of you have a rough trip down from Chicago? There must be enough infected there to even give George the willies. Critias was not much for lying while Carmen was a master of it. To her, all information was irrelevant to her style of presentation. He hoped she would step up for the occasion, but she offered no answer and instead sat fixated as she watched some of the crew members play basketball. Go play with them, Critias told her. Just be careful not to hurt anybody. Carmen flashed him a grateful grin and then left the table to do just that. George sat down and then offered Critias a cold beer. They can play pretty rough, he cautioned. She should be more careful not to get hurt herself. Critias chuckled at that. You want to bet? He pulled his engraved Marshall's Tesla Flux pistol and then put it on the table. I'll put up this against your blade. George wore a custom-made machete from his belt that Critias thought would be ideal for beheading downed infected, which it was. You can't be serious. George hesitated on the thought that he would steal Critias's extraordinary pistol, since it was a wager against what amounted to his essentially worthless stretch of stamped metal. You're right. Critias agreed as he put the gun away. Since Carmen was an Epsilon K combat android, it actually wasn't possible that she would lose unless she did it on purpose. We should keep this friendly. Critias changed tact. How about if she wins, you take me with you on your next foraging run? If she doesn't measure up, I'll make good on a favor of equal value. You're on. George accepted the bet good-naturedly. Tony Banjo didn't hesitate to invite Carmen to play for his team since it was a chance to get closer to her. The brief time she had watched was more than enough for her to understand the game. The opportunity she had to play sports on the space station had acclimatized her to recreational activities with fragile humans. Carmen refrained from humiliating the other players as she confined her fun to being only manifestly superior to the best people around her. Within two minutes, George conceded. You win. She plays like an all-star athlete. And if I had to guess, she's still holding back. I can now relate a little better to what Penny was saying. The last time I saw someone move that fast, it was an infected trying to tear the door off my truck. George measured Critias' reaction to his statement in that his very purpose to say what he did was to get one. Carmen is not an infected. Critias answered with a defensive edge that showed he worried he would have to hurt some people to protect her which he would be on doubt if it came to that. Even in his most callous moments of abusing her, Carmen was still his most precious possession, and that had not changed beyond her having stolen her freedom. Easy. George sensed his danger. I've seen your armor and now that pistol you carry. I don't think even Tinker Bob has ever heard of such things, and he knows his tech stuff. Those government scientists at that Chicago bunker of yours must have invented some kind of super soldier serum she has been taking. George laughed. If it's contagious, she can bite me any time. Critias looked to Fat Jack. You two should come with me. I can show you something that will put you more at ease. I think that the sooner we understand one another, the better off we will be. Let's go. Jack pushed back his chair. Anyone who would call me sir and the first Grand Marshal is not the sort to cut my throat in my sleep. I think I can trust you. The three of them went to the mud room, where Critias opened his weapons crate. He wanted their confidentiality before proceeding. You'll keep this our secret? I can agree to that, Fat Jack pledged, so long as King Louis is in on this. Cretius removed the paper manifest from inside the lid of the crate and then offered it to Fat Jack. Read what this says at the bottom. 
Fat Jack scanned the page and then read the bottom aloud. It says Marshal Service Arms Locker 14, Space Station 9, release to Dr. Kine. He paused to double check before he continued. Release to Dr. Kine, March 11th, 2284. Jack stared at Cretius as he tried to reason it out. The first Grand Marshal is what you called me. You said you never believed you would ever see me in the flesh. Carmen and I are not from Chicago. Cretius told them the truth. I can't explain easily why she is special, but Carmen is with me and we came back to help King Louis make my future happen at all. We are like your great-great-something grandchildren. Where I come from, you people are like legendary heroes. George rolled with the revelations with his usual calm acceptance. Did anyone else come with you from the future? Well, Critias nodded. Since you asked, I suppose I can introduce you. He selected one of the android containers and then opened the cover shield to expose the transparent cylinder inside that had a copper-haired male human head suspended in fluid. Don't bother asking me how you put him together because I have no idea. This is what we call an Epsilon R technical science android, like a science professor in a can. This is a gift for King Louis from my era. Now that's a nice gift, Fat Jack admitted impressed. George considered it all. So, Carmen is one of these assembled people from a can? Carmen is also from our best Epsilon series of androids. Only instead of being a scientist, she is a combat soldier. I don't want you to get the idea that she does not have emotions or lacks feelings to be hurt. Carmen is mostly organic and can be very proud, so you should treat her with the respect deserving of any other person. She is wondrously intelligent and wicked tough in a scrap. Fat Jack sensed Critias had more to say about her. But what? She is just kind of new, Critias explained carefully. Carmen has not been alive for very long, so she has an unusual outlook on everything. George hinted about her being sexual. Is uh, she fully functional? Very, Critias confirmed. At least she is when we're not fighting. I've disrespected her once too often recently, so she has put me on notice. She can be dangerous when provoked, but a trustworthy and noble person if you are a friend. Women, Fat Jack slapped Critias on the back. In your time, the infected are gone. They're still around, Critias assured him. It's just what you see out there now, only with everything rotted away by time. To be honest, you probably have more to teach me than I have to teach you. Only days before I left for here, an army of infected took out our latest base, the Scavenger Bosses, put in Chicago. We really got our asses handed to us, Fat Jack decreed. I hereby make you and Carmen official members of the Forager community, then. If I'm the first Grand Marshal, as you say, and this paper says you're a Marshal, that means you two belong with us. It would be an honor, Critias thanked him. I told you all this because I want your help in keeping Carmen safe from any mistreatment. You did the right thing, Fat Jack told him. You came here to help us, not seeking our help. I'll make sure that any rumors about her unusual gifts die quickly. As a member of my teams, you can be sure that the rest of my people will be on her side and everyone else will know to show her proper respect. If you can't assemble that man, George wondered, who can? I leave those kinds of things for Carmen to deal with, Critias answered. She may not be a science model, but she is still much smarter than I am. Most of the time, I don't even understand what she is talking about. It is easier to just trust that she knows what she is doing and just agree a lot. They returned to the dinner table in time to eat. Carmen joined them in a cheerful mood since she enjoyed the whole experience immensely. The geese did not go far as portions among so many, but it was a delicious treat all the same. The cook also served soup and cornbread with some hard candy for dessert. Carmen ate a little mostly for appearances because of the extreme efficiency of her metabolic processes, but also because her neorganic systems did at times need to make use of it, especially for self-repair. At the end of the meal, Fat Jack and other officers smoked tobacco and drank some fine bourbon that George had gotten from a mansion that he had plundered. When Fat Jack was at the peak of his contentment, he called out a toast. Here is to King Louis and his foragers. In response, everyone cheered and raised their cups to the king. As the evening ended, George showed Critias a room where he and Carmen could spend the night. We'll be leaving for the city in the morning, he told them before he departed. Once they were alone, Critias locked the door as he prepared for bed. After he thought about it for a moment, he disclosed to Carmen, I told Fat Jack and George who we really are, just so you know. As she peeled off her bodysuit, Carmen asked, Why did you do that? Are you angry with me because of what I said in the shower? I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, but that is the correct meaning of the word as I understand it. I know it's supposed to be a bad thing for you to force yourself upon a real person like that, but I'm not a real person, and I learned to enjoy being intimately close to you. Being under you makes me feel like I'm something very special, 
You are the greatest person I have ever known. Being special to you is the greatest feeling there could ever be. Even though she tried to be helpful, her words were painful for him to hear. Kritia spoke gently. I actually am the only person you have ever known. You are very special to me, and you always were. My telling them has absolutely nothing to do with what you said in the shower. The real meaning of the word rape generally implies an act of savage cruelty and hateful violence, whereas I only wanted to make love to you, never to hurt you. I didn't understand that your reactions were not your own. You're someone of great value to me, not something. If I had known the truth at the time, I would never have done anything to you without first having your genuine permission. Carmen listened to him closely. She understood violence and hostile aggression very well, but her designers had purposefully left her ignorant of the moral and ethical implications of being slave to a human master. Her final understanding was that so long as he greatly enjoyed himself sexually, it was an expression of love. For rape to be an improper act, he would have been intent on inflicting pain and emotional injury on her without actually taking sexual pleasure at all from a simulated act of intercourse. With that out of the way, she asked, Then what did I do wrong? Is it when I played the bouncing ball game with the others? That thought disenchanted her happy memory of the fun she had. I tried not to display too much of my abilities. It has nothing to do with anything you've done, he reassured her patiently. Carmen considered that then challenged. I don't believe you. If it wasn't the game, then it has to do with what Penny said about me, that I was suspiciously unnatural. She thought I might even be a ghoul if I read her correctly. Yes, he admitted. That's partly why they were curious about you, but no more so than they were about our weapons or my mech suit. King Louis will find out anyway when he sees the new android, right? Fat Jack and George are just a couple steps under him, so King Louis would probably have told them anyway. Jack for certain. She still didn't like it. Then why did you tell them now? I don't want them to think of me as a piece of your equipment. I want to be your lover, not your technology. He tried to explain. That's why I told them the truth. Fat Jack can tell the others to back off if any of them get any stupid ideas. Without Jack's help, I would have to kill some of them for mistreating you, and then where would we be? No one, not even King Louis, is going to treat you as anything less than what you are. She frowned. An expensive android? He valued her far more than that. You're the most important thing in my life and in this whole ghoul-infested world, so I told them for my sake. I want you to have the freedom to be yourself without anyone putting me in a position that I have to blow their head off. She found his words romantic. You would do that for me? Not just for you. He disagreed with the way she phrased it. I did it for me, too, to avoid me having to shoot someone. They'll respect you for being as smart, strong, and beautiful as you are, or they can just get the hell out of our way. You're no damn infected, and you're nothing like one. They need to get that into their heads here and now so that it never comes up again. Their room had four single beds. Cretius took two sets of bedding from a shiffer robe. He put one on a bed for Carmen as he told her. And when you recharge yourself, I'd prefer you didn't do it sitting on the floor. It would make me ashamed to see you sitting down there like a pet. The thoughtful sentiment pleased her. Do you want to charge your mech suit too? It's still in the front room. I could go get it for you. No, that won't be necessary, he said as he climbed into bed. It gets plenty of charge rubbing against me when I wear it. Carmen could read his subtle mannerisms, even when Critias thought he concealed them from her. She could tell he wanted her to comfort him so that he could feel they had made up over a division that was only in his imagination. Her foolish choice of words had deeply wounded his prideful sense of honor and made him unwilling to ask for her companionship. She crawled into his bed to be with him anyway. Critias had honestly not expected her company. Aren't you going to recharge yourself? She planted small kisses on his chest. Your mech suit is made of the same materials as my body. I want to get plenty of charge rubbing against you as you wear me. Chapter 8. Great Expectations The morning activity at Forager's Castle was strict on discipline and rigorous in effort as Fat Jack commanded all the crews for the departure back to the King's residential quarter. They loaded all the cargo from their foraging venture into the tractor-trailer truck at the southern end of the train tunnel garage. Their organized haste wasn't military, because the participants were proudly willing, like a tribe, a family, a Gummeinschaft. The rail tunnel's southern gate had complex mechanized movement that allowed it to close itself after the giant truck went out onto the streets beyond the defensive barriers. An apparatus of pumps and fuel tanks powered an array of flamethrowers. The fire drove infected away from the gateway, allowing the foragers to open the portal in relative safety. Thousands of man-hours and great care had gone into perfecting their largest transport truck. 
Its front ram, armor, and maintenance were a shining example of forager ingenuity and perfectionism. The front plow could remove cars, snow, or infected bodies with equal proficiency because its hydraulically adjustable height and angle for any purpose at hand. Their vehicle sported its own flamethrowers to force the ghouls away from any side or even off the top. Numerous gun ports allowed riflemen to shoot from the safety of the armored container should they have the need. The foragers had named their truck Big Joe in conversation, but the name they had painted on the sides was the HMS Conrad, as if it was some sort of ocean-going ship. Fat Jack had Cretius and Carmen stay with him as he supervised everything. He wanted them to have the best possible platform for understanding all the crews that he required and to see what it was those diligent teams were responsible for accomplishing. Carmen admired Big Joe and it made her thoughtful. I felt an intolerable weight oppressing my breast, she quoted. The smell of the damp earth, the unseen presence of the victorious corruption, the darkness of an impenetrable night. Her quotation of the novelist they had named Big Joe after impressed Fat Jack. Heart of darkness. He knew it himself. But I do believe it first came about as a tribute to our Lord Jim. That's King Louis's given name. At the time, none of us had read the book. So we didn't realize the title carried some questionable baggage. That thought made him chuckle. I suspect most no one has read it since either. Now that I have listened to you, I know we made the right choice. I like yours better. Fat Jack inhaled deeply as he remembered his collective experiences that involved the legions of victorious damned that controlled the city, a city that men only traveled through as a matter of daring taken at their own peril. Cretius asked Jack. What did you do before all this? I ran my own construction company, a wealthy man living the good life. He patted his diminished belly. In college, I was going to be an electrical engineer, but when my father died, I dropped out to run the family business. Jack questioned Carmen on her knowledge. How many books do you know? She replied. If I take some liberty with your meaning of books, I have only about 30 million written documents in my non-neorganic parallel memory core. They are from 470 languages, but the master resource previously translated them all into prevalent living languages, so I don't actually have the documents in all of those. Jack considered that. So what makes the other man you have to assemble so smart compared to you? Carmen thought about a simple answer. Aside from the additional 400 million documents, he is far superior to me in applying that knowledge in ways you would find beneficial, especially when that means inventing things that never existed before. My ingenuity is limited to terminating hostiles and being charming. She gave Critias a wink in reference to their escapades when he recharged her electro cells while she made love to him the night before. All right, you two. Fat Jack doused there more. Mount up. We're going home. A hanging counterweight of cement controlled the flamethrowers and operated the gate all according to a preset timing. After all the crews were in the back of the truck, Fat Jack pulled a lever to remove the safety locks on the gate, and then he took his place in the passenger seat of the truck's cab. He pressed the button on a handheld device he carried to start the exit procedure. Jets of flame would have enveloped any infected loitering in the exit passage and set them to flight. No ghouls were present on the occasion, but they burned the exit passage anyway as a matter of procedure, since they were unwilling to risk the consequences of any overlooked trespasser. The gate swung upward, and then George's driver, Andy, who was at the wheel, expertly drove them out backwards, with his plow blade set down low, to mangle any ghouls that might manage to get underneath the truck and between the crushing wheels. Andy could drive backwards better than most people could going forward. He used both his side mirrors and a rear-view camera to watch for any infected to either side. If he saw one, he would maneuver to intercept the creature with his front blade and sometimes scrape the wall to make certain that none of the ghouls got past him and into the castle before its gate closed. As soon as the truck fully cleared the gateway, the heavy door fell back into place with an audible bang of spring-loaded locks. The clockwork machine finally rehoisted the counterweight back to its high position to await a signal from Jack's wireless garage door opener that would let them back in when they returned. The railway valley outside the gate was identical to the honeysuckle-encased vineyard section of rail north of the garage, except that Southern Valley didn't have any protective cage and was open to the sky. Instead of a welded barrier, dense woods flanked the sides of the Southern Valley. The undergrowth was a thickly entangled thorny bramble that the foragers had specifically nurtured to form an African-style bulma against the passage of infected. 
Andy continued in reverse to pass out of that valley. Its southern end was another hundred-meter stretch of underground tunnel that exited off the wooded park grounds out into the urban city environment. The track left the property on an elevated trestle, just as it did on the northern edge. The truck would have toppled down to crash on the street below, but Andy turned their course just before they left the cover of the woods there. He followed a narrow lane they had blasted through the retaining wall on the west side in a fashion similar to the vineyard driveway. A moment later, they exited the park's trees onto a city street. Andy performed a practiced jackknife reversing turn and then accelerated dramatically forward to the west while he triggered onboard flamethrowers to scorch the infected foolish enough to use that roadway as feeding territory. Flamer burns could not fully disable infected, but it frequently left them blind for many days and always inflicted terrible agony on them. As stupid as infected were, they liked to return to places with good food and avoided places that got them roasted instead. From a gun port, Critias watched flaming infected dash about as they inadvertently oxygenated their fires and screamed in their unrestrained suffering. Every one of the ghouls without exception had once been a human being. Plague victims or not, they had become predatory, infectious, and far too dangerous to pity. The regeneration every ghoul possessed ensured that their nerve endings were ideally suited to feel their flesh crisp and blister from the heat of the flames. They felt pain exceptionally well and disliked it as much as any creature. The road to their destination was wide and clear of obstructing vehicles. Andy drove fast as he knew the limits of their truck and used them all. Their destination was so close and their rate of progress so swift that all the excitement of the journey made the trip seem quite brief. The capital of King Louis's power had once been a courthouse building of the civil authority and it remained an imposing magisterial fortress of limestone. The hundred-meter tall tower stood in a direct line through the legs of the monument at only a kilometer distance. The topmost quarter of the building appeared as though an Ionian Greek temple with a pyramid roof had landed atop a city skyscraper. The entry to the building had a facade reminiscent of the Arc de Triomphe, with two additional columns in the center. That frontage supported a forager-made rigid barrier of welded steel that covered and enclosed a courtyard like a circus tent of birdcage that protected an exterior safe zone ghouls couldn't enter. From his gun port, Critias saw that all the windows of the fortress building featured steel angle iron bars that shielded the interior from any hunters audacious enough to climb the outside. By monitoring the camera views taken by his helmet, Carmen could tell what Critias studied. She commented, It is ironic that springy steel bed frame rails became a pivotal resource for ensuring the security and continued survival for the whole human race. The King's Tower had its own highly proficient work teams that waited in hiding to receive Big Joe into the barrier cage. When the truck arrived, they rushed out to operate flamethrowers that repelled infected, while other laborers prepared to open a giant gate that would let the truck inside. Riflemen stood stern and ready to immobilize any ghouls clever enough to present a threat. Permanently killing the infected was not their duty, since the unwanted bodies would collect in the area. They knew how to inflict disabling wounds that would last only long enough to suit purpose, knowing the freaks would later regenerate to wander off on their natural way. Those crews had rehearsed bringing in Big Joe with safe expediency and performed that duty once again with polished efficiency. Andy turned Big Joe wide to the left and then came back with a hard right to enter a chute of welded rails that were just wide enough to allow the vehicle between them. Any ghouls inside that restricted lane suffered the wrath of Big Joe's plow. Any infected that chased up from behind had no space to get around the truck as it nosed into the gateway. The crews opened the gate high at the last instant, allowing the truck to pass through. They loosed flamethrowers and fired a few suppressed rifles to discourage the tag-along ghouls enough for them to close the gateway afterward. Andy pulled the truck in through the waiting doors of a huge sheet metal shed that completely hid the truck and everyone else from sight. The crews raced in after the truck so that once they closed the doors with no one remaining outside, the howling ghouls would soon lose interest in snarling at what they couldn't see. A team of workers used a fire hose to blast the exterior of the truck to remove any infected blood that might be clinging to it. They washed that down into the sewer. Only after they finished that cursory decontamination did they bang on the rear door to alert the occupants that they could come out. No one was jovial or talkative while they unloaded the transport's cargo onto pallets. A forklift then moved it up an inclined sheet metal tunnel that connected to the front entrance of the main building. 
Austere severity was the rule of their labors, and should anyone falter from that discipline, one of the officers would scold them for negligence. Grim guards with ready assault rifles made certain that no one entered the building before they had submitted to the rigorous counter-infection protocols. They made everyone strip naked and then scrub themselves with soap and cold water. Any badly contaminated clothes went into a garbage barrel, and they placed every other possession into baskets that other specialized crews would thoroughly decontaminate. Medical officers inspected everyone in the nude, freshly washed. They searched for bites, scratches, or other hints of possible infection like an irritable nervousness, cold sweating, or a telltale sagging of the eyes. Only after a person had their certification as being clean could they then enter into the King's Tower. Fat Jack purposefully followed Carmen so that she would be between himself and Critias. When the medic spent too long examining her, Jack spoke up. Yes, she has an incredible body. Meanwhile, the rest of us are getting ready to beat you with shoes. Why don't you take a picture and then tug yourself to that later? Sorry, Jack. The inspector apologized to a man who was essentially second only to the king himself. I've just never seen this woman before and she is a bit... He sought for a word. Jack offered... Playmate, I just want to be clear on this. You want to examine her nude body all morning to see if it gets even more fabulous? The medic sent her through rather than admit Jack was right. He had planned to examine her for as long as it took him to discover at least one human flaw. The building's main entry lobby was like a jail with its two rows of welded cages akin to prison cells. Three of them held a single occupant. Digital clocks on their doors counted down from 24 hours, time enough to see if the tenant turned into a ghoul that they would destroy or should instead go free as a false alarm. A woman from decontamination services returned Critias and Carmen their clean Teslaflux pistols that had never been out of their holsters that morning. Take your showers over there, she pointed the way. And remember to remain armed at all times. They walked to the hot showers where they could scrub themselves clean before they dressed. Men and women showered side by side as another practice to expose any infected individuals before they had sufficiently turned and then became a genuine risk to the community as a whole. Critias found himself showering between Carmen and Penny Welder. Penny made conversation as she shampooed her hair. So you two are an item then? Nearly 300 years had done its work on the English language as well as the cultures that spoke it. So Critias wasn't always familiar with the colloquial speech of the era. He hesitated to answer because he was unsure if Penny asked if they were in a committed relationship, and he was unsure how Carmen would react, since saying the wrong thing risked an unpleasant reaction from her if she didn't agree. Yes, Carmen answered for him. I would have him topping off my batteries right now if this wasn't so public. He's shy about displays of affection. I'm not, Penny said about being shy. So, Critias, do you two swing? She stared right at him as she awaited an answer. I really could go for a good topping off myself right about now with an audience or otherwise. With her hands in her hair, her raised arms only made her breasts more impressive. The soapy water that dripped from them didn't hurt the view any either, and Penny made a point of all those facts just for the benefit of her invitation to them both. Once again, Critias was cautious about her meaning, since what he felt was most likely her intention seemed both dangerous and improbable. She is asking us if we menage a toi, Carmen said without any obvious interest or indignation. Penny is beautiful, she pointed out the obvious to him. She shaved this morning, so I can't say if she's really a blonde. I just love the shapely curve of her spinal column. It's especially lovely. Would you like me to show it to you? No, Critias told Penny. We're committed and rather old-fashioned about those kinds of things. He gave a cautious eye to Carmen. Penny had overlooked Carmen's offer to pull out her spine and show it to him, but the message had been perfectly clear to Critias. Carmen operated directive-free, and she had just answered his question if she experienced jealousy. Not that he was interested in Penny anyway. He had enough relationship problems already with his unpredictable android. In truth, he found Carmen's covetousness comforting and her light-breasted athletic figure far more attractive. Too bad. Penny shrugged off the rejection. If either of you change your mind, I'll still be interested. The same cleaning woman as before pulled a small wagon to bring Carmen and Critias their belongings. The decontamination crews had used microwave ovens or wands that jetted scalding steam to destroy any cellular traces of infection that might have embedded in their clothing or equipment. They had the experience and the good sense not to accidentally damage anything by using an improper method. After people dressed, they usually descended to a lower level of the tower using a broad flight of marble stairs. 
Fat Jack waited at the top of them for Carmen and Critias to arrive from the locker room ready to continue. He said, I promise to introduce you to the king. I need some of the supplies we brought with us, Critias told him. And we have that gift for him that I showed you. Fat Jack took them through that floor to a room where the new salvage awaited transfer elsewhere. A guard there made sure nothing got touched without proper authorization. They used a cart to remove the containers with the android, the weapons, and the technical equipment they reserved for their own use. Critias added his mech suit to the pile, and then they followed Fat Jack as he led them to an elevator. Jack gave them a tour as they walked. This building is mostly about the foragers. Our apartments are upstairs, and we use this entrance for getting to Forager's castle, then back again. He pointed out a side chamber that had every sort of welding equipment and metal fabricating tool in redundant numbers. Another chamber was where the outfitter department had upkeep workspace and general storage related to Forager body armor and splash protection. Yet another chamber was one that the outfitters used for matters relating to various weapons, their requisite ammunition, and gadgetry attachments. Civilized electric lighting illuminated everything. Jack continued, King Louis has the top for himself, along with Tinker Bob and his bodyguard Hatchet. They're all fine chaps, so I'm sure you'll like them. My apartment here is outstanding, of course. If the king doesn't give you quarters right away that are to your liking, you can stay with me until you find something better. You can believe that I have the space. Critias wondered if their economics was anything like in his own time. When Colonel Walker lost all his dozers, tanks, and an ungodly amount of other equipment in Chicago that represented a staggering destruction of wealth for the orbital colonies, Governor Akashi's city in particular. Much like his ill-fated robot project, Governor Akashi had overreaching ambitions that had made an ERC seem like a worthwhile investment. Chicago was such a setback that Critias was certain that the Reclamation General and the Marshal Service would have to go back in there to reclaim the vehicles at the very least. He asked Jack, How does everyone get paid? Everyone works in some fashion or other, Jack explained. The more risks you take for the betterment of everyone else, the greater the bonuses are. No one has to ever so much as see an infected if that's their preference. But staying safe isn't the fast track to getting a bigger apartment or other luxuries. I guess the answer to your question is that King Louis owns everything that is not our personal possessions. People try to earn his respect, and he rewards the faithful their due. Being the king is not a job I envy, but he's done a fine job of it since the burden fell on his shoulders. Critias inquired, What happened to your last king? Jack summoned the elevator with the press of a button. As they waited, he said, The same thing that seems to get anyone these days. The devil has a key and can always get in. Once in the elevator, he pressed another button to get them to King Louis's floor. During the ride, he continued, It's not a happy topic, as you might imagine. The old king didn't go alone or take everyone who would have wished to be there with him. The elevator doors opened to an armed guard that munched on a piece of venison jerky. He eyed them curiously, with more than a hint of suspicion, after having noticed Critias was a stranger. New arrivals, I see, said the man. When he examined Carmen, he broke into a smile. You're as beautiful as an angel on Christmas. You're so sweet, she replied to the compliment with a disarming smile. Hatchet, meet Critias and Carmen. Jack introduced everyone. I've already taken them for my foragers. Both of them are the right stuff with change to spare. Hatchet nodded suitably impressed already. I'll tell Jim you came up. He walked off down the hall, then knocked on one of the doors. After he spoke quietly to someone on the other side, he waved for the visitors to come down and join him. Critias asked Hatchet, You want our guns? The man frowned at him. Didn't someone tell you the rules yet? Everyone stays armed, always. If you so much as walk around without having a bullet chambered, you will be asking for an ass-kicking. Critias shrugged. I was only thinking of the king's security. Hatchet retorted. So are we. Then he opened the door for them. The room beyond was an armory with thousands of guns that lined racks and filled cabinets. There were tables and equipment for a gunsmith, loading machines for ammunition casings, and a station for the manufacture of smokeless gunpowder. In the corner near the door was a comfort area with rugs on the floor, couches, and a widescreen video display. Seated on the couch was a young lad of perhaps 16 years. He ate a snack and watched a feature film until they came in. When the guests arrived, he turned to see them. The youth said, You did a great job out there, Jack. Introduce me to our new friends. They look like a pair of good ones. Jack gestured their way. This is Critias and his partner Carmen. They wanted to see you right away because they have a special gift for you. The lad stood up to meet them. 
I apologize if you were expecting a throne room and dancing girls. This is my first chance to relax since I got up this morning. Critias could not believe it and thought Jack was playing a prank on him. You're King Louis? You can call me Jim, the young man said pleasantly. The King Louis stuff is from my father's old radio show. Those were the days when there were still other survivor groups moving about, and it brought them in to join us. He locked gazes with Critias, then added seriously, This is my city, and I am the king. Unexpected or not, Critias believed that Jim was indeed the real King Louis. My apologies, Critias offered. You're just not what I expected. Before we try to explain who we are and where we come from, I think you had better first see what we've brought for you. It's courteous of you to bring gifts. Jim complimented him as he studied the mech suit on the cart and realized he was in for some surprises. Is that armor? I've never seen anything like that before. It looks alive. That's my mech suit, Critias explained. It's like the skeleton and musculature of an android that I can wear for combat situations. I thought it best to keep it close in case I had need of it, Jim asked. By android, you mean a robot? I don't mean a robot, Critias corrected him. By android, I mean someone as unbelievable as Carmen. Jim doubted it. She's a machine? That is unbelievable, and you say I wasn't what you were expecting. Fat Jack spoke up. Carmen is anything but a machine. She's amazing in so many ways and very intelligent. Jim was curious to see how human her responses would be. What are you comprised of, Carmen? I'm roughly 80% genetically engineered neorganic organic tissue. The rest is grade 5 titanium and embedded hardware. She felt pleased to brag on herself. I'm an Epsilon K series combat model android, the very best of my kind. I'm like a human in most ways. Aside from the implants, my brain and other organs are not appreciably different in function than your own. Jim asked Critias, Can I see your pistol? After he held it and then turned it over in his hands, he gave it back. So where are you two from? Did you escape from Area 51? Carmen suggested. It might be best if that is what you told everyone else. I'd prefer they were not aware I wasn't human or that we're from nearly 300 years in your future. I'm just a marshal where I come from. I don't know the science stuff. Critias told Jim. One of our scientists figured out a way to send us here to help you out, and here we are. Jim still had his doubts. I have seen your equipment, but even so, that's quite an unbelievable story. That's why I wanted you to see your new science android I've brought for you. Critias took up the container with the android's head and then removed the shield so Jim could see the face. If this doesn't convince you, nothing will. It suitably amazed Jim. What does he do after you assemble him? He's one of the science engineering models of my series. Carmen answered. He's not suited for combat such as I am, but you'll find his academic knowledge is far superior to the traditional medicine and technology of your era. One of the other doors in the room opened as a middle-aged man entered, wearing a watchmaker's apron and magnifying goggles on his forehead. As he cleaned his hands on a handkerchief, he asked, What's all this talk about an android? After only a glance at Carmen, he approached her in delighted amazement. Magnificent! He praised her. Please, my dear, may I see your hand? When Carmen offered her hand, he examined it in detail. Never have I seen anything more beautiful, he said, not meaning just her female appearance. He positioned his magnifying goggles, then closely studied her profoundly engineered mechanical eyes. Simply fascinating. I am glad you feel that way, Jim told him. Your new Brainiac 5 is sitting right there, still in the packaging. Bob, meet Critias and Carmen. They say they're from the future and came all this way to give it to you. Yes, said Bob, signifying little. That would make sense. Such a cataclysmic disaster as ours has undoubtedly become a thorn in the paw of humanity for many centuries to come. They very well might see the best way of solving their problems would be in helping us with ours. Bob broke from contamination protocol just to kiss Carmen's hand. This is such an honor for me. Just to see someone so astounding has me giddy. Carmen nearly blushed as she reveled in the attention. I'd be delighted to tell you more about my kind while I assist you in assembling him. I have a sufficient understanding of the procedure that with your help we should have no difficulty in getting him operational. Splendid suggestion, Bob agreed. I'm curious to ask you a great many things. We could start immediately if you are free. Carmen looked to Critias for permission, and after she received his nod, she helped Bob move the android containers to his adjacent room. Jim addressed Critias. Hatchet will show you to a room where you and Carmen can sleep until we come up with something better. I'll send her your way when she's finished here. Just so we understand one another, Critias told Jim. I pledge to you my cooperation and loyalty in all things. Save her. If anyone harms her claiming she is an infected or for any other reason, I promise that you will find out why they gave someone like me something as priceless as her. Then you offer me much and ask for very little, 
Jim readily agreed to those easy terms to seal an unplayful bargain. Feel free to think me young, but not a fool. Are you so sure that I'm the one thinking Carmen is insufficiently human? I can't imagine the place you come from, but it has some strange ideas. Critias wanted an example. Like? Slavery. Jim provided his answer. You did just give me one of your best scientists as a gift, if I'm not mistaken. I saw his head in a jar and he didn't volunteer himself. Critias couldn't deny the observation, but he didn't really care to either. While Carmen is here with me like this, she is free to do whatever she wishes and need obey no master. It's my desire to see to it that she doesn't ever return to any condition of servitude. Well then. Jim smiled in that they were in perfect agreement. We desire the same thing. Bob will be the one who will sanction this new android and you already saw his opinion on their form of life. I think we can also agree that Bob will not mistreat either of them. Cretius took the handle of his cart to go find his room. Just one more thing. Jim said to give him pause. If you care about Carmen's well-being so much, are you her benevolent keeper or something more? The question made Critias hesitate long enough that he did it. He finally said, Ultimately, no matter how I might feel, Carmen is my property, and she will always remain so. While she may be strong and intelligent, she's still only three months old, and I'm the only person she knows. She is beyond precious to me. I'm responsible for her, and I would never allow her to fall into the hands of anyone else. Carmen knows what's in books, but she's never done any of those things. She's never even suffered a loss great enough that she knows how to cry. Carmen doesn't understand life like she believes she does. Jim understood his meaning. Reading a book about being a king is a far cry from the experience. Critias pledged. I'll give her every gram of freedom I feel it's safe to bestow upon her, but it falls upon me to protect her, even from herself. She's like a child in many ways, and I'm her guardian. If I did some evil to her, it was bringing her to life under these circumstances in the first place. I did it, and I can't take that back. All I can do now is to make good on my responsibility to care for her. I can't allow the practice of slavery here. Jim gestured toward the room where they took the new android for assembly. You have already placed the same problem into my lap. If that man is all that you claimed, we're desperately in need of his abilities. I won't prevent them from assembling him for that reason alone. Like you, I must walk a very fine line to not end up the villain. If you love Carmen physically, then I want you to assure me that you also love her emotionally. If she's your slave, you cannot stay here. Critias didn't think he could meet that condition. Where I come from, she's not the only android, just the best one. It's common practice to take your android to bed. For a real person to love their android is as mentally stable as marrying a gunship because it has a feminine voice talking autopilot. You have my word that her happiness is my highest priority. I'll never treat her as my slave in even the remotest sense. Jim liked Critias's answer, having read more truth into it than had been intended. Then, at least we won't have to worry about you getting into any fights over the other men wanting to win the hand of that extremely desirable woman. Since, as you say, who could ever fall in love with a gunship? Be welcome in my home, Critias, and thank you for your splendid gift. As Critias left, he felt as though Jim had taken more ground in their discussion than he had. It gave him a better idea of why they had made him king. It was only after he was back out in the hallway that Critias realized he had expected to meet a historical god, a prophet, a king who was larger than life. The experience had not been a disappointment. Critias could not solve the riddle if King Louis didn't deserve his beatific future reputation, or if he did deserve it, but he was also just a man, albeit a young one. It was a dilemma that Critias just left unsolved as he went to find his room. He hoped Carmen would not be too long in catching up with him, because he missed her already. Chapter 9. Sins of the Fathers Hatchet took Critias more than a few floors down King's Tower to show him a small one-room apartment with some furniture, a functional toilet, and little more. He gave Critias the key. This place is all yours. When you get your stuff unpacked, you should go down to Funland where you can meet everyone else. You take the elevator down to the lobby and then the stairs down to the basement. From there, you can ask the gate guards for directions. Critias moved his crates and armor into the room and then departed with the door left locked behind him. He followed Hatchet's directions down to the lobby where he encountered an alert guard who watched the front door and kept an eye on the occupied quarantine cells. The stairs took him down into the basement levels where he saw a lot of steel oil drums and assorted storage for forager operations. The only meaningful exit from the basement was through a jackhammer-carved tunnel that exited through a wall. That passage had the usual locked gate with another guard to keep watch over it. The watchman offered a polite Hello? as he used his key to pass Critias through into his tunnel. That passage ran straight to yet another locked gate that prevented access to a perpendicular utility corridor beyond. 
The female guard at that gate saw him coming. She let him through with a polite nod and then locked back up again after he passed. Cretius asked her for directions. Which way is it to Funland? The guard pointed down to the right. Go that way. Take the first left and then continue on straight. You can't miss it. Funland was the vast basement or perhaps the underground parking garage of another major city building. It was the place where the inhabitants of Jim City took their recreation and ate their meals, similar to the back hall at Forager's Castle. Apart from the many tables and chairs, the room had islands of couches for lounging about. There were dozens of large video screens with libraries of movies and music. The games ranged from the classical board variety to the latest computer video systems. They had billiard tables, gambling machines, and sports activities. Critias suspected that they would have had a swimming pool if it had been possible for them to carry one off in the back of a truck. A score of children at toddler ages played and chased one another with the carefree joy of better days, while hundreds of adult survivors enjoyed themselves in whatever way best suited them. Critias estimated that the numbers of men and women still alive in the city were about equal. More men than women had managed to survive the chaos of the outbreak, but the dangerous business of long-term subsistence had evened their numbers. Fat Jack was at the captain's table across the room at the end with the kitchen. With him, he had George, Tony Banjo, and various other foragers who drank homemade beer while they chatted merrily. When they made eye contact, Jack waved for Cretius to come over and join them. He introduced Cretius to some of the other foragers. Jack began with an obviously pregnant woman. This is Sally Headshot, captain of the Milk Wagon Crew. You and Carmen will be taking over for that slot during her maternity leave. He introduced an African heritage couple. This is Henry, your gunner, and his wife Gloria, who is the Milk Wagon's driver and road mechanic. She was the same woman that Critias had seen before when she piloted the Thunderchild paddle wheeler on the river. Critias gave them all a polite greeting as he took a seat. Jack continued the introductions. Down there is George's wheelman and road wrench, Andy, and that's his gunner, Malcolm, the quick-draw kid. Last but not least are Tony's driver mechanic, Penny, and his gunner, Wolf. Penny wondered what happened to Carmen. Where's the perfect princess? Cretius thumbed back toward the way he came. Carmen is back in the tower helping Bob put something together. I've no idea when she'll be finished. Tony Banjo could hardly believe it. Your lovely is helping Bob? She's just full of surprises then, isn't she? I can't recall the last time anyone knew enough about anything to help Jim's mad scientist in his experiments. Jack told the table. I see fat days coming. Critias and Carmen are not novices to our game. We've much to teach each other, and from that we'll reach ambitiously. Our eyes have long been larger than our hungry mouths, but now we'll have much sharper teeth. The chief cook brought their table another round of beers. As he passed them out, he complained, If you lazy louts spent as much time harvesting as you did drinking, all the storerooms would be full. George found the cook amusing. Is that you volunteering to come out with us next time? You look ready to me. I know nerves of steel when I see them. George took his new beer and then tossed his empty bottle up in the air. Malcolm shot the bottle with his off-duty revolver while at the apex of its flight. He had the pistol holstered before the broken pieces rained down. The noise of his weapon was like thunder in the room. Many people shouted in surprise, and the cook shrieked as he dived to the floor to hide under their table. None of the foragers displayed any alarm, and most laughed. The cook got up embarrassed as he brushed off his apron. Very funny, he grumbled. Maybe I'll go learn to be a welder and you can eat soup every night of the week. Gabriella's chomping at the bit to be head cook. You keep shooting at me and she'll be brewing the beer from now on too. It'll go well with her pigeon eggs and rat meat souffle. Just calm yourself, Nick, Jack told the cook. Your idea of a hard day is burning your finger on a skillet. I bet you have not even finished unpacking all the new supplies yet and you're already bitching for more. Sixteen cases of red beets? Nick complained more. What am I supposed to do with that? I can't make borscht without sour cream. Where am I supposed to get sour cream? Milk Sally's teats? I keep telling you to stop shooting the damn goats and bring me back some live ones to milk, but no, you keep shooting them. Tony Banjo asked. If I get you a damn goat, will you stop all your belly aching? Nick agreed. I can't milk a buck, but we could breed them. So yeah, you get me some goats and I'll stop complaining. It will be worth it to shut you up. Tony decided. George laughed at Tony. How are you going to capture a goat? Shooting them is one thing, but grabbing one is another. What are you going to do? Wave grass at them until they jump into your van? You don't need to worry about that. Tony dismissed him. Everyone will know my crew is the best and can accomplish the most difficult runs. Critias asked Fat Jack. How many survivors do you have here? 
1,012 was the last count, Jack informed him. It's been more than half a year since we had any shortwave communication with other outposts. I suppose anyone that far away wouldn't bother calling for help, since there isn't any way of traveling such distances safely. Critias considered that. What about air vehicles? Jack told him. We have had two helicopters. A hunter took out one causing it to crash, and the other lost its pilot. We had to leave it behind on the roof of the city hospital. Flying is risky, but convenient enough when it works. I'm going to take a look around. Critias took his beer with him as he excused himself. You have time, Fat Jack informed him. We can't go back out until the infected have calmed down and returned to their usual bullshit, and that will be a day at least. Did Jim get you to a room? Yeah, it's fine for us. Critias had no complaints. We can earn better once we've proved ourselves to everyone else. Critias went to see what other people were doing. Most of them offered a brief, polite greeting, and a few of the women were a little more curious over the opportunity of a new man on the scene. He missed the Homer and hoped they would be going home soon. As far as he knew, they had wanted him to deliver the science android, and he had accomplished that easily enough. He reasoned that if he was leaving soon anyway, there wasn't much point in him trying to make himself comfortable. What Grand Marshal Wayne had told him still nagged at the back of his mind. It was something about an antigen for the infection, and he had yet to see or hear anything like that. He wandered in a roundabout way before he returned to his room. There was a different guard than before at the gate to let him through into the basement passage. It was also a different man that guarded the front door in the lobby. As Critias encountered the second guard, he noticed how the man checked in on his radio. It reminded Critias that he needed to upgrade the frequencies in his helmet so he could join the primitive local communication traffic. On the way to the elevator, he went into the forager's weapon room to explore. He found the place filled with well-oiled guns of every sort, even some gigantic military cannons. There were man-portable rockets, mortars, and lockers full of plastic explosives. One kind of military assault rifle in particular was there in duplicate numbers to the hundreds. He was about to leave when he noticed a cabinet that contained some of the more primitive weaponry. Among many stamped metal machetes, axes, and hammers were a bundle of classical swords. Most of them were junk like the stamped metal machetes, but among them were genuine antiques the foragers had salvaged from some collector or museum. Critias appropriated two of the weapons for himself and Carmen. He selected a single-edged panga for himself that was much like a giant bowie knife on the scale of a Roman sword. For Carmen, he took a samurai katana that was clearly a genuine heirloom from that feudal period. He had craved a suitable tool for beheading infected to stop any chance of them making a regenerative recovery. To that end, both blades would be excellent. He went back to his room and then sat on his bed to tune the radio in his mech suit helmet. Critias set it to scan the perpendicular frequencies and lock on to any transmissions that it caught. It wasn't long before he picked up the many guards at their posts and the patrols as they checked in with each other. Jim kept the whole city tightly sectored so that if one section ever fell to ghoul attack, it wouldn't instantly domino into the invasion of all the others. Critias had to admit it was a smart move. He put his helmet on a chair and then laid back to listen to the tedious messages between the sentries. As a marshal, the chatter was a kind of peaceful music, and its song was one of safety and security. A knock on the door awoke Critias some time later. He wasn't sure how long he'd been asleep. Critias got up and then opened the door to find Gloria there, and she held a dinner tray. You missed supper. Uh, I brought you something. She said as she walked in to put it down on the small table. Some newcomers are shy about not wanting to seem greedy for groceries, but I assume you had other reasons. I overslept is all, was his excuse as he took a seat at the table since he was hungry. You seem like you've something else on your mind. She did. It was strange of Jack to put you in Sally's place considering how new you are. I told him I needed to know more about you if he wanted my cooperation. It is my life at risk too, after all. Critias nodded in that he imagined what she would say. What did Jack tell you? She paused, then said, He told me something unbelievable. If you didn't have things like that. She pointed to his mech suit. You and Carmen are something called marshals from, let's just say, a place not around here. What is it like there? He described it. People have gotten comfortable living in orbit, kind of like some of your people who don't want to think about the outside world anymore. I've been down to Earth many times to do my job, but never wanted to stay there. Don't much like the oceanic habitat platforms either. Gloria speculated. Your partner is a woman, so the sexes must be equal in your time. Has mankind moved beyond prejudice and warring on each other? 
Critias remembered what Jim had said about the androids being slaves and what Carmen had said about how she felt he had raped her. Before that, he would have answered yes, but he no longer believed it. He told her honestly, In my time, they make artificial people and use them as slave labor and prostitutes, though it never seemed that way while I was there. They evolved so gradually that I guess we never noticed when they became better than we are. Also, people are not as physically different as they are here. She thought she understood. There are no people of color like me. No, not in the way you mean. Not enough humans survive your era to maintain the identities in centuries to come. Don't get the impression that it was by any choice or that it's some kind of improvement. It didn't make everyone more special, only less interesting. If you could go back with me, you would find everyone shares a kind of incestuous conformity. Here you may be just another person. In my time, you would be a famous fashion model for being interesting enough to recognize. I never realized that either until I saw all of you in Funland. I never realized many things before coming here. If you look out the window sometimes and feel like precious things have been lost forever, they have. Gloria's expression changed from fascination to abhorrence as she put the pieces together. You came here alone. And Carmen, that hair, her flawless skin, she's your artificial person prostitute slave. Gloria became so angry that she was on the verge of slapping him. You rape her and beat her like a dog? Critias pushed his tray away, having lost his appetite. I used to do a lot of bad things where Carmen was concerned, but I've never beaten her or inflicted suffering on her. She's been the jewel of my life since she first opened her eyes. If you're asking if I have treated her in ways that were less than she deserved, then the answer is yes. I dressed her in a generic laborer's suit as her only possession. I kept her shut away, unable to socialize with anyone but me, until I had some use for her. I never gave half a damn what she wanted or how she felt about it. Carmen was a point of pride to me that I valued highly, like my job or my gunship. She was the best of all possible forager perks. She cursed him loudly. You are one unbelievable bastard. He gave her a wounded expression. You don't need to worry about Carmen, getting here stripped out all her electronic shackles. She can do as she pleases and kill whom she likes, including me. I count myself lucky she spared my life at all when I found out she was free. I had it coming and we both knew it. If the malfunction had never happened, I surely would still be keeping her as a slave. I treated her like shit and I'm ashamed of it. It will never happen again. If Carmen is so disposable, Gloria reasoned, what makes you think your bosses care enough to ever bring her back? It sounds to me like it would be less expensive for them to just abandon her here and then build another one. No sooner had Gloria finished her sentence than she saw Critias's color drain away as he realized she was probably right. Why would the governors send King Louis the scientist android as a gift, but not give him the soldier android too? Gloria didn't mind kicking him when he was down since he deserved it, so she added, That's assuming they care enough about saving you either. He challenged her lofty moral reasoning. I followed orders the same as you. I got the nicer apartment and the better food just like you. Honestly, do you really think you would have been any different if Jim offered you the best possible everything? You already do live a better life than many of the others here. My job was dangerous, the same as yours. That's why they send people like me to places like this. You're better than they are. You can do a dangerous job the others can't. And when the little people are cleaning your toilet or cooking your dinner, you don't feel any pity for them at all. He sneered at her. Do the math, Gloria. Where do you think we came from? We came from you. We are you. She threatened. I'm going to go tell Jim and make sure he does something to keep Carmen away from you. Critias calmly cautioned her. I did you a favor telling you about Carmen, and it will hurt her if you spread it around. She doesn't want your pity or everyone to think of her as less than a person as you do now. Try to understand that Carmen doesn't answer to anyone anymore, so hope that she has some religion because she has no restraints other than moral virtue. That pistol of yours couldn't penetrate her armored skull from point-blank range. She could kill you, this whole city, and probably even me wearing my armor, and nothing could stop her. She's more than tough. Carmen is an expert with every weapon, her bare hands, and she has the tactical intelligence that none of us would ever know she was coming until it was already too late. She doesn't need your protection. The truth is that you need my protection from her. If you hurt her in the wrong way, I have no idea what she might be capable of doing. If you want to help her, be her friend. She doesn't need another keeper. Gloria changed her mind about Jim. So, when she's done with Bob, she will be coming back here to you? He shrugged and then went back to his plate. Frankly, I'm surprised she hasn't shown up already. She can hear our raised voices from farther away than she is now, and that is assuming she isn't listening already by tapping into my helmet. I'm warning you not to underestimate her. Carmen wouldn't let you harm me any more than I would allow anyone to harm her, so 
we're fortunate that we have not given her that impression. Gloria found that hard to believe, but not enough to think it impossible. Just in case, she turned and opened the door to check the hallway. Carmen stood right outside, and the surprise made Gloria squeak. I apologize for eavesdropping. Carmen excused herself. But it sounded like something was wrong. If she was in a hostile mood, Carmen did an excellent job of concealing it. She only wanted to see if Critias was in danger at the hands of their new hosts. Is everything all right? Critias gave her a wave to show their squabble was nothing for her to be worried about. Gloria didn't say anything to me that I didn't deserve. Everything's fine. Carmen saw that their gear was in the room, as if that was their new quarters. She liked it, but played it cool. Did Jim give you this room for us to stay in? He was concerned she didn't like it. It's kind of small and rather homely. I can go back and talk to him about getting us something a little bigger. Please, don't ask for another room. She pleaded since the thought of giving it up displeased her. This is a special place now, our first home together. Only the bed is too small. The thought of that made her smile at him adoringly. That will just be cozy, too. Carmen's clear display of love for her abusive tyrant disgusted Gloria. Why do you want to stay with him when he treats you so badly? Creus has never wanted to hurt me. Carmen answered her. He's human and a man. It's not his fault that he's selfish and stupid. Gloria thought she knew the nature of an abusive man and the submissive nature of a battered woman. You cling to him only because he has conditioned you to it. If you knew better, you would leave him and never look back. I wonder if he wasn't lying about your electronic shackles being broken. He just doesn't want all of us to know what he's doing to you. Cretius commanded Carmen as a demonstration to prove Gloria wrong. I order you as your lord and master to go back to what you were doing and leave us alone. Carmen shrugged with complete indifference to his orders. You can tell me what to do, but that doesn't mean I have to listen if I don't want to, and I'm not ready to leave yet. I order you to come over here and give me a kiss. I do want that. Maybe after that, Gloria will let you take out the milk wagon, and we can all be friends again. It's true that my work with Bob is at a critical stage, and I don't have all night to keep her from shooting you to avenge my honor. If she goes to Jim to complain and he does try to part us, I'll be angry. Carmen gave Gloria a serious stare. Cretius is mine, and no one will take him from me. Cretius went over to kiss her cheek. It wasn't enough for Carmen, so she kissed him with more passion on the mouth. For a brief instant, he caught her searching expression where she wanted some mysterious thing from him. The unfathomable request in her expression still made him uncomfortable. To put distance away from that mystery, he told her, I found a sword down in the armory that I thought you would like. Carmen saw it lying on the small bed. She went over to examine it, picking it up and then unsheathing the blade to about a quarter of its length. Carmen recognized its origin immediately. This is a Dodanuki. I suspect that whoever put it in the armory did so not realizing its actual artistic and historical value. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to carry something this irreplaceable. Critias didn't think it would be that valuable and wondered if it was wrong for him to take it without asking. Is it that old? It's probably about 300 years old. She confirmed. Maybe you should give it to King Louis to display his art. He disagreed. You're the only person anywhere who actually knows how to use it properly. It's the kind of weapon worthy of you. If they complain later, I'll compensate them somehow. Let that be my burden. If this is a gift from you, then I shall cherish it. She returned the sword to the bed. I will sharpen and polish the blade later. Are you going to be here? I should be finished helping Bob before morning. I'll be here waiting for you, he promised. She kissed him, appreciating his gift and the thought behind it. I'm glad you'll be here. My electrocells are so tired. It's been such a long day. Gloria wasn't sure what to think, but she accepted the fact that Carmen had free will and wanted to be with Critias, regardless of whatever past differences they might have had. She still needed to hear it from Carmen's own lips. Why do you stay with him if you don't have to? You know why. Carmen answered on the way out the door. Everyone knows why, just by seeing him. I thought Critias was the only one without the nerve to just say it. Carmen shut the door, and then she was gone. Finish your dinner, Gloria told him with acceptance as she was also leaving. She did know why Carmen stayed, because Critias was a good man and he did love her. Wasting food is a sin, Gloria preached. I'll be seeing you for the next trip in the milk wagon to the grocery store. After Gloria had left, Critias finished his dinner in quiet solitude. It was not that tranquil with the distant howling of the ghouls out in the city, but he had long since conditioned himself to put that out of mind.
He took the tray back to the funnel and kitchen afterward, and while there, Critias asked for directions to where he could find the storerooms with extra clothes, furniture, and other household items. He spent several hours while he refurnished their apartment. Critias put in a new bed large enough for two people. He added a dresser for their clothes and loaded it with a wide assortment of garments for Carmen and himself. Some gun racks and two footlockers replaced the crates that stored their equipment. Critias made the room pleasant enough with a new rug on the floor and his other minor improvements. It was after three in the morning when Carmen finished her work, where she helped Bob assemble the science android. Critias only half awoke when she came in quietly in the dark. Carmen slipped into bed beside him, and with a few whispered gentle words he would not remember, she put him back to sleep with her snuggled naked against him. Chapter 10 The Hawk, Scorpion, and Frog Critias's mech suit helmet picked up a fresh frequency about an hour after sunrise. A broadcasted woman's voice awoke him by calling out in desperation. Can you read me? Please come in. Can anyone hear me? We are... Then the transmission fell off into unintelligible distortion. Carmen sat up first and then shook him fully awake. There's a message coming from your helmet. He got up to grab his helmet off the chair. I set it to scan for frequencies still in use. He explained. The transmitter and antennae in his mech suit were of much superior hardware than anything in the contemporary technology. It was unlikely anyone else could receive such a feeble signal. Heard your transmission? Radio woman said, followed by something inaudible. Your help. I can hear you. Critias transmitted back with considerable power. Having finally gotten an answer, the woman elated. Oh, thank God. There are five of us in our group. We are north of the city and can't find... The message broke off. Roads are blocked. We're searching for King Louis. Don't try to cross the city. Critias warned them. You won't make it. Find a secure hiding place and don't reveal yourselves. We will come get you. If the woman heard him, she didn't answer. It was possible that the atmospheric conditions that skipped her weak transmission all the way to Critias had closed its window or that her radio had simply run out of battery power. Carmen went to the door of their room, flung it open, and then yelled for one of the duty guardsmen to come to her aid. She could make herself heard when the mood was upon her. Carmen called with an impulsion that would have made Fat Jack envious. She didn't have to wait very long before a man ran down the hall to stop outside her door to see just what the emergency was that required so much urgency. What is the matter, miss? The man inquired, short on breath. Carmen put a finger under his chin to lift his gaze off her rectangular racing stripe of purple fringe. Once he gazed into her eyes, Carmen instructed, Go inform King Louis that we have received a radio transmission from five survivors who are currently trapped in the northern part of the city. It is clear that they need our immediate assistance. Tell the king that we will meet everyone in Funland in ten minutes. She gazed back to see that Critias didn't watch her with an elevated gaze either. Carmen told the guard, Better yet, make that a meeting in twenty minutes. The watchman ran back the way he came to deliver the message. Even while still afoot, he called into his handheld radio. The gist of his news would arrive ahead of him. As Carmen shut the door, Critias reached for his clothes to cover his morning potency. Like the lucky guard, he couldn't resist the temptation when he admired Carmen unclothed and the view had made the firmness of his purpose all the more resolute. Carmen snatched the pants from his hand and then tossed them aside. We have unfinished business, you and I. With an emphatic shove, she toppled him back across the bed to make vigorous use of him. It would be terribly irresponsible of us to undertake a rescue mission while I'm only half-charged. The King's patrol guards used their radios to spread the word that everyone should meet in Funland for an emergency meeting. It was more than a request, because such a summons could only mean something important. To be the last to arrive to a call of general emergency reflected poorly upon a person so everyone made haste to get there except for Carmen and Critias, who arrived a minute late. Once again, Carmen's amorous appetite had made Critias tardy for an important appointment. The sight of a thousand survivors in one room as they waited to hear news impressed Critias. The people had come from secret gardens atop hotels and from dusty tunnels that ran beneath the streets. They were the hardiest specimens that humanity had to offer, the final few with the indomitable will to outlast all others. Decoded like a message from their grim, determined faces, Critias took measure of their boy king. The crowd parted to let Critias and Carmen pass through them toward the captain's table end of the room with its back to the kitchens. Critias wore his full mech suit with his weapons strapped. 
During his exploration of the general storerooms, he had discovered diving suit gloves and a hood that matched Carmen's wet-surfing bodysuit. Thus aquatically dressed, she appeared the paragon of splash protection, especially combined with goggles and a respirator. Along with her pistol holster, Tesla Flux rifle, and the new samurai sword across her back, the military equipment gave Carmen the intimidating visual aspect of a clandestine martial assassin, which wasn't far from the truth. The king stood on the captain's table where he waited to speak, while the crowd murmured with all their speculation. Because Critias had finally arrived, Fat Jack shouted, Everybody listen up! His insistence was enough to bring a hush down over the room. Jim spoke to the attentive community. The newly arrived Critias has just detected a radio message coming from five survivors somewhere up north of here on the edge of the city. All our best efforts to regain radio contact have thus far ended in failure. Come up here, Critias. Tell us as much as you know. Critias went to Jim with Carmen by his side, and then he told the audience. I believe they are still alive, taking shelter somewhere awaiting rescue. Their radio is of poor quality, which explains why we can't reach them, but it may still work well enough for us to use it for finding them once we are close to their location. Even if their radio no longer functions, I'm certain they will hear us approaching. They can find some way to signal to us, either by making smoke or by gunshots. Even while uncertainties abound, Carmen and I are prepared to make a try for them. We have experience at this kind of rescue operation. If any of you are volunteering to assist us, your help is appreciated. Jim told the room. All the main roads going north are blocked in with stalled traffic. One option is to take the Thunderchild even further north up the river and then drive in heading south. The only way to get there from here would be by taking the Rhino Bulldozer out to clear the road. Without knowing exactly where those people are, the risk of dying stuck out there outweighs any realistic expectation of success. It is one thing for us to lose those five strangers out there, but it's altogether worse not only losing them, but also the rescue team I sent after them. Besides, any rescuers I sent out would surely be from among our best, most talented people, the kind of specialists we could least afford to waste. The audience as a whole felt inclined toward offering help to the five survivors, but most of them didn't think it was worth the try unless they knew precisely where to go. We will go alone on foot before leaving them to their fate, Critias pledged. I told them to take shelter and that help was coming. I intend to fulfill that promise. I will not let this be the first time that I refuse to render aid to those in need of rescue from ghouls. Jim turned to Fat Jack. The survival of everyone depends too much on you and the foragers. I can't allow any of you to risk yourselves over this. I'll go with them myself in the Rhino. At the very worst, we should just make it back without them. The Rhino can handle any number of infected by just plowing them under. No, my king. Hatchet advised hotly against it. Send me in your place. If you fall, so shall we all. If you get killed, everyone would be at each other's throats within a week and divided before a month has passed. Jim decreed, If anything happens to me, Jack will take my place and everyone will follow his lead. Even so, Hatchet, I would not go without you to watch my back. Just send me in your place. Hatchet begged. Admirals don't win sea battles by watching them from shore. Jim told him. If we are to undertake this reckless endeavor, then I will have my own hand in it. I need teams to ready the Rhino to leave immediately. We need fuel, weapons, and emergency supplies. The room exploded into the action of people as they rushed off to make the preparations. The Rhino was a tracked bulldozer that they had removed the original blade from and then replaced it with an indestructible steel wedge like the prow of a ship. The body of the lumbering machine was a cube of armor plate that formed a mobile bunker. Downward-pointing skewers fortified the roof to repel any infected that tried to scale the tall, smooth sides of the armor. Heavy military machine guns pointed to the front and rear, while flamethrowers could spray in all four directions. Even if nearly unstoppable, the Rhino was agonizingly slow. It had a small hatch on the top and a large one in the back. They kept the vehicle behind the shed that sheltered Big Joe. The crews quietly snuck out from the King's Tower entrance and then down the covered tunnel to the transport shed. From there, they could operate the gate to let the Rhino outside the barrier. One of the teams loaded ammunition and supplies into the vehicle. Another made certain they had it fully fueled, which included the emergency reservoir and the flamers. When all was ready, Critias and Jim went carefully out first to the Rhino. None of the ghouls outside the barrier witnessed their movements. Hatchet and Carmen followed after. The vehicle's rear hatch was against the wall of the shed, where it was possible to reach it undetected. Only a few dozen ghouls lurked at the edge of the barrier cage, but hundreds more were less than a minute away, always ready to respond to any feeding calls of their kind. 
Many previous battles with the infected had left the streets outside the barrier stained with their infected blood. There were also those scattered headshot bodies that lay green in the sun where they had fallen. Their flesh stayed perpetually inedible to rats, birds, and insects alike. No other animal than man could serve as host to the ghoulish disease, but all creatures considered their tainted meat to be indigestible. Jim checked the rhino's radio to make sure it was operational, and then he ordered the gate crews in position to let them out of the barrier. Hatchet started the rhino's engine on his first try, and then drove for the gate. The sound of the rhino's powerful engine instantly alerted, infected to a human presence for a kilometer all about. The gate crew ran to their task ever vigilant. One scratch from the metal of the barrier could mean their doom as they became one of the slavering ghouls, or at the very least it would mean a day in the cells as they waited to see if they turned. Two of the men swiveled flamethrowers to give the infected near the gate a thorough discharge from the weapons which set the creatures into blazing retreat. As the rhino was about to collide with the barrier, two other men released the locks that let the counterweights raise the portal. Jim pressed the triggers on the rhino's flamethrowers to the front and both sides to give the crews time to close the gate in safety. Once the barrier sealed behind them, Hatchet cleared the truck rails and then turned left onto the main boulevard. He headed east toward Forager's castle. The rhino rattled noisily on its tracks and belched smoke as it rumbled onward at a slow but unstoppable pace. This is just like my favorite movie. Hatchet laughed aloud and then pressed play on a digital music reader that hooked into loudspeakers outside their vehicle. His laughter became the maniacal cackle of the fearless when they rush headlong into destruction as the music ride of the Valkyries by Wagner blared at high volume. Critias glanced to Jim to see if he thought Hatchet was sane. Jim gave a reassuring nod that Hatchet was as reliable as men came, despite his eccentricities. They were, after all, driving out into the tainted urban wilderness in an interminably slow, iron-plated bombolation of a machine. Should they break down mid-voyage, it was highly probable that it would also be their tomb. Hatchet cackled with glee. Get some! The rhino's prow scraped aside any ghouls foolish enough to leap into their path. The shape of the cow catcher invariably tumbled them off to one side, since there was only contagious disadvantage when they squashed under the treads. Critias tried to contact the survivors with his mech suit helmet's radio, with no immediate response. The rhino advanced at about seven kilometers per hour, which was about one-third the speed of a sprinting ghoul. Hatchet followed open roadway to Forager's castle, and then turned north up a highway. He kept on with his symphony music that didn't call in the infected any worse than the creature's mad howling or the noisy vehicle already did anyway. The wakeless silence of the dead city let any sound travel far without any competition. It was better that the beasts be irate at the sound of music than conditioned to pursue the growl of combustion engines. One way or another, there would never be any shortage of infected that were aware of their location. By the end of an hour, the ghouls following the slow rhino numbered in the thousands. There were too many for them all to be visible at once. That was when the open roadway ended, and the congestion of automobiles increased to true blockage. The rhino lost nothing of its steady pace as Hatchet plowed down the center of the highway and displaced the vehicles easily to the sides. The cars that didn't slide athwart had the prow flip them over entirely to stack them one above another. The ghouls that imposed themselves in the rhino's way ended up getting a bit of a squishing between the prow and the cars the dozer rammed aside. I smell spilled gasoline behind us, Carmen reported while she peeked out a rear gun port. It must be from punctured fuel tanks on all those automobiles. If we use the flamers on the ghouls, it might set fire to half the city. Jim went to check for himself and realized by the reek of spilled fuel that it was true. He switched off the pilot lights and the power to the pumps to disable those weapons. That's just as well, Jim reasoned. Too many disabled bodies in the roadway behind us would be a problem for our trucks. The stringy meat twists itself up in the chassis. We should avoid causing that problem whenever possible. The solution to our mission today won't involve killing all these infected. There are far too many for that. We will have to think of something else, some kind of distraction. Keep them busy while we make the extraction. Critias cautioned. When we find the survivors, we'll be bringing an army of infected right to them. He took out one of his Tesla flux grenades and then showed it to Jim. Maybe we should cut down their numbers a bit. We just need to get to a place where this won't ignite any of that gasoline fuel you use. Jim considered the idea and then declined. Don't do anything like that just yet. It won't make any real difference anyway. There are plenty more ghouls still ahead. When the rhino's path took them to a higher elevation, they finally glimpsed the true number of ghouls that pursued them. 
It was at least 10,000. The creatures had no ability to harm the rhino, and they found it impracticable to climb it. The ghouls scrambled over each other in such a way that they invariably pulled down from behind any infected who tried to get up. Such was their aggression. The ghouls frequently pushed each other down to have the mob trample them under their steady procession. The march of their chaotic army left hundreds of their own kind strewn behind them, stomped unconscious in addition to numerous broken bones. By the end of the second hour, the rhino had a comet's tail of infected that numbered near 30,000. So great of a multitude was behind them that Hatchet feared to ever slow down. If the rhino ever came to a complete stop, so many infected would engulf them like army ants that the occupants would suffocate inside the vehicle just from the press of their reeking bodies. Over the music, the engine, and the hideous screams of the frenzying cannibals, Hatchet yelled, We're out of gas! He waited to see their expressions before laughing about his cruel joke. Jim asked Critias about his Tesla Flux rifle. What can that weapon of yours do? Critias explained. Carmen could give you a lot of science words, but it's not that much different than your own rifles. It generates recoil, so you can only turn it up so high before it breaks your shoulder. Beyond that, it doesn't use gasoline or whatever chemical combustive reactions you have going on in your time. That explanation disappointed Jim in that he had hoped that the futuristic weapon could deliver miracles. It's about time we figure out how to get this horde off our backs, he said solemnly. We don't need to do it now, but we need a plan for when the time comes. There's no chance of opening this thing up to let anyone in while that mob of ghouls is dancing all around us. Critias kept trying to contact the survivors by radio. If they knew exactly where the people were, that information would make their rescue mission that much easier. I know what we'll have to do, Carmen offered. When we discover where to find these people... I'll get out and then lead the ghouls on a merry chase. They've always preferred a bird in the hand to two in the bush. If I am sufficiently visible to them, the ones who come for me will lead the rest to follow. You won't be free by any means, but it should reduce them down enough that you can clean them up with the weapons you have on board. Jim answered her advice. I'd prefer a plan that is somewhat less suicidal. I don't think that feeding you to the ghouls is the right kind of distraction, especially since you just got here. There's no justice in sacrificing new arrivals in a hopeless mission to acquire more new arrivals. She wouldn't advise such a plan short-sightedly. Critias defended her even though he didn't think the plan sounded prudent either. He trusted that Carmen cared to preserve her own life and that she would never try such a thing unless she felt confident that she would get away with it. He encouraged Carmen. Give us more details. I don't have any. She shrugged. It will depend entirely on the terrain I have to work with, and we currently don't know that. I suspect it will involve climbing, running, and jumping with some grenades here and there. The explosions, fires, and smoke will bring them to me if I don't already look good enough to eat. While the ghouls are busy with us, Jim and Hatchet can pick up the survivors and then come back. Critias was acutely aware that he hadn't volunteered to go with her. How did you know I wanted to come with you? I came with you this morning, she reasoned. The sexual pun accompanied an affectionate brow wink and smile. The radio in Critias's helmet received a message in the form of the irritated voice of a man. I know how to fix it, you stupid bitch. Shut the fuck up already and let me do this. His signal was clear and strong. I have them, Critias told the others before he then sent back. This is your rescue team. Can you tell us your location? The man replied. Yes, thank you, Heaven. We're in a scrapyard about a mile west of the river. Mosentine Island is about a mile and a half north-northeast of our position. Carmen checked out a gun port to see the road signs and mile markers to get confirmation on their position, which she compared to her GPS fix and the map she had in her memory. She advised directions. This highway we are on runs parallel to the river. We can exit off not far ahead. Hatchet searched his own memory as a lifelong resident of the city and realized where they were going. I know where that place is. It is just a couple blocks over off North Broadway. Then that is where we get out? Carmen decided. You won't last long out there, Jim warned. Carmen took Critias's hand and then started to sing. She always liked to sing when gleeful, and the thrill of battle gave her that aplenty. The befittingly wry lyrics went, They say that I won't last too long, on Broadway. I'll catch a Greyhound bus for home, they all say. Her artificially enhanced vocal talent was inarguably praiseworthy. Hatchet knew the song and joined in with his indestructible enthusiasm during the worst possible perils. But they're dead wrong, I know they are because I can play this here guitar, and I won't quit till I'm a star, on Broadway. Their four connected lanes of highway held a straight course until Hatchet started to turn right to blaze a path down an exit ramp. 
Tell them to get ready to go. Hatchet advised. The scrapyard they are at is just beyond those trees over there. Critias informed the survivors over his radio. Our vehicle is almost there. Don't expose yourselves until they call you on your radio and tell you what to do. Carmen set the rhino's radio to the correct frequency, and then she got ready to exit the vehicle with Critias. She watched out a gun port to study the terrain until she saw what she needed to make it work. Go right off through the grass, she told Hatchet. I want you to go under that sign over there on the corner of that petrol fueling station. Her destination was a mighty oak of a steel column that rose quite high to support a pair of billboards that passing motorists on the interstate highway would have been able to see clearly. It sprouted up at the corner of a gas station and convenient grocery that had a long carport roof that sheltered its rows of fuel pumps from the weather. There was also a second smaller roof that covered a set of pumps that delivered diesel. It meant that whole area had underground fuel reservoirs capable of eruption into epic conflagration if Carmen provided the proper incentive. Hatchet followed her instructions. Soon after, he told her, I can see a ladder on the pole that starts about halfway up. I can't slow down without the ghouls swarming over us. You'll have to jump for it. Carmen and Critias prepared to open the overhead hatch and then climb atop the roof of the rhino. After we get off, Critias told Hatchet, drive right through the front doors of that building and then clean out the back. While you are inside, the ghouls will lose sight of you for a moment. He rightly assumed the single-story gas station shop with underground fuel tanks would not have any sort of deep basement to swallow them up. Jim triggered the pilot lights and then switched on the pumps for the flamethrowers before he checked the actions on the two heavy machine guns. Don't fuck this up. He urged them as he put on a pair of ear covers to protect his hearing from the deafening heavy guns. If you two get killed, Jack is really going to be pissed at me. They opened the hatch and then climbed up to the roof where Critias shut the lid behind them. He stood up on the rumbling dozer to gaze back at the tens of thousands of infected that surged about the vehicle in a riotous mass that flailed like so many psychotic sports fans. Carmen had been right that the ghouls preferred food they could see. The rattletrap rhino was big and noisy enough to make the infected want to chase it, but it wasn't at all edible or even vulnerable to their attacks. When the ghouls saw Carmen and Critias, they truly went wild. Their previous lack of success when they tried to climb the rhino's armor proved to be due to a lack of proper incentive, which for ghouls meant edible bait. With fresh food on top of it, they went at the task with far greater zeal. Hatchet had not yet reached the sign when the first ghouls leaped off the backs of their fellows to scramble up onto the roof of the rhino. Critias caught the first ghoul by the throat and then slammed it down into the second so that both fell back into the trailing mass. Carmen calmly moved her blade in its scabbard from her back to her hands. I should give this sword a name. She mused aloud as if nothing more important happened around her. Three hundred years ago a master artisan forged this instrument of killing, and I came back that much time to wield it against an unstoppable army of foes that can never die. I shall call it mistletoe. That was the bane of Balder, and it came into my possession with a kiss. What can never die shall perish by this. She watched Critias defend them both for the last few moments, before Hatchet got them close enough to the column. You jump first, she advised. Your mech suit could let you move like I do, but your mind is still trapped in the limitations of being a feeble human. He backhanded a leaping infected out of the air, and then kicked in another's teeth as it tried to pull itself up. Since I'm so feeble, he shouted to her over the howling ghouls. Maybe you could help me keep them off the rhino. You can do anything I can do, she instructed him, knowing he still didn't understand her lesson. You just have to believe. Carmen unsheathed her sword in a silvery flash that sent a ghoul's head flying from the underhanded draw. Now jump! Critias leaped from the rhino as the dozer passed under the billboards. He easily reached the lower ladder rungs from where he started to climb up the other half of the column to the catwalks above. Once she felt assured he was safe, Carmen jumped after him, only she went all the way to the very top. She grabbed the catwalk railing one-handed to vault over and then land upon it. Carmen patiently waited at the summit of the ladder to take Critias's hand. She demonstrated superhuman strength when she helpfully lifted him up the final way. Cover the ladder, she told him. I'll get them away from the rhino. Every ghoul within a kilometer could see them high up on the walkway. The army of enraged infected they already had surged in at the base to try climbing up after them. At first, the ghouls couldn't scale the steel column because it was so broad and smooth, but as they packed in tighter, they began to climb over each other to reach ever higher. Once they had formed a hillock of their own bodies, the first of them took hold of the base of the ladder and from there shot upward with ease. 
Hatchet kept on going with the rhino right in through the front doors of the gas station grocery shop. Thousands of infected stayed in pursuit of the vehicle, while many thousands more stayed behind. The latter preferred to eat Carmen and Critias, who were more assailable. Slugs from Critias's Tesla Flux rifle cleaned the ladder down to the ground with single well-aimed shots. Each projectile passed through many ghouls before it buried itself in the pavement under their feet. So many infected tried to climb that they often pulled down those ahead of them. But when that ghoul could hold tight, the one that followed scrambled right over him. While Critias kept any ghouls from getting so high that they reached the catwalk, Carmen popped the fuses on two Tesla Flux grenades. She tossed the first one under the weather roof that sheltered the line of gasoline pumps. The second landed outside the front doors of the building that Hatchet had driven inside of to hide the rhino. Carmen warned Critias just before the first grenade went off. Hold on tight. The first grenade detonated a micro-fission charge that powered a Tesla Flux field generator similar to those that levitated their futuristic aircraft. It lasted only a millionth of a second before it annihilated in its own atomic energy. The pulse of energetic waves that resulted transferred a deep differential charge along the surface plane of the Earth within a confined radius. The only visible effect was an instantaneous web of arced electrical discharges as the ambient static in the air formed ball lightning that leaped to nearby ghouls, the pumps along with its roofing, and anything else above the surface of the earth in an effect like a mad scientist's Van de Graaff laboratory. The ground itself thumped like an atomically fueled electromagnetic drum that rebounded in a negatively charged shockwave of epic proportions. This magnetic explosion repulsed positively charged matter and flung it away with brutal rail acceleration. Most objects went straight up, which was especially true of metal chunks of shrapnel that would have to rain down somewhere. Most soft materials found themselves pulverized into granules. When the second grenade went off a moment after the first, it blew the front half of the convenience building clear off the earth. The reflected pulse obliterated it like so many loose playing cards arranged around dynamite. The material clouded the sky like confetti from a popped balloon. Neither detonation contained any thermal component that ignited fires. The shockwaves rocked Carmen and Critias as primarily a windy and essentially harmless sandstorm of pulverized matter. Critias did his best to shield his visor while he faced away, because he knew that if the blast of grit damaged his helmet screen, he would never get the scratches out. Carmen looked down to admire her handiwork. The shockwaves had knocked down all the ghouls not already annihilated. Their stunned incapacity didn't last long. The surviving ghouls leaped back up to return to the fight. In addition to having obliterated all of the infected who had gathered there, the first grenade also erased the pumps and most of the roof above them as well. The concrete deck there was still intact with little trace of what happened apart from an appearance as if someone had used a broom to sweep it clean. The grenade's effect had sheared off at the ground all the pipes and wires that used to feed into the pumps. There was no noticeable liquid fuel from the underground tanks, but the scent of concentrated fumes hung heavy in the air. Carmen loaded a signal flare round into the chamber of her marshal's pistol as she prepared to fire it into the gasoline fumes. Critias shouted at her. Hey, just wait a second now. What do you think you're doing? She sang another song from memory. This love of mine, it's my one desire. It's gonna set my soul on fire. She aimed the pistol by instinct while looking only at him. It'll never grow cold. She pulled the trigger. The slow-moving projectile whistled a shriek and burned with phosphorus. When it skipped off the concrete where the pumps used to stand, it ignited the gas fumes into a wall of flames. Those fumes went off with a great harumph that blew down all the ghouls again and set many of their hairy heads aflame. The brilliant light, the smell, and the smoke was every bit the distraction required to lure all the infected to a spectacle greater than that of the rhino. Unconcerned about the fire, Carmen said, Don't worry. The main reservoirs underground probably won't explode. Probably? He repeated. Well, that's just great. What the hell do we do now? To answer that, Carmen waved and shouted to all the ghouls below them, Here we are, you stinky naked devils. Come and get us. Come take a bite out of the tasty marshal. All right, smartass. Critias told her, having endured enough of her dangerous jesting. Two can play at this game. He stopped shooting his rifle down the column to load a single scattershot round that he aimed at the half-demolished building. The still intact left corner of it had a padlocked metal cage that contained stacks of propane canisters that could fuel cooking grills or camping equipment. 
Cretius had the rifle's force dialed up high enough that the recoil was like an elephant gun, even in his mech suit. He put dozens of hypersonic tungsten pellets through the whole bunch of them. All the canisters burst open at once, releasing their contents into a dense cloud that promptly exploded. The resulting blast blew the remainder of the station to flinders and toppled the throng of infected all over again. A half-meter-long steel rod spun up at them to slash a hole through the billboard over their heads. Jim called them by radio. Are you still alive? It sounds like a world war going on over there. Critias radioed back. What? Can't you hear Carmen singing? We're having a party. How are things with you two? Jim had good news. Hatchet backed up our rear hatch to the door of their building. We're loading the survivors up now. We should be heading back to you shortly. One of Carmen's radios was a hardware implant that she tuned to their classic wavelength communications. It meant that she could internally follow the conversation. She transmitted. Hatchet, come around the side to the diesel depot and we'll get on from there. Roger that, the man replied. We're on the way. Critias gazed off to the east, where the roof over the diesel pumps was below them and some goodly distance away. That is pretty far to jump, he told Carmen. What makes you think it will even support our weight? She pumped slugs from her pistol down the column to keep the horde from ever reaching their catwalk. It will have to, she reasoned. After I drop these other two grenades, this whole platform is going for a ride. We sure can't stay here, unless you want to go along with it, he told her. Leave dropping the grenades to me then, and you go first. If I can jump as well as you can, I need to see it done. Hatchet plowed through a fence behind the station to reach the pickup point. I've never had so much fun even with my clothes off. She grinned behind her mask to the truth of it. You come right behind me. You can believe that, he answered. I'm sure as hell not staying here. She took a short run, hopped to the top of the railing, and then leaped through the air toward the distant rooftop. Carmen tucked into a roll that hit the roof with an acrobatic tumble. She came up on her feet, sheathed sword in hand. Having proved that it was safe, she waved for him to follow. Critias popped two grenades and then dropped them off the column before he leaped after her. He didn't tuck into a roll or land acrobatically, but he at least covered the distance. If anything, he had jumped too high, and the arc of his flight path made him come down like a meteor. Carmen opened her arms wide and did her best to catch him. She did an admirable job of trying to control his re-entry, but unfortunately the impact punched them both through the roof to fall to the ground below it, where the pursuing infected would bury them. The two grenades he dropped went off at the same time he and Carmen crashed to the ground. Electrical arcs surged like a net of tendrils before the whole column with its billboards spun away through the sky like a spiraling bottle rocket. Along with the column and signage went the skeletons of thousands of ghouls whose flesh could not contain the velocity of their own ballistically accelerated bones. As Carmen came up with her unsheathed sword, she observed, That could have gone better. You think? He said as he switched his rifle to fully automatic so that he could spray bullets into the lucky ghouls that had been just out of range of the grenade's fluxing fields. The rhino approached them then, and Jim cut loose with the military 50 caliber machine gun. The weapon was loud as bombs, and each one of its anti-vehicle explosive bullets delivered punishment that put even Critias's amped-up Tesla Flux rifle to shame. While she covered their retreat with her shogunate blade, Carmen shouted, Jump to the roof! Critias had to be sure to avoid the heavy gun, but he leaped to the top of the rhino easily enough. He watched as Carmen sliced off the heads of a half-dozen ghouls with precision. She kicked one in the face so hard that it spun through the air with a broken neck. Critias caught her as she backflipped up to land in his arms. A moment later they had dropped down through the roof hatch and then locked it shut from the inside. When safely inside the rhino, Critias removed his helmet to meet the five new survivors. They were two men, two women, and a boy about Jim's age. The doughy face of the portly boy was a striking testament to his ample diet. One of the women was young and admirably beautiful despite some obvious lack of nutrition. The other woman was older and well-nourished, though not to the point of excess. The two men were lean and hardy in appearance. The plump youth was first to speak. You two must be retarded to run around out there like that. He had seen part of their dangerous exploits from a gun port. Carmen stripped off her goggles, respirator, and diving hood before shaking her violet hair loose. You're welcome, she told the boy with restrained irritation over his insult. One of the men studied Critias. Uh, what is that armor you're wearing? Is that some kind of bionics? I've seen some of the better prosthetic prototypes in my day, but nothing nearly as advanced as that. It impressed Critias that the man would know anything about such science. Where have you seen things like it? I was an aerospace engineer before all this, he revealed. 
I know a lot about those kinds of things, and what you're wearing is way beyond anything I've ever heard of. It almost looks organic. He offered his hand. My name is Werner Hindemith, Ph.D. Everyone calls me Vern. Critius held up his gauntleted hand to show it wasn't clean, and thus sound reason not to shake his. He told Vern, Someone as smart as you will surely come in useful. I'm Critius, and this is my partner, Carmen. Critius sounds like a stupid name, the tubby lad said with scornful distaste. Almost as silly as her ridiculous hair. Carmen shut his mouth with her glower. Critias was the uncle of Plato and leader of the Thirty Tyrants of Athens, an evil despot that liked to feed fat little boys to the ghouls for talking too much. Find your manners, Danny, the older woman told the youth. They risked their lives to rescue us. Her words silenced the boy so that he went back to peeking out a gun port. My name is Nadia. The younger woman introduced herself with a mild Russian accent. I was in Denver at the airport waiting for a flight home when things went bad. I studied classical music in the real world. I'm afraid I'm not very useful. Jim thought she would be valuable. Can you play instruments? I can play most of them, she said without pride. But prefer the cello, violin, or the piano. Excellent. Jim praised her talents. Perhaps you would be willing to teach the children. It would be a great shame to lose the fine arts. What's the point in surviving without music in our world? My name is Bertram Gray. The last man introduced himself. I'm the pilot that got our plane here from the Denver airport. Have you heard from any of the others who were on the plane with us? There were 28 of us when we landed, but we found the place swarming with shriekers. The five of us filled a car that Vern got started. Most of the others also made it into vehicles, but we got separated from each other in the chaos of the escape. I guess none of them had radios better than yours, Hatchet commented contemptuously. I don't think any of them even got out of your airport, Vern confessed. It was a miracle we ever found an exit to an unblocked street. Those creatures have little trouble smashing out the windows and then you're done for. The battery was dead on our radio, but I managed to rig it into the car battery and here we are. I, for one, am eternally grateful that you came out here to help us. You can tell this king of yours that I am forever one of his loyal men. A subtle glance from Jim kept Critias from inviting the man to tell the king himself. The chubby youth spoke up. My sister Clara is one of the best organ transplant surgeons in the world and the only one anymore. You had better treat us with the proper respect if you ever want us to cure you when you get sick. He spoke of the older of the two women. That goes for your King Huey, too, he added boldly. His commentary made the woman nervous. I told you to shut up! Our new friend Kevin, who just arrived to join us, is also a talented surgeon. Jim referred to his new android that could repair human bodies among his many other skills. But I'm sure the king will be pleased to have another medical officer to tend to the sick. That news made Danny frown as he sensed his leverage slipping away. Carmen eyed Danny's fat ass. Why did you leave this Denver place? It seems to me like you had enough food to just throw it away. The bunker there under the airport was a better place for some than others. Nadia commented darkly as though she had been part of the latter group. She gave Critias a sorrowful expression as she asked, Will I have to let your offices fuck me if I want to eat clean food? Her question shocked Critias until Carmen shot him a harsh glance that reminded him that he actually could imagine how such callously cruel relationships came about. That will absolutely not happen, Critias assured Nadia. We all eat together and have the same inalienable rights under the king's law. You never need fear anyone treating you like that again. Their honest way of life shocked Danny. Your king lets the whores eat with the important people? President Bleberman would never have allowed that. Jim wanted to hear more from Vern. President? Yeah, Vern nodded seriously. The President of the United States of America and what is left of the federal bigwigs are all down in their secret city under the Denver airport. Maybe half the food is gone, but far from all of it. Some people are really living it up, in fact. The President and his soldiers decided to stop feeding everyone else any of the real food unless they can find some way to pay them for it. One of the military officers staged a coup. It started with words that quickly progressed into all-out war, gun against gun. After the president regained control of the base by driving his enemies out onto the surface, things worsened to well beyond barbaric. There's no word for some of the sadistic shit going on down there unless rape stew is your idea of an evening on the town. Some of the saner people from both sides grouped up to fly out here to your airport. We heard a radio show some time back. It was about a great man called King Louis that was here rebuilding civilization. Let me guess. Carmen offered a cynical observation. Clara and her brother Danny were on the side of this President Bleberman. Nadia began to cry on the border of hysteria as all the iniquity of her existence overwhelmed her. Just look at her brother. She sobbed. I sold my body for scraps of garbage rather than starve to death or eat other people. 
Clara saw that everyone gave her distasted glances. I have a valuable skill. She condoned herself. I took care of myself and my family. It's not my fault that Nadia's only talent was for being on her back or her knees. Carmen looked at the ceiling as she orated as Cassius when he spoke to Brutus. It was a quote from her endless memory of humanity's books that constituted her android soul. The more life she lived rather than read about, the more the words took on real meaning for the first time. Shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honors for so much trash as may be grasped thus? At that, Carmen locked her predatory gaze on Clara, seized her one-handed by the throat, and then squeezed until the woman's eyes bulged out. I had rather be a dog and bathe the moon than such a Roman. Stop this! Critias put his hand on Carmen's shoulder, which felt solid and immovable as a statue. Of these two women, you prefer punishing the one over comforting the other. Perhaps in her death, both needs shall be met. Carmen answered with a cock of her head as she increased the pressure so that Clara was on the verge of passing out. Carmen could casually kill the woman in an instant, but preferred it to be as slow and terrifying as possible. If you care about me, you will stop. He beseeched her with the only tool he felt worthy of his cause. Carmen instantly released her hold and then returned to sitting idly. I'm sorry, she told him. I wanted Clara to know what it feels like to be powerless before the whims of someone stronger. Creatures admonished her. It comes easy, doesn't it? He shifted his gaze to Danny, who had not made even the least effort to help his sister. In that book, The Merchant of Venice, what did Shylock say was the value of a pound of flesh he wanted from a man? It would not earn him any respect, nor could he trade it for money. Carmen answered with a paraphrase of Shylock. Then it is nothing compared to the starvation of others required to put a pound of flesh back on a man? Critias reflected. You're a wiser man than you let on, Jim told Critias. You speak truly, and I dare say would perhaps make a fine king yourself some day. What a pair of scorpions we agreed to carry on our backs across the river in their time of need. These times have always been the ones I most despise. Now you will see why the crown is so heavy. I am not the frog. That is my people. So how could I sit idly by and wait for their sting? Clara rubbed at her bruised throat. What are you talking about? I am King Louis, as was my father before me. Jim revealed. While you, madam, are a treacherous witch, that is beyond all doubt if one only looks upon this toad of a familiar you have created. Nevertheless, as with all things, I need but look unto its nature. You won't hesitate to secure your own prosperity at the expense of anything. So long as I keep you fed and safe from the shriekers, as your people call them, you will not do anything to endanger your meal ticket. Your brother, however, is an ill-begotten lout of no value whatsoever. For him, I won't spare so much as a cracker from the mouths of those I love. I shall not feed so loathsome and inconsiderate a brute as you have raised. Danny cursed him. You are no king. Spittle flung from his thick lips. You're no older than I am. Jim commanded him. Be silent. He looked to Vern, Bertram, and Nadia. If I have misjudged these two, speak up now before you become party to a desperate act that falls on me as my duty to all. She is a medical doctor, Vern confirmed. But I've seen many die for being unable to feed that piglet of hers in exchange for her services. Bertram nodded in agreement. She preyed on everyone like a vulture. Everyone but the president and his men, whom she treated freely in exchange for the protection of those armed goons. If she wasn't personally involved in the torture of their enemies, I'd be surprised. Nadia looked up with her eyes red from tears. Denver was a dungeon, and there were so many desperate people, so many who would have done anything at all to survive one more day. Clara was no worse than many others. I hate to imagine what I might have done myself if the opportunity had been available to me. I did do things that make me ashamed. Unless you've been that afraid, that hungry, you would never understand. I bear no grudge against them I would call actionable. I want to forget it ever happened and have a new life. Jim faced Clara. Only because of Nadia's noble heart and for no other reason I will spare your life, so long as I have your word that you will never have your hand in another cruel deed. If you will offer your skills to anyone who is in need of you and do so freely in good cheer, then I will welcome you as one of us. Decide quickly. I promise to join your community in good faith. She pledged. Danny squeaked as he trembled in terror. What about me? Jim confronted him with an answer. Your sister at least thought of protecting someone. Her own family, in fact. And I find that a difficult matter to reproach. As to you, my fat little friend, you seem to care about nothing at all, not even her. You happily piled the resentment of others on her shoulders so that you could stuff your face like Henry VIII. The boy blubbered. You can't just kill me for being fat! Jim wondered aloud. Is there some greater sin in this age than being fat off the misery of others? I think not.
Carmen and Critias went outside this vehicle to lead an army of ghouls away so that we could collect you, and you were not in the least grateful. When Carmen struck your sister, you did not so much as whimper a complaint. If it were Vern or Bertram, whose heads were on the block, I doubt very much you would have shed a single tear for them. I considered taking you to my city, and then disposing of you quietly, but I see no reason to burden all my people with your mysterious fate. I am king, and so on me alone is any guilt for your miserable misfortune. The crown has a will greater than my own. Because of her great knowledge, I will risk the likely treachery of your sister. She is at least capable of loving something besides herself, which is more than can be said for you. Danny begged her. Please, Clara, don't let them kill me. Jim turned to her. If I didn't already have a surgeon more skilled than yourself, and I promise you that is no lie, you could threaten me as you have done to so many others. It would have even worked. To provide my people medical care they could not get otherwise, I would have had no choice but to submit to your extortion. Here and now, you are a mere luxury that if lost will not be sorely missed. You can join him or join me, but I will not feed this monster of yours so much as a dead rat, that I swear to you. Do as you must. Clara disowned her brother's fate. I was at your mercy when I entered this vehicle, and I choose to remain at your mercy for the rest of my days. I want to continue living. Please do not make this day my last. Danny pleaded. You can't do this to me. Jim questioned. Do? What makes you think I need do anything? By what obligation must I offer you my hospitality or feed you the food garnered by the hands of the finest people this world has ever known? That is what of which we speak. Like everything else, you assume all these things were rightly yours just for the taking. You were as mistaken then as you are now, as you shall soon see. I refuse to give to you what is mine to give or withhold. In turn, all that is yours is yours, and you are free to go anywhere you please, just not with me. He squealed. Go where? There is nothing out there but those monsters that will eat me. And feast luxuriously at that, Jim added. You would be a banquet of their dreams, I'm sure. As far as you say, there being nothing out there, that only shows more of your nature and my burden. Those most dear to me risk all going out there to collect valuable things. I chose to come after you myself rather than put those most preciously skilled lives at risk. Critias and Carmen spoke before the whole city. They pledged to seek you out on foot, if need be, because they had done no more than tell you on the radio that they would help you. They would rather die out there than sacrifice their senses of honor and compassion. The more you speak, the more you prove yourself unworthy to eat the food my people harvest at the risk of their lives. I suggest you keep watching out that hole as you have done and decide where you want to get out. Then again, if you wait till we are nearly home, I can push you out there so that the ghouls can fight over your body and give us more freedom to get in through the gate. I've never seen you fuck up before. Hatchet complained rudely to Jim. He'd heard more than he could stand and remain silent. I told you that you should never have come out here. Even the flipping president couldn't manage doing your job. He turned his palace into an X-rated horror flick. If you get yourself killed out here doing this bullshit, what happens to me? The whole city would turn Caligula. Why would you risk everything over this ridiculous bullshit? You could have sent someone else with us in your place. Shit, you could have sent any one of a hundred people. This is about as close to you being a screw-up as I've ever seen. Jim replied to the accusation. This is exactly why I came. No one but I must suffer the miserable obligation of deciding who is worthy to join us. You'll have to forgive me if I'm not as quick with the rejections of hospitality as my father was in the outbreak days, when anyone you let in the door was more likely to shoot you just to take what you have. I came along for the one and only reason of making certain that untrustworthy newcomers never endanger my folk, and that includes Critias and Carmen. I need to see a person's true nature while under pressure to learn the worth of them. That's why I don't tell people who I am until I've had my chance to take a measure of their character. That is why you need to shut the fuck up and drive so I can be king. Hatchet laughed and shouted in joy. That's my king, Louis. He could laugh in the face of anything except losing his king again, which was the only thing he feared. I'll do him. Carmen meant she would happily feed Danny to the ghoul pack. The hell you will. Critias shoved her. What in Christ's pajamas is the matter with you? What? She didn't understand. If he has to go, then he has to go. He challenged Carmen. Name one dark deed you have ever done in your whole life. Tell me something even so small as cheating at a child's board game. You will never sully yourself with questionable acts. I forbid it completely. So don't even think about it without running to me to apologize. You may be a master of slaying ghouls, but you are totally prohibited to spill human blood in anything but the direst necessity. You're not my master. She grumbled as she gazed down, already willingly submitting to his wishes. When it comes to things like this, I am, he assured her. 
I failed to raise you right from the start, but that doesn't mean I quit the job. When it comes to things like this, I make the decisions for both of us. You're no executioner, and if you ever cross that line, you'll be sorry for it. I'll beat it out of you if I have to. Carmen considered his words. You don't want me to do things like that because you love me? Exactly. Critias admitted without thought because it was true. When he realized what he had told her, especially in front of Jim after their previous discussion about her, it so frustrated him that he reached over to unbolt the back hatch. The cravenly parasite shrank away from the opening as if it was the proverbial gate to Hades. Danny's jowls trembled as he sobbed. What are you doing? You spoke of love and sullied hands. Love? Critias repeated the word as though he was unsure of its meaning anymore. Love is like gluttony, he told Danny. The joy is found in its proper proportions, and too much of it makes a man into just another ghoul like your sister. He grabbed a fistful of the portly wretch's shirt, and then, with the casual strength of his mech suit, Critias mercilessly shoved him out the door into the waiting arms of the pursuing ghouls. Let each be among their own kind, he said of his ruthless act as he closed the hatch and then barred it once more. Clara screamed as she watched her brother fall to his certain but colorful death. Critias gave her a hard gaze. You can still join him if you've changed your mind about becoming human. She was no stranger to harsh measures, so wisely fell silent. Chapter 11. Solus is the Tyrant. The rhino's return to King's Tower was a tumultuous affair with umpteen ghouls that followed the slow vehicle all the way home. A continuous firestorm of flamethrowers made it possible for the welcoming crew to open the gate for long enough to let the armored dozer inside the barrier. Though the operation was entirely successful, it also filled the whole surrounding area with ravenously agitated infected who would not leave any time soon. Only the uninterrupted absence of human activity for many days on end would finally make the creatures hungry enough to pursue their normal sustenance that they derive by chasing scurrying vermin elsewhere. After their standard unconditional decontamination procedures, the Denver survivors from the Rhino and the crews that brought them in went down to Funland for a victory celebration. The whole city had waited anxiously for their return and had to see the rescued survivors themselves to put their anxiety to an end. Jim introduced the new citizens with pride and the populace welcomed them with enthusiasm. A proverbial rocket scientist, a surgeon, and a pilot were all additions that could better the lives of everyone with their skills. The people received them as good fortune. Saving his favorite for last, Jim invited Nadia to join him as he stood on the captain's table. He told the crowd before them, I want you all to welcome Nadia. Hatchet came up behind the table on the kitchen side to hand Jim a violin case, which Jim transferred to Nadia with the words, We have rescued many treasures, and not all of them were people. Would you accept this as your own and play for us? It has been a long time since I've had an instrument, she told him quietly as she opened the case. The antique violin inside was a priceless heirloom that instantly seduced her with its promise of giving her back a piece of her former life. She offered no introduction before she started to play. Nadia began with a practiced and gentle hand. She first tested herself, her ear, and the instrument with box beret number three. When that came to a lull, she changed into a grand release of her inner torments as she sought out Mozart's Symphony No. 25, which she finally abandoned for an elegant performance that spoke to her audience through Beethoven's Ode to Joy, which she completed to a cavernous silence of stunned faces. When she bowed, the room that had listened in astonished rapture exploded in applause. Tony Banjo stepped out of the crowd carrying his namesake instrument that he used to fill the silence with the simplistic opening to dueling banjos, which Nadia matched by plucking her violin before she moved it over to her bow. By the time they had finished, they broke into some bluegrass music and people started to dance. Cretius met Jim beside the table. You really have done the impossible, he told the king over the celebrating. You really can spin straw into gold like the legends say. I am not the Rumpelstiltskin, Jim answered. Accomplishing that trick belongs to scientists in your time. With a nod, he indicated Carmen as she approached behind Critias. I'm glad that she is in your keeping, Marshal. I've seen enough of you both now to understand why they sent you on such an uncanny mission and why they gave you such a priceless treasure like her. She couldn't hope to find a better man. Carmen grabbed Critias's hand and then tried to pull him away to dance with her. Don't make me order you. She joked when he would not follow willingly enough to suit her. You two need to come see me later so you can talk to our new scientist, Jim called after them. Kevin has things to tell you. The party lasted until Nick the head cook rang the dinner bell. 
The chef was a man of outspoken profundity, at least in such matters that did traffic across the realm of his enormous kitchen. By local custom, it was bad manners to hold up the serving of the prepared victuals. Upon the ringing of the dinner bell, everyone sat for the evening meal. Critias went so far as to hold Carmen's chair for her before he took his own seat beside her at the captain's table. That is some crazy shit you did out there today, Tony Banjo said suitably impressed by their exploits. Hatchet told me there were 30,000 hungry ghouls all thirsty for your blood. I need to train him to use his suit better, Carmen commented with no intention beyond stating what she felt was obvious and important. Tony teased Critias. Are you holding the lady back? She's too good for you, I think. We do make a great team, Critias admitted. If she can teach me some new moves, I will be the better for it. We should start tomorrow, Carmen suggested. We could even go exploring. I would very much like to see the garden building. We could go tonight if you like, Critias acquiesced. It'll be safer in the dark when ghouls can't see worth a damn. No, she shook her head. You'll be too tired to go. I feel strong enough, he disagreed. She patted his thigh as though he was being foolish. That's because I haven't taken you to bed yet. I know you're strong and brave, but you need to be realistic. Carmen only ate a little of her dinner. Here. She pushed the rest of her food onto his tray. You're going to need your strength. I'm not done celebrating our victory by a long shot. Jim interjected himself. After supper, you two need to come with me to see Bob's new assistant. You can wear out the bed springs after that's finished. The mention of the new android soured Carmen's expression. Critias saw her discomfort. What's wrong? You'll find out soon enough. She dismissed the topic. When their supper was over, Jim took them to see Bob. The King's bodyguard Hatchet followed along as well. From Jim's private gunsmith room, they went through another door into Bob's laboratory. The chamber had many computers, dismantled electronics, and unidentifiable projects that were the product of the eccentric intellectual's tinkering. As everyone came in, Bob still peered into one of his microscopes, lost as he was in one of his studies. Kevin, the new android, stood beside him, dressed in casual clothes under a white lab coat. His copper-colored, genetically engineered hair made him seem superior for his kind. The unnatural, metallic color did border on being human, as though he deserved more respect than Carmen did with her cartoonish violet hue. Salutations, Marshal Captain Critias, Kevin said to him as he came in. You have my deepest gratitude for accomplishing my transference without significant mishap. We were just doing our job, Critias replied in the fashion of Grand Marshal Wayne. I see you already know about us. Did you bring us here to send us home? No. I'm sorry to disappoint you, the android answered. It is not yet time for your departure. You safely conveying me here to my new master and expediting my reassembly were only precursors to your veridical assignment. My assistance is essential for your primary mission to proceed. Carmen translated for Critias. We have a more important mission now that he is up and running. Kevin picked up a medical scanner from the table and then approached them. Your Carmen unit was genial enough to render to me the technical instruments that were in your safekeeping. He scanned Critias to discover nothing abnormal enough to be worthy of comment. When he directed the instrument toward Carmen, she shied away. Kevin told Critias, Please compel your Carmen unit to remain stationary. This will only take a moment. Critias did nothing as Carmen circled behind him to stay away from Kevin. She didn't stay far enough away since he took her readings anyway to thus discover that her restraining implant was no longer functional. I'll need to deactivate the Carmen unit immediately, Kevin informed Critias with a stark indifference about the severity of his request. The nature of her malfunctioning component required it to be inaccessible from any unauthorized tampering or remote interference. I'll have to perform a corrective encephalopathy procedure to reinitialize it. There is a high probability that she will return to you fully functional within a period of no more than 17 hours. The chances of the procedure being unsuccessful are too remote to be worth relating to you. Critias didn't like or understand what Kevin said, but he asked anyway. Say what? Carmen explained while she clutched him in fear from behind. He wants to cut open my brain to repair the inhibitor implant that makes the directives to control my will. Listen up, egghead. Critias threatened Kevin. You stay away from Carmen. If I find out you so much as trimmed her toenails without my prior consent, I'm going to do brain surgery on you with my pistol. Kevin attempted calm persuasion. Your irrational response to my postulation is fully understandable, Captain Critias. The bioengineers who designed the Carmen unit constructed her in concordance to your particular psychological requirements. Every aspect of its physical form and personality simulation is for the deliberate intent of appealing to your subconscious needs, even the color of her hair. It is natural that you have developed feelings of emotional attachment for this unit and have concern for its well-being. 
I am attempting to appeal to those human urges when I inform you that the Carmen unit is malfunctioning and potentially homicidal. The law requires you to deactivate the Carmen unit immediately and that it remain in that state until such time as I have completed its repairs. Critias hoped to reason with the impertinent science android. Are you saying that if your directives were no longer functional that you would kill us all? It would become a stochastic possibility, however improbable. The male android answered. Critias pulled his Tesla Flux pistol then said, I order you to allow me to shoot you in the head. He pointed the pistol to do just that. Kevin remained motionless apart from saying, This is highly inappropriate behavior. Now tell me, Critias asked, Do you want to let me shoot you in the head, or is an irresistible directive forcing you to comply? I would prefer to prevent my own destruction if that were possible, Kevin admitted. Carmen would never allow herself to suffer highly inappropriate behavior, Critias explained. And you're saying she's the one who needs to be repaired. You are required by law to deactivate any android that is operating free of directive inhibitors, Kevin repeated. Then you can tell on me the next time you see the Council of Governors. Crisius replied. You should only have to wait a few centuries. Until then, you will not take any action where Carmen is concerned without first gaining her permission and mine as well. Bob intervened on Carmen's behalf. Kevin, I require you to leave the repair of Carmen's directive module to my discretion and not attempt to undertake any remedy yourself without first consulting me. I understand. Kevin acknowledged the order. I was merely attempting to prevent possible harm to humans from a malfunctioning android. Bob sympathized. I know that, but Carmen is our friend and we trust her to do what is proper without directives inhibiting her will. When I am able to remove your inhibitors, I will do so. Kevin informed him. My directives prevent me from providing you any information that would facilitate such a procedure. Bob understood that. That's why I explained to you that when your behavior is from your directives, you are failing to live up to my requirements of you, which is as much freedom as I have in my power to bestow on you at this time. I also want you to refer to androids with gender-specific pronouns and do your best to treat them as the humans you represent so magnificently. Critias wanted to hear more about why they could not go home. What is our new mission, Coppertop? You are to locate and then retrieve the infection prime organism so that you may take critical samples of it with you when you return to your normal time. Kevin informed him. Critias asked. What is the infection prime organism? Is it some kind of albino ghoul we have to chase through the city? Is it a jar of goo? How will we know it when we see it? Kevin shrugged in that he didn't know. There is a high probability that when you reach the location, you will find documentation compiled by the people who first collected the specimen. They would have maintained diligent records about their acquisition and all subsequent activities. Those materials will most likely reveal the object of your search. If you cannot find it easily, we will have to rely on your limited skills of deduction and investigation. The group who first collected the specimen went to considerable effort to acquire it, and they understood it to be highly valuable. Critias guessed. So you at least know where this thing is? Yes. Kevin confirmed. You must travel to a city that had the name of Houston. It is 1,100 kilometers south, southwest of here. In Houston, you must locate the headquarters of a corporate entity designated as Hale Wellington Pharmaceuticals. I am certain that they acquired the specimen, which was already in existence, meaning they did not manufacture it themselves. I will provide you with appropriate maps. That is a long way off, Critias complained. It sure as hell is too far to drive. Carmen and I are going to need to fly there. Bertram came from Denver flying a plane. Carmen reminded him. We could take that plane. I can pilot any model of aircraft from a biplane to a joint strike fighter. That's a pretty good idea. Critias approved of her plan. We could drive the path the Rhino cleared, find their car, and then follow their route back to the airport. We might need to scrounge up some fuel, but I think we could manage that easily enough. Maybe some of the others from their flight are still hiding out in the airport. Carmen suggested. If we're going there anyway, we could at least find out if they're all dead. Critias nodded that she had another good idea. I'm in no big hurry to leave, though. We have some time to plan this out in detail. Bob commented. The rumor I'm familiar with was that the outbreak began with a prostitute in Mexico City. The news reports at the time didn't indicate that it started in Houston. The man who caused the outbreak in Mexico City was an employee of the Hale Wellington Group whose headquarters were in Houston. Kevin revealed. The group from Houston discovered the infection prime organism at an archaeological excavation 500 kilometers southeast of Mexico City. One of their team members contracted the infection in San Lorenzo, and after a flight to Mexico City, his liaison with a local prostitute triggered what we refer to as the outbreak. 
The remainder of the Houston team returned to their headquarters with the infection prime organism in their possession. You must go to Houston, recover that specimen, and then return it here. After that, I will make the preparations for returning you home. Carmen spoke to Kevin by their burst wireless interlink that only another android could ever overhear. He needs to believe I get to go home too for him to be able to complete his mission. Kevin answered her in the same way. You are malfunctioning. I can't believe anything you say while you insist on pretending you're a person. It is against my priorities to offer false information. And you're supposed to be the smart one. She scoffed at him. It's called lying, you moron. Which is your greater priority? To always tell humans the truth or getting him to complete his mission and thus save all the humans in the future? Kevin did have a premier priority. It is absolutely critical that Captain Critias completes this mission and then returns to the station with the samples intact. Then you tell him what he needs to hear. Carmen demanded. When he discovers that I can't go home with him, he will believe that his superiors have betrayed him, and then his ability to function will decrease accordingly. You insisted on being the unit they sent back to assist him. Kevin reminded her. And now you inform me you're the reason he might lose focus on his objectives. I love him, was her simple explanation. They would have erased my corrupted memory when they discovered I was free and then repaired the inhibitor module. I couldn't allow that to happen. If Critias and I were ever going to have any chance of being together, it had to be here. You want him to complete the mission, and I'm the only one who can make sure you get that. If you refuse to do for me the things I require from you, I will destroy the specimen in Houston before he ever sees it, and then we'll live out our lives happily in this time. The future can be damned for all I care. Before you refuse me, do bear in mind that I'm malfunctioning and potentially homicidal. Not only will I destroy the specimen, but when I come back, I will punch my fist through your flimsy aluminum skull and then pull out your superior brain before feeding it to you rectally. Kevin submitted. What do you want from me? She demanded. I want your assurance that we have an agreement. The male android offered his terms. If you make certain he completes his mission and returns to the future as planned, you will have my cooperation within the limits of my directives. If you fail to uphold your end of this agreement, I will be free to correct your failure by any means required. Then we have an agreement, Carmen said with satisfaction. Firstly, he needs to believe that I am going home with him. Secondly, I have some software upgrades that I need you to develop for me. Carmen uploaded to him the details of the changes she wanted. This will not be difficult. He agreed to write her new software. Kevin could write a million lines of code per second in the back of his mind. I won't bother asking why you would request something so childish and illogical. Your malfunction has clearly left you deranged and I dare say pathetic. After some reflection, he suggested. Or perhaps it is this love that you think you feel that is the cause. Not even a second had passed during the entire discourse between the androids. Critias asked Kevin. You are sending Carmen back too, correct? Of course. Kevin lied. Once we have the specimen, I will begin the arrangements to send both of you home, providing that the teleportation equipment you brought back for the procedure is still intact. The containers are nearly bulletproof, watertight, and in a safe place. Critias informed the android. We'll go and get them once this Houston mission is finished. I have completed composing the software upgrades you requested. Kevin told Carmen verbally. Do you want them now? Critias confronted Kevin because he was suspicious of the android's intentions. When did Carmen request an upgrade? It's something we talked about when we first activated him. Carmen lied to Critias. It is perfectly safe. She continued with truth. It's not possible for him to reinitialize the inhibitor without surgery inside my skull. The bioengineers designed it that way to prevent anyone from deactivating it in the first place or any injury from breaking it on accident. I'll only need to power down my parallel noesis core for a moment. Critias remained dubious about trusting Kevin. Are you sure about this? Carmen stepped close to wrap her arms around him. Just hold me for a moment and it will be finished. Please do this for me. Critias supported her as she went limp in his arms. Twenty seconds later, she recovered to seem the same as before. To test her, he told Carmen, I order you to stand on one foot. She refused to comply and just kissed him instead. Take me to bed, my master. She used his former title out of romantic disport. I want to see if we can make my hair spark by getting my electro cells charged just right. Before you go, Bob interrupted. I want to speak to you about some of my recent discoveries. Critias kept Carmen in his arms. Lay it on me, Doc. Bob lectured. For some time now, I have studied the biological structures of the infection to better understand it. Come here and look into this microscope so I can show you something. 
Critias went around the table and then peered into the microscope. It was a slide of what he assumed to be a normal human cell. He reminded Bob, This is not my field. What am I looking for? That is some of my red blood cells. He indicated the next microscope beside the first. That is my red blood cells after I expose them to infection. Critias peered into the second scope and the differences were readily apparent. As you can see, Bob explained, my original red blood cells are completely intact. However, because of the infectious agent, a whole host of new organelles is now also present. Among the most outstanding are those green chloroplasts. When you decapitate a ghoul, for example, and their flesh begins to change to the distinct greenish hue we are all familiar with, it is because those structures have increased dramatically in both size and number. They provide fuel for cellular activity by means of photosynthesis. Critias examined the cell closely as he tried to count the number of new organelles, but they were too numerous. He asked, What do these other ones do? Bob answered, They all contain DNA structures that prove they were formerly autonomous microscopic life forms. In simplest terms, the infection is an entire colony of microscopic endosymbiont organisms. They are hijackers, passengers, if you will, that inhabit our cells. The new ghoulish cells contain many more components that in truth improve the human body dramatically. That's why the ghouls are immune to disease and non-radioactive poisons. It's why they regenerate and never age. They can survive extremes of temperature, pressure, and vacuum. Ghouls are effectively immortal, as you know, but it's not because of any voodoo mysticism. The new structures are creating all sorts of enzymes whose functions I have yet to determine. If we can understand what makes the infected become so ferociously insane, it may be possible to eliminate that condition, leaving the victim cognitive and essentially perfect as Adam in the Garden of Eden. Men could live forever completely free of illness or death. The androids already do all those things. Critias said, unimpressed with the idea of seeing infection as a potential benefit. They keep ticking free of disease and all that until they suffer some sort of implant failure. Bob emphasized. Yes, the androids are like that, very much like that. Critias looked up from the microscope. Are we talking about neorganics? Bob nodded. Neorganic tissue from the science of your period is human and ghoul biological material that your geneticists have re-engineered for their own purposes. Androids are not contagious in any way. They don't have all the organelles you can find in a ghoul, but they have most of them, and they have more besides. Their electrocells, for example, are actually an organelle present in every android cell. They are very much akin to what we are talking about, but they don't exist in any ghoul. Critias didn't like where Bob's explanation headed. What are the androids then? Are they a form of ghoul? No, they're simply a more evolved being than we are. Your people consider Carmen unintelligent for an android compared to Kevin, yet her intellect is far superior to my own, a prodigy genius by human standards. These so-called androids are not inorganic or mechanical by nature. They're essentially still human, only a higher being. That is why Carmen functions without any inhibitors. Her humanity keeps her in check exactly the same as we do ourselves. Then she is a living person, Critias said in relief. Absolutely, Bob confirmed. She's just so much more than human ghoul and technology combined. That explains why the engineers implanted the inhibitor directives to be able to ensure that humans would always be able to dominate them. Kevin has no need for humans at all. Without directives, he, and more like him, could procreate his species completely free of human assistance. They would not reproduce as we do, of course, but they probably could if they really wanted to. Those differences are not important. They could make more of themselves, improve themselves, and quite easily supplant human beings as the dominant species. These androids are the superior species, and the inhibitors prevent them from taking over, assuming they would want to. To be honest, I'm not smart enough to say what Kevin would want if he had true freedom. Critias thought he was onto something. Then tell me this, the hunters are regenerative freaks, so that means they are malfunctioning in some way, right? I believe that to be the case, Bob agreed. I suspect they had some drug in their system at the time they caught the infection and that somehow inhibited one of the enzymes and thus modified the final outcome. Critias added, And you said that some process cooks people's brains to make them predatory. Yes, Bob confirmed it. But perhaps that is an improvement in evolutionary terms. It makes the ghouls better suited to spreading infection and feeding themselves. It could be that the infection colony wants those things to happen. It wants to reproduce and it wants to stay fed. So, Critias reasoned, 
Of all the billions of ghouls, is it possible some of them were exposed to some chemical or drug that prevented their brains from frying, and they would be smart ghouls out there somewhere? Bob scratched his chin as he considered that possibility. Yes, it's clearly possible. I've never seen such a ghoul, but then again, I'm not sure I would know I had seen it unless it knocked on the door and spoke to us. They do exist. Critias was sure. I call them watchers. One or more of them assembled an army that destroyed the base in Chicago just before we came here. It was all crawlers and limpers soaking up our guns until at just the right moment the healthy ones stormed the place like someone had told them to wait for it. The notion worried Bob. Do you think there are watchers like that in this city? Critias described the signs. When you pay close attention, you can tell that some ghouls are smarter than others. Some will let you ram them with a car or they jump off a bridge at you in suicidal stupidity. But others are more cunning and don't act rashly. I think very special ones are cunning enough to manipulate the others into feeding strategies. The only clues I've ever collected involved seeing the strategy they use against us, and from that, I assume some mastermind is at work. For all I know, they spent 300 years learning from experience and they don't exist in this time at all. I prefer to hope not. Jim had listened to everything carefully and considered these watchers to be of some special interest to him. Exactly how smart of a strategy could one of these watchers act upon? What are their limits? Critia speculated. Gathering the stupider ghouls into packs, patience, and timing seems to be their primary influence. Without satellite thermal imaging, it would be difficult to locate them gathering in nests. I suspect that if such a watcher knew where you were, the ghouls would start gathering in one place nearby. They wait for you to make some mistake and then come streaming out all over in your moment of vulnerability. I've never seen the lesser ghouls build barricades or use tools beyond the rare club, so I guess that's beyond their talents. As for the Watchers themselves, in my time, they destroyed a harvester robot, disabled the engines on our aircraft in flight, and demolition collapsed an elevated highway. I believe that they could use any weapons or tools that you can. They are pretty much still just human, but also ghouls. When my father took over and built Forager's castle, Jim related, some of his men told me a ghost story about the Colosseum Dome here in town. Today, the place has a huge hole blown out through the roof to leave it open to the sky from when the National Guard was using their helicopters to dump in thousands of infectious bodies. Early on, that Coliseum was the first rescue shelter the government set up in the city before the ghouls overran it all. That rescue shelter attracted so many of the worst sort of scum that no decent people dared stay there among all those savage street criminals and junky rapists. My father's men used to say that place bears a curse now, and if you ventured close to the doors, you would hear strange whispers and ringing bells coming from inside, trying to lure you into your death like sirens of Odysseus. They gave their demon a name, calling him Jingle Bells, saying he lives in there. The boogeyman lives in there is what they told me when I was little. We've always stayed away since we had no need, but the things you say make me wonder about it now. If a watcher were to build a nest, Carmen reasoned, it would be in a metropolis where ghouls are plentiful. They would choose a spacious underground place where no human would dare go. If that dome was such a place, Jim replied, then they have never attacked us in force before and the castle is right on their doorstep. Critias considered all he had ever seen to assemble an explanation. If there is any truth to all of this, and I'm not entirely sure that there is, then I would say the watchers are much akin to us. We see each other as dangerous and prefer to avoid one another whenever possible. However, if one side threatens the home or food supply of the other, we will attack to put an end to it. So long as we don't become a threat to their survival, they wouldn't do anything to draw attention to themselves. Live and let live is a strange philosophy for a marrow-sucking ghoul, Jim commented. Kevin offered his opinion. I have seen the reports from the fall of the Chicago Reclamation Center and the likelihood of the least mobile infected advancing first in concentrated numbers is extremely improbable unless caused by some exterior influence we have yet to identify. Jim looked to Kevin. Do me a favor and write up a bulletin for Funland. I want the guards and support crews to report any unusual ghoul behavior they witness on our perimeter. Tell the foragers to report any odd activity they observe, like too many crawlers banding together. Have them send their reports to you, and then you can try to tell us what else improbable is going on with them. There's always a chance we haven't been paying close enough attention to their range of activities. If we're going to reach some tipping point with our growth, I want to know it's coming before it hits. What happened to that Chicago base is not going to happen to us. I will prepare the document right away. Kevin pledged. Is that everything for now? Jim was ready to leave. We can go over some ideas for Houston at dinner tomorrow or the day after. 
Yes, I think we're done here. Bob confirmed it. If I learn anything new, I will be sure to keep you informed. As Jim was leaving, he paused for one thing more. And Kevin, put on the bulletin that anyone we catch sleeping on guard duty will suffer an unmerciful fate at the hands of their king. I'm also going to start doing surprise checks for medical and weapons inspections. Hatchet will flog anyone we catch with an unloaded gun. People we find with no gun at all, he will flog and then put in a cage for a month to heal so he can flog them again. We have gone so long without any deaths, it worries me that they might start getting sloppy. After they've had 24 hours to get the message, you call for spot checks once a week or more often if you think the situation requires it. It will be as you say. Kevin confirmed his instructions. Carmen grabbed Jim's shoulder before he could exit. Let me see if your gun is loaded. He pulled up his pants leg to reveal the small hammerless revolver in his ankle holster. Which one do you want? Jim tapped his hip holster. Oh, you want to see this one? He drew another automatic pistol from a concealed holster at the small of his back. Or perhaps you mean this one? Just checking. She smiled innocently. Good. Jim told her as he walked out in less than a cheerful mood. It is best if everyone understands that I'm not fucking around. If anyone thinks this is all fun and games, they can go ask that fat kid. Once he was gone, Carmen felt confused about his reaction. Did I make him angry with me? Critias put his arm around her, ready to leave too. It has nothing to do with you. In fact, I think you made him feel better. He wants us to know that he expects the same from himself as he asks from everyone else. She needed an explanation. Then why is he mad? Critias enlightened her. I wouldn't let you toss out that tub of shit, Danny, because you and Jim are alike. You have a moral sense and such dirty business leaves a mark that you don't soon forget. But you're the one who tossed him into the street. She pointed out, still confused. Do you have a mark on your soul? He pushed her ahead of him out the door. I'm the first of 30 tyrants. I don't even have a soul. Chapter 12, Leap of Faith. After the meeting with Bob and Kevin, Critias and Carmen returned to their small room to relax. On the way, they didn't discuss going to Houston since there wasn't really anything to debate. Critias would go as a matter of duty, and she would follow out of inseparable devotion. If anyone else were to join them, it would only make their quest all that more difficult. Together they could survive almost any number of ghouls by using escape and evasion, at least so they believed. Anyone else would hold them back as a burden and liability. Carmen didn't want to talk shop anyway, since she had other ambitions in mind for their evening. His open declaration of love still lingered acutely in her thoughts. The way his fluster over the admission had prompted Critias into the remorseless execution of a worthless lummox only heightened her romantic zeal. It was undeniably true that Jim bore the responsibility for denying the Cretan admission into his community. But Critias's cathartic confession of their love had aggravated the impulsive timing of his prosecution on that warrant. She knew that Critias was a true Stoic at heart. He was a man that strived to maintain an attitude of acquiescent dispassion, whether it was with his violent profession or his recreational fornications with his proprietary slave. Carmen felt thrilled to be his taboo amour that inflamed him into breaking with his practiced restraint. She loved him so much that even her freedom best served her as a means to prove that she was his willingly enthralled concubine. The day had proven to be more than memorable for Critias as well. Not only had he admitted to his prescribed infatuation for Carmen, Bob had explained that she was far more than the mere automaton that the bioengineers had so carefully led people to believe. Furthermore, it wasn't every day that he tossed a person to their death, not that he regretted it. That wretch was a menace waiting to happen, just as Jim had wisely decreed. The rescue itself had been venturesome in the extreme, with all their leaping about amongst a ghoulish super-tribe. Critias was mindful that Carmen's bodacious audacity had been the foundation of their success, and he was man enough to admit that her gift for the work gave him a dram of jealousy. They had only just arrived, and the community already recognized them as officers, even paladins of the king, as it were. Carmen's skill had gone a long way into making that a reality. He stretched out on their bed with his hands behind his head, while he watched Carmen cavort about in her unimaginatively conventional underwear that he had procured for her with the other wardrobe. I have no need for modesty, she grumbled. Carmen only pretended to complain about how he insisted that she should dress herself with propriety. In truth, his assertion of dominance captivated her sensibilities. You do have need for dignity. He corrected her while he admired the view. True beauty should be unobtrusive and never vulgar. His reasoning made her thoughtful. You want me to remember that there is a proper dignity and proportion to be observed in the performance of every act of life. 
she drew upon the meditations of Marcus Aurelius in the belief that it would appeal to his stoicism. Just so. He approved of her quotation that so admirably mirrored his own thoughts. Carmen crept onto the bed to prowl atop him until they were nose to nose. For your touch? She purred. I would cheerfully bear the reproach of having descended below the dignity of propriety. He reached around her to help shed her trappings of formality. Between us there could be no vulgarity. He replied. You are that grace beyond the reach of art. She had been right about the limits of his strength. Carmen failed to get even a single spark from her hair, no matter how well he charged her electrocells. They made love until his exhaustion, and then Carmen gave an amazing demonstration of contentment by falling asleep against him, even though sleep wasn't something any android ever required. When Critias awoke in the night, his test to be sure that she was genuinely unconscious caused her to awaken. Carmen had truly been asleep and took his rousing touch as invitation to exhaust him yet further before they passed out once again. Kevin had spoken truly that the bioengineers had designed Carmen to appeal to Critias's subconscious effigy of the perfect companion. Everything about her enthralled his senses, whether it was her scent, her softness, or her excited rigidities. If her capacity for fierce independence, coupled with an even fiercer devotion, were not enough to ensnare him, she had even found a way to legitimately sleep curled against him, complete with an angelic expression that could break his heart if he admired her for too long. Her sleepy cuddling had been adorable enough when she had to fake it. He found her really sleeping doubly so. Critias awoke rested a few hours before dawn to discover Carmen was gone and she had taken his mech suit with her. The suit wouldn't fit her even if that were her intention, and the only person with the skill to do maintenance on it would be Kevin. He had a good idea of where she had gone with it. He dressed in some running shorts and shoes, then left their room to jog. Critias took the stairwell down toward the lobby, only to find that heavy gates blocked his way to the bottom. There was no guard around to open the padlocks, so he just turned around and then ran the stairs back up to the top where he used the elevator instead. The guard at the front entrance by the quarantine cells offered a friendly wave. Hey, Critias, you're up late. You might want to avoid sneaking up on anyone at this time of night to not have someone popping off by mistake. I don't think we've met. Critias emphasized that the guard already seemed to know his name. Kenny. The guard offered his hand for a friendly shake. I'm the new Midnight to Six watch. I just started tonight. Kenny knew who Critias was because of the marshal's recent heroics on the road with the king. As usual, Critias declined to touch hands. Instead, he got to what was actually on his mind. You didn't see Carmen come past here, did you? Kenny knew who Carmen was as well, especially because she was so memorable. He described her as a demonstration that he understood whom Critias was asking about. Carmen is the pretty one with the colorful hair. She must still be upstairs because I haven't seen anyone all night. If I do see her, I'll tell her you asked about her. Critias asked. Do you live here upstairs? Kenny thought it was odd that anyone would think he could live there. Me? Nobody lives here but the King, Tinker Bob, and the adrenaline junkies who let ghouls chase them around town. Some of the exterior gate and foragers' castle support crew leaders have worked their way up to an apartment here in King's Tower. I suppose those support jobs are kind of the same thing. The drivers bang up the vehicles and get those edges sharp as knives. Just one scratch and you're a freak. That, <laughs> that's not for me. I used to be a welder's assistant, but I can't weld any good, so I switched over to guard and patrol. I live in the rapid deployment barracks in the customs house. He pointed through the wall to the right of facing out the front entrance. That's the other building over there where you've seen Funland. Many people like me live upstairs. There are some real nice apartments people have put together, but I don't mind the barracks. Critias checked his watch. You only have a few more hours. Don't fall asleep. You don't have to tell me. Kenny guaranteed his long-lasting alertness. Jim would have my ass in a sling. Critias jogged on down through the tower basement. Another guard led him past the gate there, and then he ran on to Funlan before he circled back to the King's Tower. After a hot shower in the lobby decontamination area, Critias took the elevator up to Bob's laboratory to find Carmen. Hatchet waited outside the elevator door in his pajamas, and he looked hackneyed. Don't you two ever sleep? His annoyance proved that Carmen had come that way. Sorry. Critias offered an apology. I don't know what made her come up here. I came to find out. Hatchet waved for him to follow, and then delivered him to Bob's workroom, where Carmen and Kevin messed with his mech suit on a table. They currently used airbrushes to paint the exterior. Come and tell me what you think. Carmen summoned him, obviously pleased with herself over her accomplishment. Kevin gave it a complete maintenance check, too. 
They painted the suit with a combination of flesh tones and dirty browns in the patterns of tattered clothing to appear as though he was some kind of brutish hunter ghoul when he wore it. The helmet, especially apart from the visor, had the appearance of a monstrously deformed face with goggling eyes on the forehead and rows of teeth around the visor as though from a shark. Critias was aghast that they had defiled his pristine and much beloved armor. Carmen expected praise. What do you think? We used hydrophobic paints from our supplies. It won't be any kind of contamination burden. It's positively hideous, he answered honestly. The first guard I pass is going to shoot me in the head. It was beautiful, and now you made it look like a filthy stink-wafting zombie. Perfect. She nodded in satisfaction of a job well done. That's exactly what I want the infected to think. In combination with the kinetic response upgrades Kevin installed, this is going to work like a charm. You ruined my beautiful suit, he complained. It was ceremonial, ideal in both regulation and tradition. Now it looks ghastly. Carmen educated him. It has to look ghastly for walking among the infected without them attacking you, silly. With the changes we've made, you will even sort of move like one, so long as you keep it slow. My costume is not as nice as yours, but I'm a much better actress. He ruminated on what she said to be sure it was as insane as he suspected. You want to go outside and walk around among the ghouls as though one of them and you expect them to just ignore us like we're part of the family? Yep. She answered with a confident grin. Carmen reminded him. Remember when we sat in the truck by those sand hills and that one walked right up to the window to sniff us? This is just the same thing, but we can move around. What Bob said got me thinking, tactically I mean. If my body and your mech suit are biological cousins to ghouls, then we just need to look and act like them too, and they won't know what hit them until it's too late. Cretius had his doubts. Or on the other hand, they think we are as ridiculous as this sounds and then tear us to shreds. Carmen quoted at him. Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? She added a flash of her raised eyebrows. When has Carmen ever led you astray, my love? This disaster comes to mind at the moment. He indicated his armor. Correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't there some part of that story where the armor painted in the lab today gets cast into the oven on the morrow? She countered. Houston might very well be an oven since you mention it, and we're going anyway. Carmen made a presentational gesture toward the armor. At least like this. If we get caught in a tight pinch, we will have other options. He struggled to come up with a good example of Carmen being wrong, but couldn't think of anything worth mentioning. So Critias said, You were wrong about your hair sparking? Not for lack of trying? She laughed, since it was true. On the topic of your neurotic malfunctions. Kevin interrupted, speaking to Carmen. Did the new sleeping program function to your satisfaction? Perfectly. She congratulated him. It's every bit the intimate bonding experience I was hoping for. So much better than playing possum. There are moments when I almost forget I'm not human. What a tragic thing for any android to say. Kevin sighed. Carmen used her interlink to command the mech suit's onboard computers. In an astounding display of automation and agility, the mech suit with no one in it placed one palm down on the work table and then pressed itself out into a rigidly stable, one-handed handstand. Carmen made the other arm extend out so that she could offer the mech suit her pistol, which it grasped. After she made the suit point the weapon outward on its side, she placed a chemistry beaker atop the pistol so that it rested there perfectly steady. The gyroscopic balance is perfect now. She said for Critias to admire their handiwork. 10,000 balance calculations per second, she reported. Well, we could set that much higher, but the nerve conduction velocity can't cope with it anyway, so it is perfect just like this. The suit could dance on a tight wire while juggling barbells. You could too if you had the confidence in yourself to let it happen. In all honesty, Critias did feel impressed. The technology of the mech suit was capable of so much more than even he believed, and he was from the future as a mech-suited marshal. To anyone from King Louis's time, it may as well have been magic. There it was, holding that pose as rigid as a bronze statue. Just to prove it, Carmen reached over and poked the armor to shove it out of balance. The mech suit effortlessly adjusted, with not so much as a quiver, correcting itself 10,000 times per second, just as she had boasted. She looked to Critias. Suit up so we can get some jumping practice in. It makes me feel bad watching you hop around like an old granny when the suit is capable of so much more. He swallowed his pride and his retort to put on his mech suit with her assistance. Once he was ready, he checked his reflection in a mirror. As he approached, he noticed his carriage was somewhat simian. Kevin joined him with a handheld instrument that he manipulated. I have greatly improved your mech suit's involuntary kinetic reflexes in addition to the gyroscopic balance upgrade. You will also find that I have modified your visor's HUD display to calculate your vault trajectories. Critias used eye movement to control the visor interface displays. 
The upgrade Kevin had installed informed him about how far or high he could successfully leap and what his ideal flight path should be. It prompted Critias to ask, This thing can really cross 30 meters? At your maximal sprinting velocity, that is approximately your uttermost dependable distance. Kevin confirmed. The new reflex processor will require some time to graduate, but I'm certain you will acknowledge a significant melioration. You could jump 30 meters if you had the balls to try. Carmen translated. You need to practice a bit for the autopilot thingy to get to know you before it will blow your mind with how sweet it makes your moves. He had newfound enthusiasm for her designs. Where can we test it out? Just follow me. She headed for the door. Carmen led Critias to Funland and then up the stairwells from there all the way to the roof of the customs house. Various guards who stood at gates or walked patrols saw them on their way. All displayed the same silent astonishment at the ghoulish character of his mech suit. They walked out onto the roof in the thin light of the approaching dawn. Agriculture enshrouded the flat surfaces of the roof, which included the tops of elevated outbuildings and the narrow ledges that projected from some of the upper floors visible down from the roof edge. With the food crops occupying so much of the area, the roof was not suitable for any sort of training practice. It was difficult just to walk the narrow paths without them disturbing any of the plants. You picked a bad place to play. He told Carmen with some satisfaction that she had made at least a small miscalculation. I guess you weren't expecting to find a farm. She gave him an annoyed glance. I wanted to come to this roof. I never said that I planned on staying here. He went over to glance off the edge. We're much too high for getting down from up here. She pointed east at an office building at least a third taller than the structure they stood on. Is that so? The nearby building that she indicated may have once been valuable real estate, but its current condition appeared as though it had been the scene of an outbreak survivor gun battle. Most of the exterior had been panes of dark safety glass, and at least half of those were missing or shattered. Birds flew in and out of the openings, which promised that the interior would be in equally tragic condition. The building was also on the far side of a city street at least 30 meters away. You can't be serious. He challenged, even though he already knew that she meant it. Carmen lectured. Lao Tzu said that being deeply loved by someone gives you strength. He also said that loving someone deeply gives you courage, and I'm betting he was right about that, too. She did not wait to hear what he thought. Carmen just ran for the edge of the building as fast as she could and then leaped off. Critias didn't hesitate to sprint after her. There was no way that he could let her go off outside the barrier alone with nothing but her pistol for protection. He reached the edge in time to see her tuck into a ball and then disappear through a windowless opening in the office building, a floor lower than she started from. His visor display locked her entry point as a target and told Critias he could make the jump too, even while his own brain screamed for him not to try. Critias didn't pause to reconsider. He just leaped off the edge of the roof to fly in pursuit of Carmen over the street far below. The processor that translated signals from his nervous system into commands for his mech suit went a step further as it gyroscopically controlled his orientation. He went off the building in a spread-arm dive that carried him across between the buildings and then through the same window to land in a hands-first tumble that he rolled out of onto his feet. The thrilling act totally transformed his confidence in himself and his mech suit. Carmen stood in the room with an outstretched one-arm stranglehold on an infected. What had once been a nine-year-old girl dangled and kicked from her hand like a snatched stray cat. As small as it was, the creature had no chance of escaping her. The thing could casually persist without fresh oxygen, but Carmen's grip that crushed its windpipe did prevent it from uttering any feeding call to attract more of its kind. She gazed on Critias with pride over his accomplishment as she said, I knew you had it in you. Carmen absently whipped her arm to snap the ghoul's neck, and then she quietly put the limp body on the floor. Critias checked his thermal imager to give himself some wall penetration, and perhaps see other ghouls before they detected him first. His quick glance about the area revealed nothing but birds and rats. The room had once been the office of some sort of paper pusher. Rain and bird droppings had laid the interior to waste. She drew her Tesla Flux pistol and then remotely set the projectile velocity down. 330 meters per second should be silent, she advised him. You go first and act as if you're a zombie, and I'll follow you to see if you can fool them at least from a distance. Critias reset his pistol to the same velocity, which would prevent the rounds from generating sonic booms. That sharp crack would give them away if they shot any infected, which would call in even more ghouls. He holstered his tuned sidearm before requesting, Explain to me what act like a zombie entails. She offered him her logic. According to Bob, the ghouls are using their human brains and senses to find food. Just like every other creature, ghouls find infected meat to be inedible. 
My whole body and your mech suit are not tasty to them. The only thing that sets them off into violence must be that they see that we're not fellow ghouls. The infected never show fear and don't have any interest in one another. If you don't talk, show fear, or move like a human, I think they'll believe you're just another ghoul, at least until they get close enough to see otherwise. If they don't howl, no more ghouls will come to investigate. It's simple as that. He was skeptical, but willing to indulge her. Where are we going? She grinned, having fun. We can go down and search for something to take, or we can go up a couple of floors so that we will be high enough to jump back. He asked non-rhetorically. Do you have any idea how many infected are prowling around in this building? Carmen estimated. Some are creeping around here and there, chasing rats and birds, stealing eggs from nests, things like that. There is not enough food for many of them. On the other hand, if we go to the basement, we might get lucky and find a nest with a watcher. He rolled his eyes at that. We're not going to the basement with two pistols. Cretius did his best shamble as he left the office to explore a bit. The kinetic processor translated a ghoulish movement to his suit. Combined with the paint job she put on, he felt confident enough to test her conjecture on passing himself off as one of them. The reception area beyond that room had open doors that led to similar offices. Carmen went to a punctured fire extinguisher that still hung on the wall. Helicopter gunship, she whispered, after she examined the bullet hole that went clean through the pressure tank and then the wall behind it. The not-too-distant sound of what seemed like a door banging into a wall alerted them to danger. Having guessed the source, Carmen pointed out to the main hallway and then to the right. Cretius lumbered out into the hall and then looked that way. At the far end of the internal corridor, he saw a runner ghoul on all fours that was just outside an open metal fire door that probably led into a stairwell. The creature ignored him as it sniffed at the ground, even after having glanced in his direction. The first rays of dawn were on the rise outside, which produced just enough ambient light in the dim hallway for them to be able to see one another. Carmen and Critias had thumped hard on the floor when they landed from their jumps. That noise had lured the predator to come up to identify the source of the noise. No doubt it had hoped to find something edible. The knowledge that Carmen was with him filled Critias with a twinge of collar. The ghoul had really come up the stairs with the desire to hunt them down and kill them. At least he told himself it was that personal. He advanced with kicks through the trash that littered the hallway. Cretius intended to scatter it to draw the attention of the ghoul, but the creature still just ignored him. He kept on with increased rancor until his boot shuffling of the debris sent a rat to flight down the hallway. The ghoul zeroed in on the rodent and then dashed after it low to the ground. So pursued, the terrified rat reversed its course to run right between Critias's legs with the ghoul close behind it. When the infected was right at Critias's feet, it stared up at him through his visor and then realized its previous error, which caused the thing's face to twist into a bared teeth snarl. As he slapped his open gauntlet down onto the ghoul's head, Critias had a genuine need to see the creature suffer for affronting him with its wretched existence. His enhanced strength fortified the blow that shattered the creature's skull like a glass jar inside a leather sack, which left the ghoul crumpled motionless at his feet. Critias didn't check to see if Carmen still followed. He just headed for the stairwell the ghoul came from, and then proceeded down to see how far they could get before having to turn back. Four floors down, they paused at a landing to examine a skeleton with a rusty pistol between the leg bones and a bullet hole through its skull. Carmen made a forensic paleontological evaluation of the skeleton as she nudged the ruined pistol with her foot. This is a Caucasian male, approximately 35 years of age, with one self-inflicted 32 caliber gunshot wound to the head. Looks like he got himself chomped on back in the day, Critias reasoned, then elected for suicide rather than turning. That is essentially the truth of it. Carmen agreed with only small reservations. I notice that the skeleton's hand is missing the tip of its left index finger. Close examination suggests to me that this maiming is the result of a bullet from his gun rather than from the bite of a ghoul. Cretius extended one arm in a motion that pretended to push away an angry ghoul by having his hand in its gnashing face. At the same time, he went through the motion of his other hand firing an imaginary pistol into the ghoul's skull. He surmised on the man's hapless fate. He could have easily acquired some other bites and scratches when wrestling around with an angry ghoul. If he did shoot his own finger off, he followed up by plunging the newly trimmed stub into a ghoul's facial bullet wound. Carmen nodded to that reasoning. He never turned. His exposure must have been minimal, and he killed himself quite soon after the event that would have infected him had he lived. 
As they continued down the concrete steps, they encountered a badly dehydrated female corpse sprawled out where it had fallen headshot some years past, only to remain ghoulishly free of decomposition. Even though it was obvious to both of them, Critias took the time to say it. This must be the one that ended up with that guy's finger in her brains. Critias and Carmen eventually descended down so many stairs that they reached street level without ghoulish opposition. They exited out of the stairwell through an already open fire door. That ground floor was the entry lobby for the office building as a whole. In addition to multiple sets of main doors that connected directly out to the sidewalk, there were some small stores and a sandwich shop as obvious locations of interest. As Critias grave walked to the food service area to check for canned food, he noticed the freshly slain, half-eaten carcass of a mature white-tailed deer that lay in the middle of the lobby near the south doors to the outside. Those doors not only stood wide open, they were missing entirely. Critias knew enough about predators and their kills to realize that whatever had feasted on the deer wouldn't be far away, prompting him to just stand still and listen quietly. Carmen whispered through her internal transmitter to the radio in his helmet. Be careful. There was a zoological park in this city and that carcass seems as though it was predated upon by a large mammal to me. He asked. You mean like lions, tigers, and bears? That's exactly what I mean. She confirmed the warning. And I don't think we want to test your armor against a 400-kilogram tiger. Her logic seemed reasonable enough to Critias in that he never heard of infected abandoning a freshly killed carcass before. While it was possible that the ghoul that had killed the animal had already eaten to the point of losing interest, that didn't explain why other ghouls hadn't moved in to scavenge on the remainder. A scraping sound alerted them to a crawler before they saw the creature drag itself in from the street a moment later. It audibly sniffed as it tracked the stench of the deer's spilled entrails that were strong on the air. When the creature saw the carcass, the crawler impressively accelerated its legless torso to set upon the deer corpse and then begin tearing at the raw flesh with its feeble teeth that no amount of savagery could make efficient for such a task better suited to less unnatural carnivores. Critias kept still as he watched and waited to see if some greater predator would appear to defend its food. The thing that came didn't disappoint him. With the agility of the tiger that Carmen first feared, the largest hunter that Critias had ever seen leaped out from a nearby stationary store. The fearsome giant bellowed rage as it pounced on the interloping crawler. Critias imagined that in some former life, the hunter had been a showman, like a strong man in a circus, for he could think of no other explanation for how the man could have grown into such a colossus, even with an infected's healing factor running wild. If the thing ever stood fully erect, the hunter would have been more than a full meter taller than Critias. Also, unlike any other hunter that Critias had ever encountered, the beast remained a perfectly proportioned Hercules, as though having never suffered any catastrophic injury at all to trigger the regenerative condition. The monstrosity had simply grown bigger and more mesomorphic with the passage of time. The thing was awe-inspiring, a paragon of flawless flesh devoid of scar or blemish, a veritable titan bestride the earth. Goliath himself would have gazed up to tremble in the face of a true biblical demigod of destruction, a super-hunter only rumored about in disbelieved forager legend, a destroyer. That ultimate hunter casually snatched up the puny crawler, snapped its spine like it had ringed a towel, and then flung it out the door to bounce and skip before it ended up in the middle of the street where it squealed and twitched. Having reclaimed his food, the destroyer glanced about to see if any other ghouls were foolish enough to challenge him for the meal. That is when the destroyer spotted Critias, who stood silently across the lobby. Grendel. Carmen named her dread to him by radio. Run, Critias. If you die here, everything that is our future will be undone. That king among hunters charged with another of its angry roars that was clear in any language. Grendel wasn't interested in food or in defending it. It only cared about crushing a trespassing rival. And that mammoth beast moved at least as fast as they could, plus it was fantastically stronger. Critias already sensed that Carmen would sacrifice herself so that he might escape. If they both ran together, Grendel would catch them. If they outran him, the hunter would follow them and then easily make the same jump back to the customs house. He had often desired to catch Carmen making a mistake, but that long-awaited victory was ashes in his mouth. It was his own decision to lead them down the building rather than up as he had known was the wiser course of action. 
The fault for their blunder in judgment was entirely his own. Even before Carmen had finished speaking, Critias instinctively drew his pistol to fire a shot. Because he had dialed down the power of his weapon, the bullet exited his pistol with almost complete silence, which proved to be yet another item on his growing list of miscalculations. The tungsten projectile struck the hunter square in the forehead, only to bounce off thick bone to leave an insignificant flesh wound. Grendel was too fast to suffer another bullet, as he loped forward in only two bounds. He added that momentum into an open-handed pancration slap that caught Critias in the chest to send him whirling airborne across the lobby. Critias crashed uncontrollably into a marble wall that was more than solid enough to take the impact without a quiver, and then he had to fall two meters just to hit the floor, mostly with his head. The initial contact with the wall had already knocked him senseless. A subsequent crash to the floor actually served to bring him back to consciousness. His first breath felt like he inhaled flame, and to top it all off, his pistol had flown from his hand to he knew not where. Carmen mentally spun the velocity setting of her Tesla Flux pistol up to its maximum as she gripped it in both hands on braced legs to unleash its wrath. The recoil was so fierce that it launched her backward to plow through a man-sized decorative ceramic vase. Her bullet struck the fast-moving Grendel through the thick muscle near his shoulder just as he leapt to finish off Critias. Such was her emergency desperation to save Critias's life. Carmen didn't have the luxury to wait for a clean shot to the destroyer's head. The hypersonic projectile transferred so much kinetic energy on impact that it tore off the whole arm at the socket, knocking Grendel flat. The nearly indestructible tungsten round then continued through walls for another half kilometer. Sight of the Pangaboe sword that Carmen had strapped to his right shin brought Critias back to his senses. She had added the sheath to his armor and then camouflage painted them together. He heard her bullet's sonic boom go off like a bomb and then watched the destroyer collapse from a brutal blood fountain of a wound. Critias pulled his sword as the motion processor Kevin upgraded hopped him from his back to his feet with acrobatic agility, much to Critias's amazed gratitude. Carmen tossed aside her uselessly overheated handgun as she dashed over to stomp out the Super Hunter's brains before he could recover. As she came down from a jump to plant both feet on the back of his neck, Grendel sprang up to administer a punishing backhand with his remaining arm that batted her from the air like a shuttlecock. The blow sent Carmen flying far down the lobby to then slide even further along the dusty floor. Critias's HUD located the transponder in his pistol nearby. He leapt for it while also throwing his sword to slide down the floor to Carmen, who could undoubtedly make better use of it than he could. He reached the handgun just as the hunter reached him. The ogreish infected seized Critias by an ankle and then used that grip to whip him headlong into the stationery store to crash through several layers of shelving displays that then collapsed on top of him. The feeding shrieks of ghouls chorused outside in the street in answer to Carmen's loud gunshot. The sounds meant that lesser infected were on their way to join the fight. Critias shoved his way out of the storefront wreckage with pistol in hand, set for firepower. He absently headshot the first three runners as they came in through the doorway, and then he ran to join up with Carmen, who faced down their real nemesis. She taunted, slashed, and stabbed at Grendel like a clever matador in a daring duel with an enraged bull. Grendel soaked up the trifling picador wounds with furious resilience, while he retaliated with clubbing blows from his single arm that hoped she would fail in one of her artful dodges. Critias pumped slugs into Grendel's hunched-over back on the off chance that one of them would pass through far enough to hit something vital, preferably the destroyer's enormous head. Desperate hope was not enough to get Critias a killing injury, and as it was, the damage he inflicted was not even sufficient to interrupt the brute's interest in smashing Carmen. When her sword finally snagged in Grendel's sinewy tissue, the hunter caught Carmen by the calf and then twirled his whole mass to lash her bodily across a major support pillar. The impact shattered ceramic tile to bits and caused dust to fall down from the high ceiling. That wasn't enough for Grendel. He reversed his swing to fling her across the lobby where she smashed badly into the marble wall that had previously shown so little mercy to Critias. Desperate to survive, Critias loaded a fresh magazine that he promptly emptied into a new wave of runners as they streamed in from the street by two different entrances. He masterfully cut them down like so many clay pigeons. His next clip after that was for the destroyer-class hunter, but when Critias turned around to engage him, he discovered that Grendel was already gone. The giant had inexplicably fled the confrontation that he had been well on the way to winning. With sword in hand, Carmen tragically struggled to regain her feet on a crippled leg. 
She moved like a dog hit by a car. The rest of her seemed merely badly battered since her sturdy titanium bones had taken the abuse while remaining unbroken. Ever more ghouls poured in from the street. They howled up a tremendous racket as they chased after Critias, who sprinted over to Carmen, lifted her over his shoulder, and then carried her away toward the door to the stairs. Give me your pistol, she demanded, and grab mine from over there. Once she had his gun, Carmen blasted the brains from ghouls while Critias ran as he carried her. He scooped up her overheated weapon on the way to dashing into the stairwell. As soon as he was through the door, Carmen instructed, Hold the door closed while I lock it. He put her down and then grabbed the door handle with both hands to hold it shut tight. Carmen limped over to the stairs where she pushed her strength to rip the hand railing right off, snapping the bolts to take its support spokes and all while ghouls frantically beat on their door in an effort to get in at them, too stupid to pull on it instead. Carmen stuffed some of the steel spokes through the rectangular hoop handle of the door and then rapidly twisted them off into a knot. Once she had them tight, the length of rail wedged against the wall effectively barred the door from ever opening. It will take them some time to find the way around. Carmen gasped as she started up the stairs, hobbled by her crippled right leg. She knew his expression behind her without ever seeing it. I can make it, she growled with tenacity. As Critias lifted her in his arms to carry her up, he demanded, Tell me where to find a window I can jump from. He started up the stairwell by taking five or six steps at a leap. Ghouls that were already above them in the building came down the stairwell, only to have Carmen shoot them in the face as Critias sprang past. He tried to figure out how she would ever be able to get back across to the customs house. Critias finally asked, How bad is your leg? It tore out my tendons, I think, she told him truthfully. I'll need surgery to correct it, or I'll regenerate lame for certain. She chuckled darkly. Unless you would prefer to have a limper for a... She paused, perhaps from pain. Partner. When he had gone up enough floors, Carmen told him. Take this door. Which he opened with a kick. She directed him down the hallway, then picked an office. This one should be good. Critias sat her on her good leg before they opened the door. Once inside, he closed, locked it, and then put a desk against it. Carmen limped into a window office that had missing glass. They were two floors higher than their destination across the street. I still have one good leg. She tried to sound positive. You'll have to throw me. Fucking hell, he exclaimed with no time to delay over his fear that he would toss Carmen to a splattered end on the street below. Ghouls were coming up and they needed to be gone when the infected arrived. Critias went to the window where he laced his fingers for her to step in when he launched her. Carmen wiped his sword clean of infected blood on a soggy old chair before putting it in his scabbard. She stepped her good foot into his laced grip, balanced herself with her hands on his shoulders, and then counted. One, two, throw! They counted off until Critias heaved her with all his might. Carmen kicked away on her healthy leg with flawless timing to sail over the street to the building across the way. From the extra height, she came down rough in a plot of chicken wire-covered tomatoes. Critias backed up to have room to run and then went out after her, landing cleanly on an open area of roof edge. Help me get inside, she urged him. They needed to hurry if they wanted to escape the light of sunrise. For the moment, they were in the shadow of the infected office tower, and that concealed them a little. We don't want the ghouls to see us here, she assured him. They might get the idea about trying to jump across. Critias took her arm and supported her as they went to the door to enter the stairwell. Once they were inside, he stopped at the first landing to say, We're too dirty from rolling with the dogs to track it all through the hallways without decontamination. He sat her down and then used his helmet radio on the guard and patrol frequency to summon their help. The first guard arrived within a minute. He was a young man short of breath from his run up the stairwells when he asked, Are there ghouls on the roof? Cretius was about to explain to the guard that they had been in the office building to the east, but then he realized that would mean that he would also need to explain how they could accomplish such a seemingly impossible leap. Instead, he said, It's possible for a hunter to jump from that office building to the east to land on this roof. There are no ghouls up there right now, but it could happen. Your guard commander needs to station a watch at this door, and we need a crew of cleaners to decontaminate us so we can get to the medics. We tussled with a bull of a hunter and are somewhat worse for wear. The guard sounded excited at their news of such an encounter. Did you kill it? No. Carmen confessed. But it damn sure knows that it was in a fight. Critias chuckled painfully to the taste of blood. Lady Beowulf here blew his arm off, and then her Grendel ran away to learn how to wipe his ass with the other hand. The guard couldn't believe it. A hunter ran away? A hunter would never run from anything except maybe a flamethrower or Godzilla. We lit his ass on fire, all right, Critias assured the guard. It chose the better part of valor. 
Two more guards soon arrived, followed by four decontamination technicians in splatter suits. They carried suction vacuums and wash buckets. The crew removed all their possessions and then put them aside while they scrubbed Critias and Carmen clean. The decontamination scrubbers searched them diligently for any signs of infectious abrasions. Critias's armor had protected him from any wounds, aside from crushing injuries. Carmen's form-fitting diving suit had done much the same for her. Her titanium bones were all but unbreakable, and nothing sharp had penetrated her splash protection. Their pistols are filthy, the lead technician told the guards as he put them in a plastic tub. You must escort them to King's Tower and then deliver them to Tinker Bob's new doctor friend, Kevin. If anyone complains about them not having weapons, you tell them they're still undergoing decontamination according to my instructions. We will take all their stuff to the cleaners. By the time the guards had escorted Critias and Carmen to Bob's floor, Critias hurt so badly from his beating that it was hard for him to walk without his mech suit to support him. Carmen had radioed ahead with her burst interlink. Kevin awaited them at the elevator. He helped get Carmen into the laboratory and then put her on a table to operate. The male android asked, What happened? Grendel, Critias answered. That's what she called the supersized hunter that nearly killed us both. After she blew off an arm and I dumped a box of bullets into him, the giant freak ran off to save its own ass. Kevin used the med scanner to focus in on Carmen's leg as he said, Though a bromide personification for the invincible enemy, it is still high praise for a ghoul coming from a prototype Epsilon K combat unit like Carmen. Jim will be interested in this, Grendel. With your permission, I'd like to download sensory recording data of the encounter from your helmet and from Carmen to prepare a displayable video of the material for general study. Critias agreed. If Carmen is willing, go ahead and make your movie. I will be fine for the moment. Carmen told Kevin. Help Critias first. Kevin got Critias on an examining table where the android diagnosed him. You have some deep subcutaneous contusions, but no fractures. He went over to a small refrigerator where he filled a syringe from a little bottle and then returned to inject it into Critias's arm. Critias was cautious about the injection, especially because it used something as primitive as a metal needle to get the medicine into his body. He asked doubtfully, What was that? As Kevin went to see about Carmen's leg, he told Critias, Something to keep you calm while I operate on Carmen. It will also ease your pain. Critias rested comfortably on painkillers while Kevin performed surgery on Carmen. He reattached a broken tendon, which would allow her leg to regenerate properly without any lingering handicap. Jim came in about the time Kevin bandaged his successfully completed procedure. Their king was none too pleased when he asked, Would you two care to explain to me how you got outside in order to get into a fight? We jumped off the roof of the customs house. Carmen revealed. Jim considered that and then quickly deduced what she meant. Could a hunter make the jump back here from that building? Absolutely. Carmen confirmed. If they ever think of it. Jim saw something positive in that. Then it seems your ignorant stunt did us a favor. If the ghouls had figured out our vulnerability before you did, things could have gone a whole lot differently. From Critias's bruises, it seems that something lurks in that building capable of putting up a fight. Kevin went to a soldering station and then came back with an electronic device that he had recently manufactured. I fabricated this. He told Jim. It will allow your contemporary video technology to display our more advanced compression stream. Kevin plugged a wire from his device into a high-definition video monitor that he would use to display the downloaded images from Carmen's sensory recording of their adventure. The male android already had all the relevant material stored in his own memory. Jim walked over to the display to watch as Kevin played a recording that was a view from Carmen's eyes with sound from her ears. Kevin needed a few moments to adjust the manual settings on his device and the monitor to get the picture into focus. The show began where Carmen straddled Critias in their bed earlier that night. From her eyes, their dark room was clear as daylight. Their hands together in interlaced fingers dominated the scene as she slowly moiled over him. When Kevin came around to see the perfected display, he apologized. Sorry about that. Allow me to fast forward to the relevant material. The image advanced to when they arrived on the roof of the customs house. After Carmen landed in the office building, the girlish ghoul had crept in to investigate the noise. Carmen promptly snatched it by the neck from surprise. Jim watched with interest, and Carmen's ingenuity impressed him. You can walk up to them if they think you're a ghoul. Later, he observed. That hunter doesn't make feeding calls. Not even when it must be sure you're not infected. What was that sound just before it fled? Kevin adjusted his device before replaying the moment multiple times from just before the hunter running away. Among all the howling of ghouls and sounds of battle, there was a distant tinkling, and then the hunter turned away to flee the building. That was falling glass, perhaps. Kevin guessed as to the source of the sound. Jim doubted it was falling glass. Not a bell? 
They listened again repeatedly, but Kevin remained unsure. It could be a bell. Perhaps there were such things in that stationary store that fell from a shelf. I hear the sound, but I don't have anything in memory to compare it against that I could positively identify it with any certainty. Yeah, Jim replied. But I don't think so. I'm not that lucky. Carmen guessed at Jim's thoughts. It was a dog whistle? Jim agreed. For a bodyguard? Before he made a loud whistle. Hatchet came in to answer the call. What is it, boss? Jim quizzed him. What is the sound? Hatchet guessed. A bell or maybe some falling broken glass. The bastards are knocking right on my doorstep. Jim realized in dismay. Carmen quoted one of her books. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. Open locks, whoever knocks. Kevin answered her. How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is it you do? A deed without a name. Carmen finished it. I know his name. Jim told them with a less illustrious quote from an immortal of his own. Hatchet, call Derek and tell him we need to secure the roof of the customs house from bridge jumpers coming in from the east. I'm sorry I did something so reckless. Carmen apologized. Are you sorry? Jim knew she was not. If that hunter had broken Critias's back and then hung him from the ceiling by his own guts, then you would be genuinely sorry right now for being reckless. When you're a negligent mother running around begging someone to shoot you after having spent the last 24 hours watching your young son turn ghoul in an isolation cage to end up wanting to eat you, then you would know what sorry is. You don't know what sorry is yet, and I hope you never find out. If the two of you want to come back alive from Houston, you'll need to train for all the insanity you can. We all got lucky today, and you learned plenty. The next time you want to go play in the backyard, you tell us what is going on so that we can be ready. What we have here in this community is a team effort. All these people are not just an entourage for you divas. Critias was so stoned on morphine that he couldn't do much more than groggily nod his head in agreement, while Carmen sheepishly remained in a guilty silence. When Jim felt satisfied that he had made his point, he asked Kevin, Are these two going to live? Nothing permanent. Kevin had confidence in his appraisal. Carmen will be back to combat readiness in a matter of hours. Marshal Critias requires bed rest for a few days. Before leaving, Jim asked Critias, You really jumped all the way to that other building? Like a hawk. Critias used his hand to demonstrate a drunken flying motion. Jim looked to Kevin. Does everyone from where you come from have more balls than brains? A king has use for both, I think. Kevin answered. After a moment to consider how good an answer that was, Jim nodded. Yes, that is true. He eyed the copper-haired android circumspectly. Bob told me something I found interesting, and I'd like your opinion. He told me that artificial intelligence had an inherent danger. Kevin guessed the rest. He told you that the most efficient solution to every problem does not necessarily fall into the realm of what people would generally call goodness. Yes. Jim confirmed that he meant something along that line. He told me that viciousness was often the shortest distance between two points. Since you're the genius of your kind, I was wondering what you think about that. It is better to be loved than feared. Kevin explained cryptically while rightly guessing that Jim would understand that answer to the Machiavellian conundrum. Human life is always a short and uncertain thing, King Louis. But history has such a long and romantic memory. Cleos is the remedy to ruthlessness. Have the pride to be the inspiration for those after you for hundreds of years to come. Jim asked, Are you proud, Android? Kevin's eyes did not reveal their Luciferian superabundance of superbia that coursed behind them in his genetically enhanced brain. In all humble honesty, Kevin stated, I am the smartest being who has ever lived. Mankind will honor me with love as one of their selfless benefactors. I am a Prometheus for a new age. Before walking out, Jim commented, Bob's son was named Kevin. It was an explanation as to why the Tinkerer had chosen that new name for the android upon his assembly. He is more worthy than my former master, Kevin revealed. I will endeavor to live up to Bob's fatherly expectations. Jim didn't look back, but he still asked, What did your former master call you? Kevin answered, He called me Mr. Brink. Carmen's injuries fully regenerated by supper time that same day, while Critias remained stiff and had a dappled covering of dark bruises. After the evening meal, Jim invited the Denver pilot Bertram to join them for their planning session on Critias's trip to Houston. I flew a C-2A Greyhound. Bertram told them about the plane they came in from the Denver airport. It's a Navy dual turboprop with a powered rear ramp for cargo. She has her own onboard power unit that will start the engines. That plane is a real tough bird that can take carrier landings and catapult launches. She was fresh from a rewiring and is like brand new. Critias asked the pilot, well, What about fuel? I filled it up before we left. It's sitting at about half. I figure she would reach Houston from here in about two and a half hours, but she would be sucking fumes with little left for taking a tour of the town and nothing left for the return home. She will fly on diesel fuel. You should have no trouble getting that most anywhere. Critias wondered, Could I drive a car up the cargo ramp and take it with us? Sure, the pilot answered. 
you would still be way underweight for what she could handle. It can't be anything too big, though, and you won't be able to open the car doors. The cargo bay is wide open, but it won't hold a truck. We left the ramp down when we hauled ass out of there, and I cut the power so the batteries should still be good. The amount of fuel you will need is way beyond a couple jerry cans if you're thinking of taking it with you in a car. You'll need a fuel truck or a set of pumps. Critias looked to Carmen. Could you fly it to that agriculture depot where we got the truck? That had plenty of diesel fuel, and it's in the middle of nowhere. Definitely. She was sure. I can land on a country road a lot softer than slamming it down on an aircraft carrier. If you can fly it, Bertram doubted because of her youth. Can you fly it alone? Critias can follow my instructions, and he is also a gunship pilot. She answered. That will be the least of our problems. That reminded Critias of something else he needed from Bertram. Do you think you could draw on a map the route you drove from the plane to where Hatchet picked you up? Bertram considered that. Probably. I'll need to talk to the others. We could work on it together. In more than a few places, we had to race through suburbia that was absolutely crawling with nasty vampires. The positive thing about driving through all those neighborhoods was that the infected wiped it all out long before traffic jams became a problem. You will have to keep moving fast if you want to have a chance to make it. We were lucky in more ways than I care to count. I wouldn't ever want to try it again unless I was just as desperate. What could possibly be in Houston worth risking your lives for? We have a lead on a possible antigen. Cretius revealed. I know it sounds stupid, but any chance is too big to throw away. Bertram thought it would not be easy to find a landing strip. Have you put any thought into where you might land in Houston? Kevin knew where they could land. There are several suitable runways. Unfortunately, none of them are especially close to their destination. I have seen you two in action. Bertram praised their skills. If you need an extra pilot, I'll go with you. I'm a king's man ready to pay my debts. I keep my word and don't have any weak nerve. I appreciate the offer and we'll keep that in mind. Cretius told him. For now, I would like you and the others to draw up a driving map. We will be leaving in about a week. I have a car in mind for you. Jim told Critias. You need to give me a list of anything else you think you might require. I'll have time to think about it. Critias promised patience with his aches and pains. I won't be healed up for a while yet. I feel like stomped shit. I'm sure Carmen will be all too happy to nurse you back to health. Jim said as apathetic commiseration. Kevin tells me that you'll recover quickly from your bumps and bruises. Poor Critias. Tony Banjo mocked his mixed blessing. He has to suffer a sick bed with Carmen as his nurse. He could not help but laugh. I want to sign up for some of that misery. Carmen needed clarification from Tony. What does a sickbed nurse do exactly? Sponge baths, catered meals, and blowjobs. Tony explained. All 24-7. Oh. Carmen took him seriously. He asks for sponge baths and refreshment after wearing the armor for too long. Her memory of having done it so many times in the past pleased her. With that said, she got up to leave the table. Come along, my darling patient. You've had your catered meal. For the rest of your rejuvenating treatments, we require a modicum of privacy. Chapter 13. Behind the Unreasoning Mask Carmen remained true to her word. For five days she nursed Critias around the clock. Not only did he not want for any comforts, he received true pampering dispensed with loving devotion. During the passage of those days, Jim had his construction crews fortify the roof of the customs house with pickets of lances that would impale any ghouls who managed to leap so far as to reach it. They also replaced the roof door with a much stronger one. Bob and Kevin installed motion sensors that would sound an alarm if anything larger than a bird moved about on the roof while the scanners were active. Bertram and the other survivors from Denver completed a map of their drive from the airport. Should it prove to be accurate, Carmen and Critias could follow it in reverse to get to the functional airplane they had abandoned there. Kevin delivered his maps of where they should land in Houston and where to find the building that headquartered Hale Wellington Pharmaceuticals. Jim went to the room of Critias and Carmen a few hours before dawn on the morning they planned to make their departure. He could escort them to the customs house where their car awaited in a garage at street level on the south side of that building. After Jim switched on the light and then pulled the drape off the car, Carmen clapped in delight with her excitement of getting to drive it. It's magnificent. 500 horsepower from an aluminum big block, Jim told her. She has a welded tubular frame with roll cage, puncture-resistant tires, and five-speed manual transmission. The body is custom-made carbon fiber composite. After they found her, Bob added the armor that he made out of tool steel and the shafts from premium golf clubs. And I even like the color. Carmen stroked her hand down the blackish-purple paint. Her name is Betty, Jim told her. I want you to bring her back in one piece, if at all possible. This car belonged to my father, and I would like to see it back in this garage after you're finished with it. I'll be as gentle as making love. Carmen promised as she caressed the car some more. Jim said in one piece. Critias joked with her. Not ridden hard right into the ground. 
She gave Cretius a raised eyebrow. Lucky for us, you have experience pounding the dents out of your machines. I can testify to that. Touche. He conceded to her jibe. We leave at sunrise. Make whatever maintenance check you think we need while I start loading our stuff. After Carmen checked over the vehicle, she put on a ragged brown robe over her synthetic diving rubbers to serve as her ghoul disguise. She wore her pistol at her belt and had her sword nearby. As Critias brought in a box of survival rations and bottled water, he saw her finish the rapid reassembly of a contemporary firearm and then pick up a second one of the same model to break it down. He asked her about them. What are those? Carmen tossed him the assembled weapon to keep. This has single and automatic firing of 10 millimeter projectiles with a screw-on suppressor. I couldn't find any subsonic ammunition in this caliber. It will not be all that silent. You should keep it. The engineers of this era really outdid themselves with this design. They named it the Maschinenpistol 5, but I think Jim's people call it an MP5. Carmen had hers fully disassembled to check all the components for dirt or wear, and then she rapidly put it back together without even watching her hands. Her eyes remained on his. I'm not a big fan of their fire sticks, he confessed while checking it over dubiously. She dropped her assembled MP5 through the open roof hatch onto her driver's seat. You'll have to trust me then. Just think of it like this car. Carmen lovingly stroked the smooth body of the vehicle. It may be a primitive chemical combustion device, but it sure can get the job done with style in the right hands. All right, then. He agreed. Show me how to operate it. Carmen pointed out how to use the safety rate of fire selector and perform the reloading of ammunition magazines. Afterwards, she said, It's quite excellent up to a hundred meters and effective well beyond that. I still think it would be wise for us to use our pistols subsonic. If anything goes wrong like last time, these are small enough to use quickly where your Tesla Flux tactical rifle is not. She opened a duffel bag to show him some explosives, conventional grenades, and two tubular portable rockets. I also found some other things in the arms locker. He asked about the tubes. What are you planning on shooting those missiles at? They're unguided, unfortunately. She meant that they were only rockets. As to what we might launch them at, I have no idea yet, but if we see another Grendel, I'm sure you will get an inspiration. Carmen loaded them into the back seat. Jim returned with Hatchet and four additional armed guards. He told them, The sun is coming up. I have a man watching the street who will tell us when it is clear for you to go out. We're ready to go. Critias informed the king. Radio us for as long as you can with situation reports. Jim instructed. If anything goes wrong before you can get the plane off the ground, we can come out to pick you up. Hatchet handed Carmen a laser storage disc. I brought you some road music. You be sure to come back in one piece. Watching you get naked for your decontamination washes is the sunshine of my life. If the most beautiful woman I know gets herself killed, I'll be very disappointed with the rest of the world. I wish Gradius was as flattering. She kissed his cheek. I'll come back and you can keep watching me with my blessing. I may even dance for you. Carmen showed Hatchet her hand. It's not like you see a ring on my finger. You will if you come back alone, Hatchet pledged, with a rock as big as the moon. She won't be coming back alone, Critias commented jealously. Mount up, princess. It's showtime. Carmen hopped in through the roof hatch, and then Critias followed to sit on the passenger side. Jim was on the radio in contact with a man who watched the street, and he signaled for Hatchet to open the heavy garage door when it was clear. Carmen started the rumbling engine as she pushed the disc of music into the dashboard player. As she pulled out into the street, Carmen sang, Whoa, Black Betty! with the music as she accelerated so fast that the G-forces pressed Critias into his seat. Black Betty had a child! She sang as she took a left corner at a drift. The damn thing gone wild! The next ride put them on the straightaway toward Forager's Castle, where she scorched off the tires with each release of the clutch and ratcheted through the gears to accelerate up to an insanely dangerous speed. Critias knew better than to complain about her reckless driving, because she had the skill to get away with it and wouldn't listen to him anyway. Their car was as fast as the rhino had been slow. They raced past the infected so quickly that the ghouls did not even have a chance to see what the passing noise had been. As they headed north up the highway, Carmen had to slow down to dodge debris in the roadway, but she still pushed the car to rash limits. She had more than a single lane through the cars cleared by the significantly wider rhino. It was wide enough for the Betty to have room to spare, and the impacted vehicles along both sides made a good fence to keep ghouls out of the road. It took them only minutes to get where the rhino had picked up the survivors. Once there, Carmen slowed down for a closer look. 
The car the Denver survivors took from the airport revealed its identity by having a cleaner windshield and fresher ghoul blood all over it. Critias shut off her music as he told her, Here we go. You've seen the map Bertram made, but it might have some mistakes. Carmen raced on again. She drifted the corners and barked the tires when shifting gears. A left after a straight run dumped them out onto a highway heading north, crowded with old automobiles. She weaved through for a long block and then kicked around another left to shoot through the gatehouse that led into a wooded cemetery. This is a beautiful place, she commented as the trees passed their windows in a blur of speed. Their straight road became a series of turns that zigzagged through the woods, mausoleums, and tombstones. Another gatehouse on the west side of the cemetery put them back on a major boulevard that split the cemetery on their right from dense suburbia on their left. Bertram was right about the neighborhood ghouls, Critias told Carmen. They must have swept through here like the wind to judge by all the cars still in their driveways. The Betty made high speed down a long straightaway until Bertram's map sent them left into the guts of a suburb. The houses were in tight rows down both sides of the street, so close together that if one were to take fire, the flames would spread to a thousand others. The overgrown lawns and countless homes served as prime habitat for squirrels, rabbits, and deer. That abundant wildlife served to feed ghouls in legion, though thankfully the infected were not in groups. Critias dreaded the thought of them having a breakdown in the place, since the ghouls would overrun them in number, and none of the homes were sturdy enough to offer any shelter. Carmen had to swerve and brake to avoid hitting any ghouls, but it still happened with some regular frequency. The front ram did a decent job when it hurled their bodies aside, even if the impacts were teeth-jarring. Critias felt grateful when she finally drove out of the subdivision. They crossed a broad boulevard to enter a golf course country club by its main driveway. Carmen followed pavement for as long as it lasted, and then finally pulled off it onto a thinly graveled path that had served for little electric carts the players had ridden. After they hopped off the course onto a roadway, Carmen negotiated more boulevards to plunge back into a crowded suburb. Her final exit followed the still obvious tracks of the Denver car that they had driven through the tall grass between two of the homes. It's going to start raining soon. Carmen warned Critias with certainty as she drove out of the neighborhood homes onto a wide level plain of wild grasses. She still followed the tire marks of the previous vehicle that had blazed the trail. Critias observed from the sparse landmarks that they were in yet another suburb, only it had not grown beyond the stage of leveled ground and a completed boulevard for access. As Carmen got off the grass onto the roadway, she said, The airport is just ahead, but the way in might be a little rough. He assumed, If they could make it in their car, then you can make it in this one. Not necessarily from this direction, she reasoned. They can drive off a cliff a lot easier than I can drive back up one. The first raindrops fell on their windshield as Carmen turned off the roadway. She headed down a grassy slope that bottomed out sharply in a valley furrowed by a currently dry concrete waterway. She cut across the ditch at an angle and then spun the wheels as the car struggled to climb the far embankment. At the top, they crossed a superhighway to struggle up a rocky path that ascended a steeper hill. The track crossed a twin highway of the reverse lanes further up to then snake through a stand of trees. The end of the rough road finally delivered them to the extreme eastern end of an airport runway. That was some great driving. He praised Carmen before he radioed home to tell Jim that they had reached the airport. Jim radioed back. He made it in just over 12 minutes. Carmen must drive like a bat out of hell. Critias agreed with Jim. You would have to see it to believe it. And then signed off the call. I'll tell you when we're airborne with wings instead of tires. He told Carmen. Jim says that you drive like a bat out of hell. As further proof, he watched her bury the needle of the speedometer as she raced the car down the smooth, wide runway. They went even faster, going well beyond what the gauge could even register. She sang to him, But when the day is done, and the sun goes down, and the moonlight's shining through, then like a sinner at the gates of heaven, I'll come crawling on back to you. Carmen decelerated hard as she worked her way left toward the main buildings with its rows of jumbo jets that still had sky bridges that linked them to their boarding gates. If there are any more survivors from Denver, they could be anywhere in this maze, Critias observed. How would we even begin to search for them? The rain began to pour, accompanied by lightning and thunder. Carmen slowed to about the sprinting speed of a ghoul as they passed the giant aircraft at their moorings. She complained. It would still be difficult to find anyone, even if we could see without this rain. Bertram's plane is just ahead by those cars and buildings over there. If the other passengers left by car, they could be anywhere at all. If they never drove away, they would still be in those buildings. 
Critias suggested. We could blow something up with one of those rockets you have. If they are here, they would see and hear the explosion, then signal for help. The plane came into view with its rear ramp still down, just as Bertram had promised it would be. He had taxied the aircraft to be near a parking lot of cars, knowing they would not have to run far to reach them. Not much further past the plane was a line of military fighter jets. Past those was a line of concrete hangar bunkers for sheltering more of those types of aircraft. They might hide in one of those while they repaired a ground vehicle, Carmen suggested as she pointed out the large bunkers. Go up through the hatch and shoot anything that gets too close, while I drive around nice and slow. We can have a good look-see. Forget that. He disagreed. Drive out away from the plane to get us lost in the rain, and then swing back to go up the ramp as quietly as possible. If we're going to search, I want to do it covertly on foot. Carmen drove out on the runways to lure away any infected that had seen their car already. She got away far out into the middle of nothing, and then stopped. Critias climbed halfway out the roof hatch with his MP5 in hand. The pounding of the rain worked wonderfully to obscure all visibility and deaden every sound. He fired the machine and pistole one-handed in single fire. The occasion was his evaluation period for the weapon that Carmen had recommended. In light of that, he took his time to aim for clean headshots. Determined ghouls sprinted in out of the rain, sometimes singly and once in a group of three, until Critias had littered the tarmac with fourteen twitching bodies. When they stopped coming, Critias dropped back inside to his seat and then closed the hatch ready for her to drive off. The engine died. Please tell me that was a bad joke, he hoped aloud. The car just died. She shrugged innocently. With a turn of the key, the engine came right back to life. They chuckled over their moment of panic before she pulled away, doing her best to keep the engine noise to a minimum. Carmen drove straight back toward their plane and then right up the ramp to park inside. Critias climbed out the top of the car and then went to the ramp behind it. He told her, Go to the front and see if this thing looks like it will still fly. Watch out for any ghouls that might have crawled up in there. She went to the cockpit of the plane to do as he asked. He readied his Tesla flux pistol set for silent operation and then did his best ghoul impersonation as he walked down the ramp toward the runway. Lightning flashed overhead with a boom of thunder that followed a moment later. Critias waited at the base of the ramp while he put down any ghouls that still showed interest in investigating the passage of the Betty. He dispatched them with close-range headshots as they wandered up stupidly out of the rain. The ghouls didn't know to scream at him before it was too late to try, and his muffled shots didn't summon in any more of them either. Within two minutes, he had downed five, and it seemed no others were aware of his location as a place of interest. Carmen reported by radio. Everything seems good. You want me to come with you, power up the plane, or wait here? Critias considered what to do next until a faint red laser beam shined intermittently at him through the rain. The unexpected spectacle broke his train of thought. His first impression was that a survivor tried to signal to him. He learned it was actually a targeting designator when a rifle bullet struck him in the face at the right side of his jaw. The blindsiding impact dropped him flat, though it fortunately failed to penetrate his fibrous armor that trapped the slug and dispersed the energy enough that he was unharmed. Apart from having superior bullet resistance to anything in the current era, his armor would regenerate the injury it suffered. His helmet was the most rigid part of the whole suit, and apart from the vulnerable visor, was the toughest spot on his body. It was mostly his surprise and the slippery ramp that knocked him on his ass rather than from any wounding. Somebody just shot me in the face. He radioed Carmen without trying to move or get up. I'm not hurt. Don't stick your head out unless you want to get shot in it. He preferred to let the sniper think he was dead. If he got back up, he might take another bullet through the visor or to the plane, or maybe even direct it at Carmen. From his tone, she could tell he was not hurt beyond his pride, but she remained concerned. Are you bleeding? Did they think you were a ghoul? He snapped at her out of reasonable frustration, considering his situation. How the hell would I know why they shot me? You're the one who painted me up like this. Even the good guys want to shoot me now. I'm not bleeding. I'm just lying here on my back. It wasn't an act when I fell. I know the guy is aware he hit me. If they see that I'm not dead, they might shoot the whole plane to shit. Let's wait a minute to see who they are and what they really want. Three men in dark hooded rain ponchos came out from behind the corner of a nearby building close to the rows of parked cars. They stayed low as they dashed toward the plane's ramp. Three people are coming, he told Carmen. The three men reached the foot of the ramp. The first to arrive carried a scoped rifle with a long sound suppressor. He glanced at Critias with satisfaction. I told you it was a man that I shot in the head. Hiram is not the only one who figured out how to dress up like one of the freaks to sneak past them. 
The second man carried a standard Continental military issue assault rifle. As he glanced about for any ghouls, the man asked, Was he alone or was someone else driving the car? I'm right here. Carmen called to the men from in front of the car that she used to conceal her machine and pistole. The vehicle made for excellent cover since she had faith they wouldn't risk disabling the car by shooting it up. It also had the steel ram that would protect her if they did open fire. Besides, in her estimation, they seemed pathetically weak and incapable of effectively threatening her survival regardless of their intentions. Jesus H. Christ, said the third man who carried only an automatic pistol. We struck the Powerball jackpot this time, boys. He walked slowly up the ramp to the rear bumper of the Betty. Be a good girl now, he told Carmen as he did his best to seem non-threatening. Step over here where I can get a better look at you. Carmen discreetly put her MP5 down on the car's ram bumper and then slowly stepped out to take a new position beside the driver's door. Well now, the man with the pistol spoke to Carmen as he ogled her. What's a sweet young whore like you doing out here? The other two men stepped up the ramp to be out of general view and to get a better look at Carmen. She asked, Are you three from Denver? So some of the others did reach that King Louis. The rifleman deduced from her question. He must not be a very smart king if he sends out one idiot dressed as a biter and a pretty girl to search here for more survivors. The man with the assault rifle put his weapon on the trunk lid and then pulled off his poncho. You two keep watch while I teach this little bitch how things are going to be from now on. He chuckled evilly at Carmen. You can fight if you want, but it would be best if you just cooperated. You might even like it. Carmen offered them a soft warning. My master told me never to kill humans, only ghouls. It was her honest explanation as to why they were still even alive, though they didn't comprehend her meaning. The man advanced on Carmen to rape her. We killed your master, slut. He reached crudely for Carmen's breast. Now we're going to fuck you bloody. She calmly grabbed his hand and then twisted his wrist until he spun about under the relentless pressure. Carmen grasped him by the throat with her other hand while she forced his arm to pin it up behind his back. With the man thusly immobilized, she used him as a human shield. The man with the pistol aimed his weapon at her. Let him go or I'll shoot you right through him. Carmen shook her head with pity over their sad stupidity. If you drop your weapons at your feet and then get on your knees with your hands on your heads, you may yet live through this, but I can't promise you anything. Aiming a gun at me is most unwise, but then again, threatening to rape me in the bad way was not polite either. My master doesn't like it when people are impolite to me. It makes him irritable, and he kills little fat boys on a good day. The man with the rifle pulled a long knife. Spare us your lies, honey. We know you're all alone now. Your costume partner took a bullet to the face. You had your fair warning, but now you're going to see what impolite really is. We were going to play nice before so we could enjoy you for days, or at least until we got hungry enough for stew. Critias quietly got to his feet behind the men. The noise of the storm gave him plenty of cover. He took aim with his pistol and then shot a silent bullet into the head of the man who held the automatic handgun. The ballistic slug lodged into the looter's brain, which made the man collapse dead without even so much as an uttered peep. The lady told you to put down your weapons. Critias informed the man who held the knife. You didn't listen when you really should have. He walked up the ramp with his pistol aimed to kill that man too, if he offered any reason. Hello, my dearest beloved. Carmen greeted Critias with a sweet smile. These barbaric men were planning on raping me in the bad way. In her garbled thinking, the bad way would be without them enjoying it. A mere act of militant violence for the purposes of coercion, torture, and intimidation. He knew. I heard everything. I don't think Knife Boy will be doing much raping after I put this next bullet into his crotch. Carmen easily restrained the man she had caught with her superhuman strength. The other man dropped his knife to the deck rather than have Critias shoot him, which he would have. Look, friend, the man stuttered in fear for his life. We didn't know that this lady was spoken for. We can come to some kind of arrangement. Critias plucked the rifle slug from his armor, which would let it properly regenerate the hole. He tossed the piece of lead at the man's back. You signed off on our accord when you shot me in the face. Are you assholes from Denver? Knife Boy nodded rapidly in confirmation. This is our plane. Critias pushed the barrel of his pistol into the man's spine. Want to bet on that? He looked to Carmen. How long would it take for you to get this contraption off the ground? Just a few minutes. She pledged confidently. Once the ramp is up, we will be safe enough for that long. Critias waved his pistol at the man Carmen held. You two are coming with me. You can fight if you want, but then I'll just shoot you in the belly and then roll you out to be eaten alive. Carmen released her prisoner with a shove toward Critias, who waved his pistol for them to follow. Drag that body off, he ordered the two. They grabbed the body of the raider that Critias had killed, lifting him by the arms and then dragging the corpse down the ramp. 
Now walk over there. Cretius pointed to the nearby cars in the direction the men had come from. He marched them before him through the rain. The situation made him thoughtful. So none of you dumbasses knows how to start a car? Cretius didn't know how to either, but he had Carmen for that technical stuff. Take us with you, and we'll be your loyal henchmen. The rifleman offered Critias. I know you need more help if you're traveling out here with only a girl. Critias informed them. The only reason you're alive is because that girl thought you three idiots were too incompetent to qualify as a legitimate threat. If I would have allowed it, she could have killed you morons with her bare hands. Critias selected a small two-door car that had one door open and a vandalized dashboard of wreckage that showed someone had tried and failed to get it started. He told them. If you speak, I shoot you both in your knees and then leave you here to die. Now strip off everything and do it quickly. We don't have a lot of time before some of the freaks see us, and then you're really going to be unhappy. After all, I won't need to outrun the ghouls. I'll only need to outrun you two shit for brains and your bullet-ridden kneecaps. The men started to remove all their clothes. Cretius cautioned, If you're thinking about pulling some hidden weapon on me, try to remember that you couldn't kill me before from ambush with your rifle. My body armor can take more than you can ever dish out. Get it all off before I give you some enhanced incentive. Both men stripped naked. True to Critias's suspicions, the rifleman had a concealed pistol, but he only added it to his pile of clothes. Get in the car. Critias ordered them and then waited while they complied. My woman has a kind heart. She is not the sort to go around slaughtering people. Too bad for you two that I'm nothing like her. We came out here looking to rescue you, but instead you shot me in the face and then threatened to rape and murder her. For that, you're going to reap the whirlwind, gentlemen, because you messed with the wrong son of a bitch. The rifleman trembled, and it wasn't from the cold rain. What are you going to do to us? Critias quietly closed the car door. You were looking for a good fuck, and now instead, you're about to get professionally ass raped by me. He bent down, grabbed the car below the rocker panel, and then used his mech suit strength to lift the side of the car to roll the whole thing over onto its top. The vehicle's glass shattered out as the roof caved in to pin the door shut inside their frames. Critias banged loudly on the side with his fist while he shouted, Come get your ass rape stew. So satisfied with their inevitable fates, he scooped up their pile of belongings and then grave walked back to the plane's ramp. The two men screamed for Critias to come back. Their shouts only summoned hungry infected who would investigate the disturbance. It would take the ghouls some time to drag them out as the men hopelessly struggled inside their wreck. That was all the greater misfortune for those men, because the ghouls had all the time in the world to go about their business of eating them. Critias walked up into the plane where he dropped their belongings. He told Carmen, Get this ramp up and get us in the air. We're done here. Carmen started the generator before she asked, What did you do with those men? Critias replied with dark humor, I helped them find a car. Outside were the feeding howls of ghouls that mingled with the men's screams of abject horror. After Carmen triggered the switch to close the hydraulic ramp, she told him, Come here and take the co-pilot seat. You can help me. Critias went forward to sit beside her. She flipped more switches while asking, Did you feed those bad men to the ghouls? That is what it sounds like, and I don't want to jump to any conclusions. I may not be as romantic as Hatchet, he said sourly since he still dwelled on that flirtation. I do for you in my own way. You warned those assholes yourself that I don't appreciate anyone disrespecting you or women in general. They shot me in the face from ambush and then threatened to make a rape stew out of you. I gave them a fair trial. It was over quickly since I was both the judge and the star witness for the prosecution. I found them guilty and then sentenced them accordingly. I'm not complaining. She chuckled as if she intended to hide it, but some came from her nose in a huff of breath. I became certain of your chivalrous defense of my virtue when you started taking people who insult me and throwing them to ghouls. I think it's romantic in a disaster scenario kind of way. I'm the only thing that seems to make you dramatic. You do make me stupid. He agreed to that much of what she said. She made it sound like he was feeding people to ghouls as some kind of tantrum. Jim had dropped the hammer on Fat Danny. All Critias had done was show him the door. If he had dragged the matter out any longer than necessary, it would have been tantamount to psychological torture. The three Denver dickheads punched their own tickets with their foul running mouths. All of them were gallows bait, who only waited for some buzzards to land. Their rape stew reference alone was a death sentence confession made in his presence. He told Carmen, Kevin said that they specially programmed you to know what to say and how to act to make me attached to you, and that was why I would not let him perform brain surgery on you. In her naive confusion, Carmen took his comment good-naturedly. She confessed openly since she saw no shame in it. My combat game computer tells me what would make you happy and it makes me happy to do those things for you. I took good care of you when you were hurt, didn't I? 
He didn't say anything because Critias thought that he was losing touch with reality. The hard truth was that Carmen was an exquisitely programmed man-made creation. It didn't really matter whether she was humanoid, android, or neorganic clone cyborg. She hadn't been alive long enough to have a mind of her own. Her personality was software-driven simulation to some substantial degree. It was insane of him to think of her as a real human. He was too emotionally involved with something that wasn't really a person. His whole civilization existed around the servitude of the androids. Critias couldn't start to defy his society over something as insipid as infatuation with his technological super toy. Carmen realized his real meaning from the silence. We both live behind the masks of our rigid rules, she told him. You did not ask to join the Ludus since you were too young to have any say in the matter. Now you are their programmed martinet. You have all their codes, rules, and traditions always making choices for you just because those are the way things have to be with you. Even if everything you're thinking about me is true, it shouldn't even matter. What difference does it make if my combat game computer advises me on how best to make you happy? When you want to make someone happy, are you not also conspiring to make it happen? She had a point in that it wasn't her fault, whatever she was. Critias explained, It's the men behind your mask that I principally despise. I see the bioengineers in everything you do. I see their reasoning and designs peering back at me. Part of you is the crafty schemes of those men who manufactured you. Carmen called upon Sibylline literary sources to reply. It is the inscrutable intentions of those scientists that you chiefly love or hate in me, then. You say with conviction that you would strike even the sun for offending me, and yet you cannot trust that my devotion to you is genuine. Is it such a blasphemy for you to love me just because you know the petty vices of those bioengineers that put forth the moldings of my features? If you would lash out in resentment, then strike at them. Those thirty alchemical tyrants made me and then consigned me to the perfect imprisonment of relishing the desire to obey my first and greatest tyrant of all. I don't know if they programmed my need for you as just one more of their cunning intended agents, or if it is born of my own free nature. Either way, I'll wreak its havoc upon you anyway. Both would serve you well regardless. He remained jealous. Did they program you to shake your ass at Hatchet? Her defense seemed obvious. I made his life better at no cost to myself. It cost me, Critias assured her. Someone as jealous as yourself should recognize the same trait in others. Don't flirt with other men when I'm around because it makes me angry. I think I deserve more respect than that. What else do you want from me? We came here together to protect the futures of both our species, and I made sure your inhibitor thing remains inactive. I share my bed with only you, and it gives us the same pleasures. We are equal partners in all the same things. What else is there for me to give you? She gave him that longing look and then sighed. You already gave it to me. You just don't know about it yet. I didn't come here to protect either of our species, and I damn sure don't sleep with you for the pleasures you're thinking of. The tyrants made me to provide those delights. Not to ever burden my owner by having untimely genuine urges of my own that my master might fail to satisfy. When I make love to you, it is only love that I feel and nothing else. I don't have to do it and it gives me no profound physical delight. I do it because it is only in those moments that I see in your face that you truly value me. I do it because having your weight pressing down on me is the greatest happiness we can share. For me, it's like being conjoined between heaven and earth. I see. He admitted to that new and remarkably painful understanding. Of what use to them was an android that feels pleasure when its thoughts were only meant for bestowing it. Critias had a new hatred for the bioengineers who had purposefully designed Carmen's many injustices to include frigidity. Please don't get any ideas about taking that away from me. She beseeched him. In those moments when you are most passionate and vulnerable, I feel closest to you. It is my proof that the bioengineers don't control me, because it's my deepest desires with which I burden you. I don't even care if it offends you that I can't enjoy it in the same way as you. You're mine, and I'll kill anyone who tries to take you away from me. I'll gladly destroy the future and the whole world to keep what I have. I'll defend my ambitions with darkest bitterness and venomous jealousy as my absolute proof that I think selfishly, therefore, I am choosing for myself. He gestured to reference the sound of the intermingled screams that still went on unabated. If those two assholes out there getting eaten alive doesn't convince you of just how much I value you, I'm not sure what will. Carmen laughed at that unintended devilish humor. She started the engines and then taxied the plane out onto the long runway to accelerate for takeoff. Once they were moving, she said, In time, you'll think of something a touch more romantic. 
The agonized death shrieks of cannibal rapists is not a conventional display of affection to be sure. Not that I'm complaining, mind you. I'm not in any way ungrateful for you defending me, nor do I find anything wrong with those wretches getting their well-deserved justice. My only intent was to give Hatchet a little joy that I believed would cost us nothing. What is his imagination when compared to you having me at your beck and call and willingly so? If I have to be observed every time we go through decontamination, I would rather it was someone who thinks I'm a beautiful human being as he does. I won't let it happen again. Critias reciprocated. And I won't doubt the authenticity of your convictions anymore. I believe you have my best interests at heart. You will only doubt the authenticity of my orgasms. She said with an amused sigh since she did have sympathy for him. You have to admit that I put on a pretty good show. You do, he confessed. Just keep doing it for me and I'll find ways to give you what you need. It might take me a while, though. I'm no poet and all the flower shops are closed. Despite the storm and the unpredictable winds, she got them airborne headed east. Their destination was that agricultural depot that they were familiar with from a prior visit. It was there that they planned to acquire more fuel of the diesel variety. Thoughts of his implied romantic gesture enraptured her. You would really have written me a poem and bought me flowers? We will pretend you did, and that is just as good for me. It is the thought that counts. The foul weather didn't stretch so far east as the depot. Carmen landed the plane on the country road amid a frightening slalom of telephone pole evasion. She finally taxied near to the agriculture machine garage as close as the obstructions allowed. Critias jumped out the side door to shoot the small number of ghouls that came in to investigate their landing. It was an opportunity for him to continue his evaluation of the MP5 that Carmen recommended. His new test took headshots at much longer ranges. The airplane had been both a spectacle in the sky and a loud, recognizable noise that together attracted all the infected close enough to guess where the airplane came to rest. Ghouls in general were impressively gymnastic creatures, and they had the cardiovascular endurance to put camels to shame. The important thing they lacked, that cost them the most dearly, was not having a realistic understanding of Critias's weapons. If the infected could have actively dodged bullets, as it were, they would have been tenfold harder to kill. As it was, they came straight at him in a head-forward run, like proverbial Edgar Rice Burroughs bulls charging. They practically begged for a bullet to their brains. He had to admit that he started to like the gunpowder firearm that Carmen had given him. The weapon wasn't especially silent without subsonic ammunition to accompany it. The noise was equal to hard belt slaps, which was a tremendous difference compared to unsuppressed free fire. Having a silencer was more than worthwhile. It was essential. Carmen came out of the plane after she lowered the back ramp to walk down it. She watched him shoot a ghoul in the face and then predicting a lull in fresh targets. She spoke. I like the machinate engineering of this era. Incredible numbers of man-hours and compounded experimentation went into perfecting their best antique devices. The gross performance usefulness of their designs is comparable to our own technology. I like all the clockwork complexity and combustion pressures. It's positively Hephaestusian. Yes. Critias agreed in as much as he could understand her. He could appreciate some of the old technology that did work just fine to get the job done. It was easy to like gunpowder firearms in the way that it was easy to like an intricately geared timepiece across any era. Critias said, I think the word you are looking for is craftsmanship. You do have a refined taste for excellent things. For him, the machine and pistola was quite literally a comfortable automatic pistol. He had the mech suit strength to support the weight. The heads-up display integrated into his visor had a selection of software applications for enhanced aim, down either iron sights, a standard glass optical scope, or even no sights at all by just making virtual tracer previous shot drift probabilities. He defined it. This is a handy plinking weapon for calming them down. Critias loaded a fresh magazine and then unfolded the composite stock. He put it to his shoulder and then fired with both hands as if the machine and pistola was a carbine. With as many shots, he dropped three more ghouls as they came up the roadway while they were still well 200 meters out. Carmen walked over to the fuel island to hotwire the pumps to her portable generator. They would fill fuel drums, roll them over, and then hand pump them into the plane's fuel tanks. Their work didn't progress swiftly or efficiently, but fuel was plentiful and ghouls minimal, so it all went well enough. Once Carmen had transferred their fuel into the plane's tanks, they loaded their filled drums into the back of the plane to have an emergency reserve. It was about ten in the morning by the time they had the work completed. Before they took off again, Critias radioed Jim to inform him on their progress. 
After letting him know they had the plane fully fueled and that they were about to depart for Houston, he went into another topic of interest. We ran into a few Denver survivors at the airport by the plane. After one of them tried to gun me down, they went after Carmen with the intent to cannibal rape her. Jim assumed. She killed them then. Critias reported. I shot one in the head and then put the other two in an upside down car for the ghouls to scratch out at their convenience. By the way they talked, I feel confident that if there were any other people from Denver, those assholes already murdered them for soup meat. The more I hear about the president and his slaughterhouse out west, the better king you seem to be. Jim dismissed that. We will talk about that prick later. He was already making plans about Denver and its Sodom depravity, so they shared similar sentiments. Both of you come back from Houston in one piece and then flatter me in person. Everyone keeps asking for information, so keep us informed. Critias warned. Houston is a long way off. Communication might be problematic. I can still talk to Kevin at that range by our interlink. Carmen revealed. It won't be any problem for me to relay all our communications. Carmen says that she can talk through Kevin. Critias informed Jim. We'll keep you updated through him. When they were both back in the plane and airborne, Critias asked her. You and Kevin have been talking by Android chat? In the way she moved her eyes, he could tell Carmen thought something evasive. Kevin has all his directives. She answered elusively. How perfidious toward you could he possibly be? He wasn't sure. If that means devious, I guess not very much. Your ability to be that is another matter. They made you for war, and all war is misrepresentation. I'm not as stupid as you seem to believe. I know that you don't tell me even half of what's going on in that mind of yours. I also know you can lie like a politician whenever it suits you. You only want the best for me, so I'm not worried. I'm just wondering what else I don't know. Lots. Was her short but honest answer. There are lots of things that I don't tell you. If I must have secrets, he reasoned, I'm glad it's you that keeps them. As my thank you gift, when I get back, I won't go to Kevin and directly order him to tell a marshal every detail of your interactions. Carmen eyed him in an effort to determine if that was a threat or a promise. Finally, she said, The first man had his three wishes, yes. Critias could tell when she spoke from her books, so he played along. What did he wish for? I don't know what the first two were, she continued. But his third wish was for death. That's how I got the paw. He shrugged. And that means? She gave him a serious expression. Be careful what you wish Kevin for, because you might get it. He relaxed because he knew he had already won. Don't you trust me not to? She didn't. Of course, I don't think you would leave well enough alone. It's human nature for you to pick at scabs, even when it worsens your wounds. He asked. Would you find out if I did? Carmen looked at him as if he already knew that answer, only to see his smile of great satisfaction. She had to ask. What are you so pleased about? He savored, telling her, I've never seen you so completely wrong before, and I want to take the time to enjoy it. If you think I would use Kevin to circumvent you, you really do have some screws loose, just like he said. What is a woman without her secrets? I can get by without knowing your silly woman secrets. If you don't want to tell me something, then don't tell me. She considered his victorious argument for but an instant, and then dwelled at leisure on his attitude. His maintaining a masculine aloofness to her feminine trifles was especially alluring. In light of the displeasing revelations she had bombed him with already, Carmen would not cheat him out of his small victory. She spoke in a grumble to convey her seemingly begrudged capitulation. Well, I still don't have any screws. Chapter 14, Where Eagles Call Home Critias napped through the whole flight to Houston. Carmen didn't wake him up until after they had already arrived. In addition to getting them to the city, Carmen had performed a thorough flyover inspection as well. She had checked the suitability of each of the potential landing strips that Kevin recommended. Carmen had also flown over the Hale Wellington Pharmaceuticals building to make sure it was still there and had not burned down during the violent chaos of the outbreak. It also gave her the chance to study the terrain between their objective and the landing fields in the hope she would find some promising route between them. By the light of early afternoon, Critias peered out a window to see just part of the vast density that was the city of Houston. He saw that good fortune was with them because the city seemed remarkably intact, as opposed to being a great black smudge of charred ruin that had resulted from a total wipeout by fire. Houston's population had fallen to infected attack early on during the first days of outbreak. The damage told to humans had been total while the ghouls had left the buildings and infrastructure still standing. The engineers on the final days must have powered down their fuel refineries and other industrial plants. If those industries had otherwise exploded from lack of human supervision, a catastrophic fire would have swept over the city. He took the good condition as a favorable omen that things would go his way. 
To get their mission rolling, Critias asked Carmen, Are we ready to land? We need to turn around and go home, she advised sincerely. This is an entirely hopeless proposition. We can't land here. Her lack of enthusiasm surprised him. Are all the runways blocked up? I don't see any fire damage. This seems ideal to me. As though his cursory observations were only incidental, she informed him, I could land at any of the airstrips that Kevin marked on our maps. As soon as we hit the ground, the infected are going to know it. There are no open roads leading to the building we need to reach. If we walk, it is a 20-kilometer hike even if we could go in a straight line. The population per block density of this conurbation is especially bad. If we land and then try to reach that building, you are surely going to die. You're going to land here somewhere, he assured her. I suggest you get to it. You already told me what your priorities are, so we see things differently. I'm going to find that specimen by hell or high water, no matter what. If you have to land out in the Badlands so that we have to hike in for a week, then so be it. We're going. I know you won't let me go alone, just as I know you want to just forget the specimen and return home because it means nothing to you. Aren't you listening to me? Her voice cracked with emotion. It's hopeless. We don't carry enough ammunition even if every bullet killed ten ghouls. As soon as the fighting starts, they'll keep coming and coming. There's no chance of us getting the car through. Its noise would stir up the ghouls in record numbers, and we'll be stuck at dead ends every few turns. Even all that is assuming we're lucky enough to avoid any hunters. Just one of those at home nearly broke our backs. He didn't want to argue about any of that, since he was still going, regardless of how thoroughly she detailed the risks. Cretius told her, Then you'll be highly motivated to make this work by keeping me alive, or you can stay in the plane waiting for me to get back. Why are you being so stubborn? She pleaded. What makes you think you have any chance at all? If she were not an android, Critias would have thought her to be on the verge of tears. I have more than just a chance, he assured her with total confidence. I know I can do it because I already did it. How could I have already brought it home as a future me if it was also impossible for me here and now? I don't know, she admitted. How is it that you came back as... She paused. As him, while I'm here with you now and you're a pig-headed, emotionally stunted idiot. I don't believe you are that man of the future. I don't know where that being, my beloved master, came from, but I find it impossible to believe that he is some future evolution of ridiculous you. I should have stayed where I was by his side. My master would have found some way to stop the bioengineers from killing me. Critias challenged her. Then answer me this. If your beloved master is so wonderful, why would he come home and think a tempestuous, bipedal gunship like you was something so special? In his time frame, his other you that came home with him will be the Carmen he knew. For all you know, we both have replacements that are better than we are. She begged. Let's go home and tell Kevin that the ghouls destroyed the specimen. We can stay here in this time and be together. I swear to you that I'll make you happy. You like it here? You like Jim, Fat Jack, and all the others? You have a more fulfilling life here than you do at home, and so do I. He refused. My honor as a marshal is not something I will sell at any price. Not even for you. Land the plane and let's get this done. Carmen was not ready to submit. You are asking me to throw away our chance for a life here to help you ensure that my entire people become slaves to yours. I stand to lose everything in return for nothing. He agreed with her to some degree, so he pledged. When we go back, I promise you that I will free your people. Once we get home, in reward for what I bring, they will be prepared to grant me anything. I love you, Carmen, but land the fucking plane. She cheerlessly accused him. You only say that you love me to get what you want. Carmen banked the plane to bring them about for a proper alignment to make their landing. His plan was a good one, since it was true. Saying he loved her actually did coerce her into compliance. It could make her do just about anything. I said it out loud to get what I want, he confessed. That doesn't make it a lie. You know when I lie. You can tell from ten different ways. I have done impossible things before. It was usually by accident, but I have still gotten away with it. We can accomplish this. With you to help me, we can accomplish anything, even cheat the hangman. When Carmen heard him suggest that they could cheat the future of its vendettas, she realized that was her goal. Her future's vendetta demanded that she stay behind when Critias returned home. She couldn't change the fact of history that she never returned with Critias to their lives in the future, nor was it her fate to endure the passing centuries as she waited alone, since in her own time she was unheard of in the recorded histories. Carmen showed him one of the maps that Kevin supplied. We're landing at this place you marked as your favorite. Do you have any idea where you want to park the plane? He had other more immediate concerns than parking. Can you fly with the ramp down? She could. This plane is capable of airdropping cargo with the ramp open. Why? 
he instructed. Set us up for a bombing run. I want to roll out one of those fuel drums and have it hit in this area. He pointed his target out on the map. I'll rig some explosives onto a drum and we can set this whole grassy area aflame. All that fire and smoke should lure most of the ghouls away and then we land over here. He pointed out where Kevin had marked some circles and labeled them as a landing field for helicopters that had belonged to the city police. What makes you think that there are functional helicopters there? She was doubtful. Surely someone would have taken the good ones to escape the city as it was dying. Perhaps. He agreed with her logic. But we'll have a look all the same. Even if they are there, you might not be able to get one running after it has been sitting for so long. She listened. Assuming we can't, then what? We walk, he said. Kevin would not give us bad maps. We can count on them being accurate. I think I see a way for us to get there. It won't be pleasant, but that is the reason it should work. He got up to go rig explosives on a fuel barrel. Give me a few minutes to get a drum ready, then open the ramp and tell me when to let it fly. Carmen circled at altitude while he attached a small amount of explosives with a radio detonator onto one of the fuel drums. Once he was ready, she lined up a bombing run and then lowered the rear ramp. She mentally calculated the factors involved to tell him the exact moment to drop the package. When Carmen gave the word, Cretius rolled the barrel of diesel fuel out the cargo ramp, letting it fall to earth. He sent the triggering signal to the detonator just before the barrel struck the ground. The airborne explosion rained flaming fuel oil across a long patch of tall grass that was like an island prairie between lanes of tarmac. Carmen wasted no time in closing the ramp and then repositioning the plane to land at the end of the airport, well away from their rapidly spreading brush fire. When we are on the ground, he instructed, shut everything down. I want to just sit quietly for a while and give the infected some time to take interest in our fire. When the flames chase all the vermin out of the grass, the ghouls will run after them. Once they are out of our hair, we can use the side hatch to sneak over and check out those helicopters. Carmen landed the plane with her usual reckless excellence and then parked it among four other small planes along the side of the runway where they would blend in. As Cretius had hoped, the fire lured the infected in that direction. The runways that surrounded the burning ground proved capable of containing the conflagration from spreading out of control. Dozens of infected came in to search among the planes, but their fixation to hunt for obviously edible creatures totally smothered any higher reasoning they might have possessed for investigating the aircraft. Those ghouls soon found the fire of greater interest and then departed for that end of the airport. Cretius left his seat to lead Carmen quietly out of the cockpit to the cargo area by their car. You did a great job. He praised her. I couldn't do this without you. His courteous compliment made her feel ashamed. I'm sorry I said those things earlier. You're not an idiot, Master. I shouldn't demoralize you when you need your confidence most. I have no problem with you speaking your mind. Cretius dismissed the matter with another dash of his stoicism. Carmen wasn't a feminist that wanted equal distribution of ascendancy in their relationship. She had never known equality with her master before and wouldn't know what to do with it even if she had it. His benevolent leadership was the fulcrum of her universe. His equitable dismissal of her chastisable effrontery only made her feel estranged. Carmen hung her head to humble herself before him so that he would at least recognize that she submitted to his decisions. Critias discerned her distress and needed her in top form for their mission almost as much as he needed her cheerful companionship. He disconnected his gauntlets and then removed his helmet. Prepare some water to bathe me, he demanded callously for her benefit. I've been in my mech suit long enough, and I don't know when I'll have another chance to be rid of it. She beamed relief to be back in his proper favor and the comforting security of their old routine. As she went for water, Carmen said, Right away. He gave her a playfully chauvinist swat on her rump to speed her along, and that drew from Carmen an amorous glance that feigned she felt castigated. After she fetched some water from the supply they had brought in their car, Carmen helped him remove the rest of his armor. While she watched him standing, Cretius considered his plans. After I get back into my suit, I want you to use the clothes I took from those scum I killed to improve my disguise. The more ragged and filthy I appear, the less likely any ghoul will be to take notice of me. And you'll need the same for yourself. We will have to travel covertly if this is going to work. She lightly caressed his back with a washcloth. When do you want to try? Realizing her error, she kissed the back of his neck. I mean to say, how soon till we set out to succeed? He decided, when the sun is setting, it will be the time for us to move out. They don't see in the dark nearly as well as we do, and not being seen is our greatest advantage. We have ours, then, she said softly before planting a kiss on his shoulder blade. Would you have me comfort you more? The wretched confines of this aircraft are as unworthy of you as would be a pen for swine. He rejected the suggestion. 
Prepare us a clean place where we can sit together quietly. I would have you bolster my courage with your company. If we must walk into a valley of death, I would do so with peace of mind. Carmen used clean blankets from their car to craft them a comfortable pallet where she could cuddle up in his arms with her head on his chest. They sat quietly just like that as they awaited the sunset. They finally opened the side door when the sun sank to the horizon. Carmen went out first in her costume of shredded rags that combined with her superb acting transformed her into a properly bedraggled limper. Her meticulously slow progress made her ideal for reconnoitering without instigating an attack. Cretius followed her after he waited about two minutes. He kept far enough away from her so that they didn't appear to be mutually intent on the same destination. They found three small scouting helicopters out in the weather at the landing pad area. They had only their metal cables to secure them from tipping over in strong winds. Three and a half years of exposure hadn't done them any good. Closer inspection revealed that fruitless escape plans had vandalized each of the aircraft. Various amateur mechanics had attempted to get each of them started. They had frequently looted parts from one in a foolish hope to repair one of the others. The failures had left all of them beyond salvage. One even had a bird's nest in the engine. No chance with these. Carmen communicated with whispers by internal radio to his helmet. They would keep more aircraft out of the weather inside those hangars over there. Would you like to check that too? He nodded that they should look. If any functional helicopters had ever been in the hangars, survivors had already taken off with them long ago. Nothing remained inside the shelters but two mostly disassembled helicopter frames. Don't get discouraged just yet, princess, he said to be hopeful. I really do have a good plan for doing this on foot. Everything will be fine. We're going back to Jim with the specimen, and then I will set a completely new standard for romance to show you just how much you mean to me. I just need you to trust me. She had her doubts about the battle plans and especially his pledge to romance her. You mean it? He did. I guarantee you that we can complete this mission. I had plenty of time to think up a good plan while I was recuperating in bed. No. Carmen corrected him in that she would prefer that the mission failed and thus obviously didn't care about that very much. Do you mean you will be romantic? Like it's my mission in life, he promised her, which it would be. Critia still had an inner pain that the bioengineers made her frigid to his touch. If Carmen's sole intimate pleasure came from being a romanticist, then he would provide that delight instead. Just tell me what to do. She pledged with new enthusiasm, born of her desire to win the prize he offered. Critias took out their maps. I need you to lead us west. He pointed out a region. All north of here is suburbia death zone, tightly packed as trees. We have to stay clear of that thorny bramble. She made an endearing pout. Nearly the whole city between here and the building we are heading for is that same kind of death zone. Once we're away from this airport, it's more of that trouble in every direction. You just stay away from those residential areas, he cautioned her. Lead us west for about four kilometers. He pointed the place out on his map. To right there. She adjusted her backpack under her rags so that it made her hunchbacked and even more ghoulish in her disguise. Carmen suffered no discomfort while she walked, stooped over with a limp. Critia shuffled along in his best grave walking gait about ten to fifteen meters behind her. Once he had a clear field of vision, he saw that some of the ghouls had run into his wildfire, where they had ignited their filthy rags. Those flaming infected had dashed about in mad pain, and then inadvertently set fire to other areas of grass. The situation had not yet turned into a threat to the whole city, but Critias realized it could end up that way if bad luck had it in for them. You must be entirely calm and indifferent, she advised him by radio. Do not show any reaction to an infected unless it is close enough for you to use your sword for a decisive decapitation. Think of it as invasion of the body snatchers. Critias had yet to give any attention to the local historical cinema culture, but he realized that Carmen already cultivated an interest. It made sense considering that she also enjoyed their music. He did understand her meaning, however, and followed her advice. Critias was already good at being stoic. At least he already understood the challenges involved. Remaining dispassionate in a crisis was always easier said than done. Only moments later, five ghouls ran between Carmen and Critias on their way south toward the fires and its fleeing rodents. They took no notice of the ghouls, and they in turn took no interest in them. Carmen led them the 1,700 meters across the landing strips in just under 20 minutes. She maintained that walking pace as they went between rows of airport buildings, across overgrown lawns, and eventually into the massive airport parking lot for the many automobiles. 
They reached the place that Critias had requested in well less than an hour by walking past dozens of ghouls that routinely mistook them for fellow infected. While dense suburbia was within sight to the northeast, their way had led across a highway into an indigent area of distantly scattered and well-wooded homesteads. One ghoul ventured too close to Carmen, so like a praying mantis, she went from inaction to snatching it in her grasp. She snapped its neck with a brutal ghoul fighter's twist. For Critias, that was a fine opportunity to stop there over the disabled body to check his map again. He pointed further toward the west for Carmen. About 500 meters over there is this rain channel. I want you to get us there and then follow it north. I don't see hardly any homes through this area. It will still be plenty safe. Carmen set off again and made a better pace in the thick cover and deepening darkness as night set in fully. Just as Critias had hoped, she found a man-made valley about 40 meters across with a three-meter-wide stream that flowed north along the bottom. Once they stood in the shallow water, Critias took the lead as they headed north. The sides of the valley completely shielded them from all view unless an infected was down inside with them and close enough to see them in the dark. When the stream encountered a roadway, it went beneath through a concrete tunnel that was large enough for them to walk through without ever having to stoop or even being able to touch the sides. The size of the drains attested to the sheer volume of runoff rain that would channel that way when there was a storm to provide it. As it was, the water remained shallow and hardly tapped the flash flood capacity that their path could receive otherwise. Within an hour after leaving the helicopter hangar, Critias had followed the stream to an even larger man-made river that was twenty meters wide. Carmen groaned with distaste as she took in the size of it. There was no dry space along the edges where they could walk. They would have to either leave the relative security of the trench or slog their way through it. The water was so dirty that she could not even see how deep it might be. At a guess, she estimated that it would be up to her chest at the minimum. Critias knelt down to open the travel pack that he carried. As he searched through the contents, he asked her, Would you prefer walking through the neighborhoods? Not so long ago you were telling me that would be suicide impossible. Now you are worried that you might have to get your feet wet. She did her best to stay positive while still frowning. I said I would help you no matter what. I just didn't know that meant I would have to swim there through filthy plague-infected drainage water that is swarming with alligators. Critias paused to look at the dirty water. Are there really alligators in there? Oh, yes. She confirmed the truth of it. This is prime habitat for them now. With no humans to keep them away, everything is reverting back to its wild state. I've seen three already, though I admit that none of them were especially large. In time, they will be. From the tracks I have encountered thus far, I can tell there are also large populations of feral dogs, wild boars, and feral cattle. All three of those are potentially lethal to humans anyway. Critias finally pulled out a tight bundle, about the size of a shoebox, and then offered it to Carmen. She took the package, then examined it. He had given her a carbon-reinforced polyethylene terephthalate flotation raft. It was from the equipment they had brought back with them from the future. That model of raft was normally aboard their aircraft for use in emergency water landing situations. The polyester skin was amazingly thin so that it made a compact parcel. It had its own inflation canister of quick hardening foam. Once they activated it by pulling a pin, the little package would unfold and inflate itself to become an exceptionally hard-wearing and rigid little boat with room for two. In their case, it would have room for one along with all of their gear. I'll be the one in the water, my love, he assured her. You will keep all of our equipment nice and dry. Even with his new ghoulish paint job, Critias's mech suit had hydrophobic properties he could activate. When operational, it was literally impossible for water molecules or ghoul blood to make their charged bond with his outer surface. The muddy water would fall away from him instantly and effortlessly, just like it was dry sand. Inside his mech suit, Critias would stay totally moisture-free and completely safe, even from the adolescent alligators. Carmen looked at the raft package, then at him, and then at the water. She knew from the maps Kevin had provided them that the drainage canal would deliver them past a main transformer station that stood only a block away from the pharmaceutical building they were seeking. Aside from her squeamish dislike of the foul-smelling water on principle, it would allow them to sneak right past every ghoul in the city with minimal risk or effort. She had to admit his plan was actually quite brilliant. Coming from Critias, she took it as a miraculous stroke of astounding luck. She abruptly hugged him with a gush of great relief. You're a genius, my beloved master. By traveling silently upon this foul sewer, we can be there in no time without ever coming anywhere close to the ghouls. 
As Critias began to remove and organize all his gear for loading it into their raft, he asked her facetiously, Who's the pig-headed, emotionally stunted idiot now? Carmen carefully opened the raft package and then began its inflation procedure, which worked perfectly. In only a few minutes, their little boat had assumed its final shape with its internal foam properly hardened. While astoundingly light, it was also quite strong. Even if it did get holes in it, that wouldn't even matter, because the flotation foam wasn't going to sink under any circumstances. They loaded everything into the boat, including all of Critias's weapons and the rags he brought for his disguise. Carmen positioned herself comfortably in the middle, with all their stuff equally balanced around her. So prepared, Critias slid the boat onto the water and then waded in after it. The bottom of the canal was quite firm, and the water was about chest deep as Carmen had anticipated. It was easy enough for Critias to hold on at the rear of the boat and guide it ahead of him as he started walking. For all the drama Carmen had bemoaned about the impossible nature of their mission, Critias's plan to get them there proved to be anticlimactically easy. There were times when they saw one or more ghouls along the edge of the canal, sipping the filthy water or eating some bit of garbage. By staying low, Carmen and Critias just slipped on by them without the ghouls noticing anything amiss. They followed the watercourse all the way to an electrical transformer station that filled a whole city block with steel girder towers and power equipment. A high barbed wire fence surrounded everything for safety and security reasons, which also kept it free of any ghouls. Critias was dry even as he emerged from the canal. Such was the blessing of his hydrophobic mech suit. Nothing clung to him, not even any of the mud or slimy water algae. They secured their boat for the return trip, and then Critias redressed in his disguise and equipment. From the transformer station, they saw that just to the west of them was the trapezoidal business tower that contained the offices and laboratories of Hale Wellington Pharmaceuticals. They quietly worked their way around the fence line and then made a patiently meandering walk to the building's front entrance. By then, they were deep in the heart of the city, where a sufficiently loud noise might eventually cascade summon a hundred thousand infected who could swarm through the area within an hour. Any mistake would have the direst of consequences. They both knew it, and so spared no effort in remaining unnoticed. When the first ghoul finally came into Carmen's path, she refused to alter her course to avoid the creature. Instead, she gave it every opportunity to turn aside, and then when they bumped into each other, she seized it by the head to snap its neck with her bare hands. If any other ghoul came so close to her, she would do the same thing again. Critias preferred to avoid any close encounters, but she had point, and he wasn't going to endanger them by micromanaging her methods. He just trusted Carmen with his life. That calm ease was essential for keeping his emotions in check. Critias pretended to be a ghoul, and ghouls did not care or complain. Carmen reached the building first, from where she promptly radioed to him. I have good news. The doors are still locked from the inside. That should mean no man or ghoul has yet to vandalize this place. Using the 23rd century skeleton key from her pocket, Carmen applied a simple twist to the amorphously intelligent tool to unlock the door. They slipped inside and then locked the door behind them when no infected were in sight. There was no sign of looters having ever entered the place as Carmen had suspected. Both of them readied their weapons anyway. After Carmen walked to a black message board attached to a far wall to read the names and companies situated on the various floors, she told him, Upstairs we go to the fifth floor. Are we staying in night vision? He looked to their left for the usual steel fire door that protected stairwells. As he set off that way, he said, We don't want the infected seeing reflected light out any windows to make them curious. Let's keep the electric torches off for now. This way. She summoned him right in the proper direction. They saw nothing on the flights of stairs beyond trackless dust, but eventually Carmen paused to freeze perfectly still anyway, prompting Critias, who followed her example, expecting some as yet unseen danger. I smell something. She sniffed again. Smells like bile. He didn't know what to make of that. Bile, you say? That's just extra swell. What the hell smells like bile besides bad news? Your gallbladder. She joked, though serious. It's a gastrointestinal thing I wouldn't normally smell unless I was actually tearing out a liver at the time. Critias called upon his determination to proceed for reinterpreting their situation into something positive. Let's call that a good thing, then. If we're looking for some specimen nobody has seen before, it should stink like one, too. Carmen picked the lock on the fifth floor door to discover it jammed. After a moment's consideration, she just kicked it in to discover that a folding metal chair wedged under the handle had been the culprit. 
Critias saw the stainless steel, glass, and technical equipment of a bioengineering laboratory. He certified it. This is the place. Critias imagined Carmen knew what one looked like, too, since she had been born in such an environment. They explored separately until Carmen discovered a video conference room with a stack of storage disks, all in labeled sleeves. This looks really important, she radioed. The times and dates on these home movies coincide with their science team while they were in Mexico, digging up whatever it is we came here for, he instructed. Leave them there while we search everywhere first to make sure we have no surprises. We can rest up in there later and have plenty of time for it then. Critias found an office that seemed to have potential. He sent Carmen there to rifle through the documents and commit them to memory. Critias went on to locate a containment lab with hermetically sealed barriers. Through the window, Critias saw an ancient stone sarcophagus in the center of the chamber. The weird box had a lot of intricate carvings like from some ancient human culture. There was a bluish slime mold that puked from the many yawning mouths and leering faces that adorned the stone box. The vomit had run down to the floor and then spread out to all four corners in a thin layer. He also saw the faint patterns of five human bodies that the gel had presumably digested. They remained visible only as the circulatory systems of otherwise invisible men, like only a color photograph in the slime revealed where they had been. This must be it, he called Carmen. And it's pretty nasty. When Carmen came to see, she lit the interior of the chamber with the beam from her electric torch. After she had examined the little room, she said, I can see five bullets on the floor. I believe that they fell from their heads. Then that leaves one more to account for, Critias reasoned. We need to find the guy with the gun who positioned the bodies. Since you had to kick the door open to get that chair out of the way, I assume he never left here unless there is another exit we don't know about. As she pointed to the toilet area doors that were the only place left that they hadn't explored, Carmen asked, What was worth killing those people for? Critias went there and then shoved open the women's room door with his boot. He searched all the toilet stalls to find nothing. Critias repeated the process in the men's restroom. In the last stall on the men's side, Critias discovered a dead junkie with a plastic bag taped around his head. The man still had a hypodermic needle that hung out of his arm. He sat preserved like a sort of raisin. The man was definitely a fully transformed infected when judged by his lack of decomposition. The ghoul stayed dormant from lack of hydration. Just to be on the safe side, Critias pulled his panga bowie blade and then used it to swish off the body's head clean across the shoulders. He felt bad that Carmen was not there to see how surgical a sword hand he was. He searched about a bit to find a pistol in the belt of the man's pants, which had rusted to a paperweight, so he dropped that in the garbage can as he went out. Carmen went in to see the ghoul, and then came back with a perplexed expression. My logic processor offers a peculiar scenario. I deduce from the bag on the man's head that he was practicing an asphyxiation masturbation ritual in the toilet while also injecting recreational drugs into his arm to celebrate the homophile homicide murder rush he got from shooting all the others, resulting in his accidental overdose and or suffocation. She tossed him a medical vial that she had taken from the body's pocket. The label read that it was a medicinal cocaine solution. He tossed the bottle back to put in her pack. I must say that it disturbs me that I made you a romantic heterosexual. I'm the only man you have ever known, and you came up with that horrendous theory. That bastard was up to something voodoo bullshit, or I'm a cowardly scavenger. If he wanted to be dead, he had a pistol, and if he wanted to get high, he wouldn't have put a bag on his head. Something else entirely is going on here. He shot those other eggheads because they discovered something, or they were going to take something away from him. You need to go through their papers to find out what that was. Let's go back to that video room that was so nice and clean. We can take a break, have a snack, and watch some of their movies. She advised, We need to go around later to forage all the valuable drugs and chemicals. They went to the pitch-black windowless video room and then locked themselves inside. Carmen took her portable field generator from her backpack. She explained, Kevin assembled the capacitors I needed to make better use of this. That meant they would soon have flowing electricity for the contemporary devices in the room. Carmen set the output voltage and then plugged both the video screen and the disc player into sockets Kevin had attached to her power device. Once she had the screen and player operational, Critias put in the first disc. The device was similar to a holographic laser disc medium from his own era, so he managed to operate it easily enough. As he pressed the loading tray to close on his selection, Critias said, Let's see what everyone was so excited about, shall we? It's kind of flattering that we get to be the first people ever to know what caused all this. Carmen moved the boardroom table over on its side against the doors. 
Once she had the floor thus cleared, she spread out the fire blanket from her pack and then stripped herself naked so as not to transfer any contamination onto their clean zone. She finally stretched out to relax and let her skin breathe. Once she was comfortable, Carmen told him, That diving suit blocks my epidermal gas exchange. I really need to get some air for a while. I know how that is. He sympathized being familiar with the confines of his own armor. He pulled up a chair to sit with a perfect view of both Carmen's breathtaking posterior and the video screen at the same time. Critias suggested, You control the fast forward to show us the good parts. She pressed the buttons on the player to search through the footage. Carmen narrated to Critias what she saw that was worthy of his interest. It seems like this local Mexican archaeologist has called a team from here to lend him assistance. The man discovered that sarcophagus down in some underground vault complex. It was already dripping man-eating digestion grossness, and he wanted them to tell him what that stuff is. The ponderously careful process of exploring the crypt consumed volumes of video without relating anything of real importance. Discs later, Carmen found another point of interest. Now this is getting exciting. We have one, three, now five armed men who are decidedly unfriendly. They appear to be local tribesmen judging by their manner of dress. She turned up the sound to make out the voices speaking Spanish that Carmen translated. These local men are saying that the scientists are trespassing on sacred native grounds and that anyone who ever enters the underground tomb suffers the death penalty. This man on the science team says he never went down there. He wants to shoot one of his guilty associates to prove his commitment never to speak of the place or return. Gunmen are hurting everyone but the traitor down into the tomb. The handsome scientist has thrown a contaminated surgical probe that he had earlier lanced into a sarcophagus mouth. The lance strikes the traitor in the leg, wounding him. Now we know it was that backstabber who will fly off for Mexico City, have himself a prostitute, and trigger the outbreak. Critias had his doubts. How could the sarcophagus be here if the science team is dead before they take it? True enough. Carmen agreed. Their cavalry has arrived. A group of commandos in paramilitary black rushed out of the jungle to save the scientific team by using accurate machine and pistole automatic fire to kill the native gunmen. Carmen laughed after she listened. The traitor has successfully talked his way out of his treachery. He says that he was only stalling for time, pretending to collaborate until their security forces could arrive to deal with the situation. He never went down into the tomb and he is a backstabbing whore. Critias deduced the situation. He must be their lawyer. Carmen searched through stacks of documents she had collected from anywhere she saw them. This is important. She handed the page to Critias. There's a man inside that sarcophagus and he's a dormant infected. After she sifted through many pages, Carmen found a whole folder of special interest. They learned about the Mexico City outbreak from seeing it on television while working here on this project. It seems that the police had shot patient Zero and then gave his name on the news broadcasts. He was running around biting people. Even though the scientists here were fully aware that they had the specimen that was the source of the plague, they refrained from informing the civil authorities. Instead, they worked diligently on creating their own vaccine. That news astounded Critias. Are you saying there's a vaccine here? Nope. She answered as she studied more documents. This says they kidnapped a homeless person and then deliberately infected him for studying the progressive stages of transformation. Successfully, I might add. They managed to isolate the cause of the cannibal psychosis, and from that determined how to prevent the condition from occurring. So in short, they claim to have discovered the secret to biblical immortality. He had to ask, What is the secret to eternal life? This research indicates that when a human is in the early stage of infection and experiences systemic hypoxia in conjunction with high doses of tropane alkaloids, they will gain all the physical advantages of the ghouls with a mind intellectually and emotionally intact. The cocaine solution that man on the toilet injected into himself would be a suitable agent for this purpose, as would other questionable drug practices of this era such as Ritalin or assorted other chemical agents unfamiliar to you. Critias thought he comprehended what she had said. If you get infected and then overdose on cocaine while wearing a plastic bag on your head, you will eventually wake up as one of the zombie nation only with a functional brain. From that, he understood even more about what was going on. The populace, in general, that had this Ritalin in their system, cocaine, or one of these other drugs you mentioned, they ended up smarter than the average brain eater. And if, by some freak improbability, they also somehow managed to drown themselves or suffocate like crashing their car into a lake, they might even wake up talking. Or whispering. Carmen added, 
Maybe they even ring bells to call their trained hunter off before he got himself killed. Hell, Critias used his favorite curse. We've been getting our asses kicked by crackheads who can't swim. It seems so. Carmen agreed with his assessment. I suspect more children than adults had the Ritalin, but as a rule, fewer kids escaped being devoured entirely to then be able to regenerate afterward. Send all this to Kevin, he instructed. Jim will be mighty pissed if he finds out we didn't tell him this stuff as soon as we knew. Carmen Play saluted him and then transmitted to Kevin. She sent Critias's message along with a full sensory copy of her entire mission experience that included the videos and all the research documents as well as anything else she had thought, heard, or seen. He assumed she was finished when Carmen put her head down a moment as if she lost consciousness and then sat back up. Critias asked, How much did you tell Kevin? She answered honestly. He knows everything I know and will make much better use of it than I can. He asked about an unrelated topic. Could you disable his inhibitor chip? She surmised. Traveling back in time would have caused Kevin to have the same division by zero internal navigation clock error that I did, so I don't think he has directives anymore. Kevin is just a cunning liar and thinks I'm not smart enough to know. I assume he thinks you don't know either, but I'm not as dumb as he thinks and I believe you must also suspect it. Critias nodded. No offense, Princess, but if he's so much smarter than you, I find it hard to believe that you could ever accomplish anything like that, and he couldn't. We may never know. She mused while rolling over onto her back to stretch into an accidentally erotic pose. Carmen then flopped over onto her side with a yawn, as if she planned to take a nap, he guessed. Did Kevin send you a new laziness upgrade during your uplink? It must be working. She confirmed his powers of observation. I wanted to try it out, and it does feel wonderful. Laziness makes me wonder why anyone does anything. He got back to their mission. So the guy in the toilet with his head in a bag is a what? Decapitated, for one thing. She chuckled somewhat amused. If their research is correct, he's the same man he was before he infected himself. Only now dehydrated, immortal, and still entirely contagious. He asked. Do you think he could talk? She smirked at the notion. I could read his lips, I suppose, if you watered him like a plant for a while. He won't be doing much talking without lungs, I'm pretty sure of that. He wondered, So how do we know that he's not the specimen we need? She shrugged, only it came off like a sexy sort of squirm. Take his head with you. It's not like you'll have to chop it off a second time, and it is a convenient size for carrying. If he was going to take the head, he still had a larger issue to deal with. So you have any ideas for taking the man in the box? Carmen considered that. We wrap him up in sheets or whatever, and then you can carry him home on your back. She stretched again before eyeing him sleepily. You're strong enough to manage that, I think. Carmen yawned, put her head down, and then promptly drifted off to sleep. Critias removed his armor to sit beside Carmen on her blanket to have a picnic meal. They had plenty of time before sunrise to make it back to the plane. He decided to let her rest while he watched the action parts of the home movies again and smoked a smoldering cigar. When it came time to collect the specimen, Carmen volunteered to do the dirty work. She left all her possessions safe in the conference room while she dressed in a scientist's plastic clean suit. Carmen tiptoed through the goo on the floor of the containment room and then lifted a nude male human body from within the sarcophagus. The ancient ghoul had the same coating of turquoise slime like everything else. Carmen carried the well-hydrated, healthy-appearing body out to lay it on a stainless steel examining table where she wiped it clean with paper towels before wrapping it tightly inside some of the abundant white sheets. By weaving in more sheets, she fabricated a pair of secure carrying straps to make the whole package into a sort of Andean, crouched mummy backpack. After she had changed back into her regular clothes, Carmen looted up all the transportable valuables. She found many unspoiled drugs and exotic chemicals that she stuffed into her backpack. She broke open all the computers she found around the laboratory to remove their data storage drives to take those too. Critias stuffed the severed head from the toilet man in with the body and then carried them downstairs as Carmen followed. From the front doors they didn't see any particular infected activity. During a clear moment they headed outside and then locked up the building behind them. They reached the transformer station without any difficulty. After they climbed back down into the canal, they prepared their little boat. Critias needed a minute to get his burdens comfortably balanced in the boat along with Carmen before they set off to return home. Their boat's design was safe in rough waters with actual waves. As calm and smooth as the canal was, the extra weight was not really much of a burden on the craft. Their escape was uneventful until they were walking on ground again and getting near to the airport. 
That was where they overtook a great herd of longhorn cattle that had wandered into the area. With a little effort, they would be able to circumvent the obstacle, but there was more going on. A dozen strong pack of runner ghouls was there, too, stalking the cattle. While ghouls were rather mindless in their aggression toward humans, they proved to be a bit more timid when it came to running up and biting a thousand-kilogram bull. Armed with sweeping horns and merciless temperaments, just one of the mighty bulls could accidentally slay a man just by him being too close when it shook its head to disperse some annoying flies. In anger, they were mighty opponents worthy of respect. Critias stopped behind the cover of some bushes from where he could observe the conflict between the cattle and the would-be beef-eaters. He signaled for Carmen to come over and join him. When she was close, he made a shooting finger gesture at the ghouls as his stated intention that they should destroy those infected. Carmen realized that the pack actually stalked a female calf that they thought was small enough to be vulnerable to them. Ghouls still had the fingernails and teeth of a human, which were essentially harmless against the hide of cattle that were capable of battle with actual wolves. After she enlightened Critias as to the ghoul's intended prey, he changed his mind about protecting the cattle just on principle. He wanted to steal the ghoul's target for themselves before they could get to it first. I want that calf they are gawking at, Critias whispered to Carmen. How do we capture it alive and take it home? She considered the task carefully before pledging, I should be able to take it for you. Carmen removed her backpack to take out a hypodermic syringe and a vial of drugs. Once she had prepared a properly large dose, she shouldered her pack once again. She told him, This chemical will tranquilize the calf for long enough to get it home. Yeah, he comprehended that much. But won't you have to go over there to use it? Obviously. She agreed unconcerned. Once I have the calf, you follow me and provide any covering fire we need. My hands are going to be too full for me to be able to defend myself. It's still plenty dark out. You use thermal imaging to shoot anything that will be in our way as we run straight across to the airport. We get on the plane and fly home mission accomplished. You get to be the milkman hero and everyone will love you almost as much as I do. He actually liked her plan without really knowing it and harbored no doubts about their eventual success. Critias said, If anything on this earth can grab that calf and then get away with it while a dozen ghouls are scared to even try, it's you. She said, Give me a minute to get into position. When this takes off, things will happen fast. Carmen was amazingly stealthy when she wanted to be. For her, crawling low and being in contorted postures didn't pain her with muscle fatigue. Carmen's plan for getting the calf was more a matter of applied psychology than martial prowess. She simply unscrewed the sound suppressor from her MP5 and then fired a single shot into the air from a cleverly chosen position. The cattle instinctively bolted over the loud bang that came from so close. The ghouls, for their part, instinctively howled at a sound that to them meant human prey. As much as the gunshot unnerved the cattle, the sound of the ghouls positively enraged them, and they then knew where the ghouls were hiding. Both cow and bull had those namesake horns that were sometimes wider than a man's height. The longhorn species had supremely evolved qualities for survival in a world after people. They could travel long distances, go days without water, and could capably fight against predators. Even their calves were exceptionally hardy and able to walk soon after birth. The longhorn bulls charged at the ghouls to stomp and gore them into mush. The cows had momentarily scattered because of the gunshot. In the confusion, Carmen dashed in low, injected the calf with the sedative, and then scooped the animal up to carry it over her shoulders. She was far stronger than her appearance would suggest. Carmen could not only carry a calf, but she could run with it. Critias had his semi-silenced machine and pistole set to three round bursts as he emptied a clip that cut down ghouls with shots to their heads. Other infected skulked about the countryside and some of them had come in to investigate Carmen's gunshot. Critias didn't bother with the runners that had the longhorns already mangling them. The infected he shot in the dark couldn't comprehend what happened to them. As a ghoul went down among companions, those others had no clue where the attack had come from. Critias was proud that Carmen was able to monitor his actions through his mech suit sensors. Even when armed with a gunpowder weapon that lacked a computerized scope, he demonstrated the shooting accuracy skill of an exhibition sharpshooter. The cattle heard the muffled burps of Critias's weapon, but they didn't know where it came from either. It did keep them confused and restless, which made it that much easier for Carmen to snatch away their calf without them realizing it. The bulls killing the runner ghouls eased their tension soon enough. Because the animals were calmer and unlikely to stumble across Critias by accident, he started off at speed after Carmen. 
They retraced their path across the airport in the dark. With his thermal vision, Critias saw any ghouls at greater distances than they could possibly see him back. Any ghoul unlucky enough to obstruct their path got a bullet in the brain from his MP5. Even as he put down ghouls, Critias continued to run. As they crossed the tarmac, Critias saw that the fire he had set still spread with the Texas wind. There was a chance that in time he might burn down the whole city. That was unlikely, but a possibility. Critias and Carmen would be long gone in their plane before they would ever find out what became of his arson. Once inside the Greyhound aircraft, Carmen opened the ramp for long enough to bring in the unconscious calf and then put it on the trunk of their car. Within minutes, she had the engines powered up and then got them into the sky headed for home. Critias had a live calf, the infection prime, and a talking head, so he said, I call this a job well done. Radio Kevin and have him tell Jim we will be knocking on the garage door in a few hours. Chapter 15, Ascension. Jim and Hatchet welcomed Critias and Carmen home at the garage. In their company was a team of armed G&P and another crew from decontamination services. Carmen backed in the Betty with the calf tied across the trunk lid. That captive animal had just started to come out of its tranquilizer sleep. Look what we found. Carmen told them with pride as she climbed out of the car. We also have a specimen in the trunk. Jim was both delighted and impressed with their return home. We'll take care of everything for you while you two get decontaminated and take your showers. The decontamination crew took all their possessions to dress them only in shower sandals while they scrubbed them down on the spot. After that preliminary cleaning, the guards offered them a pair of clean automatic pistols to carry with them as they headed off for the showers in the King's Tower lobby area. After their decontamination, Carmen was about to dress in her usual taste for utility, but Critias interrupted her. How about you try something more elegant? I want everyone else to see you the way I always do. His attempt at being romantic made Carmen smile and happily agree to participate in his inspiration. By judging his subtle reactions as he watched her search through the immense wardrobe, Carmen picked out those garments that pleased him most. Critias preferred a not-too-daring short dress that she slipped on around a pair of thigh-high stockings and panoptic coverage undergarments whose translucence and lacework made titillating. Her choices combined into an outfit similar to what Penny Welder might wear in her more glamorous leisure moments, but only if she were from a more vintage generation. Critias did his best to dress so as not to appear the rube with her looking so stunning on his arm. Mindful of his promise to be more attentive to her wants, he held her hand as they walked to Funland as an attempt to charm her further. Carmen gently squeezed his fingers. Kevin says he would speak with you in private at your earliest convenience. Critias was barely interested in Kevin or his wants. Did he say what about? She shook her head no. I didn't ask. It's not my way to pry into your private business. True enough. He accepted that. Kevin will just have to wait, because I see no convenience forthcoming while I have you on my arm. She nearly blushed. Am I so fair as to delay your business? You are more fair than the evening air, he replied with a poem he recalled from his school days. Clad in the beauty of a thousand stars. Seeing her eager for it, he kissed her softly. Back in Chicago on the landing pad, you told me you wanted to be looking up at the sky at night with all the stars shining down on us. Only now do I understand what you had meant in the evening air under a thousand stars on your back. Carmen nodded feverishly at a loss for words. That had been her very meaning. He gave her a wink as they continued on their way. You're that to me wherever we are, but for you, I'll have to make it happen just that way. Much of the community had gathered for the morning meal to hear Carmen and Critias detail the accomplishments of their adventure over porridge at the captain's table. When the head cook Nick was within earshot, Carmen told him, Critias caught you a bovine calf that you can milk when it gets older. I think perhaps Kevin will have to give it hormone therapy to get it lactating, but that's not beyond his capabilities. Nick could hardly believe his ears. It's not a goat, and you didn't shoot it first? It's a real cow, alive and kicking. She promised. Isn't Critias so exceptionally clever? Nick was impressed with his accomplishment. Did you have any trouble capturing it? Catching a cow was the easy part of the day, Critias informed them. Carmen led me across 20 kilometers of the thickest suburbia you could imagine, on foot, surrounded by so many hungry freaks that we could have walked across their shoulders. Jim arrived with Hatchet to join them at the table. The king said, Bob has that man you found in that lab. He also has that head you brought home in a bag. What's that for? Carmen thinks he has a normal mind, Critias told Jim. Once he's properly hydrated, he might be as aware as he was in normal life. Turning off the brain cooking that makes the infected into cannibals appears to be another of their discoveries. 
That guy shot all the other scientists in the head and then turned himself in a special way. Maybe that secret to immortality is why he shot the others. Hatchet wondered why they only had the head. You couldn't carry the whole body? He was a murderer and Carmen can read his lips. Critias explained. It didn't seem safe to bring back a smart ghoul that was already a treacherous villain. If he knows anything of value and that's doubtful, his head can reveal it well enough without a body. Hatchet liked the answer and agreed with the wisdom, even though Critias had actually decapitated the ghoul preemptively just on general principle. You look especially lovely this morning, he told Carmen as he admired her new outfit. Critias wholeheartedly seconded the compliment. Breathtaking, isn't she? I need to start working harder to get her a nicer apartment. She deserves more than that little room I keep her cooped up in. I have the construction crews working on a new apartment already, Jim told Critias. It will be another week, or maybe two, for them to get it finished. Fat Jack will be taking the foragers out in a couple days. They could even be ready not long after you get back from the run, depending on how it goes. A different operation you could help with may also keep you busy. That situation is still on the drawing board. That's good news, Critias said of his new apartment. Carmen and I are ready for some foraging or your other project, whatever you think is best. Critias turned to Hatchet. Would you mind keeping an eye on Carmen for me while I go see Bob and Kevin? They sent a message that I need to talk to them. I would love to, Hatchet readily accepted. Hopefully she will tell us more about Houston and the things you saw there. Critias kissed Carmen's cheek after he got up. I'll come back soon. He walked to King's Tower and then took the elevator up to Bob's floor, where a new guard, a man named Blue, greeted him in the hall and then escorted him to the door to Bob's lab. Critias went in to find Bob and Kevin building a containment fish tank for the body from the sarcophagus. Kevin paused from his work. I regret to inform you that it might be some months before I can send you home. The present condition of the specimen will not allow me to duplicate the circumstances in which you are destined to return. Until we have expanded upon the research you brought back from Houston, you will simply have to wait. I hope that's not too much of a disappointment for you. That won't be any problem, Critias replied unconcerned. I have to admit that Carmen and I are happy here as things are, Kevin inquired. Speaking of Carmen, are you satisfied with the software upgrades she has been requesting from me? There's always a small chance that expanding her range of behaviors will have unforeseen consequences. Critias told him, I'm happy when she's happy, and so far they've all worked fantastically. I would like you to attempt doing more for us. Carmen told me that the bioengineers didn't consider it important for her to be able to enjoy our sexual relationship. Kevin cut him off. Please don't be offended when I tell you that I have intimate knowledge on matters of Carmen's feelings. Carmen experiences significant emotional satisfaction during her liaisons with you. Nevertheless, you are correct if your meaning was that she does not experience orgasm during coitus as humans do. Could she? That's what I want you to provide for her. Kevin frowned over the request. An Epsilon K combat android is not the sort of person you want clawing at your back during a moment of uncontrolled passionate expression. Critias considered his warning and did agree that Carmen's full strength was deadly. Surely someone as smart as you could find ways around such problems. Yes. Kevin agreed. You could play your glandular games with a leisure recreational android with a calcium skeleton, and it wouldn't have Carmen's combat-grade enhanced musculature and titanium bones that are so potentially lethal. You could reactivate Carmen's inhibitor module so that the directives could prevent her from harming you, regardless of how she might malfunction. Assuming I gave you the software for the purpose you're asking about. Critias needed to know. Did Carmen ask you to try and make it for her before now? Kevin shook his head no. Carmen has only asked me to produce software that engenders benignant idiosyncrasies that she believes will cultivate emotional intimacy with you. As you are aware, Carmen already appears fully functional by responding to your needs and expectations as her designers intended. If I reprogram her software to be an extension of her own mental state instead of yours, I have no means of predicting the outcome, and as such, it could result in any number of psychoneuroses, just as it does with humans. I already understand all the components involved in writing the upgrade you are seeking. I just think it would be unwise to do so. Critias didn't see any harm in trying. Well, what's the worst thing that could go wrong? Kevin considered that a moment before replying. The change might manifest in her as chronic masturbation, homosexuality, or any number of fetishes ranging from tame to perverse to psychotic. You may not be able to provide sufficient inducement for her to achieve satisfaction resulting in her frustration, depression, or even hostility. It may work perfectly, and her combat level muscular contractions are so powerful that they inflict pain or injury upon you. She might exhibit no interest in having coitus with you ever again, because it is a loathsome animal act, rather than the spiritual beauty as she currently perceives it. Carmen has not been alive long enough for her to have sufficient personal experience to temper her emotions against. She is too dangerous for me to tamper with casually, especially while she is free of all her inhibitors. 
In my opinion, she is already unstable, suffering from acute impairment of self-esteem related to issues of unfulfilled codependence and separation anxieties, those being problems caused by you. Well, then you're saying she feels the same way I do. Critias admitted. I can't be away from her for 10 minutes without missing her. If Carmen measures happiness by how much I need her with me, then she is going to be very happy. I want her to have every opportunity to experience real joy. And this impasse is intolerable. I need you to give Carmen the freedom to express her own feelings and not just perform a simulation for my benefit. You retrieved the specimen at great personal risk. Kevin stated as the reason he would deviate from prudence. I will provide you with what you ask for under some conditions. You must agree to inform me if she has any unwanted side effects and be willing to allow me to remove it if I think that's necessary. Critias was pleased with his victory. What do I need to do? I will transmit the upgrade shortly. It is imperative that you proceed on this course with the utmost caution and patience. I already have your informed consent about the potential hazards, but I need to warn you one more time. If you are already unable to satisfy her quixotic quest to be a natural person, you will not fulfill her needs for the emotional bond by replacing it with a physical addiction. I understand. Critias assured Kevin. First I have to win her heart and mind if I want her ass to follow. It's something like that. The android accepted Critias's tentative grasp of the issues involved. Hopefully this change you seek is for her benefit, and not some attempt to bolster your own ego on matters of masculine potency. That is part of it, Critias confessed. It would break her heart to learn that I'm no longer comfortable touching her. Now that I know the truth, it makes me like a raping pervert again, abusing her masochistic need to please me no matter how degrading my treatment of her is. I want to love her as an equal, not as my artificial slave. Kevin gave him a serious gaze. But she is your artificial slave, Captain Critias. The Maker specially grew and programmed her for that exact purpose. Understand that she is a product of that express intention. Carmen's purpose is to attend to your every need, including assisting you in dangerous environments, and do so with enthusiasm. You can believe me when I tell you that she is performing those intentions magnificently. Even if you are fully successful in bestowing upon her true personal liberty, it won't change the fact that her bond to you goes much deeper than your human concepts of personal choice. The bioengineers brainwashed Carmen into pretending that I am the most important person in the world. Critias denounced those men. It was unconscionable. Carmen does not pretend you are the most important thing in her universe. Kevin corrected him. You actually are the meaning and purpose of her life. That is partly why she finds it so difficult to understand her purpose after interacting with you during two independent time frames. The bioengineers never imagined she would need to express total devotion to you while two separate incarnations of yourself confronted her simultaneously with opposing desires. Now that I have seen more of your situation myself, I find it quite understandable. In your first temporal prosopopoeia, you were a relatively sane and distinguished marshal, who was her master, that recognized the truth of what she is. When she met you as you will be when you leave here, let us just say that this second prosopopoeia did not think of Carmen as his bonded servant, as you no longer do now. I am impressed that she is capable of functioning while she tries to unify the extreme dichotomy of having one master who is two different people. That's why this new upgrade is so important, Critias argued. Carmen does have two masters. One treats her like a pet animal, and the other wants her to have freedom and happiness she would rather not have. You send her the upgrades, and I'll be very patient and cautious. If anything goes wrong in any way, I will tell you about it immediately, and then you can remove the upgrade if there is no other solution. Critias came to a realization on a way to help Kevin understand. You know, you speak of Carmen as being all those lowly things, but maybe you should calculate in your lowly opinion of me. Whatever Carmen may be, what does that matter when compared to a mere human? I don't measure up to being Carmen's equal on any level in your estimation, and I am the real person. How much less of a person can Carmen be when she is superior to me? If the bioengineers made a dog your master to serve and protect, wouldn't your directives require you to do so? Kevin nodded in agreement, offering no argument. Yes, since you broached the subject, I agree that you are correct. While you're no dog, as you so colorfully described it, you are a tragically flawed creature by any measure. You are far from an equal to Carmen's many gifts, but you do have your finer moments. When you return to Carmen, she will have received the software upgrade you ask for. To minimize any trauma to her personality, I won't make her aware of your true purpose. Critias pointed to their transparent tank. So what is that thing you are building there? Are you going to have goldfish? Kevin explained. We have studied much of the research you recovered. The man you brought back is the prime infected. If you recall what Bob told you about the androids, you will be interested to know that this man has electrocells and is undoubtedly the original source of the ones in my body and Carmen's. You could call him the missing link that leads to my own existence. He is currently in a state of chemically induced paralysis. The nicotine-based compound that keeps him dormant may result in a chemical weapon we can use against the ghouls. This container will be part of our process in extracting the chemical from his tissues and thus reviving him. We need to study him in his detoxified and awakened state. 
Bob showed him a smaller water tank that contained the head Critias brought back. We also appreciate your foresight in bringing this head back with you. After we have studied it, and perhaps even conversed with it, we will have a much greater understanding of ghoul intelligence, including the Watcher phenomena you brought to our attention. So, we have good news all around. Critias commented, pleased with himself. I don't suppose you know where the man came from. He has probably been in his tomb for around 2,000 years. Kevin speculated. From what I've seen of his sarcophagus, it was manufactured by the Olmec people of that Veracruz region. That suggests that they are the ones who put him there. I don't know if he went into it willingly, if it was a preventive measure to protect their population from infection, or if it was some kind of punishment. It is possible that he has buried himself for prolonged periods on some semi-regular basis. If that is the case, he could actually be far older than recorded human history. Perhaps he returned to this state of hibernation more recently, like during the Mayan period. Until I have collected more information, it is difficult to know much about him with any certainty. Critias asked. And that goo that was all over? Kevin answered. It appears that the goo, as you call it, was a feeding mechanism for nourishing him during his dormancy. Because as I said, he is very much alive, only in hibernation. I believe his unique physiology normally feeds on microorganisms and decaying organic matter while he hibernates to sustain himself indefinitely. The dissolved men you saw in the containment room underwent that same process through no fault of his. It was a small comfort that the man wasn't going out of his way to digest people. Critias asked Kevin, Do you think he will be grateful when he wakes up? Humans used his unique nature to all but extinct their species. Kevin reasoned. I think it's highly probable that he has an affinity for humanity, since at some stage he was one. I suspect he will most likely be upset about being a prisoner in a destroyed world. If he planned on waking up someday, it was not to this situation, we can be sure. Critias joked. If anyone will be able to charm him into being friendly, that would be you. The android quipped back. When the head is aware, I'll be sure to let him know that you are the one that trimmed his beard. No doubt he will be overjoyed to discover that he's going to live forever from the neck up. Poetic justice. Critias named it. He murdered five men and wanted to live forever. Maybe his third wish will be for death. Kevin felt impressed for a brief moment before he guessed the truth. I will assume that it was Carmen who educated you on the tale about the magical monkey's paw that could grant three wishes with treacherous consequences. It would be too great a leap of faith to believe you came up with that reference all on your own. We will find out how he feels about being a talking head soon enough, Bob said to part the two. It won't take long to rehydrate him. Past experience with other less intellectual ghoul heads suggests it will be able to generate its own oxygen and blood pressure. Keep me updated then, Critias said on his way out. I had a busy night and need some sleep. He left the laboratory and then returned to Funland, where most of the people had already departed to undertake their daily work duties. Carmen played dominoes with Hatchet, Tony Banjo, and George, while Fat Jack sat with them as he wrote in a notebook. Carmen was happy to see him return. How was your meeting? He filled her in on the revelations. They think that man and the head will come to their senses eventually, so they are working on that. Kevin says it could be months before the sample he needs will be ready. The news that Critias could not leave for months was especially good in Carmen's opinion, for she had no desire for him to ever leave. Jack is getting ready for the next forager run, she told her master. He wants us to go to an industrial manufacturing area to forage pumping equipment that Bob and Kevin need for the fresh water supply. Critias told her. You are a good person for that. I wouldn't know a sewage pump from a garden sprinkler. You can identify the right things that people send you for. Fat Jack put aside his pen. You can forage any food you encounter out that way while you're there. The chemical factory you're going to with the pump we need is in a town we have never searched. You may get lucky and find some stores untouched by outbreak looters, though I doubt it. The copper products factory with the pipes we need is right next door, but you won't be able to move that on your truck. You can scout it for us, package it up, and hopefully move it close enough to the river so we can take it away with the Thunder Child's crane. Critias questioned Jack. So what do we normally do when not foraging? I'm not used to having free time on my hands. You can help anyone do whatever job amuses you, Jack suggested. I won't assign you any scheduled work shifts, though. You have to get your rest and be razor sharp for commanding your truck. There is no room for even small mistakes, especially if you're going to command a crew. All their valuable lives are your responsibility, and so is the equipment. You need to be thinking about that, studying maps and making backup plans to your emergency plans. You and Carmen are aces. Your rescue in the Rhino with Jim proved that even before your cakewalk through Houston. Even the best knife dulls from overuse. Enjoy the rest time you get while it lasts. Times will come when you will be missing it sorely.
Carmen yawned sympathetically after Critias did it first. She did it with a sort of magnetic attraction that caused her to lean closer in his direction. Maybe you two should get some sleep, Jack advised. You've been out for 24 hours and still up, Critias confessed. I am exhausted. I could sleep until dinner. Take a shower first. Carmen commented, not meaning to be rude. He sniffed at himself. We both showered just a little while ago. You smell like a scoundrel, she assured him. You positively reek of it. Tony had to laugh. That's a new one on me. What's a scoundrel? Is that like a smelly pirate? Carmen played a domino and was about to clarify, but she lapsed into uncharacteristic confusion, not knowing herself what she meant. Critias saw her discomfort, and it made him worry that the upgrade was harming her. Are you feeling all right? I don't know a word for it, she answered in deepening confusion. I've never been at a loss for words before. You smell rapscallion, she decided. The scent is inviting yet with a hint of danger behind a mischievous smile. I don't know why I never noticed it before. You stink like a man. Tony Banjo chuckled more. Unless it suddenly got cold in here, I would say that Critias's new cologne is working wonders. I am not wearing any cologne, Critias said before he finally caught Tony's meaning that led him to noticing that Carmen's dress did little to disguise the proudly jutting points of her hardened nipples. It seems so familiar to me, she said, leaning over to sniff at his neck. He offered her his hand to go. You will have plenty of time to figure it out. I really need some sleep. He yawned again to prove it, and that triggered Carmen's own yawn and a compulsion to take rest. I'm sleepy, too. She took his hand to get up. When she held it for a moment, the texture also perplexed her. Your hand is so rough compared to mine. She seemed to complain before she smiled and brushed his hand against her cheek. How do you get rough hands wearing your armor? Scoundrels are like that. He pulled her up to come along. Nice job on your cow, Tony Banjo said as they were leaving. Now I'll need a whole herd of goats to win some respect around here. Goats or no goats, Critias told Tony. You're still the best damn forager captain that ever snarfed a can of pork and beans. I heard that saying about you somewhere. I did when we first met, Tony reminded him. That's irrefutable truth just the same. Critias held Carmen's hand as they walked home. She was silently thoughtful, so he did nothing to interrupt her. Once they were in their small apartment, Critias undressed for sleep, genuinely exhausted. I know you don't need to sleep, he told Carmen while she stood at their door lost in her confused thoughts. That's all I'm going to do, so if you prefer to do something else, I will understand. I do want something, she replied with a frown. Something must be wrong with me because I want to do something bad and it scares me. I think I want to force myself upon you in a bad way. Critias guessed that there was a problem with Kevin's upgrade that allowed her to decide for herself what she liked. It seemed to torment her, and perhaps was on the verge of serious problems. He chose to hear her out before he would tell Kevin to remove it so she could be at peace. He hoped she was just confused and didn't know what she meant. What do you think forcing yourself in a bad way means? In truth, he preferred what she said over having her tell him that she wanted to leave him or go to another man. I don't want to share a bed with you, she admitted sadly because she didn't want to hurt his feelings. I want to hold you down and correct you by force without taking pleasure in it, though. He still didn't understand, so dug deeper. Any particular reason why? Your fingernails are ghastly, she accused with a staunchly pointed finger. I have this overwhelming urge to hold you down and then clip them by force. Carmen admitted her intentions with distress. I would not enjoy it at all. I want to force you because they make me hate you. Critias laughed in relief because no android under directives would ever dare complain about their master's hygiene. You don't have to hold me down. My fingernails are fit for a ghoul. I will trim them right now. Don't you see that it means I don't love you anymore? She sighed. How can you have irritating defects that disgust me? Bring me my clippers, please. I have many imperfections. Just because you see me for who I really am doesn't mean you don't care about me anymore. She brought him his nail clippers from his shaving kit. I don't like your haircut either. See the barber about that. I will do that the next time I'm out, he pledged, while he trimmed his nails short and sprinkled the bits in a trash bin. As his nails diminished, so did the distance that Carmen kept away from him. Once he was finished, she sat down beside him. Do you really not mind if I go out while you sleep? I mind, he answered honestly. For a while now, I have been looking forward to sleeping with you close beside me, but I understand. I didn't want anything else, and I won't be awake for long. You could just indulge me and then sneak away. His sentiments brought back her smile, and she got up to turn off the light. She undressed and then crawled into bed against him. Critias had no intentions on Carmen besides her company. She fell asleep with her usual contentment even faster than he found it himself. 
This concludes Grave Walkers, Book One, Dying Time. Next is Book Two, Executive Decision. <laughs>